Thank you very much. He makes them easy. <laughs> You want Gatorade for your run, running belt? Yes, please. You already have a gel in there. Yes, ma'am. Thanks for coming, man. Hey, thank you. Someone tells me they paired, uh, paired to this, whatever's in there via Bluetooth. And it's only a single Bluetooth thing. You know what I mean? So what does that mean? I gotta read for it. I can read for it. Do we, uh, can we ask them? No, it's fine. I just found it again. Just wasn't finding it, you know? I gotta make sure the heart rate strap is also uh, not paired via Bluetooth. Also, make sure it's still paired to the cork thing, hey? It's paired via Bluetooth to the cork thing. Mm -hmm. That's why my thing wouldn't pick it up. <laughs> uh, okay. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You need a pump? You don't have to put this in the box, do you? Just go here? Yeah, either on the top there or there, whatever you want. Uh, like this is just for the wetsuit. Um, just throw the wetsuit in the box. I see. Beautiful shirt. Uh, running is finished? All done. Thank you. Good. everything via Bluetooth to that thing, so it's like none of it's connecting now.
mal live. Ja, Hallöchen, meine Damen und Herren. Welcome to the Swift Cry Battle Royale. I'm Melly. I'm over here. Das ist Daniel. Ich bin Melly. Und Daniel bespaßt euch ja sowieso schon den ganzen Vormittag. Ich hänge am Kabel und habe keinen Kabel, aber ist ein bisschen schwierig. Dürfen. Und wollen wir einfach schon mal Hallo sagen. Wie ist denn soweit die Laune hier direkt in der ersten Reihe? Nee, kommt, nach der Pandemie müssen wir das jetzt nochmal üben. Das ist erst die Wende wieder mit sowas wie Zuschauerschaft. Und deswegen, liebe Leute, wie geht es euch heute? Ich habe aber ich komme doch nicht über die Treppen bewegen. Ja, das ist genau das wollen unsere Athleten und das brauchen sie auch. Sie brauchen euren Applaus, eure Zurufe, euer Anfeuern. Habe ich recht, Daniel? Mini, genau so ist es. Denn die Athleten, die spüren natürlich... Die Vibes, die Good Vibes, die wir hier vom Ufer in Richtung Altsee schwingen lassen können. Und jetzt geht auch Lionel Sanders ins Wasser. Er beginnt seinen Warm-up ein bisschen später wie Jan Frodeno. Der ist schon draußen auf dieser ganz speziellen Runde. Es sind vier Runden zu schwimmen und das Besondere daran sind nicht nur die, ich sag mal, abgeschwächten 90 Grad Kurven, man versucht dort einfach die Geschwindigkeit voll um die Boje mitnehmen zu können, sondern es wurde eigens eine Leine unter Wasser gezogen, ungefähr ein Meter unter der Wasserfläche. Die nächste Stahlbauer, nämlich die 7 Stunden 30. Wir schauen, was diese beiden außergewöhnlichen Sportler heute imstande sind zu leisten, bei sicherlich perfekten Bedingungen. Hier im Alpsee, vier Runden, zum Schluss sind es 3,8 Kilometer. Kurze nächste Zone, dann geht's aufs Rad. Bundesstraße D19, fünf Runden mit Steilkurve. Two kings. One battle. Time. To make triathlon history. The Tri Battle Royale.
Immenstadt im Allgäu. Look at this beautiful scenery, the perfect scenery to fit this competition, which is lying ahead of us. A beautiful day full of triathlon sports in, yeah, in a good anticipation of hunting down a world record. Welcome to the Swift Tri Battle Royale. My name is Melek Meli Balgun, and it is my utmost pleasure to be welcoming you today in this lovely day next to the Alpsee for a competition that has never been there before. We have have prepared a big, big run for you guys. We have a big triathlon ahead of us, the full distance, the full Ironman distance, well, 3.8 Uh, uh, kilometers in the water, 180 kilometers on the bike, and a full marathon to close things off with 42.2 kilometers in running shoes. And our athletes are already getting warmed up for the big, yeah, well, history that is being made here in the Algoy. Just to add on the triathlon history that has been written here already. Well, welcome you guys. Thank you so much for tuning in from all around the world. And today it's going to be epic. We have Jan Frodeno going up against Lionel Sanders in the purest form of competitions there is. A 1v1 that has never been there before, and I'm really, really excited to be here for my first ever triathlon, maybe together with you, with some of our viewers, and of course with our lovely audience, well, next, right next to us pretty much. Guys, how's it going? Are you in a good mood for the competition today? That sounds perfect, and I think our athletes are also getting ready and getting into the zone. We are standing right next to the green rooms where, where athletes are getting ready for the competition, which is lying ahead of them. They're having their downtime. They just warmed up, came out of the water, and now they have to prepare because at 9 a.m. CEST, it's going to start here in Immenstadt in Allgäu. And, I mean, we have a very fast course ahead, and you guys probably have heard that we're on a hunt for a new world record, which has been set back in 2016 in Rot by Jan Frodeno. And let's see what the course has to offer. But for that, I would kindly hand over to our expert, Paul Kay, to show you the course and to set the mood for the competition.
guys, it is almost time to kick things off. The music is running, our athletes are getting ready, and the mood is pretty good right here at Eibsee. And there are plenty of people coming over, and it's really nice to have a real-life audience once again after such long time here in the triathlon world without events, without races. But now we're here. The full distance will be covered today, and we're really excited to see how things will go. You saw the course. It's, it's going to be really Really fast. I'm really looking forward to our first stint here, the swim at Alpsi. We have a beautiful course set ahead of us with, uh, well, with uh, very, very neat conditions, I'd say. The, the, the weather isn't too warm, which is kind of well, not expected for mid-July, obviously, but it's the perfect condition for athletes. So the, the air is not too warm, not too humid. The water is probably roughly around 19 degrees, 18 degrees, so the perfect condition there as well. And we're really excited to see when our athletes will come down. But first of all, let's have a closer look at one of our stars, Jan Frodeno. Triathlon is, to me, of course, a sense of identity. It's something that I've longed to do and where I found my place in the world. Hawaii, honestly, was a love I had to find. I, I rejected the idea of Hawaii for quite a long time, and once I found it, it did become my great love of sport. I believe free time and switching off is something that's become the key to the longevity of my career. It's uh, pivotal to what I do. I think the try at home is something that seemed like a ludicrous idea at first that it somehow turned into indeed something really, really great. I do think it's possible to say. Very, very uh inspiration on it. It's nice to get everyone together. Here's a marathon poking him. And that's it. 42.2. Yeah. No one has forced me to become a better athlete than him. Uh, from your Jan Frodeno and to drop a few numbers I mean Jan Frodeno actually doesn't need much explaining he's a star of the triathlon world since a long long time 2008 Olympic champion 2014 the first Ironman 15 16 and 19 winner of the legendary Ironman uh, in Hawaii the world championship a true champion and a true champion needs a true challenger so let's have a look on our second king Lionel Sanders What has fascinated me about triathlon has changed over the years. In the beginning, it was uh, a way for me to, I was, I was, you know, abusing drugs and alcohol, and it was uh, an outlet for me to change my life and to, to feel better about myself and to get, you know, self-esteem. And then it became just a pursuit of how far can you go? What can you do? All the hard work is worth it when you get in a good battle, toe to toe with someone, and it takes you to the very limit of your capacity. Uh, I love playing golf in my free time, so, and Aaron's very good, beats me every time, so that's what I enjoy in my free time. From about a thousand feet away, but you got it. Oh! Mother, you alright, bud? Cut her finger again, probably. Survive Corona times through exercise and active, healthy lifestyle. It's, that's what keeps me sane. He can be the guy to push till the very end.
Lionel Sanders, one of the hardest competitors and rivals from Canada, the rock star in the triathlon world, and an athlete who only knows 100%, and also a multiple Ironman and Ironman 70.3 winner, and of course, second coming in Hawaii on the Ironman in 2017. And well, we are really, really excited to see the competition go down here in Immenstadt im Allgäu, and it's going to be fantastic. So well, the weather is clearing up. Yes, it was quite rainy, and we're wondering if it's going to rain, but today it looks good. The forecast is in our favor. And I would quickly check in with our audience, because there are a few people joined us. So let's hear. So we're going to hunt the world record today. Do you think it's possible to break that world record? Oh, that's, that doesn't sound too convinced. But I mean, we have to, we have to kind of uh, get into, into the mood of an actual offline event here. So guys, are you ready for the Swift Tri Battle Royale? That sounds more like it. I hope you guys at home are in the mood as well. And I would say, let's head back to our experts. Paul Heller, take it away. All right, ladies and gentlemen, roughly five minutes to go until our, well, our race starts the full Ironman distance here in Imstadt im Allgäu. Our athletes are already ready. I can, like, 
closely watch them uh, through the doors. And I think Jan is almost ready to have a few words before he goes into the competition. I'm really, really excited to be able to speak to him right before start of this caliber. And uh, well, let's see how, when he finds his way outside, when the preparation is finished. And well, we are really excited to see things go down here in Imstadt. And I mean, when have we seen a competition of this format? A one we one, well, that has never happened. You're absolutely right. That's why we're doing it. We're doing it for the first time here in Imstadt im Allgäu. And the, the, the good part is also you're getting more and more insights than ever. So we're going to share so much data with you when it comes to the vitals of our athletes and also when it comes to track information. So it's going to be very, very, very interesting thanks to our partner SAP at this point. And I'm really excited to welcome my first athlete here at this point. I'm currently waiting for him to finish his pre-challenge, well, pre-competition routine, because that is also something very, very important, because such races, uh, actually, of course, I mean, you guys at home are mostly triathletes yourself, obviously, but uh, for the ones new to the sports, is uh, a solid mindset is almost well, it is key to, to win a competition like that. So we, we're leaving the athletes uh, in peace as long as they need until, to, until ready to come outside here. And I would say it is almost time to head on the boat. So I would kindly ask Jan to join me here up front for a few words before the race. And I'm really, really excited to see yeah, and what mood Jan is. He's smiling. That is really nice to see Jan. How are things going so far? Yeah, really good, really good. Uh, super nervous, obviously, now. It's, uh, it's, it's quite surreal to have this actually happen. And uh, right now, yeah, I'm just uh, looking for the gun to go. I mean, Jan, it was a crazy idea at first. It, was, it wasn't planned at all in this, well, in this uh, breadth of, of the competition uh, spirit. But now we're here, now we're in Immenstadt, and we're almost done to start our 1v1, which has never happened before. Yeah, I'm not sure what, what seemed crazy. Uh, it still seems pretty crazy to me. I mean, uh, all you guys coming out, thank you very, very much. Uh, I think a few people watching online, it's, uh, it's super exciting. And uh, really, it's just a bit of a dream project. Uh, a big uh, thank you at this case. Uh, the last words I'll say, but thank you also to Lionel for making it happen. Thank you for all the local people coming in to help, people coming from all over. Um, to actually follow this crazy idea. Ideas are cheap, but uh, there's been an awesome, awesome team here to make it happen, so uh, let's get ready to rumble. All right, no further questions at this point, Jan, because everything has been said, and this is our audience today. Thank you so, so much for your time right before the competition. I will leave you to sit down in our boat, which will bring our athletes on the platform to start the race. And let me quickly check the time, two minutes to go. So, Lionel Sanders, we need you here. Our second king, or first king, has already entered the boat, ready to, to mount the platform to start this race, and Lionel Sanders, welcome in Immenstadt, welcome to Allgäu. How are you doing? Uh, very nervous. Yes. I <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I, I've trained for, well, since I was in grade school, really, for this, this moment, to, to race the best in the world, head-to-head, -head, the best to ever do it, really. Uh, this, is, this is truly a dream come true. That is very nice to hear, and the perfect setting for this extraordinary challenge that is lying ahead of us. And Lionel, I mean, I already spoke to Jan. Well, this all, uh, this undertaking, well, was planned on social media. How did it happen? Uh, I mean, I think it happened a long time before then. I think this was this was a well thought of event. Um, I mean, the course is amazing. This is this is built for speed, and uh, I think I'm just here to to try and push Jan to to a new limit, and. Uh, Anyone who starts on that start line, though, can take it. So uh, let's do it. Absolutely. So without further ado, I would kindly ask to, to go on the boat as well, because it is almost time, ladies and gentlemen. Big round of applause for two kings ready to face this challenge here on the Swift Tri Battle Royale. Our athletes are safely on the boat, heading towards the platform where, will, where they will start the full Ironman distance here in Imstadt. Well, under the flag of Swift Tri Battle Royale. And you guys at home, you can actually be a part of it. Uh, 
uh, tweet to us using the hashtag TryBattle, and maybe your tweet will appear on our LCD screens here at the venue. So guys, get involved, and I would say, without further ado, enjoy the challenge, and back to you, Paul. I'll tell you something, Hela, I'm going to bring you in here, but you and I, we, we, we've had goosebumps <laughs> since, this, since this got going, and, and, and watching Lionel and Jan sitting across from one another, um, and, and you can see Lionel's usually quite sort of light-hearted, he, he keeps it light, but you can see the jaws clench, the tension is starting. Oh yeah, his fists are completely tense, right, and I think for both of them it must be super surreal, we are actually sitting here and we are going to do this, this wild idea we had is actually going to happen, like, I can't believe that you're sitting there on a boat casually and going out to, to do this race now. I love the way Lionel is just in his wetsuit, but Jan's really embraced the moment. He's wearing the robe <laughs> that they were wearing at the press conference we had on Friday morning. They both entered uh, wearing these robes like, like boxes entering, entering the, the ring. And uh, Jan choosing to wear that, I sense that Jan's not just doing it for a sense of occasion. There's a purpose behind it. He's keeping his body nice and warm. Absolutely. Like, it's very, very normal to be cold when you're nervous and, and shake a little bit. And, and to keep your core temperature warm is so important now. And, I mean, the water is not warm. It's not cold either. And they are lean guys. They have a very low fat percentage, so they need to keep them warm. Well, as they step onto the Zwift Tri-Battle Royale pontoon on the Große Alpsee, we got quick sound bites from Lionel and Jan just pre-race, the battle's about to get, begin. Check this out. Lionel, make sure you bring your A game. The train is fast, and I need you to get on board. Jan, I believe limits exist solely in the mind, and I'm gonna show you that today. They are under starter's orders on the pontoon. You cannot believe the massive amount of work that has gone into making this moment a reality. We are in beautiful southern Germany, and you can hear that heartbeat. Let's just leave this moment with our athletes as they prepare. The Zwift Tri Battle Royale in beautiful Algoi. Southern Germany in Bavaria is a go, go, go. And immediately, Jan Frodeno moves to the front. There's not a huge amount of sighting that's going to be needed here. And Hella, typically at the start of a mass participation pro triathlon, there's that massive surge. You want to get that little bit of advantage. But, but here, it's just Lionel versus Jan, Jan versus Lionel. It's about getting into that rhythm quickly and maintaining it for 3,800 meters. Yeah, absolutely. This is a different condition than we are used to. Used to that there are a lot of bodies, there are a lot of people that we need to kind of maneuver around and, it, and you are swimming a little bit over your limit in the beginning to actually get out to some free water and get away from the washing machine as we call it. But here we don't have that and, and I think they both know that they are swimming their own swim and they can be pretty smart from the beginning. Well. It's Lionel being very smart at the moment because he's taking advantage of a bit of a, a slipstream from, from, from uh, Jan. He's letting Jan pull him along. Absolutely. Like, I would definitely also do that if I was Lionel, like, as long as you can, but at the same time, you can't get carried away. Um, he can't be swimming too much over the limit for too long. It's going to cost him later on. And, and, but definitely get some free speed in the beginning and then just settle into your own rhythm. But, I mean, Lionel's swim is improving significantly and I think we'll see that today. I think we've seen it already as, as it starts, as we get a great close-up of the Canadian Lionel Sanders, a 30-time Ironman 70.3 distance champion, 25 of those Ironmans, two of them the World Championship summer in. Uh, this, this, is, this is no slouch. He's also the ITU long distance world champion from 2017. Uh, but he keeps saying that he hasn't, he hasn't got the titles that Jan's got. I mean, you look at Jan, you've got an Olympic gold medal. You've got three Ironman world championships. You've got two Ironman 70.3 world championships. You've got a Challenge Roth, which, you know, for those of you who don't speak German, Challenge Roth, you know, he went, he went 7.35 in several seconds. Um, and, and, and Lionel's saying, well, you know, he, he's never beaten Jan Frodeno, but I had to remind him at the press conference, at the Ironman World Championship Kona Hawaii in 2017, 
Jan did finish, albeit with major back trouble, and walked the marathon. And, and Lionel Sanders finished second. So he has beaten Jan in a world championship. He definitely has beaten him. But and I understand that he, he looks up to, to Jan and he, he mirrors himself in Jan. And it's a role model. And I think like Jan he has really achieved what, what anyone would love to achieve. Like So I think like it's only normal that, that uh, like he's really inspired, like Lionel is really inspired by Jan. And, and now we can see already, yeah, that they are moving and we can see the gap already. And, and that is what we are expecting. And this gap will only grow um, as we get into the swim. Well, if you look very, very carefully at your screens, if you're getting really, really close, Hella, can you see under the yep. water that line? Yeah. That's the line that they're following. It's a Teflon yep. white rope that's sitting yep. approximately one meter below the right surface. Right and, and this is basically a, a big oval uh -huh. that they're swimming. Uh, and they get to follow the line. So there's, there's none of that head up and sighting where usually, mm -hmm. especially with the, the less experienced swimmers, your, your, your legs and your hips drop and you slow down substantially. So this course is designed to be super fast. Absolutely, this is almost like a pool and you can see the water surface as well is flat as a pool. Like this is, I would say like this is Lionel's, um, it's an advantage for Lionel because I mean, if you are a very good swimmer, you, you can actually manage very hard conditions easier if, you, than you're, if you're not that good of a swimmer. So definitely Lionel's advances and, and I mean, it would be very surreal to swim open water and actually don't have to sight. I mean, like sighting is a big deal, and as you say, like you know, sighting is a is a is a tool you need to you need to train it. You need to only put your eyes over the water edge. Don't lift your whole head because that's going to affect your whole body position, and you are going to create drag, and you don't want that. Now I know you're you're a professional. <laughs> the fastest time of the 70.3 distance. You're a, a long distance world champion. I'm an age grouper, as the Germans call it, a hobby athlete, mm -hmm. uh, as, as a lot of people around the world call it, a, a weekend warrior. One of the things we all struggle with is the swim. We struggle with the sense of anticipation, the panic attacks in the water in that whole group. Uh, we struggle with swimming straight and sighting. This, to me, is the perfect swim course for an age group. I can look down at the line, and it's just me and one other athlete. But look at that gap that Jan Frodeno is already opening up. We got time to speak to our two kings quite a bit before the race and find out a little bit more about their preparations. And we're going to now share that with you. So my preparation for this race really has changed somewhat more because of the course, not because of the competitors, because I always, you know, I would prepare against Lionel like in any other race when I get to go against him. But the course does demand a special kind of training. There's very little technical difficulty and it's all about building an engine. Uh, we really took out um, any skill factor, more or less, uh, in order to make this race fast and to make it more competitive and, and really something where, you know, it's much about the physical preparation, staying in the aero position for a very long time. And that demands a, a different kind of training, perhaps more indoor focused, um, just being very much concentrated on riding in the aero position. Um, and then also, you know, the tactical element really falls away a little bit because it, it's about the time in general. So you're trying to be as fast from A to B, and that's generally more of a monotonous kind of pace rather than, you know, having a big takeout speed or surges or anything like that. I've been preparing for this race for the last 10 years, basically, because of my swim weakness. I've been doing individual time trials for most of my career. So I would basically get dropped in the swim right off the start, be swimming by myself, and then come out of the water. I've literally come out of the water at 70.3 Worlds in 2014, for instance, last place of the professional men. So uh, you basically are by yourself, ride by yourself. Maybe if you ride well, you can start to catch guys towards the end of the bike. And then you have to be able to run well off of having done basically your entire effort on your own the entire time. So there's really nothing new here for me. Um, you know, if anything, I'm going back to my roots, back to my style of racing that I have excelled at and that sort of got me to where I've been able to get to. So I'm excited for that. You know, as you get better at the swimming portion and as the, the, uh, the, the, the competition has gotten better over the years, 
you've had to improve your swim and have been bigger and bigger packs on the swim and then in the bike, which brought tactics into the game. And so I've had to get better at tactics over the years and, and I've, I have done that. But this is more, this is more like, you know, true racing. There's not really that many tactics here. It's basically who is better at the combination of swimming, biking and running. And, uh, and, I, and I would like to see, I would like to, to find out. And especially over the Ironman distance, you know, with the 70.3, it's one thing, but this is the true, you know, the true test of endurance to do the full distance. And we're testing our two kings in the Grosse Alps there, almost eight minutes of swimming. And I remember Jan talking about sort of 110 per 100. I mean, that is just brutally fast. Even in a 25 meter pool where you get to tumble turn and kick off the walls, 110 per 100 is flying. It is definitely fast. I mean, the wetsuit will obviously help you to swim faster as it gives you buoyancy. Um, but yeah, 110, that is absolutely world class. It's even like for an open water professional swimmer, 110 pace is really fast. Flying at the moment in his debut wetsuit is your three-time Ironman world champion, your distance record holder from Germany, Jan Frodeno, living in Girona in Spain. So, and I, and I wanted to bring that up earlier. So, so Jan coming up from Girona in Spain, Lionel coming all the way across from, even though he lives in Canada, uh, he's from Canada, but he's living in, in Arizona. So, so Lionel having a bit, of a bit of jet lag to deal with in the first couple of days he got here. But the truth is that on this course, with brand new design, uh, on a territory that neither of them have really raced, although Jan did become German champion here in the Algoi Triathlon, mm -hmm. um, there's no real home ground advantage. And, and, and these athletes, I mean, Jan is very, very shrewd. He relies on his tactical strength as well in a, in a normal race. But, but here, I would imagine all those tactics have been planned well in advance, but there's still the sense of unknown. Absolutely, they're both racing blind. This is brand new for both of them. Also, the the way of racing, like it is literally man against man, but it's also you against you because you need to be within yourself the whole day. It, it's a pacing game. It's staying within your limits uh, and not, you know, going above even though you're feeling good. So, like as as also as. As Jen said, it's about finding that pace that suits you all day long and staying there. So if we look at this, I'm, I'm guessing, Hella, but I'm guessing we've got about a 200 meter lead for Jan Frodeno over Lionel Sanders. And at a 110, that's already two minutes 20, theoretically, he's in front of, of Lionel. But what we also did is we, we got a chance to hear from them about their specific swim expectations over these 3,800 meters. And we're gonna share from each of our kings, Lionel and Jan, what they hope to do in the Grosse Abse today. Listen to this. The swim really will be somewhat crucial. We always say in triathlon, you can't win the race, but you can certainly lose it. And if we look at the benchmark that set, um, that was a, a 111 per 100 meter pace. Um, that's quick. I'm not sure I've still got that in my arms. Um, but really, the, the great thing is that the course will be lined. Um, there's no sighting going on. And it, it's really, again, about setting an even as possible pace, not being too excited in the beginning, which will be very hard. Uh, I will be frank, there, there's a lot of pressure on at the moment. And, and the whole construct that we've created here um, is obviously something that I get to take my backpack on on Sunday, um, which don't get me wrong, I love it. Um, I, I need I need that kind of pressure, but it does tend to excite me that much that I have to watch out in the beginning, and then yeah, keep the pace high um, and and keep it as even as possible. Hella, keeping that pace even and, and, and not needing to surge and, and not needing to go you know that little water polo fight through some of the tight turns around the boys these are gentle turns this makes for a lower heart rate and lower expenditure of energy yeah you don't have these surges you don't have to kind of speed up and come down and, and waste energy like that to to pace evenly definitely make you you can know you can tolerate the same pace for a longer time and we can see now the graphics came up 56 minutes 56 seconds uh, difference between the two of them and I think that's what expected and 
And I think it's interesting also to look at the two different style of swimming. Yeah. Um, and you could, when you're looking at Lionel there, like I'm noticing um, a very, very flat stroke uh, with his arms, so very wide and flat, uh, and a, a relatively high head position. I was um, going to say that the head looks a little high, which the higher the head, the more you drop the hips, yeah, the more drag. Absolutely. You need to think about sometimes like to, to look further down that you want to, like push your head down. It needs to almost feel over-exaggerated sometimes yes. that you need to stick that head down yeah. because you don't want to create that drag in front of your body and also it alters your body position so i think it's something that we easily make a mistake that we we want to look up a little bit and we also do it in the pool we want to look up to the turn but we actually need to kind of force ourselves to stick that head down in the water so we don't alter that position well we've got the wonderful crew at sap at sap who are providing us with a huge amount of data now you know, Ella, I always say that if I was intelligent and good with numbers, I'd have a real job. So you here to do the analysis <laughs> and give us the job. In red, the King Frodeno. In red, in green, the other King Sanders. And we're just looking at after 750 meters in the swim, the projected time for for Jan is 44:45, 49:41 for for Lionel. That that seems to be a bit more than what they were hoping for in terms of the gap. It's more than they were hoping for in terms of the gap, but I would say if Lionel is swimming 49 on a swim, he will be happy. <laughs> that is fast swimming for Lionel. And I mean, a 44-45 is flying. I've got a feeling Lucy Charles is watching this and go, <laughs> Oi, give me a chance at this course. Exactly, yeah. She can give the pro men a battle, that's for sure. That's, oh, why don't we do like a, a tri-battle royal next year with like Lucy Charles versus Daniela Reeve? <laughs> I think that would be amazing. Oh, I'll definitely be there for it. No kidding. So we, we, we heard from, from Jan Frodeno a moment ago about swim expectations. And we've been watching Lionel Sanders Yen talking about his swim style. But, but his swimming has improved. And here we get to hear from the colonel himself about his swim expectations. Yeah, it's business as usual for me on the swim. The gun will go, Jan will drop me, and and then I will have to swim to the best of my ability by myself, which is what normally happens. I've really worked on that. The last, I've had my four last swims in my last four races have been lifetime best swims. And I attribute that to uh, just all my swimming in the pool now. All I focus, I don't focus on the clock. I just focus on feel for the water. Just, just, just getting the perception of the water better and better and better. And it's really helped me in the open water because there is no, there's nothing to gauge. There's no other people really. Uh, there's no pace clock, all these things. There's no way to gauge how well you're swimming. So you have to be able to feel the water and know that, oh, that that's what good swimming feels like. So that's all I'll be thinking about in the swim is don't muscle the water, feel the water. If you're hypoxic, you're not s swimming well. Um, and then, and then I'll just, you know, as, as far as I, I've heard, there's a, there's a pacing line or a, a rope that you can follow so you don't even have to sight, you know? So it's perfect for me. These are all skills that uh, for a weaker swimmer that, that you know, probably aren't up as, as, as good as some of the better guys. But uh, so I'll just focus on that line and focus on feel for the water. Then I'll come out of the water and I'll hear whatever the deficit is. If it's under three minutes, I mean, I'm, I'm doing real good. Uh, but if it's not, you know, well, who cares? The race must go on. He's so honest. And, and that honesty and that, that, that style of when he speaks is completely uncensored, is very, very endearing. And for sure, his swimming's improved massively. I mean, I'm talking about the Colonel from Canada. Swimming has improved absolutely massively. Head came out the water there. He's just probably trying to see where, where Jan Fredeno is. And he said, well, you know, hopefully it'll be three minutes or less, but you and I both know from the SAP projections we've seen, possibly he's not going to get that three minutes. It's going to be more like four minutes. But a very critical topic he brought up there, which is something all average to poor swimmers need to learn, is that feel for the water. Yeah, I mean, feel for the water is the magic of swimming. Um, it is something that is so difficult to to learn to get that water and catch that water. It is a sense like you are an element that essentially is working against you. Yep. It's creating resistance for you to move forward. And when you get the feel of the water and then when you can catch that water, that element is something that can propel you forward. It works with you. And, and that's when you're starting to love being in an element, to feel how the body and the body of water surrounds you yep. and how it actually 
it's an amazing feeling. And as a swimmer, um, it doesn't take it more than a few days out of the water if you have been a professional swimmer where you lose that feel. Really? Of course, you get it fast back again, yeah. but you lose it. It's such a fine feeling. And, and when you have it, as, as Lionel is getting that feel for the water, if he's getting there now, whew, then we would see great things. Talk about seeing great things. We were watching Jan Frodeno there, and he just looks so beautiful in the water. It, it looks like he's expending no energy. It looks graceful. Yeah, I mean, he also breathes bilaterally, so like to, uh, to every time to the right. Uh, so every second stroke he will breathe. But the way he moves in the water, so basically you want to break the water in as small as an area as possible. So your rotation is key. Uh, so that you, you're breaking the water in a small, small area and kind of making you as, as little as possible to move forward. So again, like this body of water is not creating too much of, of, of a resistance on your body. And yeah, I mean, Jan is p picture perfect, but he is also swimming pretty fast. Now, the thing is, when you watch Lucy versus the others, when you watch Jan versus the others, Henry Schumann in, in, in Olympic distance racing, uh, the Vargas, etc. You, you, you look at, like if you compare Henry Schumann to Richard Murray, everybody thinks Richard Murray is a slow swimmer. He's not a slow swimmer. He's just not as fast as Henry. And we look at the, the, the gap now, we're looking at about one minute 50 gap between Jan Frodeno who's currently in front of Lionel Sanders. Um, when you watch Jan swim, and then you go look at Lionel, you think Lionel's slow. He's not swimming slowly by any means. Absolutely not. Like, it's just, you know, this is high standard. Like, Jan comes, he has a swim background, and he is, uh, has a short distance background in triathlon. So ITU racing, and in ITU racing, you need to be a super, super fast swimmer. You know, you have 65 guys on the start line, sometimes 75. And, and sometimes you will have 50 guys coming out of the water within the first minute. Mm. This is fast racing. So, I mean, like, he has obviously kept that swim level up to his long distance, and, and you can see that. And, I mean, like, what you're seeing is that there is no, as I talked about picture perfect, but there is no perfect yeah. stroke. Like, above the water, doesn't really matter. Just get those arms around that recovery phase fast around, and then it's about what's happening under the water, the feel for the water, the cat, the grab. How are you kind of moving under the water, the high elbow under the water? Use your big back muscles to swim with, and then keep that head down, your body position as close to the surface, and then you need to be fit. <laughs> you and need that, to be fit in the water. And being fit means a lot of time in the pool. So let's just compare our two kings here. Now, in the left corner, representing Germany, Jan Frodeno, 75 kilograms. He's exactly one month away from his 40th birthday on the 18th of August. On his right-hand side, all the way from Canada, in the right corner, representing Canada, a little bit younger, seven years younger, but not as experienced in the sport of triathlon, Lionel Sanders. We're looking at, a, I think Jan's about 193 tall, and uh, Lionel's about 177, 178. I think Lionel and I are about the same height. And um, in water, body length makes a difference to speed. So like a long, thin kayak or a long, thin yacht goes much quicker through the water than a short, stubby one. So theoretically, just in terms of body shape, Jan should be fast. He's also got a huge wingspan. Excellent. So there's a lot of leverage under that water. Yeah. He is a long man, he has long limbs, he has long feet, he has long legs, and that's definitely perfect in open water. And also his, as you said, wingspan, he is super strong. His latissimus dorsi, his big back muscle that we really need to engage when we are swimming, is really, yeah, it's spot on. Like, he doesn't waste any, any time under the water before he catches, and that's why he's swimming so efficiently. Now, a lot of people who come into the sport of triathlon and I know we've got a lot of people watching on tribattle.com online we've got a lot of people watching on our syndicated live tv show around the world uh, just so that you know it's it's raining a bit at the moment the Grosse Alps here which is why we don't have the drones in the sky we do have two helicopters in the sky there for the microwave links to get the images from our cameras to the helicopter which we beam down to the finish line here and put into the OB trucks and send to the world but we, we can only sh show you the images from the water at the moment, but when you train in the pool, often it's, it's that classical training, that high elbow, you know, the little spider fingers across the water, reach as far as you can, the catch and the pull. But the open water swimming style 
is quite different. Often I, I hear about like the windmill, you know. What your arm does in the air is, ir is irrelevant. It's, it's that catch in the pool that counts. Yeah, it's definitely what happens on the water. I say, as I say, like what's happening over water is the recovery phase. And whatever, how you get around with your arms, as long as it feels nice and easy for you. And also like a windmill style, as you talked about, the straight arm, there is actually something about that you carry a little bit more force and speed when, when you then have your enter your hand into the water and actually can catch water. So don't like, yeah, back in the days, it was all about high elbows over the water as yeah. well to have that recovery phase that was nice and easy. But really, today, doesn't matter. Focus on under the water. And as long as I say, as long as it's easy for you to get your arms over the water. Jan's head actually just briefly dips under the water in it, and he's creating a little bit of a bow wave. You, know? you could water ski behind him, yeah. let me tell you. And, and, and it makes me think of when you talked about sometimes you must force your head under the water. If you look at big ships, just under the waterline, they've got this big bulb mm -hmm. that, that forms that wave mm -hmm. that then runs along the hull, which is part of how it develops its speed. And to a degree... Yeah. That is exactly what Jan's doing. You can definitely see that. He's almost riding on his own wave. And you can also see, like, as he has his body position so far up to the surface, you can almost see his 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 bum is also up in the, in, in the surface. So yep. he's creating as little drag as possible, you know, on the water. And, and that's what you want. And we're talking about that efficiency, you know, swimming 113s. So he's three seconds per 100, a little bit slower than what he planned, but he's still absolutely scything his way through the beautiful waters of the Grosse Alps there. Waters that are so clean you can practically drink it with a straw. Nothing wrong with a 120 for Lionel. I mean, look at that. The man is, he, he slowed down just a touch. I think the adrenaline initially, you know, that gets you going. Uh, by the way, we are taking this data, the team at SAP are doing this data. We've got those buoys every sort of 100, 150 meters, and they're taking the time in between buoys. We're not relying on GPS because you and I are you and I both well know that GPS is not accurate in the water. And for those of you who do open water swim, for those of you who do triathlon, you know, you, you upload your file and you look at the, looks like a three-year-old with a crayon drew your swim course and you're thinking, oh, I didn't swim straight. But that's actually not normally true, is it? No, absolutely not. Like, yeah, it's, it's just difficult with GPS and water. So I think this is amazing that we have these... Uh, the stats so that we can truly see how fast they're going, their average pace per 100. And you could also see that Jan was also slowing down a little bit. And I actually think that he was slowing down a little bit more than Lionel. So he might have had a little bit more adrenaline going in the beginning and just wanted to make sure that Lionel was not benefiting longer than necessary on his slipstream. So he might have swam a little too fast in the beginning. But I mean, like, you also need to remember that this is fresh lake, uh, yep. fresh water. This it's is a not bit slower. It's a bit so slower than salt water. Uh, there's not as much buoyancy in it, um, so, but I will say, yeah, it is perfect. And, and I was looking at the lake yesterday evening, and it's so, so clean. So I don't have to, they have, don't have to worry about, you know, you will always swallow a bit of water, but I don't think they'd have to worry about if that's the case. It, it's not going to affect you, you know, your, your gut later yeah, on in the yeah. day. This is one massive aid station. Oh, uh, yeah, <laughs> definitely. They will be hydrated when they get up. <laughs> Well, it's, it's a beautiful setting. So let's just talk about where we are. We in, we're in Germany, um, and, and thoughts go out to, to all the people of Germany and, and Belgium and the Netherlands who've been affected by the incredible, horrible, catastrophic floods on the, the western parts of Germany, bordering Belgium and Netherlands. Uh, we're, we're down south. We've had a huge amount of rain. Um, and, and, and the temperature is fine for the swim, and it's absolutely fine for, for the run. This temperature, these conditions are magnificent. But for the bike, we'd obviously like things to warm up a bit. The Grosse Alpsche, Alpsche is in a town called Immenstadt here in Bayern or Bavaria. Ober Algau, so it's Upper Algoi is where we are. We're about 730 meters above sea level. Almost 15,000 people living here in Immenstadt. And, and so many people of the region, and Heli, you've seen that since you and Ben arrived here. You just, we've got volunteers everywhere just making things happen. It's, it's, like, it's like somebody waved a magic wand and boom, all of a sudden all these people built our race village. It is a beautiful part of the world. It's like... You almost expect Heidi to be walking around, you know, milking the cows, or Julie Andrews to suddenly pop out and start singing, the hills are alive. No, that's in Austria, but in any case, we're very <laughs> close. It's, it's magnificent here. You're so close to nature. Farming is big here. 
but it's famous for its winter sports. And we will be chatting a little bit later to one of the local heroes, Johannes Reitzek, who is a, a multiple Olympic gold medalist and world champion at uh, Nordic Combined. Uh, we've got the biathlon centers here. We've got the big ski jumps here. But it's a wonderful place in summer as well because you've got these lakes and you've got the lovely flat valleys, but you've got the big mountains as well. And we have the foot of the Alps here. Great place to swim, bike and run. Oh, this is a paradise for triathletes. Like, as a triathlete, you're always scouting out where there are good trails, where there are good places to bike. Can you get up in the mountains and, and swimming open water in the summer? Like, this is completely paradise. Uh, so you get the bo best of both worlds down here, I feel. We will be having a chance to speak to a lot of incredible people in the world of sport. Uh, we've got uh, also the head aerodynamicist from Mercedes-Benz we'll be chatting to. We've got the engineer from Canyon we're going to be chatting to. We're chatting to Sir Mo Farah, Sir Chris Hoy, Daniela Reef's going to be chatting to us later on. We've got a whole host of guests planned for you throughout the days. Thank you for joining our live coverage of the Zwift Tri-Battle Royale. It is the first almost 30 minutes of our 3,800 meter swim in the Grosse Alpsee. It is Jan Frodeno versus Lionel Sanders, your Olympic champion from 2008, Ironman world champion 15, 16, and 19. He's also the course record holder in Kailua, Kona, Hawaii, and holds the long distance record of seven hours, 35 minutes, 39 seconds at Challenge Roth. And Roth is also here in Bavaria. And that course is the course where the eight-hour barrier was broken for the first time by another German, Lothar Leder. We're going sub-eight on that course in Roth. And here we are back in Bavaria with this incredible battle. And, and you think to yourself, well, how did this come about? So here we are, stuck at home in a pandemic. <laughs> a lot of us had no access to pools, no access to gyms. Many of us were not even allowed outside of our homes. So then what does Jan Frodeno do? He goes and does a try at home and raised millions for charity. Mm -hmm. And then I think he had too much cappuccino and too, <laughs> much, too many espressos. And him and his best friend Felix are like, what can we do now? And here we are with our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Look at that gap at the moment. What do you think of that, Hiller? Yeah, I would say it is as expected. Um, as expected in my head anyway, yeah. uh, what I would have thought that we would be seeing, but I would still say that Lionel is, is doing a great job and I'm not concerned. Um, I know that when he gets on dry land, he will oh, make it goodness. happen out there and he will push Jan to his limits. There's no doubt about it. I'd also like, I'm just, again, always looking a little bit at their style. Like I, I guess that's my... Um, he looks <laughs> like he's settling down a bit. If anything, his style's improved. I think he's swimming really well. If you're, if you're noticing the feet as well, like yeah. um, the feet is a lot as well for balance. Um, you need to remember that not, not, not using your leg too much uh, because you need to, to bike and run afterwards. A lot of people but, don't understand why we say that, but the legs have big muscles in them. And those big muscles, if you activate them, they demand oxygen. A lot of oxygen, And yeah. the heart rate works a bit harder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you don't want to kick too much in the water. It, it's really like, it, it is in a rhythm, as you can see, and you just see them a little bit sticking up a and little it, bit. It balances the stroke and it also helps you, like you said, you want to be small through the water. You don't exactly. want both shoulders barging through the water. You want one shoulder at a time and, yeah. and that kick helps you yeah. balance. And when you are a very good swimmer, uh, like we will have to say, like, yeah, Jan is obviously a better swimmer than Lionel and, and you know, he doesn't worry about it. That is second nature. Those legs are doing its own thing and it just follows whatever his body is doing and he's so used to it. If you ask him, what, how are you kicking and is it a he six feet? No, no, he doesn't know. Yep. They're just following. That's just my rhythm and they're, they're keeping my balance and they're making me propel forward. Now, I want to ask you, and I've recently read your book, fantastic book. Thank you for that. There's a lot of talk about all that tension and all the nerves before a race. And you and I both, we didn't sleep well last night, typically. I mean, you felt like you were racing, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's always like that. You know, this is such a big moment. There's, there's so much energy and focus and investment that goes into this one little moment when the starter goes on your marks and then go. Yeah. But once you're in the water, do you actually get a chance to relax? Do you get a chance to just zone out and just enjoy the moment? That is a release of energy. I mean, that building up before the, the gun goes, it is actually super uncomfortable. I think you are, 
you're super nervous and there's so much tension in your body. The adrenaline is through the roof. Your heart rate is pumping and you're standing still and you just, you just want to get going. And immediately you hear the heartbeats. It is actually pretty nerve wracking. The heartbeats out there and, and uh, finally that you are under the command of the starter and you're just waiting and waiting and waiting and then the gun goes and you get in and then you are in your right element. Yeah. You are there what you are supposed to do. That is your job. You can swim, bike and run. That is your safe zone. You know what to do and it helps you so much with your stress level. Well, we're not far to go before the end of 3,800 meters. We're about two and a half K through that swim if we average out between our two kings there. World record pace is what we're looking at on top there. It needs to be, we need to be at a 2.6 K. We're not far off it. Frodo is pushing hard. He's uh, approximately uh, eight plus four, 12 seconds behind world record pace, but it's way too early to talk about the world record because in swimming, in triathlon, when we say you can't win the race in the swim, but you can lose it. So yep. if he goes too hard, if he burns too many matches or to use his own words, eats too many biscuits too early, mm -hmm. he could compromise the race a little bit later on. Uh, but I, I, I want to actually take this time quickly, Heather, before they, they, they make their way to T1, to hear from Jan and from Lionel sort of their, 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 their overall expectations of this Swift Tri Battle Rail, of this, this totally new concept on a brand new course. Let's just have a little insight into their mindset before the gun went off this morning. I mean, I'm just soaking this whole, I'm soaking this whole thing in, to be honest with you. I, I don't, I don't really have too many expectations. I, I can only do what I can do. It is my motivation nowadays in sport to see what I can still do, where I can still place myself. And I like to surround myself with, with good people. I generally believe that a positive striving towards a mountainous goal is what has always brought out the best performance in me. And that's why, why we're here today. The big one for me to be successful here is I've not been able to wrap my head around just how far this distance is. And, and I, I tend to run out of gas, you know, let's say at mile 10 of the 26 mile run. And for me, it's, it's getting to, to the halfway point of the run, having not, you know, gassed out and being able to race the second half of the run. So if I can do that, I think I can do well. Um, you know, it's going to be hard when there's only one guy out there and you're not catching anybody and you, you want to get to him as fast as you can. Uh, but this is a, you know, this is a calculated, I, and Jan is very good at this. He knows, I know that Jan knows what he should swim, what he should hold on the bike and what pace he can hold, he'll know exactly those numbers. So it's more, you know, for me to, to understand that if you're gonna compete in this race, it's gonna happen, you know, probably on the second half of the race. So that's gonna take discipline. It's something I've not exhibited too much of in, in these, these longer races. So this'll, that'll be the test for me. I'm happy, you know, I've put in the work I can, I've poured a lot of effort into this and I'm feeling confident about Sunday. It's not often we have the privilege and the honor of almost being inside the heads and the hearts of our competitors. No, exactly. It's really lovely to hear two people also speaking about each other with so much respect. Yeah. It, it, it's in my, it, it, I really admire that. They are two gentlemen, two kings, as we're saying, and, and it's, it's just amazing to see. Like, triathlon is a unique and a special sport, and I think for a lot of people that's tuning in today, we just love the sport. Oh. We're super addicted. I mean, I got goosebumps again just hearing <laughs> you talk about how much we love the sport and the respect that these, these, these two kings show each other. And, and Hella, you know, for me, the other amazing thing about triathlon is show me another sport where I, who might finish last, will get the identical medal to a young Frodeno who would win it. And look at the huge gap between Lionel and Jan at the moment. Look at that. It's exactly one width of this square course as they get a little bit of encouragement from our limited amount of, of spectators we are allowed. But how many sports do you know? I mean, if you were a tennis 
enthusiast. You yeah. couldn't go play tennis with Federer. No, exactly. I think that's a unique thing. Like we have these races where we are the professionals are racing alongside the amateurs, and uh, I will say, as as a former professional, it gives you so much energy yeah. when you have the amateurs out there, and we are kind of in this together, suffering together, and <laughs> suffering. I <laughs> mean, like especially on the run course, you know, when you have uh, have the age groupers coming out, maybe they're halfway through the run and you're almost yeah. finishing your run and, and they're, they're cheering, cheering for you. you. Yeah. It gives you so much. Like, it is a special sport and I think, like, regardless how big you are in the sport, I think everybody is down to earth and, and so grounded and I love that. The pros respect the amateurs. The amateurs respect the pros. We get to do this together. Lionel almost four minutes behind Jan at the moment. Or I can turn that around and say Jan is four minutes ahead of Lionel. They're on their final lap of the Grosse Alps here to remind you. Water temperature 18.2 degrees Celsius. The ambient air temperatures edging up towards 17 degrees Celsius. Humidity is high, it's very high. Uh, we've got a lot of low cloud around us, but thankfully not too low. We can still get the helicopters in the air to bring you these pictures. Uh, humidity of 96%, 94%. Overcast indeed, hopefully the rain will go away, you know. We're right next to Austria. I've got a huge amount of friends in Austria. I spent a lot of time there. And the Austrians have always said to me that if you eat all your dinner and clean your plate the night before, the weather will be good, so hello. I ate all my dinner and I licked my plate clean. Yes, me too. There we go. I See, never done waste energy. I never <laughs> waste food. <laughs> Actually, one of Hella's biggest worries for all those of you at home, this is the, one of the first times she's doing this and she's like, well, hold on, eight hours? <laughs> what about food? When, when do we get to eat? But who cares about that because we are busy nourishing ourselves yeah. on, on the most incredible visuals yeah. of two of the most incredible, inspiring, two of the most followed athletes in our sport. Yeah, I will say when you were saying almost five minutes again or four minutes now, but almost five minutes probably when they get out of the water, I will say that is a brilliant swim from both of them. Yeah. I think like, yeah, Lionel did say three minutes, but I think that he knew deep down that that's not going to be the case. Like, you have to remember, Lionel got into the sport 10 years ago, exactly. did his first age group race, um, and, and really just learned to swim. And swimming is such a technical technical sport. Now, again, you can see the, the big gag. That's a very they good They can see vision. each other. Yeah, they can see, and I'm sure they are seeing each other. And I can see that actually um, um, Frodo, he was just breathing left, and he yes. always breathed right, <laughs> just to check out where Lionel is. Um, so, no, I will say, like, you know, Jan has, he grew up swimming and, 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 and surfing and, and always been in the water in, in Cape Town and, and started swimming before he got into triathlon. Exactly. And, and I mean, Lionel probably did not even know what swimming really was. So like, yeah, that's something that... He was a track and field athlete, I think, back in the day at school, Lionel. So I will really give him a lot of praise. He has come so far with his swimming. Well, thanks to the team at SAP. Thank you, Oli, for the great work you're doing. We're looking at the, uh, the differential between... Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders. We're anticipating a 4.45 gap between Frodo and the Colonel when they exit the Alps. We're looking at 47 minutes swim for Jan. Jan has brought the pace down a little bit. He's taken his foot off the gas just a bit. A 52 for, for Lyle, which as we know is not terrible at all. In his last four races, he set personal best times for, for all his swims. So he's on a nice traje upward trajectory in terms of improvement in the water. Yeah, and I will see, say here we are so certain that this distance is correct. Yes. And sometimes you are just not certain in races. It's always off a little bit, or not always, yeah. but it can easily be, right? And here we're just so sure that, that is this, this is the correct 3.8K. So therefore, you know, they, they, they might get a more true time. It might seem slow, but that's because the course is more accurate, exactly. exactly. I and believe you mentioned the fresh water. The fresh water yeah. is a huge thing. There's a lot less buoyancy. I, I wanted to ask you, I've heard swimmers say you get fast water and you get slow water. Oh yeah, you can feel when the water is heavy or when the water is carrying you. Yeah. And fresh water is a little bit more heavy, heavy to swim in. Um, but I think at the moment there, like, it might be starting to feel a little heavy. And I think they are thinking about, oh, it would be nice when we get out of the water now and on the bike and, and can actually let, you know, take off this one discipline. It's out of the way. And then we are out on dry land. And I think, like, maybe Lionel is looking more forward to it than Jan is. <laughs> I think Jan is taking every opportunity to increase the gap. So, like, that Lionel will have to work super, super hard to close that gap. Well... We've got our drone back. That means you and I finishing our dinner last night work because the clouds have lifted somewhat and our drone is back in the air. We are not far away 
from the Kings exiting the Alpsee, the Große Alpsee, the large Alpine lake here in Immenstadt through the little canal on their way into T1. Those incredible Canyon Speedmax bikes are waiting for them. And a matter of fact, Lionel rides a Speedmax because he saw Jan ride it. So, so Lionel reckons marketing works and sponsoring pro athletes works. And, and Lionel had Christmas in July. He got a brand new Lionel Saunders green bike this week. There is nothing better than a new bike day. I mean that regard as a pro, we are so, so excited to, to get that new bike. And it's like, it's like Christmas every single day. You know what I mean? Like getting a new bike is very, very special. Oh, yes. um, and, and getting a special bike made it's more for you. Special. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I can really imagine how Lionel was feeling. Well, I actually took a photograph of, of Jan Frodeno's bike. Um, when we were at the press conference and just on the seat stay, just below the seat stay, he's got the following printed there. Now, let me just find it for you. And it says, conceive, believe, achieve. And I think it's important to remind yourself of that. You know, here we're seeing two athletes chasing their dreams, challenging themselves and one another. And you don't have to, you know, be a world champion or a massive business owner to do that in everything in life have something that you truly believe in with all your being mm -hmm. don't let the speed bumps in life take you off course believe you know conceive believe achieve absolutely you need to believe in yourself with everything you do in life and i mean like we all make mistakes and uh, you just have to keep to have that inner faith in yourself and, and do the work. Um, you will get there eventually if you work hard enough, if you keep believing and you keep staying within yourself. And I think that's uh, we can really say that about these two. Yeah. Um, they both work super hard day in and day out and has done that for so many years now. And, and we can now see it's paying off, right? And here they are doing it, showcasing their belief, showcasing what they've achieved through their belief and their unwavering focus and allowing us to share this yeah. with them and share it with the world on tribattle.com. We're on live TV networks around the world. We'll have highlight shows coming your way throughout this coming week. So good to have you join us. Remember, you can have your comments displayed on the LED on top of the Mercedes EQ vehicles that will be following the race. It's just hashtag tribattle on Instagram. We want to hear from you and we will share your comments. We're about a minute away from your three-time Ironman world champion, your Olympic gold medalist, your record holder, 735.39, Germany's Jan Frodeno, on his way to T1. His uh, mechanics are there. Everything is ready. And by the way, people might think this is just an exhibition. And we can hear world champion Daniel Unger in the background as well. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> Our limited crowds are getting excited. The mobile phones are out there at the moment. But... The German Triathlon Union, the DTU, have sanctioned this event. They've checked the course. We've got referees there. This is not just an exhibition race. You know, the course is 3.8, 180, 42.2. The course is ratified. We've got referees. We've got hydration and nutrition zones. We've got litter zones. We're doing this by the book. Absolutely. It's, we're following the rules completely, and I think that's going to make it even better, right? And the athletes know that, that what they're putting in is the true course and is the true rules, and, and uh, that's what we want. We want to follow the rule all the time. And it's not can, a record if you're breaking the rules, right? Absolutely not. And if you're cutting corners in any way, and we don't want to cut corners. And now we can see that Jan is approaching... Um, up to getting out of the one uh, out of the swim and getting ready to get up to transition and now he's just thinking about that short run up to transition and thinking about soon getting out of his wetsuit and getting up to his bike and just sucking in some energy from the spectre see now he's up gotta found ground i mean have to go vertical now always keeping the cap on and goggles on so you have your hands free and it's not before you get it down and now he's going to try and get his suit on quickly up with the heart rate belt there is it's very very short run up to transition you have like 50 meters see now he has uh, his caps and goggles off so that he now can um, see where he's going and uh, getting the suit on and now he's basically up on the stage it's a very very short run short run short transition he's on the stage he's the king 
the king of kings at the moment. The Green Canyon, the brand new canyon of Lionel Sanders standing by 46 minutes, 15 seconds. The brightening clock on top of our Mercedes EQA says and quickly into yeah. that skin suit. Yeah, and then off with the wetsuit in the box. You need to stay calm here, right? You need to stay calm. And of course, he's a little bit heart rate is going. You want to do this fast, right? There's a few mistakes. This happens, you know, it happens in the in the moment. And OK, can get your suit closed, Jan. Get your suit closed. He's obviously super, super high on adrenaline and he's probably hating himself for not getting the suit close when he's up there. In he will do that. As well, eh? Yeah, he will do that. Yeah, it will happen now and, and he will get in the shoes and he will just calm down when he gets out of that and then get going and get into the zone. What we're seeing here, Hello, is we're seeing somebody that we think is superhuman. He's showing that he is, in fact, human. Absolutely. And we all make mistakes. All the time, <laughs> like me. But I don't know about you. So this is a little drag uphill. I noticed he was in quite a heavy gear. Uh, he's running a single chain ring up front. He's running a 112. It's a 52 tooth chain ring in front. And he's got a 10 by 28 at the back. And he's on his Canyon Speed Max onto the bike course. A little left turn uh, through Immenstadt first. And the people of Immenstadt. There was a whole roadworks section on the Bahnhofstrasse, which means the, the train station street, which was an absolute mess. You know that they've temporarily tarred it just for these two guys. Yeah, I saw it. I am living out there by the lake at the moment. So we saw it that they were fixing the road. So it's quite amazing. Incredible what the local community is getting, uh, has how they've got behind this as we pan back to our contender, the challenger, the second of our kings representing Canada, living in the USA in only, what, 10 years of triathlon, 30 70.3 victories, two of them, the world championships in Samarin. I mean, this man is a superstar. And what he's done in terms of inspiring other people to do yeah. triathlon by yeah. sharing very honestly his story of, of drug and alcohol addiction and how he, he turned that around through triathlon, he credits triathlon as saving his life. Absolutely. He, he says he talks about, uh, yeah, that that you can get out of addiction and not only, you know, get out of addiction and beat it, but you can also um, make something great out of it. Yeah. So there we can see the the mistake, the slippery fingers, you know, the the adrenaline making the mistakes. And there he's like, oh, I need to get this back on. He's forgetting everything about closing his jersey. I really hope that there is, um, it's not the zipper that's something wrong with, but that he's actually just forgot it, that it's back up. I can't see if it's still open. I think he's zipped up. Good, yeah. good, good. He's, he's a big still, man, eh? He's still not in his shoes. No. Like, he is still kind of like, mm, I need to get, I need to keep this gap going. Well, he's going. still going up slightly. So it's just a gentle pull up. And I think when, when it levels off a bit, hopefully he'll get into his shoes. Will this be a sub 50 minute swim for Lionel Sanders? That would be phenomenal if it is. Hopefully the camera can just pull away or maybe the drone shot we can see to give us a perspective of how far he is away from the ramp that we've built for Lionel Sanders to exit the water. Uh, there we go, he's not too far. so. He's going to be very close to 50 minutes. He's going to be sub 52, which the projection was. Yeah, it's an amazing swim for Lionel. I don't think he's swam this fast ever before uh, on an iron distance. So, um, yeah, I think he'll be pretty pleased with that. Of course, he would like to be closer to Jan, but I'm sure he's going to make this up. Like, as we saw, unfortunately, Jan did not have the fastest transition. I, I know he would like to have had that faster and a little bit more smooth. But uh, the greatest champions also makes mistakes, and uh, we always have things we can approve. Um, and that's no matter how many races we do, there are always things we can do better, and that's the beauty of it all. And isn't that life? I mean, no matter how good you are, you can always do things better. I'm trying to look at um, the best swim time for Lionel Sanders. Thank you, Torsten Ryder, try rating. Best swim time is a 52.25, and he's going to smash it out the exactly. ballpark today. That's amazing. Hey, this course was set up for him. Eh? I think he's going to be pleased. And listen to the crowds. They're doing a wonderful job of supporting him. And looks like our swim clock has stopped at the top of the screen. Hopefully we can repair that. Okay. Here he is on yeah. the way to T1. Lionel up, up to vertical. OK, get that wetsuit down again. He also leaves his cap and goggle on, which is what you want to do. Have your hands free to get it down. Let's see what sort of suit he has on. It seems like he has it already up, so he feels fine. He doesn't feel the restriction of the suit. Um, when you are a swimmer, you're sometimes a little bit more sensitive to how a suit feels on your shoulder and your flexibility of your shoulder. So let's see how smooth he's going to make this transition. Wetsuit in the box. 
He definitely swam sub 52. So this is brilliant. the swim of swimming. his life by two minutes. Yeah, that is brilliant swimming. Wow. Getting helmet nice and smooth. Sub 50 for Lionel Sanders was one of the big goals, his wife Erin said. And I mean, he's, he's borderline there. So keep in mind, it's fresh water. Uh, that is absolutely incredible. Yeah. That was... That was a smooth He's finishing. gained some seconds on you. Yeah. Absolutely. He definitely gained something there. I think he can be very pleased with that. I know he will be pleased when he looks back after the race, how well he had a transition compared to Jan there. And uh, he's off now and uh, he's now out in his territory. And this is his happy place. Exactly. He's out of this water, this wet <laughs> stuff. <laughs> and um, Is he in the shoes yet? We're looking at Jan. Have you got your shoes on yet? Looks like they still his feet still on top of the shoes. And briefly, Hella, I can tell you that everybody can hear us at the swim exit at the Grosse Absee. I could hear us through the program sound there. And he does now have He's his in feet in the shoes. Yeah. Look how strong the river is flowing at the moment. As we want to show you the bike course here as they leave the Grosse Absee through Immenstadt itself onto the incredibly smooth tar here in the Algoi, making their way past our finish line venue in Burberg, pass through Sonthofen for the turnaround onto the P19. And this is where you open the throttle and you fly. Through the nutrition zone, we've got motorbikes that'll come to them and give them the nutrition. It's a 500 meter zone. We've brought the velodrome to the road at the canyon corner, and we're gonna do this five times. 180 kilometers, two riders, two identical bikes, and uh, they'll make their way back to Burberg into T2, and that T2 will be right in front of us here at the finish line. Our Breitling clock on the finish line says 53 minutes, 10 seconds. Hey, Hella, high five. We're one third of the way through the, the Zwift tri battle, but there's a lot of riding and running to come. It's nice to see now that Jan has settled into his position, like he's just now settling in, starting to feel the groove, getting into his zone, getting over a bit of disappointment probably from his transition. Being a perfectionist, um, we don't want this to happen, but it does happen. And you just leave, need to leave it behind you. Done is done, happened. Well, do you think I he'll do that? Yes, he is. So we need, we have tools to kind of forget what just happened. We yep. might be disappointed with ourselves, but it will only drag us down. It will only sap out more energy. So you just need to get going, get out of town, get into your um, aero position and just into the next discipline. Swim is over. He swam well. Yes. Transition not so good, but we still have a lot of racing to go. Well, I'm hoping we can get a graphic where we can compare the exact swim times of Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders shortly. But we're on to that Bundesstrasse. And I can tell you, Helle, you know, when you go around the world, you're used to different surfaces, different what the Americans call pavement, asphalt, the tar, the road surface. Let's just call it the road surface. Here in Germany, in a lot of parts of Europe, if we can call it that, I know the Brits are thinking to themselves, oh my goodness, I wish we had a road surface like this. But it is so incredibly smooth that I'm guessing you probably three to five kilometers an hour quicker on the super smooth surface because there's less resistance, there's less vibration as well. And the vibration also fatigues your muscles. Absolutely, it does cost a lot of energy and, and you will feel it when you've been sitting out there for four plus hours as they're gonna do today. And, and you will feel it on the run that you have had all these shakes up in you if the surface is not good. And you might not think about it so much on the bike, but you will definitely feel it later on. And, and the discomfort you can get of the sh shaving. Yeah. Um, so, they won't have that. It is really, really smooth and you don't really have to think about that. That is one less thing to worry about. There's no holes to ride into yep, no um, holes, exactly. and drop your bottle and those type of things. So now you can just completely like, and also you don't have to look f like that far up the road. So that means that you can stay way more error and keep that head down. So this is a completely legitimate course. He's got his Morton bottles with him. He's going to be sticking, sticking to Morton gels. Super Sapiens have got that little um, sensor on him so he can monitor his glucose levels. We're hoping to give you some of that data as well. The SAP crew, Ollie and his team are working like mad. Uh, we're going to be able to bring you regular real-time updates of speed, power, heart rate, wattage, um, cadence, uh, and then we'll be able to bring you real-time projections on average speed, how quickly we think they'll be going today. We're focusing on 
one of our two kings, Jan Frodeno, uh, looking very aero, looking very steady. There's, there's, there's very little upper body movement at the moment, but it's early days. He's still getting into the rhythm. Absolutely. But I mean, usually from watching uh, Jan race, like that is usually how he looks yes. all day long. Like he, uh, he's done that a few times before, so he knows how to, to sit still and be efficient in your upper body. Um, and he is a big man and it's impressive how error actually he can be with such a big body that he has. Uh, he can be, we're talking about that big um, uh, wingspan yes. he has his Which means arm. he's got big shoulders as exactly, well. Exactly, but he can still go super tiny in the front. And How does he make himself look so small? I mean, he's got that, you know, you, you and I were watching in the, in the pre-race preparations before we went live. That cockpit of his, I mean, I don't know how he gets his elbows that close no, and makes his shoulders that narrow. It's impressive. He's super flexible and obviously that is again trained because that is not a, com well, it is a relatively comfortable position because it's about finding a position that's comfortable enough so you can sit still and sit in that position for four plus hours yeah. you know you can't sit too aggressively so that you have to go out of your error position because that's going to cost a, cost a lot of speed and uh, you don't want that because you have to always remember as a triathlete we need to run off the bike and this is not a 10k run off the bike it's a marathon <laughs> <laughs> oh let's not talk about the marathon yet I i'm getting tired just thinking about it lovely to watch jan there are a lot of little things that he's doing that a lot of people might not realize can give you a lot of benefit so early on in the road the road had a gentle right hand bend and he stayed as close to the white line on the right as possible which means he's taking the shortest line around the corner so it's all these little things that he keeps doing so we're looking at the swim times look at that a 45 58 for jan frodeno that is uh, his best swim time as well his previous best is a 46 24 and a 50 58 for lionel sanders his previous best a 52 25 so it's a lovely lovely racing and i i will just say i believe the five minute gap yeah <laughs> you, you called it and i don't know how they did it so spot on for you no Look exactly yeah, well i could predict not even any seconds thanks to ollie <laughs> and the team at sap looking at Jan Frodeno, who is leading our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Remember, hashtag Tri Battle, hashtag Tri Battle on Instagram. We're going to try and get as many as your comments as possible on the show, on the LED on top of the Mercedes EQA. We want you to be part of this Tri Battle Royale. Thank you for joining our ongoing coverage. As we can see, the Breitling clock, the Breitling clock on top of that Mercedes. It's an all-electric Mercedes. So it's just cruising smoothly behind Jan Frodeno at the moment. Inside that Mercedes is fellow commentator from Germany, Till Schenk. We're hoping to be crossing to him once in a while, uh, and he can give us some insights from the bike course and the run course. And inside the Mercedes behind Lionel Sanders, we have Elud Palpal, who's from Hungary. So we're bringing a big team. We've got you here, Hella. We've got Meli outside. We've got Till. We've got Elud. And we've also got Danny Unger, who's going to be announcing in the stadium. So, you know, no cost spared, nothing spared. This is the best of the best on the course and the best of the best off the course. Yeah, it's an amazing setup we have. It's pretty surreal, actually, to be honest, to see how big of a setup it is. And there we have Till. Till Shanks on social media, as always. <laughs> <laughs> he is prepping. He is knowing everything that's going on. And that is, it's just super impressive that, that we also have that. And yeah, uh, on course information. We can't hear him, but he can hear us. So hopefully soon we'll get some words from Till Schenk. He, he's Perfect. looking good Sorry. as always. One of the pretty boys of triathlon. <laughs> he's just finished a bike ride uh, where he was okay. cycling with some clients. Well, sorry. There we no, are. There's Till. Okay, no, we can hear Till Schenk. Uh, Till Schenk, can you hear sorry, me? Sorry, we're, we're, we're just going. We're just at the turnaround point right now. A little bit of confusion here. Um, Jan is absolutely flying right now. You saw it in the pictures. It took him about two kilometers to even put his shoes on. And there were a couple of heart attack moments behind him. The way he was going through those wet turns, the roads are still wet, but uh, he's looking super confident. He's looking super strong and uh, absolutely gunning it. Going through that turnaround for the first time. And here he is coming back on the way back towards you guys. There we go, Till Schenk, fantastic. So we managed to get Till out there. That's another one of the innovations. So we've got a commentator just for, for Jan Frodeno and, and, and well-spotted Heller. The roads are starting to dry, which is good because there's less drag, less resistance. We'll go faster. Till Schenk is following Jan Frodeno. Hopefully soon we'll be able to speak to Elliot and see how things are looking with Lionel Sanders. But 
talking about those heart attack moments. He didn't have his feet in the shoes yet no. and to the wet corners. I mean, yes. Jan is not being conservative. No, absolutely not. He was he was being smart in the beginning. Like it would be very very stupid to to come off the bike because you were taking risk. So so absolutely. Like we were also. I was hoping that I was looking forward to see him settle into his rhythm, and now he is definitely settled. Um, but you know, when it's so so wet, it is such a big risk. You know, you might come off the bike and just slide out and you don't want to take that risk. You don't want to do that. So just behind uh, Jan Frodeno, you saw the camera pan to its right. We could see there's Tilshenk with his special Mercedes driver in the tri-battle Mercedes EQA. So we've got a commentator for Jan. We've got a commentator for, for, for Lionel as well. We've eclipsed the first hour of our Zwift tri-battle. It has just gone 10 a.m. here in the Algoy. The clouds are lifting slightly. The Bundesstrasse, the this, this, the B19, which is closed just for our athletes, is starting to dry. What we want is we want the air to warm up because when the air warms up, it gets a bit thinner. And as the air gets a bit thinner, so there's less drag and we go faster. Absolutely. I don't think that the athletes are worrying too much about that right now. They, they are really just trying to stay in the moment, what they can do right now, what they can control right now, and that's their output and just staying calm. There ah. we go. We can see Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders are passing each other. I wonder if it'll be a little wave or it's head down and the battle is on. It's definitely no little wave <laughs> right now. It is every man to himself right now. And uh, there are no helping each other out just now. Um, so you're just focusing, as I say, about yourself, what you can do in the moment. Stay within your zone. Remember your, your nutrition plan and don't complicate it more than that. We did speak to, to Jan and to Lionel about nutrition, and Jan's nutrition plan is real simple. I, I've got my Morton, I stick to what works, and, and, and Lionel, as we know, you know, post Coeur d'Alene, and, and the, the, the discussion about nutrition and sweat rates and how many liters and how many milligrams of sodium, I mean, it, it's almost like he's obsessing about nutrition. Yeah, of, of course, he hasn't figured it out yet. He hasn't found the recipe that works for him. And, and it, it is super stressful. Nutrition is the fourth discipline of triathlon. And the longer the distance we are racing, the more important nutrition is going to be. And, and for a 70.3, there are, it's, it, it is it's under four hours, like sometimes, you know, 335, 340 for the men, right? And, and it's not a long time, no. you know? And um, we have to remember like our, carbohydrate stores in our body we have for 90 minutes of max intensity so we have stores in there and and when it's only three and a half plus uh, hours it's not that long but when we are talking almost eight hours of racing you need to steadily fuel the body and yeah you need to think about carbohydrates you need to think about fuel and you need to think about electrolytes and basically those are the three key things you need to worry about and if you have not got it right and i think most of us has had those experiences oh, where it's gone terribly it. wrong, right? <laughs> and you're standing on the side of the road, or you have to walk, or you have to vomit, or you have to use the portal loo All too much. All of the much. above. Exactly. And, you know, you're just so fit and you're so ready for the race, and then it's the nutrition that's going to mess it all up. It typically is the nutrition that messes it all up because it's so complicated. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't use your nutrition plan and typically you can't use mine because you've got to figure out what works for you, what works for your body. And I'm loving these long distance shots of uh, Jan Frodeno and look at the hills in the background mm. with the, 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 the mist and the low cloud just kissing the treetops. It's stunning here in the Algoy, absolutely beautiful. It, it's, it's known and it's famous for being a, a winter paradise. You know, there's the big ski jumps here and there's the ski slopes and Oberstdorf is famous for the the alpine competitions and the downhill skiing that happens there but in summer it's magnificent as well albeit a little bit damp at the moment but it's heating up on the roads of the Algoy for the Zwift Tri Battle Royale and when we talk about nutrition you really need to take the time to learn what works for you and I find it so odd that you'll get typically and I, mostly the age groupers I'll see them you know they probably have a, a reasonably big dinner the night before fairly early then on race day morning, they get up super early and have some form of breakfast, whatever they can get down despite the nerves. But then I see them chomping gels before the start. And I think to myself, are oh, you not overloading your system? Because your body's still got a lot of fuel from dinner before and breakfast. 
Um, it depends on how much you're eating pre-race. I think like taking a gel 10, 15 minutes before the start, maybe 10 minutes before the start is, is really a good strategy and it's just topping up. And as long as you stay active, your adrenaline is going, that, that sugar that you're pumping in is going straight in and it's available for, for your muscle. It's not going to be stored like yeah. as if you were sitting on a chair. It will be stored because you have insulin kicking in when you're resting. It won't kick in when you're ready and you're hyped and though 10 minutes before the start. I think that strategy of just topping it up just before you go, you gotta remember like you are not getting any nutrition in for an hour in the water, right? And you can't take anything in on the swim. So it's a good idea. And sometimes you can also put a little bit of, of caffeine in to just pick it up. Look at that, a fairly high RPM. You know, a lot of triathletes run a, a low RPM. RPM, the cadence, very close to 90. The watts are big. I mean, he's dropping some bombs out there. He's uh, well over 300, although this is, I think it's a gentle false flat he's on at the moment, pulling up slightly. Because he was sitting at 50 kilometers now, that's dropping. Even though the wattage is going up, the speed is dropping. So it's a gentle incline at the moment. Yeah, it is a little incline going out to the turnaround point, and then it will be super fast coming back into town. Um, so, yeah, I think, like, sitting there hovering around 85 RPM in his cadence, I think that is something that, that you will see um, Jan will keep throughout the day, uh, whereas you'll probably see Lionel having a slightly slower cadence. Uh, it could be something to do with, like, Jan is also, again, as I say, coming from short-distance racing, when you're racing a road bike and you're racing draft legal racing, you like to see a higher cadence. Um, and you also, if you if you notice cycling races, Tour de France, yes, they are racing. very high cadence. Exactly. I mean, Lance Armstrong, I mean, I don't know if we're allowed to mention him, but Lance Armstrong completely revolutionized road cycling when, when he was the proponent of a very high cadence. Yeah. I mean, he was 100 above. He was dancing on the paddles. Yeah, right? as Phil right. Liggett would say, yeah. indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and apparently he did tests where he proved that at the higher cadence, he could produce more power for less heart rate, as opposed to, and a lot of people don't understand that, at, at a lower cadence, it's usually a bigger gear. So you're engaging your big, strong muscles. The bigger the muscles, the more heart rate. Well... It's, it's contentious, I know. Are you giving, <laughs> just for everybody who cannot see Hella at the moment, she's giving me the look that your wife or girlfriend gives you when you're talking nonsense and she's being gentle. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say it, it all depends, right? Um, I guess that's always the popular answer to things. But I will say, like, riding with a slightly slower cadence in, in long distance races, you will probably say, over, see over long distance that your heart rate will drop slightly mm. and it will then cost a little bit less energy when you're not having as high heart rate but you are muscling it a little bit more you are using your it costs a little bit more on your muscle fatigue yes. and there you need to weigh it up because as we talked about before we are running off the bike yep. we need to remember that our legs can't be smashed when we are getting off the bike so it's all about finding that right cadence for you you can't say okay it's best to ride 75 rpm 85 rpm whatever that feels like the most efficient riding for you so I'm, I'm looking at, at Jan's bike, and I was wondering what well, the rear cage has got no bottle in it. I know that he's got the little Morton bottle, which, to my knowledge, has got diluted Morton gels in it. And then the Canyon's also got sort of that in-frame hydration system. I saw him sipping from that in transition before the race started. But Till Schenk is saying that, from what he can see, Jan's not carrying any nutrition with him. I would imagine that uh, in, the, in the frame, he has the right diluted carbohydrates slash electrolyte mix that he needs he will probably then take water on board and of course we as we've known like it is Martin for him that is out yes. in the aid station so he knows exactly what he's grabbing at the aid station had this been a normal race I would imagine that he would just be taking water out there simply not to mess up his nutrition plan well we got Till Schenk who's out on the course Till you seem to think that Jan Fredeno decided not to take breakfast with on the bike But we can see Lionel Sanders as we wait for Till Schenk to get our message. It's good to see Lionel. Oh, he's muscling that bike. Look at that head position. is yeah. super low down. <laughs> he is super aero. He <laughs> is taking any, every chance, right? He's not even looking up the road. You know, oh, I mean, the goodness. road is straight. The road is straight. Why do I need to look up the road? I want to... I, I, I want you to tell me if, if I'm losing my mind here, but 
but I was always told you, you want to kind of tuck those knees in, you, you want to be as aero as possible. But to me, it looks like, I don't know, it's just because he's, he's got such big muscles in, in, his, in his quads and, and, and hammies and glutes and that, but his legs look slightly, his knees look like they're pointing out a bit. Yeah, I mean, you always have to ride within yourself and with your limitations. And when you, whenever you're going to get a bike fit, you're always going to be checked. What, what can you do? What position can you sit at? How limited are you in your hips? And, and what are you able to? How flexible are you? And I'm sure that Lionel is sitting in the position that is perfect for him. For him yeah. And there is no, again, there is no perfect position. You've got to find out what's right for you. And as we talked about, you need to be able to sit in this position for four plus hours. And that's what's most important. Yeah. You can't have him fiddling around and being uncomfortable on the saddle. I know like um, Jan, as we see there, he has so narrow hips. So it, this is natural for him to be very, very straight, whereas, yeah, Lionel has bigger quads. So we're just showing that uh, Jan Frodeno receiving his nutrition. So this is what we've got. We've got mobile aid stations out on the course. Look at that. We've got a, a 500 meter section. In that section, they can discard. So you know, if you're used to a race, usually we have a, a zone, a flag zone before the aid station and after the aid station where you can discard, grab nutrition, refuel and discard. And we've got exactly that here at the world. It's exactly what we've got here. We've got a 500 meter section of the course where they're allowed to receive nutrition. And they can ask for water, for carbs, for electrolytes, for gels, for whatever their nutrition is that they put on the motorbike. If we look at Jan's position, you know, we were talking about his position. He's very far on the nose of the saddle. He's very aggressive. And, and he spent time in the Mercedes-Benz um, wind tunnel. We'll be speaking to Dr. Teddy Vall a little bit later about that. But Jan's been in the wind tunnel, hence that 3D printed and designed um, cockpit that he's got, trying to narrow the shoulders, bringing the elbows in, the knees as close to the top tube as possible, forward on that seat, maybe a little bit higher, flat back, keeping the head down as much as possible. I mean, but there's always a compromise between the perfect position which you can usually only hold for a short amount of time versus a little bit of comfort to get you through the 180 Ks. Absolutely, you can't sit two crunts together and you can also see like the way he paddles, he's, he's almost on top of the bottom bracket so that he has like this, you can power transfer way more when you are sitting, you know, so far in front of the saddle or over the bottom bracket as he is. And you can also see how he's driving down with his legs. So he's almost has a flat foot of the bottom of the paddle stroke. And that means that he can engage his back chain super well. Yeah. He can really use his power um, from his glutes. Um, his back muscle, which is so, so important and to, so, to utilize the glutes when it is that you have to also run off the bike. When in cycling, you are not allowed to sit that far in front um, over the bottom bracket. You have to sit further behind the bottom bracket. So in triathlon, we do not have those rules. So we yeah. can actually do what, what works best for us. But it is important to open, have this open hip ankle um, so that you can actually also run off the bike. And as well, you can't be too squeezed in the front because you can you might actually limit your breathing yep. and, and you will be again tight when you con con come off on the bike uh, on the run again you always have to remember we have to run off the bike and those muscles that you need for running you want to conserve when you're cycling so yep. typically we all get told you you, you ideally you want to pedal in circles yep. but in triathlon you actually just want to pedal up and down you don't want to use that full circle because you're engaging the hamstrings a lot which you need for the running right yeah yeah it is actually a co contraction between the four front and the back side of the legs, but it's also a new muscular coordination to have this smooth paddle stroke. Um, but the, the so important, as I talked about, that heel coming down, that flat foot, because yeah. if you are tiptoeing, so if you are on your toes, you will then strain your calf muscles a lot on your shins, and you really need them for running, and you don't want them super, super tight coming out on the run. And you can see now he's actually just standing up a bit because he just needed to get, to get off the saddle without breaking aero position. So that is trained too. Very well trained and very, very difficult to do, especially with mm -hmm. the elbows so close together, you know, because yeah. oh, this is incredible. I mean, what we're basically doing, Hella, is we're giving everybody at home a master class yeah. in triathlon. Yeah, that is. What to do. It's super smooth riding. It's super nice. Look, he's now taking hydration without breaking any aero position he whatsoever. Had a gel from his, he, he had some, I think he's got gels in the yeah. Morton bottle. Yeah. He had that a moment ago. 
now that he's swallowed it all, because it's fairly thick consistency, he's rinsing it away. Exactly. The, 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 the pro tip about having your gels in a bottle is brilliant. You know that you have your energy there, you have your lunch packet there. You need to get through that gel bottle before you get on the run. And you can just, you know, slowly take that throughout the bike ride. So just an update from the course, you're probably wondering, is it because we are in Germany that we're only showing the Jan Frodeno? Nein, überhaupt nicht. We've got an issue at the moment with getting the heli up in the air, and that's why we're struggling to bring you images of Lionel Saunders. But what we do have, we've got the first of our many, many guests today. And now we've got a guest all the way from Las Vegas, Nevada, USA. And uh, I hope you can hear us. And I'm looking forward to seeing you. And it's probably early, early good morning. I think it's, it's like midnight. And I think he's just finished work. Hello, Paul Felder. Hi. Hey, there can he you guys is. Hear me? Yeah, dude, yeah. how are you? I'm good. I'm just here in my hotel. Uh, yeah, we called the fights tonight for the UFC. So I've just been up. It's. Um time is it here yeah it's 1 19 a.m so <laughs> staying up late for this one well there we go it's good morning to you paul felder you're a, a retired ufc fighter yourself uh, you do what helen i do you you do the commentating of the ufc fights i'm sure you've had a good evening uh, calling the fight yeah it was great great fights um 10 awesome fights uh, great main event Lots of finishes, uh, some young, young up and coming fighters really making their mark. Uh, the two guys in the main event was their first time in a main event. So uh, a lot of pressure uh, for those young guys tonight, much like these guys here who are trying to break records and uh, do some spectacular stuff tonight. Oh, they're doing spectacular stuff indeed. So, Paul, just for your information, it's uh, it's 20 past 10 in the morning for us. They've done with the yeah. swim. Lionel had the swim of his life. He beat his personal best, or what you in yeah. the U.S. call PRs, by about 90 <laughs> seconds. I know you're a big Lionel fan. Just just tell me about yeah. your, the relationship. And I know you, you're a triathlon fan as well. Yeah, so... Um, I was nearing the end of my career uh, with the UFC and fighting, and I was just looking for different workouts to do during the pandemic, and I stumbled upon his YouTube page, uh, and, and I got following this guy, and I was like, man, this guy is incredible. Just the workouts they're able to do, just the pace you guys keep, and then I started following everybody. I mean, I started following Jan and all the top pros, and I just became kind of obsessed with the sport started doing it myself to help with the fighting and my cardio and um i had one more fight while also training for my first half iron man and uh, i took it on five days notice and the only training i was doing was my triathlon training and i went uh fought a main event uh, on five days notice made weight competed i didn't win the fight it was my last fight but i went out looking good it was a split decision loss and um I completed my first 70.3 uh, back in June. I got another one next week, actually, in Oregon. Oh, good man, good man. Lovely to know that you're yeah. part of the triathlon multi-sport family. <laughs> and a family yeah. it is, and here you are. Um, you, you, you've worked a full day of work. It's it's 1 a.m. in the morning. Um, you, you're not yeah. in the bar having fun with everybody else. You, you're supporting <laughs> the, the crazy Canadian, the Colonel Lionel Sanders. I mean, what yeah, is it yeah, about yeah. him that, that just makes you go, this guy's awesome? You know, it's so funny. So when I found his YouTube page, I said, I got to reach out to this guy. Um, I, I, I went to his Instagram. I followed him. And I immediately messaged him. And I was like, I just want to let you know that you're an absolute beast. Uh, you really impressed me. I, I'm kind of blown away. I'd never been into the sport. I never really knew about triathlon growing up. I grew up in the inner city. Uh, so most people just played, you know, we played American football or, uh, you know, I did martial arts. But I never got into it. And he reached back and he's like, oh, man, this is the, the best message I've gotten in a while. I'm a gigantic UFC fan. He loves the sport. So we just got connected right away, started going back and forth. I would talk about, you know, mixed martial arts and how that is as an athlete and that. He would tell me all about triathlon, give me lots of advice. I got his number. We started chatting back and forth. I got to know his wife, um, Talbot, and, and all the guys. And uh, I got got to finally meet him i got him tickets to a show uh, when we were in phoenix uh and he was getting ready for Coeur d'Alene, which obviously didn't go so fantastically but i just inspired by his work ethic and his drive to just constantly push the limits and i think that's what so many of these triathletes i mean that's what impresses me is you're out there 
on your own, pushing every limit that you can. I mean, especially watching Jan, it's just incredible. Yeah, well, Lionel always talks about no limits, and a lot of people don't realize no no limits doesn't mean that that like at Coeur d'Alene where he, he had to walk. You know, no right. limits. You know, if he'd had limits, he could have stopped and gone off the course. But because he's a no limits guy, yes. he kept going, and that that's the spirit of Lionel Sanders. That's what endears so many people to him. Yeah, I mean, it's it's incredible, and I remember seeing that and i remember i was actually tracking the device and i saw that the pace changed and i know his pace you know i know that that pace means he's walking and i was like oh my goodness i started messaging people i was like what's going on is he walking and then we just finally see the video they put out there where he went through some dark places to really decide that he was going to finish that race and even get through it because a lot of other athletes would have been like you know what I've got this mega race with the greatest guy in the world. I'm just going to give up and uh, move on. Look at that. These guys going around these turns and stuff. It's insane. I don't know if I'm delayed. Maybe. Dude, look at that. That is insane. That is the canyon <laughs> yeah. corner. It is absolutely insane. <laughs> just so that you know, Paul, we've actually closed. I mean, I'm sure you've heard of in Germany the autobahns with the unrestricted yes. speed limit. So this is just one notch below an autobahn. It's called a Bundesstraße. So it, it's basically a freeway, not a highway. And typically the speed limit there is 120 and these crazy fools at canyon built this banked turn like you get in a velodrome so that you don't have to slow down when you go through the corner here we get a great slow-mo Jan decides for the first time he's going to move out of the aero position because it's been a bit damp as well it goes in the high up the bank so you can get some speed coming down i mean this is what it's all about you know and we were talking no limits dude this is no limits yeah that's in, that's insane uh, i i was watching all the the footage on all of this stuff on all the videos so i saw them kind of practicing that thing and <laughs> when you think of it and it's it just in its you know uh existence on its own it's kind of terrifying but i guess when you're going the speeds that these athletes are going uh, you know they're flying around those things. If I was going my pace, I probably would crash and burn pretty pretty bad around that time. No, dude, you got to go quickly around the corner, otherwise you do come straight down <laughs> that bank. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, talking about velodromes, uh, later on we're going to have Sir Chris Hoy, is, uh, you know, one of the, the most highly acclaimed uh, track cyclists, and he'll tell us all about the bank turns as well. But, Paul, um, you, you've got an Ironman 70.3 coming up. I can just imagine that watching the Zwift Tri Battle Royale, watching Jan Frodeno, watching your, your good friend Lionel Sanders, it's just all the inspiration you need. I'm sure your adrenaline, it might be 1 a.m. in the morning, but your adrenaline must be pumping now. Yeah, it makes you want to go and uh, throw on the running shoes and go hit the treadmill downstairs <laughs> at the gym right now, I'll tell you. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, got to go uh, travel back home tomorrow. L a little bit of last minute training, hit it, hit it pretty hard. I've been training here in Vegas. Obviously, I have the Performance Institute out here. Uh, great treadmills, great recovery places, uh, all, all the best facilities. So I'm able to even stay in touch with training on the road. So I uh, haven't missed a beat, but uh, not at the pace that these fine gentlemen are going right now. That's for sure. So, Paul, before we let you go, uh, my co-commentator, she's uh, an ITU long-distance world champion as well. We just saw Jan Frodeno pass Lionel Sanders. Lionel is on his way to the canyon turn, but Hella would love to ask you a question. Hey, Paul, sure. nice, nice to meet you. I just want to like to know um, this battle focus that we have this in this Tri-Battle Royale. Yeah. How do you like that? You know, how, how good is this? I love it, you know, especially knowing that Lionel is such a, a, a big UFC fan. That's got to really pump him up for this kind of a race. Because, you know, I love the robes. I love the almost weigh-in ceremony that you guys had, the little open workout interviews. You know, I've been a part of uh, open workouts in the past where fans get to come and see us hit pads and do all that kind of stuff and hype up the fight. It definitely gets people invested. I think this is really smart and a really great strategy from everyone that's involved in this. The production's great. I had a bunch of my friends earlier before I got on this call with you guys. Uh, a lot of my producers here with the UFC watching the whole stream and um, really showing them that, you know, that triathlon is is a sport that needs to be watched. I mean, these are, in my opinion, some of the greatest athletes in the world. So I've loved every second of it. And it's definitely got me pumped to go and get back to training. Yeah, I'm, I'm really happy to hear that. I mean, like, uh, 
a UFC uh, commentator saying that, and we're trying to bring the, the battle element into triathlon, and it seems like you are loving it, so it's, it's pretty good okay, I think. So I, I think we've done our job. Yeah. We, we yeah, can go yeah. home now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul, thank you so much. Uh, I wish you, we wish you a good a good night's sleep and, and a great travel home. <laughs> uh, good luck with the last preparations for your, your 70.3, and, and we really appreci appreciate you coming on board. I know Lionel does. I'm sure Aaron is listening and Talbot as well. You have yourself a good sleep, and, and thanks for your time. Oh, no, thank you, guys. Um, everyone sounds great, and uh, I can't wait to see it. I'm going to try to stay up and watch this whole thing, but uh, I'll find out tomorrow if not. <laughs> oh, look at you go. There we go. Lovely stuff. Great to have you on board. Uh, Paul Felder is a former retired UFC fighter. Now UFC commentator has been commentating all night in Vegas and still makes the time to join us here at our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Lionel Sanders, there he is. He's in picture. We've had, just so that you know at home, we're not uh, biased towards Jan Frodeno. Lionel on his way to the canyon corner also goes onto the drops a little bit more gingerly right up to the top of the bank Wee. he is no stranger to the velodrome remember he set the canadian one hour record 52 yeah. odd kilometers an hour 52 odd kilometers in an hour he changes bottles he's got a plan he's sticking to his plan the man is on fire on the course we're waiting to get some of his live data as well we're hoping to get that so look at that not taking any chances first time fortunately the road is dry and he yeah. goes right up to the top of the turn watch this Boom, he carries that speed, doesn't even need to pedal. Nearly into the, the sponsor hoardings on top and then pedals his way out of it. So actually, if anything, a moment's recovery there really as he didn't have to pedal. Exactly. I will say... But otherwise, it's just flat, fast. All right. It's really nice. I really like that. But this, man. Have you tried this yet? <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit. It's pretty great. Seems like a huge event with like the best athletes in the world. So we're really excited to be a part of it. Um, it's been quite a lot of work in the last two weeks, and we're really hopeful that it's going to be like uh, the fastest time ever because of our construction. All right. It's really nice. I really like that. But this, man. I guess the time frame is pretty hard because it was. For us, a, a short period of time to organize it, everything, and um, the area where we're building it is a bit difficult because it's next to the road. It's not on the road, so it's in a natural grass area, and um, yeah. But we we we're gonna make it happen. So we're confident it's gonna be great. That canyon turn that canyon corner, whatever it is, just like we saw in the swim course, that is another optimization where, where you know, typically in triathlon and especially in short course triathlon, it's usually that 180 degree turn, yeah. that U-turn where you slow down almost to a standstill. Yeah. You've, got to, you've got to quickly tap up the gears at the back so you've got a light cadence to come back out again. Mm -hmm. But here, uh, completely legal what we're doing, the DTU yeah crew are saying it's all good uh, that gap was five minutes down to 440 but the canyon turn allowing them to just keep their speed to, to to keep the cadence up to keep the power going exactly keep keep the smooth pace keep the this the, the smooth intensity around that corner as well and and not to slow down and as you said in, in the short distance itu racing draft legal racing um, there are so many um, corners and U-turns and to slow down into the corner, coming out, picking up like a high, high watt output coming out of yeah. the, the turn, it costs so much. It burns so many mm. matches that you can't really afford on an, on an iron distance. So, so this is really clever thinking. And, and here we are concerned about time. I will say in short course racing, the 40 kilometers that they're doing there, they are not really concerned about. No, they're anytime. saving energy for the run. Yeah, but I mean, they don't even know what the finish time is. It's just about winning the race. Yeah. It's about having the best performance that you can have. Here, we are quite concerned about the time. We are indeed. And it's a four-minute 40 gap between uh, Jan Frodeno leading the Zwift Tri Battle Royale in front of uh, Lionel Sanders. That gap was five minutes after the swim taking into account the little issue with the helmet after T1, uh, during T1 for Jan. But that's 20 seconds in the first, what, 30 Ks? Not mm -hmm. even. Mm -hmm. Jeez, not even 30 Ks. Yeah, I think... Nutrition time again. Here we go. This is that little 500 minutes, 500 meter section. He's happy. He says, Dankeschön. Yeah. 
Auf Wiedersehen. That is so efficient, eh? It's like... I like this. Yeah. I w oh, I would love that for any race. You have And this is not the Tour de France, you know, <laughs> where they hang on to the bottle. No, no. No sticky no, bottles no. at the Tri Battle no. Royale. There are no getting advances here. Like, he's getting the nutrition and then he keeps going again. And again, they... They are sitting on next to him, so uh, so there are no drafting in any way there either. So here we are on the real course, but you know that people at home, currently, on Zwift are able to race yeah. Jan and 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 Lionel because what we've got is with all their power data that we've got, we, we're managing to power their avatars so the people at home can ride with Lionel, yeah. who's in screen at the moment, and with Jan Frodeno. How cool is that? Virtual and real side by side. This is just showing that it's possible, right? Like, if I was not sitting here, I would have been sitting there. For sure, I will be joining the race as long as I could. You know, it's all about watts per kilo. And, and of course, with my weight, I'm not pushing 310 watts. You don't need no, to. No, exactly. I'm doing watts per kilo. I think they're pushing like, yeah, 4.2 watts per kilo or something like that, which is very, very high for a full distance or 180 kilometers. So I would definitely encourage people that are on Swift to try and just jump on and then do a little interval with them and yeah. see how long. See how long you can hang on. And actually see how impressive this is, you yeah. know, the level. The, what the body is capable of if you've trained it well for so many years and you have the willpower and you have the talent and then this is world-class racing. World-class racing and you are a part of it in the virtual world on Zwift and you are a part of it with us as you watch these incredible live images. We're bringing you from Bavaria, southern Germany. We're in the Allgäu. We're on the Bundesstrasse, the B19 at the moment. It is the 180 kilometer bike course. Both Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders both set new personal bests on the swim. Will they do the same on the bike? And I'm trying to find Torsten's email again. Let me see if I can get you that. Bike time for Jan Frodeno, 4.2501. That's flipping fast. And uh, 4.2326 for Lionel. So we're looking for, I think it's going to be much quicker today. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, we, we did get to speak to the guys early in the week about how they've incorporated virtual training into, into their, their training regimes. And, and, and part of it is necessity in the form of you want to minimize risk and be off the road. But a lot of it was forced on the world during, you know, 2020, uh, the, the worst of the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic, uh, where, where we were all stuck at home, so much so that you actually, well, I don't know about in Denmark, Hiller, but in South Africa, you could not buy indoor trainers. They were sold out. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, Swift has just changed indoor training significantly. I remember uh, throughout most of my career, I mean, like sitting on a home trainer, it, it could be so, so boring um, that you feel like I, I have an athlete of mine saying it's, it's uh, more boring than seeing paint dry. <laughs> to ride inside. Uh, I mean, Swift has definitely changed that. This is amazing. Like, I will ride Swift. Uh, I ride Swift often, and it, it also changed um, a lot for me. Like, how often I would just jump on Swift instead of going out on the road. It's the efficiency. I mean, do you have a two-hour ride? It takes two hours to get that ride done. You know, yeah. it's not fiddling around and, and getting out on the road. You don't have any punctures. You don't have no to... No traffic lights. No traffic light. Getting out of town. Riding on a piece of road where you can get your intervals done without any interruptions. This is super, super safe riding and it's super efficient and and it's fun that there are so many that's in there you know you hook up in the in the morning and you sit there and you get so many ride-ons from yeah. the people that's following you and and you can be riding in there with 10,000 people that's on the same course as you and you can hang on to some people or people are joining your intervals I mean I'm super excited with the platform and I think that it is just really showing what's possible now as you know bringing and um, the virtual world and the real world together um, as We're said, making this, history, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Like, I would love to just, well, I couldn't jump on a bike and sit and talk like I'm doing right now. But if I could, if I was in shape for that, I would have loved to do that. Well, these guys did that at the press conference. They were zwifting and talking at the same time at 2,000 meters above sea level. We're looking at Jan Freden at the moment, still having one or two technical issues with uh, being able to show you Lionel Sanders. Um, during the first three weeks of lockdown last year in South Africa, where we thought it would only be three weeks, I set myself the challenge of riding 21 days in a row on my indoor trainer. But Helen, my indoor trainer is from the Steam Age. It's one of those old school with a little flywheel at the back that the back tire goes against. Yes. 
no connectivity to Zwift, nothing. Just me alone in my garage, 90 minutes a day for 21 days. I got to tell you, it did two things. It made me a lot stronger. Yeah. But I started having little knee issues and stuff like that. The continuous riding with continuous tension, yeah. no freewheeling for 21 days in a row. But these guys are much smarter than that. Both Lionel and Young spent their time on Zwift. Let's find out what role virtual training plays in their lives. Zwift is something that really, to me, came as a necessity uh, being in Australia, spending time in Australia and the beautiful country and continent that it is. Uh, it's not a very cycling friendly place and it really is something that in the beginning I was forced to train indoors. Luckily, just at the time that Zwift was getting traction and the guys were kind enough to set me up and get me on an indoor trainer and, and ever since I've done pretty much 50% of my training throughout the whole year indoors. Even living in a cycling paradise that Spain is, there's a lot of history around cycling and people are very, very respectful. But you just cannot beat the efficiency of Zwift. Uh, but then there's a socialness to it as well where you can join and, and chat and um, really make friends all over the world and it's quite funny there's an e-racing scene now and you know you get to meet various pros but you also get to meet various average Joes from all over the place and and that's really something nice because you know five hours or well maybe three hours indoors um, is is not always the most entertaining thing, but when you're away and, and chatting over what is your passion, and in, in, in my case, that's cycling and, and triathlon, it certainly tends to go a lot quicker. Well, I could actually tell you the exact number I've spent on Zwift, but I believe I've spent about 70 days, full days of my life riding on Zwift. So, and that's in three years. So, I don't know, what is that? Like uh, one, at least uh, one tenth of my last three years have been spent on Zwift. Um, I mean, it's wonderful, it's safe. Uh, you can focus on your preparation properly. You don't have to worry about getting hit by a car. I've been hit by cars four times, front teeth knocked out. So, you know, there's, there's risks riding outside. I mean, you need to ride outside too, of course, in order to become competent at riding, you know, cornering and all that stuff. Uh, but if you want to focus on training, which is very important, and, uh, you know, increasing your power and increasing your uh, also run on Zwift, uh, just focusing on good workouts, uh, Zwift is amazing. And then there's also the social aspect, of course, which during the pandemic was amazing, uh, just because we, you know, very few times you were able to gather with people. So, you know, it's nice to keep that going. And uh, for events like this, even, you know, we did a, Jan and I did a ride together on there. And we had people in it asking questions and stuff. It was really cool. It's a really cool platform. And, um, you know, I love it. I've spent a lot of time on it. Lionel talking about the social aspect of Zwift. And you got a new follower just as we were talking about Zwifting as we look at Jan Frideno yet again. We have another one of our great guests on board. And, uh, as, and look at all these spectators have come out on the course. Eh? This is incredible to see. But we got another one of our, our guests on board and, and we're talking cycling. And when you talk cycling and we talk, you know, racing, Cameron Wirth. <laughs> Hello, Cam Wirth, the Tasman Devil. How are you? <laughs> G'day, Paul. And apologies again for the cycling kit, I promise you. I, yeah, honestly, I was just a bit flat out last week and my wife saw the bag of clothes sitting in the back of my car and she said, Give me that bag. I'm off to the post office. So it'll all be waiting for you when you get back to Denmark. So uh, apologies again. But um, some nice bright orange safe kit for you. I, I hear the guys talking about Swift. I love I'm a big fan of the home trainer. Personally, not much of a fan of Swift. I actually love watching TV. It's my opportunity to watch TV, being a, a dad now. And, you know, commitments in life. Uh, being on the home trainer gives me a chance to catch up on all things sport. But, um yeah, uh, some bright orange clothing for you so uh, all the cars can see you when you're back training uh, in Denmark after this uh, this great tri battle we're, we're witnessing. Indeed, Cam, thank you for that. And, and I hope it makes me faster. But I tell you something, watching all of this, watching the tri battle has just got Helen and I so excited. Just, just don't give anyone else the kit. I gave you some of the secret special speed stuff <laughs> that we're going to use in Kona. So just keep that to yourself. Yeah. Oh, well, I won't give it to Jan and Lionel. I'll keep it for myself. No, please. Where, where are you? It looks absolutely magnificent. 
I'm actually in Barcelona. I think I mentioned to you we're, we're down here. I rode down yesterday. I've just been for a big run along the up and down the beach, and we're off to pick up Fallon's grandmother. She's 97, making her first trip to Europe. So uh, Delta Airlines didn't believe us when we when we told her the age. So uh, we're hoping they uh, don't think she's a fake trying to trying to get on the plane and. Uh, smuggle herself into Europe, but uh, we'll be off to the airport to pick her up soon. Well, we won't keep you too long, but I'd just like to, to, to chat to you about the bike. You know, we've got these innovations on the bike. We've got this, this velodrome-style bank corner. We've got um, the, this 500-metre zone on the bike course where a motorbike comes up alongside it, very similar to what you see in the Grand Tours, you know, with the neutral service, where neutral hydration and nutrition, uh, and, and all these things playing into creating an incredibly fast bike ride. But I remember Jan once telling me that that a hot day is also good for biking because it makes the air thinner and there's less drag. What is your opinion on that? Well, that's for sure. I mean, also along with, with altitude. I mean, there's the, the air pressure is a, is a huge thing. And if you, you only have to look at track cycling, which I guess is the, you know, the, the cutting edge in, I mean, I believe, you know, triathlons are the cutting edge. We, we don't have the limits and the restrictions of road cycling. And I, we obviously push the boundaries a lot more with aerodynamics and equipment, but track cycling, you know, it's the fast tracks. The reason they're fast is because they're extremely high tech, and they can control the humidity and the and the temperature to the absolute perfect perfect element. Not only of the air, but also of the actual the actual wood, the actual track. So, um, yeah, the temperature is a is a huge thing. So, I'm actually not 100% up to date with with the conditions of, of the course they're on now, but. Um, Yarn being yarn, um, an absolute perfectionist, I'm sure. Whatever, <laughs> whatever they are, they're uh, they're optimal for a, for a fast time today. So it's it's really exciting to see what they can they can do. Well, we're sitting at an altitude of about 750 meters above sea level. Uh, you can't see right now, but we're looking at Lionel Sanders is looking very strong and very committed. But I've got Hela Fredrickson here with me as well, Cam, and she's got a question for you. Yeah, hi, yeah. hi, Cam. I was. I was really wondering about the, you know, the TT position. This is a super fast course and it's really made for them not to get out of their error position. How much are you thinking about that? You know, how much do you need to worry about that when you're thinking about the run too, that you're not getting out of your error position? Yeah, it's, it's a great, it's actually a great question because people say, you know, oh, it'd be great for you to get on a flat fast course, you know, but for me, I, I feel like a faster course is actually run with a little bit of of a variation because you can get out of the seat you can sort of you know change position use some power to to accelerate it's actually quite <laughs> quite difficult to hold that position for so long um and and, and maintain the power so uh yeah yeah personally i mean it, but for me personally I'd, I'd certainly want something a little bit more variable than something i was stuck in the position for so long i actually enjoy getting the aid stations giving the back a little stretch yeah i mean it's amazing, yeah, you, could, you, you can go very fast for maybe a couple of hours, but, you know, really, to go fast on the bike, it's how fast you go in that last hour, you know, 90 minutes to an hour, and, and to do that, you have to be comfortable and feeling good and feeling strong, and, um, yeah. yeah, and obviously, the position is, is extremely fatiguing, so... Uh, yeah, absolutely. It'd be interesting to see how the guys handle that. Absolutely. So, so if it was you riding this course where there is actually not really planned to get out of the aero position, you might even like plan it in yourself to get out of that aero position so that you can run a little bit better off the bike. Uh, absolutely. And also bike better. Yeah, I mean, I honestly, I mean, as I said, it, I guess the, when I've done well, you know, in races and, and use the bike to my strength, I tend to make the biggest difference in the final hour. Um, and that's obviously when other people start to get tired in that position, they start to think about the run, etc. And uh, and that's where you can really do some uh, serious damage. So, um, yeah, I, I think you'll find, I've, I've already seen Jan, I've been watching obviously the coverage now for a good 15, 20 minutes, and I've seen him out of the saddle a few times, you know, and sitting up. So I, I'm pretty sure, you know, while the, while the course is obviously designed to be in that position, be, be flat and be as fast as possible, he's... He's a smart guy and, and, and knows that he needs to look after himself for the entirety of the of the event, not just for Absolutely. the next uh, few hours. <laughs> well, at the moment, we see him pushing 330 watts. He's got a cadence of about 86, sitting at 50 kilometers an hour. But, Cam, we've seen Jan get up off the saddle quite a bit, maybe a bit more than we thought we would have, Helle. But yeah. uh, what are your thoughts on that, Cam? Is that just changing the position, just, just using different muscles, making sure you stay comfortable? Absolutely. I mean, any more than, you know, 15, 20 minutes and you definitely start to feel it, you know, staying in the position. So um, you can push through it. There's no doubt about that. And you're talking about, 
well, you know, you're talking about the greatest athlete of all time and Lionel Sanders here. So, you know, obviously two very good athletes, but one one of the absolute greatest. And, um, you know, you you know that it's a long day. You know, you have to you have to think about the entire day, not just the next, you know, 15, 20 minutes to an hour. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not surprised that Jan's um, looking to see what he can do over the entire course, not not yep. just uh, what's in front of his nose at the moment. Absolutely. Well, you can't see at the moment, I don't think, Cam, but we're watching Lionel Sanders. We've got a beautiful close-up of him. He's got a much slower cadence, sitting around about 80, 80 cadence, uh, pushing sort of 360, 365 watts. It's a gentle incline that he's on at the moment, a bit of a false flat. But uh, if you had to, to, to compare Jan Frodeno on the bike, Lionel Sanders on the bike, there was a five-minute gap after the swim. What, what, what are your thoughts on the catch happening on the bike? You're talking about beauty in the piece, aren't you? I mean, uh, <laughs> it's a beautiful piece, mind you, but <laughs> they're two very contrasting styles. I mean, um, Jan just looks amazing. I mean, he always does. I mean, people, have, there's been obviously a lot of talk about this event and, you know, about a rivalry. I mean, I say to people, Jan has no rival. Jan's, Jan's biggest rival, and has been for the past decade, is himself. You know, when he gets things right and he turns up at races, you know, it's impossible to beat him. You know, well, it's been impossible to beat him. You can't beat the guy. So, um, you know, he's got Lionel there, and Lionel's obviously going to keep him keep him honest, and, uh, and, and he's going to know that if he stuffs up, Lionel will be on his hammer. But, um, yeah, Jan, Jan, looks, Jan looks like Jan does. He looks fantastic, and... Um, you know, I, I really don't see him, uh, see him being touched, but um, he knows that Lionel's never going to give in and uh, and he's going to, you know, be in the back of his mind to, to keep pushing because Jan's going to have some dark moments, you know. I mean, the, the greatest guys, they make it look so easy, but the reality is they <laughs> they have all those moments as well. They want you to think it's, it, it's easy, you know. They, mm-hmm. That's kind of part of, I think, their intimidation to scare you off trying to challenge them. But, um, you know, he'll have some tough moments and certainly having Lionel there will help him, help him push through those, so... Yeah, it's going to be an exciting event to see how it unfolds. Well, Cameron Wirth, thank you so much. Uh, the man who traditionally smashes bike course records around the world. Uh, hey, Paul, you forget about my run course record in Italy. It, it really annoys me because that's my, the thing I'm most proud of. You were there. Um, you know, you commented at the time how great I looked. and uh, I was, you know, I was I watching it. And why you don't bring that up. Yeah. You did, you did. You were amazing. But at the moment, we're watching the bikes, so we're talking about bikes, Cam. Fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> go, go fetch Grandma, and I can tell you that Lionel's well, well. taken another 20 seconds out of Jan Frederno. We've been racing an hour 48 minutes so far, 133 k still to go of uh, yeah. our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. But Cam Wirth, thank you so much. Enjoy the sunshine in Barcelona, and please send some of that sunshine to us here in the Algoy. I'll do my best, Thanks, Paul, and great to see you in Andorra, and uh, I'll see you... Uh well, about somewhere else in Europe, or I'll, I'll see you in Kona, hopefully, later in the year. Look forward to, there we go, Australia's Cam Wirth, who's uh, super talented when it comes to sport. He's an Olympian in rowing. He's uh, an Ironman champion. And Andorra was his first ever Ironman 70.3, can you believe? And he's also oh. a pro tour rider as well. So giving us some of his insights as we see Jan yet again out of the saddle. But we're hoping to speak to Eli, Ilud Palpal, who's uh, our Hungarian announcer who's in the Mercedes EQA in the car behind Lionel Sanders. We're waiting to get confirmation that we can speak to him. The weather is playing havoc with our comms. These low clouds really mess up the frequency transmissions. Uh, The frequencies are are completely messed up with the low clouds. As we see Jan Fredino's wattage dropping, cadence is still high and speed is high. So we saw uh, Lionel's wattage go up and speed go down. Jan's wattage is going down, but speed's going up. And that is proof of Lionel was going uphill slightly and uh, Jan's going downhill at the moment. But, I mean, he's got out of the saddle a lot, but he still looks extremely good. Yeah. You know, it's um, you need to be a bit of a joker out there. You need to not show any weaknesses uh, at all, either to the to the media or to your competitor. Uh, you just want to be within yourself and... and um, yeah, so that Lionel definitely doesn't, you know, get the mental advantage of seeing any weaknesses in Jan. Um, I will say, like, uh, Lionel is closing the gap a, a little bit. 
And uh, again, that is what we would like to see and what would be expected uh, so that Jan will be pushed. And uh, at Lionel, he wants to get into the game. He wants to be within the race now and he wants to get up and be able to feel Jan out there up on the road um, instead of riding now with this uh, four and a half minute gap that they're having now. But but uh, Lionel is really pushing up some high numbers, which we saw. So 350, 360 watts. Yeah. That is really, really high. So he is really a power horse. And again, as we talked about, see the difference in riding style with the, um, with the low cadence, way lower cadence yes. that, that Lionel has compared to Jan. Um, and that's the way he, he, he races, that's the way he rides. And it doesn't gonna affect his run because he's, that is how he does it. Well, we've got a great comparison shoulder to shoulder, side by side at the moment. You can see wattage versus speed, and without a doubt, Lionel Sanders is pushing bigger watts. And you know what? We've got Ellie standing by in the car following uh, Lionel Sanders. Uh, we're not able to cross to him using the TV links, so we're going to use a telephone. Whatever it takes, we make it happen. Ellie, we'd love to hear your impressions of Lionel Sanders on the early parts of our bike course. So, dear Paul, ladies and gentlemen, it's a fantastic moment to be here and to follow these magnificent athletes here on the motorway in Germany. All the best conditions. Now we started to see some raindrops here in the car, but uh, afterwards, I think that it would be all perfect for the athletes. We are now watching uh, Lionel Sanders here from behind. I think he is doing a very good job here. He's trying to catch up on Jan Frodeno. The gap is somewhere at uh, four minutes. I think uh, his form is pretty good. He's undisturbed. He has the perfect conditions and many, many people here in Germany came out to cheer for him. We saw those people cheering from the bridges and uh, next to the fences. It's something spectacular to watch how a fantastic triathlete and athlete is occupying uh, the lanes of the motorway and on the other part, seeing the cars here. The weather conditions are much better than yesterday, so I can still say that we are pretty lucky right now. 17 degrees Celsius here at the moment and some raindrops. But uh, at the moment, I think we are that uh, the athletes are doing a very good job. I see a balanced Lionel Sanders right here from behind. He's uh, using his bottles from time to time, but uh, I think that he's in a very good shape and uh, we can still expect a great competition. We are really lucky to be here and to join these people racing here for the world record, for what else? Incredible to have the the point of view commentary from our team out on the course. Ellie with uh, Lionel Sanders, Till Schenk with uh, okay, Jan okay. Frodeno. Ellie, thank you so much. We'll get back to you shortly. Thank you for those insights. I love the way you describe that Lionel Sanders is looking so nice and balanced on the bike. He's pushing a huge amount of power. You can see the quads exploding out of his lycra there as we see Jan Frodeno taking in more nutrition. And I love the way you describe all our spectators who are all around the place as well. The spectators coming out in massive numbers on all the, the bridges. You can hear the cowbells ringing for Jan Frodeno as he goes past on the B19. We've got cameras on both our riders. We've got cameras on both these kings as uh, we bring you this ongoing footage. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching our Tri Battle Royale. Remember, hashtag Tri Battle on Instagram. And we hope to get your messages on our footage. We're on live TV networks across Europe, across the world. We're live on TriBattle.com as well. And all of next week, we'll be releasing highlights programs all across the world, more than 50 TV channels across the world and growing. We're on the portion both Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders setting personal bests after the 3,800 meter swim the first 3.8 kilometers of these 226 kilometers went by in a flash here in the awesome Algoy southern Germany very close to Liechtenstein Switzerland and Tyrol and Austria and look at that road flat and dry and I can tell you it is fast and can you imagine the beautiful noise those disc wheels are making as they hum along this Bundesstraße the B19 between Sonthofen and past Immenstadt direction to the Autobahn up and down they go it is five laps on this bike course designed to be fast but I remind you that the entire race is sanctioned by the German triathlon union the DTU we do have officials and referees out there 
what we've done new and different is the 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 banked turn at the one turnaround on the bike course we've got the mobile aid stations in a specific zone on our bike course it's a 500 meter section where the motorbikes can move alongside Jan or Lionel Jan and Lionel can tell them what they want they've all got their own nutrition with them Lionel on his custom bike with that incredible cockpit uh, and uh, should I say Jan with the incredible cockpit, Lionel with the brand new bike, and he said it was without a doubt Christmas. You should have seen him grinning ear to ear like a little boy when he came out of his swim session and received his brand new bicycle. And if that's not motivation to drop some more watt bombs up and down the B19 as he chases what Cam said, the greatest of all time. He's an Olympic gold medalist, three-time Ironman world champion. He's a 70.2 times 70.3 world champion and holds the fastest time in the world, which he set here in Bavaria in Roth, the Challenge Roth with a 735.39. From Canada, Lionel Sanders is chasing the German Jan Frodeno as they race their way around the Algoi with plenty of racing still to come as we bring you the live coverage. I remind you about the weather conditions, playing a little bit of havoc with our technology, but we're doing our best to bring you these images of two of the best long course triathletes of our time. Joining me in the commentary booth, what a privilege and a pleasure. She's a world champion herself, recently retired from Denmark, Hedda Fredriksen, you left the sunshine of Denmark to come and watch this hot, hot racing in the Algoi. I mean, it's all worth it. Normally, our, day, our stains, we don't like to leave Denmark when the weather is finally good. We had 31 degrees when I left Denmark wow. and traveling down to the south of Germany. That's normally beautiful down here and, and down to the cold. I don't know what it's that. It's well, i tell you what it is. I, I think it's got to do with global warming, with climate change. I mean, we've seen Scandinavia and, and the northern limits of Europe and northern Europe is having incredibly warm temperatures. And then here in Germany and in Central Europe, um, Germany Belgium, Netherlands, horrible rains, catastrophic floods, and our thoughts do go out to all of them as we watch Jan Frodeno and Lionel Saunders watching their watts, watching their speed. Jan is the, now the one on the false up, and I've got another female world champion on the line. I've got another guest for us. You want to guess who this um, nine-time world champion is? Five times 70.3, four times Ironman? Wow, do we have the pleasure of Daniel LaRouf? We do indeed. The Angry Bird, the Swiss Miss. Welcome, another one of our guests. We say, Hope Schweetz, good morning. Hello, Daniel LaRouf. Daniel Larif is with us, and hopefully she can hear us. She's probably watching on her laptop as we speak, or yeah. on one of the, the local TV networks. There she is. Hello, Daniel Larif. Hey, how are you? Yeah, so good to have you join us. I got a funny feeling you might be sitting there wishing, oh, I want to be racing the boys right now. Um, yeah, it definitely makes me excited to watch. I mean, these two are really pushing it, and. Um, one part wants to just join them and one part feels a bit more comfortable just sitting um, here on the on the chair right now because um, I'm sure they're hurting really hard. So, um, yeah, it's definitely fun to watch. Danny, uh, I hope you have been watching for a while. Uh, Till Schenk is in the car behind Jan Fredino and Till seems to think that Jan looks a little bit uncomfortable. I don't know what you've noticed. Well, it's always hard to say, you know, I mean, he might just, you know, stretch his legs sometimes and get out of that saddle or some days you just feel like really bad on a saddle and even you have been riding a saddle, it can just twitch you somewhere and um, that's definitely not a comfortable thing, especially on a course like that. So, um, yeah, you never know, you know, it's, it's a long day and especially on a course like that when you can't really you know, get out of the saddle, um, it might look as well that it's just, um, yeah, you, you know, you have to get out and, and make it look weird when you get out of it when it's in a flat part, where in another race where you have a downhill, you automatically get to uh, rest a bit. So we'll see. I think we only find out later when, um, when they're on the run. I mean, at the moment, I'm, sh I'm sure they're, they do everything they can and, um, yeah, we'll see. It's it's going to make it interesting. 
So, Daniela, um, hi, nice to, nice to have you on board as well. Um, I'm just hey, wondering Ellen. how much you would like to try this as well, um, when it could be another woman that you would battle against. I mean, yeah, it definitely is really interesting. I think it's great they, um, you know, they push it, you know, on their own. Um, I, I'm a big believer in you know, non-drafting and a course like this where, um, you know, it needs so much um, organization to get these roads closed. And it's amazing to see what they, um, you know, how they, how um, all the people behind this event could put up that, um, you know, make it possible. So definitely um, an amazing um yeah, challenge and yeah, it's. I'm I'm interested to see how they how they battle it out and um, definitely would be something um, one day I, I could imagine to do. It's it's a lot of pressure. I think um, yeah. what's not to underestimate is that you know like having those only two people, everyone watching them, is uh, a lot of pressure to handle because it's the whole event is based on two people. So. Um, it's I yeah I think that's also a fact um, which is not to underestimate today for um, for Jan and um, Lionel because uh, I'm I'm pretty sure they do feel the pressure as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's very interesting that you bring that up as well because there's absolutely no hiding. There's cameras on both of them, and, and it's not like, you know, as you say, like if if Jan is feeling a bit of discomfort, like then you know, as a viewer, we would normally be looking at other people, but now we are looking at Jan. So it's interesting that you can feel the pressure on yourself as well, like seeing yourself sitting out there, maybe having a a less comfortable day and 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 what does all the viewers think so i really think it's interesting to bring that up indeed it is and if you think about it i mean it's like racing under a magnifying glass the whole time you know when you're out there and i'm sure daniela it, it, you, you've had this experience sometimes in the race you you can um, you you can you can hide away a little bit you know you, you can feel bad for a while because the camera's not on you, the spectator's not on you, and you have that time to introspectively recover from how you're feeling bad and then push again. But here, there, there's, there's no rest, there's no hiding. Exactly. I mean, it's one thing if you on camera when you feel good, that's a nice thing. If you feel bad and you have that camera on next to you the whole day, it can be quite frustrating as well. So I'm. Um, it's going to be interesting as well, I believe, for the nerves and, um, you know, the nerves can uh, also go on your stomach. So um, it's just going to be, yeah. I think the nerves is not to underestimate today. Um, having the eyes and the cameras on you the whole day, even though, I mean, both are, of them are used to it. I think they're, they're handling pressure very well. They're handling, you know, the tension very well. I, I don't think it's going to be a problem for them, but still, to have that camera on you um, the whole time and sometimes wishing you know to just have like a little bit of peace yeah. um, for for a few seconds to i don't know just be on your own um, i think that can be also a challenge today danny you've you've given so much to the sport with with how you've raised the bar not only amongst the women but you've got the boys running scared as well and you've raised you've made them raise the bar but the sport has also given a lot to you and i know you you're passionate about the sport i know you love the sport but um what are your thoughts on this sort of one-on-one -on -one exhibition race and this incredible coverage live tv across europe across the world online to the world they're now busy approaching the canyon corner but i want to get your thoughts on what you think of what this is bringing to triathlon yeah it's it definitely shows um you know the, the support from a different angle i mean it it changed so much you know um even just seeing that you know that like gets kind of uh yeah a pr pursuit or like a, a track almost a track race but on, on an open road and i think um we do have a really cool sport it's uh, such a high level and to um to make it interesting for so long to watch these two battles i think is a big challenge but uh, i'm so far i've been watching it and i think it's really interesting to follow to have you know the data to have different insights different opinions on um, on the athletes, on the format. So I definitely think it's it's a uh, it brings something new to the sport and, and shows how amazing um, and how, what a, what a high level triathlon is. Mm. Indeed, it does. And we we just saw Jan Fredeno go through that canyon corner the first time he went through. Danny, uh, he took his he 
went out of the aero position and put his hands on the drops. Yeah. But this time, with a lot more confidence, he carried all that speed. He stayed aero through that canyon corner. So the confidence is growing out on the course. Daniela, before we let you go, um, so good to have you join us. I know you've got a huge amount of respect for both these athletes. Wouldn't you agree that, that another one of the benefits and, and the beauties of the sport of triathlon is, is the fact that you know you get to race shoulder to shoulder with amateurs with your fans and your fans get to race with you i mean yeah it's both i think this this here is really honest you know there's um no cheating no like you're just out there no no hiding um uh, an event with you know with a lot of people um being in the field being with the you know with the yeah community is, is um something i also really enjoy you know you you get to catch people, you get to overtake people, um, you get overtaken and you're trying to hang on. Um, this is a to total different uh, style. You're just on your own and you push hard. So I think I'm a fan of both. And um, I think uh, that shows the beauty of the sport and the variation. And yeah, I'm, I'm wishing both very good luck today. I, um, I have huge respect for both of them. Jan is an excellent athlete and then Lionel, I really admire his uh, you know, his passion and his power. And so I think both are definitely having a chance today to, to go for it. Thank you very much, Daniela Reef. Awesome for you to join us. And I like the way you said the passion and the power, talking about uh, Lionel Sanders, and we actually had him on camera right there. So Daniela Reef is uh, another one of the superstars of our sport. Yeah. If, th if these two are the kings, surely she's the queen. She is absolutely the queen. She <laughs> is setting the bar high. And, and I've raced Daniela for so many years. And um, I'm really, she's impressive. Uh, she keeps racing the bar. And uh, I'm excited for you to see you in, in Kona and see what you can deliver this year. And, and congrats on, on two amazing results in US lately. Um, yeah. It's just impressive to see, regardless if you have a bad day, you somehow pull it together and, and stand tall and, and always get through the race regardless and also showing that you are a human behind. And, and I think that's the beauty as well. Merci vielmals, Daniela Reef. We'll let her carry on with her day. I'm sure she's going to stay glued to our coverage of the tri battle. Jan Frodeno is leading Lionel Sanders. Out on the bike course, we have Til Schenk in the car behind La uh, Jan Frodeno. We have Ellie behind uh, Lionel Sanders. And Til Schenk has been a little bit concerned. I mean, he knows Jan well. He's been a little bit concerned about, about Jan out on the bike course. Til Schenk, please give us your impressions of how Jan is looking at the moment. Paul, he's looking really, really good, um, got to say. It's, it's a lot of fun out here. We're really close up. You were just mentioning the extra confidence he was carrying through the canyon turn. Um, it's a little bit because it's almost like we're going through two climate zones out here. On the far end of the course, or the first half, it started drizzling a little bit just a moment ago. But the turn, now the second time around, the canyon turn, just that, that high burn there, looked a lot more dry than in the first turn. So that definitely helped a lot with the confidence. Um, you guys saw it in the picture, you mentioned it a lot. Jan is getting out of the saddle a lot, but he's keeping that air position. So it's really just the attempt to switch up the muscles for a moment. And we just found by... There's little signs with gaps he's getting at the turnaround points, and it looks like he opened up a gap of about 10 seconds. But the interesting yeah. thing is we got to see Lionel's face, and about half a lap ago, he was really gritting his teeth, and he looked like he was going to bite your hat off um, if you looked funny at him. And he looked really, really relaxed now as they passed about two minutes ago. And he looked a lot more comfortable on the bike, a lot more relaxed, a lot less wiggling the body despite being in a slight uphill or false. Um, you know, up a bit. So it looks like he found his rhythm and everything, and it's going to be very un interesting to see how that's going to unfold in the next couple of kilometers out here. There we go. Tilshing, thank you. You know, when I was getting the messages saying that, oh, we're a bit worried, Jan's not looking too good, I thought, oh, uh -huh, come on, we've still got a lot of racing to go. But everybody at home was sitting on the edge of their seats, now they've relaxed back. They're back in the armchairs, another cup of coffee, maybe a pretzel, a butter pretzel, as it is. Uh, and, and it's before 12. You can have a vice for us before 12. Right, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. German rules. <laughs> well, here we go. This is 
passing each other. We've slowed this down. No, they have not slowed their cadence. And uh, just a little look. Did you see that? Yeah, yeah. Jan took just a little look at Lionel Sanders. And, and that's what um, Till Schenk was actually commenting on. And, and nice of Till to also give us a bit of a weather report that we've got two climate zones on either end of the bike course. Yeah. That is really interesting and, and that is what we are seeing down here because where we are located in the mountains that the weather changes all the time. Oh, but, yes. but I do also think that, that Frodo is looking good now and the way he took the canyon corner was was pretty cool. But it gave you a bit of goosebumps. It's like he took the perfect line and then the speed carried him in and out of that uh, curve. So yeah, that looked beautiful and I'm looking forward to see Lionel taking it now um, and to see how he looks in that corner. Looking good in the corner. Can't wait to watch Lionel go through it. I agree with you because uh, they were both tentative the first time. We saw Jan looking confident the second time. I have no doubt that Lionel's going to be more confident, but I just hope he doesn't go so far up yep. the turn. I got he, a little bit nervous there. He went high up. He went all the way up to the barrier. Like So let's let's see if he's coming into the corner soon now. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to see how he takes it. I'm, I'm sure he's going to take it a little different than last time. I agree with you. He's not far away. So Lionel Sanders is on his way to the, the canyon corner. We're actually going to we're going to watch him go through it. I know that Dr. Teddy Wall, who's head of aerodynamics for the Mercedes Group, he's standing by on the line. Teddy, if you can just stick around, we're going to watch Lionel go through the canyon corner. You see, it's a bit of an up. He's just pulling uphill slightly. He's going to move to his left across the road. Uh, no, he takes out of the aero position onto the drops. This is a recovery zone. Can you see? He's mm -hmm. just. Just freewheeling and nowhere near as no. aggressive through the turn no. this time. No. I think he got a fright the first time. I think he did too. And I think like he's maybe just thinking, okay, this is the time of the course where I'm actually sitting up and stretching my legs yeah. a little bit it's and getting time. out of my yeah, speed. aero position instead of taking any risk. You know, we, we, we really, really, yeah, stupid to take any risk, you know, and come off the bike in that corner instead. So I think he just learned from maybe the first time that that was a little, <gasps> okay, I'm not going to do this yeah. again. Yeah, hot in the, yeah. you know, when you got your heart in your throat moment yes. um, you know we've been talking a lot about their positions we've been talking about being aerodynamic and now we have the pleasure of having online we get to speak to he's a big fan of cycling himself he's a he's a, a sportler he's a hobby athlete he's a radfahrer dr teddy fall good morning and welcome to our coverage of the tri battle royal i hope you're well teddy Thank you it was interesting to see the guys now going through the corners Jan was uh, all the time down in this perfect aero position. Um, yeah, cool. Cool to see it. <laughs> There's a lot of cool stuff happening there, Teddy. Lovely to have you join us. I know that um, Jan was in your, in your wind tunnel a couple of years ago. That must have been interesting. Oh, yes. That was, from that point of view, the highlight of my aerodynamic career, having really? Jan in the wind tunnel and see, um, yeah, the formula one uh, level of his bike and also of his position because everything works together and he i think he was also also impressed of our cars what we do in details optimization all around the car i would imagine that is critical i mean you know not a lot of people think really a lot about aerodynamics but if, if we think about the world of climate change we have to have fewer emissions we need to make cars go faster and further using less energy aerodynamics is critical but that's identical with Jan and Lionel now they need to go faster and further using less energy if they want to break the records they want to go fast yeah that's true I mean um, on the cycle here at that speed around 50 kilometers an hour um, Ninety percent of the energy they need is for drag. Ninety percent, and this is compared with the car, maybe going at two hundred or so, two hundred and twenty. You have ninety percent in drag. Now, we, we, we're we're looking at both riders. I'm sure you've been watching very carefully. You're a lot more intimately knowledgeable about Jan Frodeno, but but that position is everything. The, the bikes have been optimized. But now you've got to optimize the athlete when it comes to aerodynamics, don't you? That's true. Yeah, the, the, the bikes, you can see uh, the fork and the wheels, everything is optimized. Even the, the uh, click pedals uh, have an aerodynamic shape. It was fantastic to see that. And then, yeah, you have the, the person on the bike, which is maybe um, three quarters of the whole uh, resistance. 
So I know that Jan is um, training his position. When you see it, when you see him from the front, you can see that his shoulders are much narrower than usual when he stands up or sits up. And he has trained to push his shoulders together very closely. And this is very good either for drag and for uh, the frontal area, which plays the same role. You know, Jan being a very good swimmer and being tall, he's got he's got broad shoulders, he's got a big wingspan. Right. But like you say, he's trained himself to, to actually make those shoulders as narrow as possible. And I know there are a lot of people at home, hobby athletes, weekend warriors like you and me, who, who don't necessarily think about that. And, and, and Teddy, do you have any advice for the people at home for the athletes who, who want to optimize? I mean, what are the things they should be trying to do to be more aerodynamic? Yeah, I mean, you can see his position. Uh, he has this support for the, for the lower arms. Um, he has his, his hands folded specially to reduce the drag. But I think uh, the biggest secret for Jan uh, were definitely his shoulders and his back. Uh, which he, I know he's doing some special training uh, for those muscles to, to press it together and get around back. You can also see it with Lionel that he has a, a real arrow uh, back. Um, look at here, we see a, um, the picture. Um, this is um, maybe the, the, the most important thing. Teddy, I know that, you know, besides your involvement with Mercedes and, and Mercedes being a part of our, our tri battle, you as as Teddy, as the person, as a, as a keen cyclist, as, as somebody who's passionate about sport, this new format of, of mano a mano, this tri-battle royale, I'm sure that's got you very excited as well. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, especially you see them passing all the time and uh, you see the distance getting uh, lower and bigger and that's a fantastic format. I'm, I'm a bit sad not to be there um, and see it only from from the TV screen, but my kids are sitting down there and so I can be with them, which is also nice. Well, there we go, that's fantastic. Um, <laughs> just just talk a bit about um, um, your role and, and, and uh, the, the Mercedes role uh, in, in helping Jan and the aerodynamics. I'm sure it wasn't just limited to that one visit in, in, in the wind tunnel with you. Um, it was limited to that one um, visit. Um, but I'm, I would be very glad if we could do that again. That was, uh, as I said, one of the highlights. And um, I think um, we could um, yeah, um, see a lot of ideas, uh, each other, to, to optimize both of our fields. You know, when we talk about aerodynamics, the faster you go, the, the bigger the play, the, the more drag. Now, somebody like me, right. I'm riding at 30 kilometers an hour. You know, is, is aerodynamics as big a role as it is for Jan and Lionel riding at 50 kilometers an hour? I definitely. If you go 30 kilometers, you have maybe 75% of drag. And at that speed, as I said, it's 90%. And Jan has also, I've seen him uh, before, a little downhill uh, part of the racetrack. He was more than 60 kilometers an hour, and there you are already at 95%. So um, drag is... Um, going up with a um, quarter of this um, with a double of the speed so um, and then yeah <laughs> indeed the faster go well dr teddy well thank you so much for taking the time to join us it was great to speak to you learning so much about the role of aerodynamics i didn't realize it was such a massive percentage and the far faster you go the, the greater the percentage uh, and the impact it has and and what we know here is that our athletes want to use as little energy as possible to get to the finish line and 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 being aerodynamic in the swim we were talking about making yourself small when you go through the water the wetsuits help as well and especially here on the bike the bikes have been optimized but uh, dr teddy vol explained to us how jan has worked so hard to optimize his bike position dr teddy vol from mercedes the head of aerodynamics thank you so much for joining us and we hope you stay with us till the very end and enjoy our live coverage today definitely thank you very much
Alles Gute, vielen Dank. Danke. There we go. Ciao, ciao. And we can see the, the, the three-pointed star with the clock on top. Two hours and 19 minutes as it follows Jan Frodeno. And uh, 310 watts. I mean, I remember listening to the guys earlier this week. They weren't talking about big watts. I know Lionel said, yeah, he's going to do about 305, 310 watts. But you and I have consistently seen yeah. much bigger power numbers. These guys have downplayed how hard they're going to be pushing. Yeah, you don't want to show all your cards from the beginning right and you you definitely don't want to show it before the race um, so I think that they are it looks like they are pacing evenly now and and of course it, it changes it fluctuates a little bit up and down the watch but that is just the the nature of the course that it goes a little bit up and it goes a little bit down and, and, and so do your moods <laughs> <laughs> absolutely and and yeah your mood or your your energy level or your mental space when you're going through a full distance triathlon is also going up and down and you will go through some patches where you are pretty dark yep. in your head and, and you know you need all the tools that you have and, and that you train all the time you know to find that positive energy and leave all the negative talk behind because that will happen um, when you're not feeling the best out there because again that will happen I I, I think that for, for most professional athletes they have only had a handful of races throughout their whole career where everything has gone perfectly. And in triathlon, you know, you've got three disciplines in terms of swim, bike, run. You've got the fourth discipline, transition. You've got the fifth discipline, uh, nutrition. And then you've got mother nature. There are so many variables. To have that perfect day is near impossible. But you can help create that perfect day by controlling the controllables. And one of those controllables is bike setup. Let's take a look at Jan and Lionel and their bike setups. You know, the, the bike setup and the bike tuning is something that really has given me peace over the years. Uh, in the beginning of a career, or in the beginning of my especially long distance career, there was tweaking and twerking and trying to get all these things, you know, to the perfect little details. I remember my first Hawaii, the night before the race, at 8 o'clock I was at a friend's house getting a special chain loop because I thought that would make my bike faster the next day. Um, whereas nowadays I have a team of mechanics and a team of aerodynamicists and we do testing, we build a solid piece of equipment that I can rely on 100% that I know is extremely fast and really gives me peace of mind because I can focus on the essentials, I can fo focus on my body position, I can focus on my training and that really gives me a lot of confidence on race day. Well, of course, I switched to Canyon, actually, because Jan was riding the bike. So uh, marketing works. <laughs> um, so I absolutely love the bike. Um, he, I mean, he, his setup is probably a little more dialed in than mine. He's got, you know, full custom front end and everything. Uh, when you have a couple of world titles under your belt, you get those kinds of things. Unfortunately, I don't have, uh, I mean, I have the ITU long course world title, but None of the big ones, none of the Kona, the 70.3 or the Olympic uh, title. So uh, I have the stock front end, but it is set up very well for myself. And uh, I'm confident in my position. And I think the, the name of the game with the bike really is can you hold, you've got this fancy bike and all these, these great upgrades, but if you can't hold the position well, then of what relevance is it? So I've really, really practiced being able to hold the time trial position well being relaxed. An Ironman, you should never be like, you know, far outside of yourself. It should be quite easy most of the time. How are you gonna do something for eight, you know, nearly eight hours, hopefully not eight hours this race, hopefully well under eight hours, but how are you going to do something for that long and it be hard, right? You know what I mean? It doesn't, it's a crescendo, right? It gets hard in hour six and seven if you're doing it properly. So, the bike should be, you know, relatively controlled. Towards the end, maybe it'll start to you start to muscle it a little bit, but um, for the first three hours on that bike, I should be, you know, very controlled and within myself. And uh, and that that just comes from practicing time trialing and in Tucson, where I'm where I'm coming from, uh, you know, I practice steep hills. I still try and stay in the time trial position just to become more competent. Uh, and then in a nice course like this, relatively flat, just light, you know, light uphill, it should be a lot easier to hold time trial. So we'll see.
Yeah, so we are back now on the on the bike course again, and as we can see, um, we are getting into another weather um, where we can see how it's two different places on the course where the weather is actually not good where Lionel is and the weather is uh, fine where Jan is and um, so that is just the, the beauty of the nature as we spoke about just before that how we have the weather element as well in triathlon and I think that yeah that's just amazing you know there are so many uncontrollables in triathlon that we just do not yeah we just do not know how that's going to impact us and you know how cold are they going to be out there you know how can that affect them are they you know can they stay warm yeah i'm, I'm thinking a lot about their belly you know if your belly gets cold that yep. can affect you later on in the race so have they thought about that before the race have they do they have some sort of thing to heat it you know they're taking the wind on on your belly or not. I didn't see they put anything in in transition. So, and now you see again now how Jan is, is taking it a little bit more careful around and playing it safe because it is pouring. It is very wet. Yeah. And I can tell you it's very wet because I just had to go for a quick run. And even here at the finish line, the, the rain has come down substantially. But it, what you and I have seen the last couple of days, we get a little downpour and then like the sun might peak out and suddenly gets so warm and humid. So this has definitely dropped the temperature. And this is also uh, making the, 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 there are not a lot of technical parts of the course, but it's making those technical parts of the course just a little bit more tricky. dangerous, possibly mm. tricky. You've got to be more cautious. So what's happening is we saw, as you mentioned, Lung Young going so gently around mm. that roundabout. Yeah, but it's so easy to slide out. You know, yeah. the surface is, you know, it's a fine, fine, fine asphalt. And, and, and the sliding is probably the easiest crash you can make when you're cornering like 180 around a roundabout yeah. like that. You can so easily slide out. And it, it's a crash that's often not going to, you know, hurt you a lot, but it's going to take time and it's going to shake you a lot. It's going to put a lot of mental pressure on you. And you don't want to deal with that if you can help it. No, no, you want to reduce all the pressures possible. So we've been telling you to send us your message. Messages. Hashtag try battle on uh, Instagram, and uh, we're going to try and show you some of those messages. As you look just over Jan's shoulder, your messages are now playing for all the spectators around the course to see. Uh, Jan's not going to look back because that's not aerodynamic to look over your shoulder, and uh, hopefully, we can pull in a little bit closer to read that message. What? So, Hella, I'm actually going to ask you the question because the message on the LED wall is what are the thoughts that go through an athlete's mind during a four-hour bike race, which is in the middle of swim and run? Yeah. I mean, four hours, you're definitely not taking those four hours into your head. You're breaking it into section. You are staying within the moment, focus on what you can do right in the moment and not going too far. You're staying... Yeah, in the zone, you're, you're keeping your watts or heart rate or whatever you are riding to or the rate of perceived effort, whatever you're feeling in, in your body and in your nutrition plan. And then you don't really go too far away from that. You know, you, there is, you can break the race a lot up into your nutrition plan. So, you know, like every 10K I'm doing that or, or at the clock I'm doing that or, you know, so that you don't make that your brain wonder because you need to have all the energy for what you're doing right now. Plus, you can also start to have, you know, negative thoughts that you don't want to have. So just stay within the moment. And now we have a passing again. Let's see. Ah. And Lionel got to read the message and he's going, what am I thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he's not concerned about that. I don't think actually, to be honest, you keep the brain super simple. Quiet. You have to quiet that brain. It actually often it's about quieting the brain and, and, and not thinking about too much out there because you can just make it too complicated. So make it simple for yourself um, and then uh, that, that's how you do it best. And I mean, if you are starting to walk, you know, to let your brain wander towards T2, oh, I mean, they still have 100 kilometers to go. A lot of things can happen. A lot can happen. Anything is possible, but you still need to concentrate. I mean, here, you know, here you, 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 you're not really, as we, as we see Tilshank uploading more photos for his social media, and um, Ellie is watching the live stream on his phone, so these are two uh, on-course commentators. <laughs> Till you are live to the world, this is hilarious. Uh, I think Ellie's watching Till, what do you think? But these are our two experts on the course who give us wonderful color 
they give us a wonderful point of view that you and I can't really see when we just see the monitor. You know, we're not out there. They're seeing the, the real-time weather conditions. They're seeing the, the body positions, the body language, um, the moments, the, the, how efficient the guys are riding all the time in real time are right there. So it's so great to have them on the course. I want to talk tire pressures a bit and tires. You know, in the old days, we used to run skinny tires super hard. But that's changed radically recently. We're riding 28s, fairly wide tires. Instead of 14, 15 bar, we're riding 6 to 8 bar. And, and in these wet conditions, a slightly softer tire is better, isn't it? Yeah, a little bit less. We have a little bit more grip. Um, so again, so you don't come off the bike. So you, do, you again, it is it is a dis decision you need to make before the start. And as here, it's super difficult to to make the right decision because the weather changes all the time. It does, and at the moment it's looking pretty wet, which means it'll bring the temperature down. You know, we were 16 odd degrees Celsius when we started this morning. 16.4 was the ambient temperature. They're moving along at about 50 kilometers now. That's a lot of wind that they're, 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 they're pushing them, a lot of air they're pushing themselves through. So it creates apparent wind on the body. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the belly, so the tri suits are wet in the rain, and that's cooling them down. Yep. And when you cool down, your body goes, oh, whoa, 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 I need to warm up. So it starts tapping into your nutrition, not just to fuel the muscles, but to warm you up. So yeah, you need to eat and drink a bit more. Absolutely, yeah. It's trying to keep you warm, and, and, and it's, it's, it's pulling the blood away from your, your extremities, so it's taking you into your core to keep you warm, because that's the main thing. And, and yeah, it does cost a little bit more energy to keep warm, so it does need a little bit more of carbohydrates, but I'm sure that both of them are maximizing their absorption of carbohydrates already, so yeah. I don't think they, they're going to do anything differently. I will say of the two athletes, I will say that I think Lionel will thrive better, um, in the cold weather than, than, than Jan will. Um, he is a more muscular guy. He is producing a little bit more heat in his muscles as yeah. well. He's a little bit more compact yeah. man than, than um, Jan is. He has a big uh, surface, surface area. Surface area to and lose there he body will heat. Exactly. Yeah. So I think like um, Jan will struggle a bit more. He is definitely loving the heat. Uh, and he's always excelling in the hot well, places. Beijing was hot. We know that Ironman Kona is hot. Uh, Roth is hot. Challenge Frankfurt Roth. Was very hot. Frankfurt is brutally hot the last couple of years. Or we did have, did have one very, very cold year. So, a lot of his big results and his incredible times have all been in very, very warm conditions. So there we go. Your stories, your thoughts. Hashtag Try Battle on Instagram. We'll put them on our LED board. What are the thoughts during a four-hour race on the bike? all alone. Hela answered that very, very well. You actually want to keep the voices in the head quiet. You want to keep the thoughts to the minimum. You're basically thinking aid station to aid station or gel to gel. You, you're keeping it fairly quiet. You're speaking, and, and I mean, then it's, I read the last word, alone. Yeah. I will say we train alone a lot. So we train for these conditions as well. We are alone at work a lot. Yes you know, day in and day out, having these long bike sessions. Um, so you train to be alone in your own head. Um, so I don't, I wouldn't want to underestimate the value of that. Great um, stats again from the SAP team. Look at this. We're looking at the average watts on lap one. So we've had three laps of the bike course already, two more to go. So you're looking at Frodo pushing 311. Sanders, not a lot more, eh? not a lot more at all. In the next lap, though, lap two, there was a very, very big difference. Lionel, very consistent, still pushing the 313. Jan dropping a bit. Could be various reasons. Could be suddenly it got wetter or he just needed to regather himself. But he's back up there again yeah. on lap number three, yeah. whereas Lionel's dropped slightly on lap three. Yeah, and that's what you see, you know, throughout a race, as also as Daniela Rueff, she mentioned, you don't feel good all the way and you might have a little bit of a down or a dark period and you come back again. And that's also what we train, you know, that you have tools to come back again and not, you know, lose it like mentally. OK, I'm not feeling good now. Oh, no, everything is going to go bad. No you know that that can happen. You've tried it so many times before. And, and now we are seeing that Lionel has a slightly higher watts average than Jan, and, and that, that will also mean he has a slightly higher watts per kilo than Jan, because, because he he's is, two kilograms yeah, lighter. a little lighter. So therefore, he's actually potentially going faster. Potentially, but it also depends on the position, right? Who's most aerodynamic, who's sitting still, who's riding most efficiently. So I would argue that it, there's probably not a big difference. I know that when I looked at the bikes at the press conference, the bikes are practically identical. But what 
the, and they're both running a, a 112 setup, so one chain ring in the front, 12 at the back. At the back, they are identical. They're running 1028s. But in the front, Jan's running a 52 tooth uh, chain ring in front. And um, Lionel's running a 54. Mm -hmm. Also, not a huge difference. No. But he prefers the lower cadence, he prefers the bigger yeah. gear. That's how he rides, and it's, it's maybe like a 10 RPM slower than, than Jan, and that, that's how his, his, that's his riding style. And it takes years again to adapt, and we see some athletes just riding with a lower cadence, and, and we see that more on, on long-distance racing, and he's just found that that is more efficient for him, and, and he can keep his heart rate lower, and he can burn less energy. And again, back to Daniela, she's also riding a very yes. low cadence, and, yep. and she's trained that, you know, it doesn't come overnight. She's been in the sport forever, and, and she can run well off the bike, and so can Lionel. So good to have so many spectators join us here at Burgberg, where we have our finish line, where we have T2 and where uh, Jan and Lionel will be lapping on the run course. They're watching the footage on the big screen and they can hear the commentary of uh, world champion Helle Fredriksen and myself, Paul Kay. Thank you for joining us at home, be it on TV or online. Keep your comments coming. Hashtag try battle. Uh, we've got two athletes racing, but we've got the world supporting and the world watching. And it looks like it is back into that 500 meter nutrition zone for Jan Frodeno as the bike moves alongside him now. He gets to ask what he'd like. It looks like it's water at the moment. And we can give you the split screen view of Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders. Jan Frodeno, no bottle in the cage behind the saddle. He's only got one in the down tube. Lionel is carrying a bottle in the down tube and behind the saddle. So he's actually carrying more weight on the bike. He is, but it's such a flat course, so I don't know that that's going to matter a lot. I think that Lionel just wants to be more rather safe than sorry and carry what he needs with him in case this rolling aid station is not going exactly as he wants to. Um, and again, I think that just Jan might have a little bit more experience and a little bit more confident in his race plan and nutrition plan. I noticed how Jan looked at the bottle. He nearly took a sip and he looked at it again. Hold yeah. on, is that what I really wanted? Boom, takes a sip. Saying thank you to the TV crew for bringing us that slow-mo. We got a great team bringing all these pictures together. Conditions are not ideal. I think uh, here at the finish line, the skies are lightening a bit. The rain has stopped. Hopefully we get the helis back up there again and we can bring you even more incredible images. We remind you that following Lionel Sanders, we got Ellie in the vehicle who can give us a point of view. Following Jan Fredeno, we got Till. And uh, hopefully we'll get a little, another update from Ellie fairly soon on how Lionel Sanders is doing. And he's not far away from going through the nutrition zone as well. Both of them setting new personal bests on the 3,800 meter swim. It'll be interesting to see what they do on the bike course today. We were hoping for a very dry bike course. We were hoping for hot conditions. We're at altitude. We're about 750 meters above sea level. So the air is a little bit thinner. So there's a little less drag as we bring you some of the time gaps. Now, hello, this is interesting. This is a big one. This is what a lot of people are asking in their minds right now. So post swim, it was a five minute gap. In that first 20 Ks, Lionel made up quite a bit of time. He made up, seems to lost time afterwards. Yeah, um, is that the race condition? Is that the weather? Who knows, you know? I know that, that uh, they've also been, you giving each other a little bit of banter that, you know, that Jan might be a better technical rider and he might be having more experience riding out in, in wet weather. Whereas Lionel, um, you know, has done a lot of indoor training, which is super yes. efficient. He's been a lot on Swift and he's, he's, he, he loves that. And as I say, it is amazing training, but you also need to ride out in bad conditions yeah. because you never know what's going to be thrown at you at race day. So no matter how much we hate to get out and ride in the rain, we just always need to remind ourselves, well, I might be better prepared for a race um, where it's really, really raining cats and dogs. and, and um, I know how to deal with that and and it's 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 not only that yeah you might feel cold but it's also like it gets a little bit more slippery and you don't feel so safe yes. anymore going around the corners and i do think that lionel might feel slightly less, less confident yeah, yeah around the corner and I, that might be what we're seeing there yeah, that's a very, very good observation. I, I know that at the press conference, there was a little bit of smack talk between uh, Jan and Lionel, where, where Jan basically told Lionel, well, you can't, you don't know how to corner. <laughs> You're useless. <laughs> I mean, they were having fun. Yeah? But, yeah. but like I said, tongue in cheek, 
little bit of truth said in jest, but uh, maybe your observation there is spot on. That's what we're seeing. And it's so good that we've finally got the splits up for you, that we can see how they're looking per lap and uh, what the gap is. And, and, and in reality, Hella, in the big picture of 226 kilometers of, call it seven and a half hours of racing, nothing has really changed yet. No, nothing. Um, you can maybe argue that you saw that Lionel were pushing out a little bit more watts, so you can maybe argue then that uh, Jan is riding a little bit more efficient, or maybe that, you know, cornering a little bit better and, and being a little bit confident in the conditions, yes. a little bit more confident, because he is actually moving a bit faster for less watts. Well, maybe that's also to do with when we were chatting to Dr. Teddy Wall, uh, you know, head of aerodynamics at Mercedes, where he was talking about the, the, the very conscious decision Jan has made to, to make adjustments to his position on the bike, just the muscles in his back, how to narrow the shoulders, bringing their elbows in, how to hold his hands around the, you know, the, the end of the tri bars. Yeah, but that is a commitment, you know, it, this is a full time job, you know, as he's also approaching 40, I mean, like, he spends a lot of time doing body maintenance, he spends a lot of time doing mobilization work, he can't sit in a position for four plus hours like that without training that, yes. and without doing all your body maintenance every single day, without having his physio to work on him. He does, it doesn't just come falling off the trees, right? This <laughs> takes work to be able to sit like that and, and such a big man be able to sit so smoothly and just ride, you know, as also as Cam put it, like it is just the beauty sitting there racing. Like he makes it look so easy, but I tell you, he is working for it. Yeah, Cam, so funny. The beauty and the beast is how he compared these two. But we'll call them the two kings. And it's Jan Frodeno leading Lionel Sanders at the moment. And in the bigger picture of things, I know people have been asking about the splits. Essentially, the time gap post-swim is the time gap we've still got at the moment in terms of the deficit Lionel has on Jan at the moment. Talking about Jan's efficiency, his position on the bike, he's looking incredible. As a matter of fact, we got a little bit worried in the beginning, even Felix and, and, and Till said, oh, I'm not too comfortable. Jan's looking a bit slow. He's looking uncomfortable. He's standing up a lot but the numbers are saying something very different and, and he's absolutely flying and so is everybody at home and look at the watts they're dropping at home as they join us all around the world on their virtual trainers in their lounges in their pain caves wherever they may be uh, not only can they watch this online and on tv we live to the world they're riding with Jan, they're riding with lionel and all their mates at the moment it's I think that's amazing, and, and I th if I think that, uh, you know, for a lot of people, sometimes cycling on the roads feels intimidating, it's a bit of a barrier to entry. Here you can upskill specifically in terms of fitness first, and once you've got that confidence of fitness, you can then take it to the road. Yeah, absolutely, and, and, and now with the change in, in smart trainers as well, where they are not so static anymore, but they are actually rocking a little bit, so like we spoke about earlier, how you said that 21-day challenge you made, yeah. that it made your knees sore, oh. and, and it I really, for me as well, like I struggle with my hips on a very static trainer, but when the trainers got better and you could sit inside and they're rocking, so it got more road-like feeling and on swift as well. You can feel the gradient, you can feel the cobblestones, you can feel the gravel, you can feel the bridges. Yes. The bike shakes a bit, like it is so road-like and it is really... Although what's not road-like, really, I, I did a virtual race and um, it was on a controlled trainer and the minute we hit a gradient, it was like somebody put my brakes on. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a... when I climb a mountain, and I've climbed a couple of big ones here in Europe, yeah. you know, I, I can change gears nicely, I can, I can feel it, I can, I can sort of ride into the climb, but geez, on the trainer, it's like somebody puts the brakes on. Yeah, it is super efficient riding and, and, and also, yeah, safe riding. So, I mean, like, yeah, if you're watching this, yeah, I would jump on. I would definitely take the talents and jump, jump on. Well, I... So whilst we've got everybody around the world virtual racing and, and virtually racing Jan and Lionel at the moment, which is fantastic, keep it up, keep joining us, and make sure you keep hashtagging Tri Battle on Instagram. We've got Till Schenk, who's finished hashtagging Tri Battle on Instagram and can tell us more about Jan Frodeno and how he's looking out on the course, as well as the weather. The guys seem to be a bit more tentative on the slightly technical parts of the section of the race. If you're in, past it. Tol Schenk, we'd love to hear from you. Well, the weather is absolutely miserable. <laughs> I mean, I'm really glad that I'm in the car here right now. It is absolutely pouring down um, out there. You know, 
Jan is looking comfortable though. He's looking really good. He's communicating with the motorbike um, in the aid station just now. So he, he's looking really good at the moment. It looks like not much has changed other than the rain coming down. We're just heading towards uh, the Kenyan turn again. So that's going to be an interesting one to see how he's going to take it this time. But, you know, it, it's not a secret. The Colt isn't Jan's favorite. You guys were talking about it. He is wearing this very special suit that they developed for him with a graphene inlay that comes from Italy that's supposed to control the core temperature, to control the body. I'm sure that's a help for him out there. But it's still a long way to go. They're heading into that slight kind of like downhill bit. We've got speeds of about 60, 65 kilometers an hour. Um, so you've got the wind there. It is not nice, but he is looking very good at the moment. Thank you very much, Till Schenk. It makes such a difference. Instead of you and I sitting here guessing, we've got our experts out there on the course who give us the specifics, which is good to, to hear. And, and in talking, you know, he, Till was listening to us when we spoke about the cold. We spoke about a lot of Jan's big performances have been in hot conditions. Mm -hmm. Interesting to hear that they've thought about that, typical Jan, of course, yeah. and they've developed a suit especially. Yeah, I had a good conversation with Dan Laurent, some which is Jan's coach has been that since 2012. Um, and, and yeah, they are really thinking about it when, when it could potentially be cold weather. This is something that they are mindful about. And this is something that they rather want to spend a few extra seconds, um, maybe taking on more clothes uh, in transition and or, or wearing a suit that's actually can keep his core temperature up um, or just, you know, so it doesn't drop because that can also be detrimental. We're always talking about that your core temperature is yes. going up in a race and you're overheating, yeah. but it can also happen the other thing. And, and now we see this, uh, the canyon turn, where they are doing everything they can for not aquaplaning out there and, and not gliding off this. I will say that I felt that material yesterday, and it yes. is grippy. Okay. Uh, so the, so it, it, it looks very, very smooth and slippery, but it's not. Like, there's definitely a grip to it. So I wouldn't be too concerned, but I'm happy to see that We're they're taking doing no this. chances. Yes, Taking exactly. no chances. You know, this is, you've got one, one chance. And that's it today, and it's it's mano a mano. It's 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 Jan Frodeno who I believe is approaching the corner right now, the canyon turn. It is indeed. Jan's approaching it right now, about to hit that canyon turn, which I think is a fantastic innovation. It adds a wonderful talking point. I think technically it's brilliant as well. And what will he do? It's a lot wetter now than the last time. So first time he went into the drop. Oh, he thought about it. <laughs> and uh, onto the drops, kind problem, kind tema. There he goes, piece of cake. Yep. And yep. didn't lose any speed, eh? He was hesitating, eh? Yep, yep, he, did, he thought about it. Yeah, but He's I human. Think Exactly, Thank exactly. Goodness. And and I think he made the right choice. He took it very fast still. He was still up in the perfect line and, and really carrying the speed in and out of the curve. So I think he did a perfect decision there and um, yeah well done out again we get to watch it again so so watch watch as the arms come out of the air just one first thing uh, no hold on a second better safe than sorry but he waits till the last minute as well of eh? course of very course. clever beautiful That's line well. as you mentioned not too high but high enough so that he can carry some speed little brief rest for the legs Arrow again before he even hits the tarmac. What a pro. I think he looks really good now. I think he looks confident and comfortable. Like, as comfortable as you can be. It's all about being comfortable in the uncomfortable, right? Yeah. If, I mean, this is not nice. It's and, and Not in this it, weather either. But regardless, if the weather was good, yeah, he makes it look easy. But you got to remember, he is pushing, you know, to his limit, like where he should be in his zones. And if it's ever comfortable, you are not working hard enough. You just need to he keep asking yourself, oh, am I feeling too good? Oh, it's not good. But, but that in itself is something you train. It's yeah. not something you know. You know, no, pacing is, you know, we've spoken about nutrition. We, we've spoken about equipment. We've spoken about aero. But now we're talking about pacing. That's something you teach yourself. We're going to get another message on the LED wall shortly. So if you could choose the conditions, hot and dry or wet and cold? Yeah, I'm going to ask you. I know what I would choose. Hot and dry every day. Really? Even hot and humid. Like, I am like Lan, like, I'm like Jan. I hate the cold and my body doesn't really Hold on, you come from cold. Denmark. I know. I don't know that Viking thing that just passed. <laughs> um, it doesn't really work for me. No, I've had some miserable races in very cold weather where my body is completely 
shutting down, my muscle doesn't want to work and I'm getting super, super, super cold and shaking, completely shaking, where I can't control my muscles. So definitely any day, hot, hot and humid, um, racing and I think that like, uh, yeah, Jan is absolutely the same. Of course, we also then you know need to know uh, how we are coping with that nutrition-wise. Yes. Uh, when it is hot and humid, uh, but I'm also um, is relatively good at getting rid of the heat, and I'm also a, a smaller person uh, mm -hmm. that usually is, is is good in the heat. Very quick for Jan Fredino at the moment. His average speed 45 and a half kilometers an hour. That's that's no slouch. That's not slow at all. No, and there is a wind chill factor as well playing in, and when, when it, the rain is this cold as it is right now, you know, you have your quads as well that, that can seize up a bit and, and get cold, and, and your feet will get cold too. Um, so, yeah, and uh, sitting in that um, very, you know, still position with your upper body also makes you, could make you a little bit stiffer. But let's not just only talk about bad weather. We, you know, in, in half an hour, it might be sunshine. Anything's possible, and, and we've seen it this week. Um, you know, if I had to choose hot and cold, and I might be from Africa, okay, um, but I choose the cold, <laughs> and I actually had it proved to me I was part of a, I was a, a lab rat in, a, in, a, in an experiment at the Sports Science Institute in South Africa under Professor Tim Noakes. And uh, we did four different things where I was in, a, in an environment chamber. I wasn't allowed, I wore a heart rate strap at a temperature probe. And why are we slowing down? Are we slowing down for the pass? Indeed. And there's the LED ball. Uh, Lionel Sanders and Jan Fredin are passing each other yet again. And this time it was Jan who got to read the LED board on uh, Lionel's car. But they put me in four different temperatures, 15 degrees Celsius, 20, 25 and 30. And my fastest 20K time trial was at 15 degrees Celsius. Yeah, but it was not raining. No, it wasn't crazy. raining. No, no, so I was, I mean, I was like, in an environment chamber. Exactly. Like So 15 <laughs> degrees is fine, and, and it's not really that cold, right? Yeah, this might be 16 degrees air temperature, but you have the rain and the wind. you got a wind chill. Yes. Yeah, so a real feel of probably 12. Exactly. And when your, your suit is this wet, uh, wet you don't really... It, it doesn't dry up. In the, the, the weather can't make it dry again, and it makes you cold, even more cold. So... Whilst we're discussing the heat and the cold, and, and whilst we've got our viewers asking us about it, we actually spoke to, to, to Lionel and said, you know, just tell us about the conditions you train and race in compared to what you think you'll be experiencing here in Algar. Let's hear from Lionel Saunders. Onto the bike. I think I can hold. I've been training, you know, in extreme heat. It's literally been... Uh, I'll do like my last long ride. Uh, the average temperature was almost 40 Celsius, so for, for four hours. So it's very difficult to use power under those things. I'll, I, I was using heart rate for the training, so I'll, I'll probably go off heart rate. But if I had to estimate uh, in, in the temperatures here, I'll probably hold between 300 and 310 watts. And just in my mind, my mantra will be form and fuel because you know you, you, you want to go as fast as you can with as least effort as possible, and that means not muscling the bike and zigzagging around the road. And then for me, the big one is fuel. I have heavy losses. I sweat even, even in conditions like this, cooler conditions. I'm still sweating a minimum of two liters per hour. I'm losing a minimum of 1,300 milligrams of sodium per liter. So I have to consume, you know, on the bike, I, you don't want to have too much of a deficit. So I probably need to be focusing on consuming 1.8 liters per hour, which is a full-time job when you're also trying to push 310 watts on the bike. So that will occupy my thoughts pretty well the whole time. I think the bike has, again, very little chance to actually rest. So the few technical turns that there are, I will definitely use to my advantage to try and rest. Um, and then you have a slight uphill on the way out and a slight downhill on the way back. The trouble is we don't know the actual steepness of this course. Nobody's ridden it and nobody's been able to compare and that makes it you know, somewhat ambiguous. The whole project will stand and fall on the bike course. We don't know how fast it is. We hope it's fast. But, you know, on the slight uphills, I think there's somewhere between 5 to 10% of extra power that I would have to push on the way up versus the way down. Um, the way down is all about optimizing and, and, and trying to be as aerodynamic as possible. Um, but, I mean, the basic cycling 101. 
We are being given a lesson in cycling by both Jan Frodeno and Lionel Saunders. Lionel Saunders powering his way on the Bundesstrasse, the B19, the, the freeway that's been closed, especially for our Tri Battle Royale. And he makes his way now to the canyon turn. We saw Jan hesitate. What are we going to see Lionel do now? So I'm just going to keep quiet. We're going to let Lionel do this for us. Here we go. Powering his way to the canyon turn. What does he do? Same as last time. Not taking any chances. He actually slows down. I wonder if he's using this as a rest. Look, he's no stranger to the velodrome. Was he no, set the one-hour record? He did like he did before. He took a rest there, and now it's raining even more, so he's again not taking any risks, and I think he's just playing it safe. Nothing wrong with that. He's playing it safe. He did also say that the colder conditions are better for him. He sweats less. He needs to take in less nutrition. Mm -hmm. And he feels that's going to play into his hands later yeah. on into the race. He did also say that he'd like to catch Jan Frodeno around about 100 kilometers into the bike race. Yep. And I'm not sure we're there. No, it hasn't happened yet. It's just even the, the gap is growing a little bit now. And uh, yeah, it might again be the condition that's playing into the favor of Jan. And um, who knows, because it's not that Lionel is not pushing out the power that he, he's used to pushing out the, what, from what we can see anyway. So um, I think that's what we're seeing. I think that just uh, even though that we talked about that Jan doesn't like the cold condition, but he's definitely handling the technical demands of, of wet weather uh, a bit better is indeed and we're approximately just a little bit over halfway into the bike i would guess just looking at the clock um that would suggest that we've done a bit more than 100 kilometers that's wild eh <laughs> it's incredible hence the 45.5 average speed this is brilliant these despite the conditions these guys are are not giving in they are they're giving it a full tank of gas full throttle this is impressive. It's impressive what the human body can train to, to do, right? It's what the mind allows the body to do, don't you think? Absolutely. It also needs, you know, how many years that those guys have been training, how many hours day in and day out, how much that goes behind or before what you see today. We always see, you know, the great professionals, the best in the world shine and makes it look so easy, but do not forget what it takes to get there. Um, that is the grit every single day. You got to turn up every single day when no one is watching, when the weather is horrendous, you got to get up early morning practice, train five, six hours a day. It doesn't come easy. Anything worthwhile takes a huge amount of effort. Absolutely, yep. absolutely. We're watching our uh, commentators in the cars following our two kings. It's Tilshenk at the moment. And by the way, you notice that they're not wearing masks. But I think what the people at home don't realize is that every single one of us, the entire crew, all the athletes, we have all been COVID tested regardless of whether you had a vaccination or not. We started 9 a.m. this morning in the Große Alpse in Immenstadt and uh, into that 3,800 meter swim, an incredible swim. No boys that needed to be sighted. This white Teflon rope, one meter below the surface for Jan Frodeno and Lionel Saunders to just look down as if they're following the black line in the pool. Initially, Lionel Saunders stayed on the toes of uh, Jan Frodeno, but quite quickly, Jan Frodeno got into his rhythm and started pulling away. A new personal best for Jan Frodeno after 3,800 meters in the lake. Ripping off the wetsuit, textbook perfect as he made his way to T1. On with the race suit, he got his heart rate strap in place as well as he made his way to his time machine that incredible bike that'll carry him over the 180 kilometers of the bike course dumping his gear into the box but wet slippery fingers and down goes the helmet you could see his frustration slows down calms down the adrenaline is pumping on with the helmet and time to complete the swim and start 180 kilometers here in the Algoi on the bike Jan Frodeno initially not bothering to get his feet into the shoes as he left T1 and made his way out onto the course. Absolutely brilliant for Jan Frodeno. Brilliant swim, record-breaking stuff in terms of personal records as uh, making his way 
up onto the Purpose Made ramp. Another personal best. His last four races, he set personal best swims. And again, this time here at the Tri Battle Royale for the Canadian contender, the second of our two kings, onto the bike course he goes. So, perfect. Even better than the script for both Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders as they completed the swim and made their way onto the bike. The weather changed very quickly. It went from dry to wet. And we also heard that different conditions on either side of the course. We're very blessed here at our Zwift Tri Battle Royale with our ongoing live coverage on TV across the world and online. We have lots of guests that we can speak to. And we've got a superhero we're going to speak to now. This man is a German export in Edmonton, Canada, same country that our friend Lionel comes from. Uh, he is uh, NHL Player of the Year, MVP, leading scorer, voted most outstanding player from the same hometown as the other man in screen, Jan Frodeno from Cologne, from Cologne. Hello and welcome, Leon Dreiseitel. Hey, how are you? Thanks for having me. So good to have you join us. You know, I know what it's like in sport, you know, elite athletes, regardless of your sporting discipline, you have so much respect for the other elites out there. You are top of the pyramid when it comes to ice hockey and next to you on the screen, top of the pyramid when it comes to triathlon. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's obviously very, very different. Um, I think every athlete at, at the top of their level in their respective sports it's, it's just very impressive the work that they put in um for us hockey players the work is, is obviously a little bit different a little bit shorter but um again like you said it's it's just impressive how every sport uh at the highest level um you know has their own way of training and their own way of getting ready and, and um no matter what sport it is it's it's very impressive you talked about those differences. Um, for you, it's, it's, it's short, it's intense, it's high speed, quite physical. I, I would imagine a lot of just general body strength. Uh, with Jan, it, it's flexibility, it's endurance, it's, it's staying at a very high intensity, not as high as your short bursts, but for a very, very long time. But what you have in common as elite athletes is that unwavering focus on your goal. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think we're, we're trying to get better each and every day, right? Um, and I think that's no, no different with, with those two guys. Um, you know, when, when you're at the top of, of your sport, you, you try to find tiny little things where you can get better and we, where you can, uh, you know, maximize your own body or your own potential. Um, and I think, again, that, that's in every sport. So. Um, it's it's fun to watch. It's it's impressive to see, um, you know, all the athletes around the world how they, you know, try to get better uh, each each and every year. Leon, so lovely to have you join us. You know, we've got. It looks like you're nice and dry and comfortable where you are, but I tell you, Jan, <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Jan and Lionel good. are battling it in the rain in the beautiful Algoy here, but I yeah. notice it's lightening up. I can hear our helicopter about to take off in the background, but I want to talk about another thing that you and, and, and Jan have in common. It's Laureus Sport for Good. Uh, yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a charity program that, that we're both part of. Um, I know that uh, Jan has, has done a lot of great work with them and, and um, you know, he's done a lot of great things in this world and especially with, with Laureus, um, you know, he's a, a big part of that. And, um, you know, I, I just started being being part of that organization and, and you know, I love it. I love giving back. I love helping people. And, and um, you know, obviously last summer I, I started the, the hockey program in Berlin, um, which was a lot of fun. Um, you know, hopefully it'll, it'll grow and grow and, and we can do, uh, you know, potentially a thing together one day. And if you don't mind, uh, you, you might detect from my accent, I'm a Cape Tonian, I'm from South Africa. <laughs> Laureus has a very, very strong South African connection. And uh, Jan Frodeno got into triathlon in South Africa. And today in South Africa is Mandela Day. So I just want to briefly say happy Mandela Day to the beautiful people of South Africa. I know you have some huge challenges you're dealing with, but you come together, unite, you will overcome those challenges. Um, Leon, I've also got Hella Fredrickson with, with, with me here, and my co-commentator. She's a triathlon world champion herself. She'd like to ask you a question. Hi, Leon. Absolutely. Nice, nice, nice to Hi. have you here. Um, we are talking a lot about fueling strategies and threat rate and, and all these things. I'm just curious, like, how are you fueling on the fly 
in ice hockey? How are you getting enough fuel in? Is it only in the breaks or, or how are you doing it? I mean, we, we obviously, um, it's the same for us as any other sport. The nutrition part or, or the fueling part is, uh, is, is very important. It's very key. Um, obviously, again, our schedule is a little bit different than, than what you guys, uh, what you guys do. Um, but yeah, I mean, water, um, electrolytes, all that kind of stuff, uh, you know, we have on the bench. So in between shifts, um, you know, you, you fuel up and, and try and get out there and do it all over again. Yeah, exactly. I can imagine that it's it's always a challenge. You know, it's about having enough uh, electrolytes and ca carbohydrates to 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 keep the concentration. I imagine that yours is you're so powerful and your concentration needs to be so spot on to not miss a little thing. Whereas like here, it's seven and a half plus hours. So okay, your concentration can clip for a few seconds, but in your your world, it's just not allowed. Yeah, that, that's that's exactly right, uh, and that's the difference, right? Um, we could never do what you guys do. Uh, no chance, no way. Um, you know, we're out there for maximum a, a minute at a time. It's it's high intensity. It's hard. You have to be focused, but we also get a little bit of break. But at the same time, I think you guys uh, would find our training very different and, and probably hard too. So, Absolutely. Um, it's very it's very interesting, all the different sports, the dynamics, um, the, the types of training that you, you need to, to be good at your sport. So again, like I said at the beginning, it's very impressive. And um, you know, I love, love watching it and I have uh, a lot of respect for you guys. You know what, I'd, I, I'm hoping, Leon, that you've been watching a little bit and you maybe saw them go through this crazy banked canyon turn as we bring the velodrome to the Bundesstrasse. Uh, but, but I would imagine you don't just look at your sport for, for, for inspiration on how to train better, how to get better. You kind of watch other sports too and go, oh, that looks like a good idea. I wonder, I wonder if I adapt that a little bit to my training. Um, you know, I, I could make myself an even better player than I am ready. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm trying to get better every day. Um, trying to find new things that make me a better uh, a better player. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of things in triathlon that that would be great for me on the ice, uh, especially in terms of uh, cardio and and um, you know the long distance uh, kind of stuff. So um, yeah, again, just trying to get better each and every day. Again, just like just like everyone else does too. Um, so. Uh, it's always great to, to find different ways of training. So I know that you, you're with the Edmonton Oilers, which means you're in Canada. So we've decided, even though you're German, you're supporting Lionel Sanders. Uh, I, 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 I wish him all the best, but I tend to disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Absolutely perfect. Leon. Thank you so much. So great to have you with us, uh, Leon Dreisaitl. You know, he's an absolute superstar in terms of ice hockey. Yeah. Uh, a, a phenomenal German export. And, and congratulations to you, Leon. Keep up the good work. You know, I know all of Germany is behind you. And keep up the incredible work you're doing in terms of giving back to communities, you know, with the program that you've started in Berlin, uh, also being part of Laureus. Because I'm, I'm sure you find that w w when you when you do more than just your sport when, when you give back uh, when you're out on the ice you actually you, you're competing for more than just yourself it's an additional motivation yeah absolutely uh you couldn't you're spot on you couldn't have said it better um thanks for having me uh, it was a lot of fun and um you know i hope it's going to be a good battle until the end for those two Oh, well, I can tell you, I, I can't share with you yet, and I cannot share with the public, but I've been getting words in my ear about that they're going really quickly, and the times are looking super good. Uh, at, what, what time is it on your side where you are right now? Uh, I'm actually in Europe right now. Oh, good. Uh, I'm in Spain currently, so uh, it is, yeah, 12 Same, 12 same time. Okay, that's same good. Time. So we didn't same get time. you out of bed at, at a no, silly o'clock. No, uh, no, I, I'm up. It's time for a cerveza. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's Sunday fun day. Maybe. <laughs> uh, are you training seven days a week, six days a week? How does it work for you? Uh, yeah, six six days. Um, usually try to take the Sunday off maybe, um, even though you guys uh, got me pretty hyped up about working out, so maybe I'll hop on the bike and do a little workout right yeah, so, now. <laughs> so what sort of additional or alternative training do you do to ice hockey? Because I can imagine that you're not just training on the ice. Like You need to do some other cardio and yeah, like strength no. training. 
yeah for example right now i'm not even on the ice yet it's all it's all dry land it's all uh it's all off ice workouts uh strength cardio uh explosive power that kind of stuff and uh, this summer i actually started doing yoga uh, a little bit of power yoga which is uh great for my hips um and i think it's gonna it's gonna really help me in uh, in the long run Thank you very much, uh, Leon Dreisaitl. I'm glad we didn't get you out of bed. It's some silly o'clock in Canada. Enjoy the sunshine in Spain whilst we enjoy the rain in the Algoy. But I tell you something, the racing on the course <clears throat> is massive. All the best with your training and keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. There we go, Leon Dreisaitl joining us in support of these phenomenal kings on our race course. Still on the bike, we've got about a lap and a half to go. Uh, we've got word from, from, from the van saying that, that the times that these guys are doing, despite the conditions, are fantastic. Hello, we're not going to give it away, though. We're not mm. going to give it away. What I think we should do, as we look at Jan Frodeno, we had eyesight on uh, Lionel just a moment ago. We're going to take a look back behind the doors as we came into race week. Ready? Ready. Let's do it. Don't worry, we'll be home in a few days, okay, Pop? Well, you won't even know. You're gonna be 15 pounds heavier, I promise. Testing the race suit. May still have a bit of sand from the last race on it. How was it? Awesome. Nice little set. The arm swinging. 3K. Nice and easy. 38 minutes. Uh, is it dinner time? Here we go. This is really cool. I'm gonna go see the pool and I'm gonna go see five technicalities of the entire 180 kilometer course. And hopefully I'm going to see a brand new bike. What about the castle? Oh, and then we're going to go see a castle. Yo! How are you, my friend? Good, man. Good Happy to see you. Yeah, you too. What do you think? Oh, Have you shit. tried it? This thing is massive. Yeah, it's I haven't pretty seen crazy. anything. Like, honestly, yeah. like Dad said, I just saw the run course first time. Uh -huh. Fabi tested it. I saw a video of yeah. him. We <laughs> built this course that's for you, be, man. That's going to be me, so I'm going to go up over the side. The one the one technicality to the course, and, and I will go uh, over the side. <laughs> so you're going to get some serious speed then. If it's windy like today, you're f If yeah. the air pressure is high, you're f and it can change within 20 minutes here. Uh -huh. What do I plan to swim? I don't have any plans. I plan to swim the distance. That is a beauty. Wow, what a beautiful green, too. Do you like it? Wow, that's my favorite bike. <clears throat> All right, 330 watts. <laughs> what happens if you win the tri battle? I'm gonna get my own custom colored machine. One of Jan's fancy machines, real fancy. Good coffee makes me happy. It's my daily ritual. Since before I was a professional, I have my Jan Ferdino poster up on the wall, and 11 years later, here we are, going toe to toe with them in the same race. If you dream it, it's possible. Conceive, ach believe, achieve. My name is Paul Kay. With me, Hello Fredrickson, as we give you the continued incredible coverage, despite the weather in the Algoy, of our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Jan Frodeno, Lionel Sanders, Germany, Canada, in Bavaria. We're just on the border of Liechtenstein, Switzerland, and Austria. It's such a stunningly beautiful part of the world as we are looking at our phenomenal two kings. A lot of footage of Jan Fredino. Let me just tell you, 
Some of you might be wondering, what is going on? It's only Yan Yan Yan. The issue is the helicopter, and we can only get the signal from one motorbike. But I promise you, Canada, I promise you, North America, I promise you, the world, I promise you, YouTube fans, as soon as we can, you're going to see a lot of green on your screen, the green machine that uh, Lionel is riding. So 101 milligrams. So this is the, the, the glucose that we're measuring from, from Yan Vredeno. We've got the, the wattage there. We've got... The, the, the cadence has dropped somewhat, but the speeds are still really good. And rumor has it, the average speeds are amazing. And the bike times, despite the wet surface, are amazing. Yeah, it's impressive to see how they just keep the pace up despite uh, the conditions and despite what Mother Nature is throwing at you. They're just still keeping the spirit high. And uh, I think we are in for some extremely fast racing. Like we are getting quite excited Bring for them to on. get off the Bring bike and on. get out in front of us so we can see it. And and now we have this uh, glucose monitor uh, measurement up on the screen too and, and where we can kind of monitor to see how the the, the blood glucose level is um, on and you want to keep there. that consistent, don't you? Yeah, you want to keep that consistent. But as we spoke about, you know, it's hovering a little bit, but it's getting like real time feedback. And we just want to make sure he doesn't drop, drop too dramatically and, and bonk, as we all yes, know it, yes. that you suddenly don't have more fuel in you. Uh, and you're starting to shake and get nauseous and, and, and even like delir can get delirious and dizzy. And it can be all sorts of things happening when you're bonking. And, and I think that we will see it relative consistently, like uh, Jan has his nutrition plan dialed, and, and, but it, it gives him, him feedback. But he is, as we spoke about earlier, that he is maximizing um, the absorption rate yes. of glucose that he can tolerate but we might see like a slight little drop due to the, the conditions that it's, it's cold. So he is utilizing a little bit more glucose to stay warm as well out there. But I will think, I expect that he would have it under control. Well, he does seem to have everything under control. And, and, and I, I suppose a lot of people at home and, and all the fans and even his fellow competitors, they go, you can't beat Jan. But that's not true because Jan himself says, I've lost more races than I've won. Yeah, you, you know, you learn from mistakes, you learn from failures, and whenever, you know, you, you get beaten, you get more hungry to kind of prove, you know, when are you ready to step up? Yeah. And, and I mean, like, he has had such a long career and his ITU racing, he has been beaten way more than he has won. Um, but, you know, he's learned in every single race. And as we spoke about, when it really matters, he shows who's the man. I mean, when he showed it, the first time, you know, for the real, for real, was in Beijing, the Olympics. I mean, what better day to, to show Kruk And that Kruk wasn't Kruk an easy win. I mean, that was a sprint. They were shoulder to shoulder to the line. Oh, yeah. ITU races is never Love easy. It. I mean, like long distance races is not easy either, but there are just so many bodies. There's so many people and it's so tight racing in ITU racing. And, and that is about having the strongest mind because when you are a bunch of five people running together the last half a kilometer, yeah. it's about who wants it the most, who can suffer the most pain, who can eat themselves and who believe in yourself to know like I am winning this you are breathing way harder than I am <laughs> you are weaker than I am I will win this one it's when all about you, the self you mean the generic you you don't mean me right? <laughs> <laughs> I am meaning oh well Hella would the beat me hands you. down at anything I think <laughs> but you know you talk about winning and you, you talk about that drive and you talk about the person who wants it the most we've got another guest this guest is a seven-time world champion a six-time Olympic champion, the most successful British athlete on the track, Sir Chris Hoy. A huge welcome to the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. It's lovely to have you join us. Thank you very much. It's great to be on. Yeah, super. I, I love that little Scottish lilt of yours, which is probably the main <laughs> reason we've got you here for the, that lovely little Scottish accent. Uh, you've got sunshine. Where on earth are you? Yeah, it's not often that we're just outside Manchester. It's not often the weather's better in Manchester than it is in continental Europe. But um, yeah, strange weather we've got right now. Yeah, all around the world. Uh, Sir Chris Hoy, Chris, I'm going to call you Chris from now and you can call me Paul. It's all good. You know, call me Mr. K. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we're in beautiful southern Germany. It is a beautiful part of the world. And I can tell you that things are starting to clear up. So please send your sunshine this way. Jan Frodeno and uh, Lionel Sanders are on the bike course, but in the pouring rain most of the time. Just, just talk us through how different track cycling is to road cycling. Well, I guess it's like comparing the 100 meters sprint on the track, track and field to the marathon. You know, it's, it's completely different athletes, 
it's a, a very different mindset as well. Um, you know, my race is the longest race I used to do last one minute, um, and the shortest was about 20 seconds. So it's there, there's no second chances. There's no options to have a second game plan. It's it's all or nothing. It's about being in the moment um, and I think that the difference with the road cycling is it's you know suffering it's trying to dissociate yourself from the pain and, and get through it so yeah very different athletes and different mindsets you know a little bit about suffering though because you were what naught coming out five seconds off the world record for the one hour attempt at the track you averaged 58.88 kilometers in that one hour um, that's not just in the moment that takes some endurance as well um, well, actually, that that was the the world that was the one kilometer yeah. record, not oh, the, the one, hour sorry, record. Sorry, the one kilometer so, record, yeah. Yeah, so the one the one k is probably the most painful event in terms of the lactic the lactate that you build up. Um, it's the highest levels of lactate you'll experience. Um, it's it's hard to explain that the, the actual pain that you experience in your muscles, not even during the event, but for the next five ten minutes after really? it. Really, um, the training that you do for it, you're you're sort of rolling around. You know, vomiting in a bucket, lying on a mat—it's—it's it's horrible. But it's because it's—it's it's like an extended sprint. It's like a minute of, of all-out sprinting, um, and because your body can't—you know—it's—it's it's working anaerobically. All the byproducts are, are building up um, in your body, and and it's—it's it's really not a pleasant thing to do. But it's—you know that it, it hurts everybody, and you know that it's about pushing yourself right up to the limit, truly giving a hundred percent effort. And, and yeah, I did that. I went into Bolivia to try and break the world record, and I missed it by five thousandths of a second, which oh. equates about I think about seven centimeters after that, that 58 seconds. Um, and it was tough. So we went to Bolivia because it was the highest velodrome in the world. It's nice got thin the lowest air. air density. Yeah. Nice thin air. Great for sprint events. Not so good for long endurance <laughs> events. But um, but it was incredible. And you know, it was yeah. I, I missed the record that I wanted. I got the 500 meter record, but not the thousand meter, which was the real a kind of blue ribbon record but amazing experience um and you see now with with newer tracks that are at a similar altitude but are indoors and smoother and, and faster the records have tumbled like they're down to i think a 56 second kilo so two seconds quicker um than, than i did in, in bolivia so i mean records are there to be broken they get faster and faster all the time but it was an amazing experience and uh, yeah certainly it was pretty painful too well, our two kings on, on our bike course here are averaging just over 45 kilometers an hour. You know they've got 180 k's to, to ride. So we've got a bit of time. Uh, Hedda Fredrickson is here with me too. She'd like to ask you a question, Chris. Hey, Chris. Nice to, nice to have you here. Hey. Um, you know, talked a lot about mindset and you know, if anyone, you know how it is to perform under pressure. Can you give us a little bit of insight or a few tools of how do you cope with that pressure of having to perform when you are multiple world champion, multiple Olympic champion, and then to repeat that? What's happening in your well, mind? I, well, I guess on an on a sort of ongoing basis, dealing with pressure or, or dealing with the motivation to keep working when you've been a champion and you want to replicate that, it's about being in the moment and, and focusing on one step at a time, not thinking too far ahead, not thinking about the fact that you've got months and months and months of training to come. Um, even in a day, you know, you look at your program for the day and you'll have a gym session in the morning, a track in the afternoon, maybe a road in the in the evening. And if you're if you're really exhausted and you get out of bed and your body's already aching, you can't think too far ahead. You're thinking, all I've got to do is get my breakfast, get down to the track, get the you know the gym session done one step at a time. Um, but dealing with pressure on the night it's a, a lot of it is about perspective and understanding you know when it can seem like life and death you know you get into the the big competitions you come into the home olympics for example and you're expected to win and you want to win and you put so much into it it's about trying to remind yourself that this isn't life and death that this is this is entertainment for the fans you know for the people watching and it's your passion it's your you know it's it yeah. started out as a hobby and it's it's become something you've, you've had the privilege to do as a, as a career so you have to try and remind yourself to enjoy it. And it's very hard. It's very hard indeed. But yeah, focusing on what you have control over, not worrying about all the other variables and, and trying to focus on the process and not think about the outcome, not consider what it would be like to win the gold medal. And equally, trying to not consider what it would be like if, if you fail and if you, if you fall off or if you come last.
Exactly. Well, there's no falling off. Our guys are still looking good on the bike. Um, and, and hopefully, Chris, we've got a lot of people at home who, who are maybe just watching for the fun of it and they're thinking, gosh, I'm gonna, we're, we're inspiring them. They're going to get off the couch and they're going to get out there and change their lives through sport and being fit. But, but I, I think I read somewhere that the movie E.T. was part of your inspiration <laughs> to get on a bike. Tell me about that. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't watching the Tour de France or the Olympics. <laughs> it was the film E.T. So I've got a lot to thank Steven Spielberg for. Um, yeah, I'd never seen a BMX before. It was the first time I'd seen a BMX bike. I think I was about six years of age. And I saw, it wasn't the scene where they're flying off into the sky that was inspiring. It was the bit where they're going over jumps yeah. and, you know, carving through the corners when they're getting chased by the police. And I thought, that looks that looks like a lot of fun. I'd never seen a bike used that way before. So, yeah, that was that was what started the whole the whole journey. <laughs> it's amazing how where you get inspiration from. But but the truth is, I mean, I know you talked about, you know, the one kilometer record and, and track cycling is like very brutal, very intense, very quick. But you're actually an endurance athlete as well because I followed a great story of you racing Le Mans. Yeah, thanks. Um, well, it's, it was a completely different challenge. So when I finished cycling um, competitively. You know, I, I then had the opportunity to try lots of, of new challenges and, you know, doing all kinds of things, whether it was, you know, becoming an ambassador, becoming an academy member with the Laureus Academy or, you know, doing various projects, starting up my own business, making bikes. But motorsport was a passion that I'd always had as a fan and I never, ever thought I'd get the chance to actually take part. So I, I started racing at a novice level and then it was Nissan came on board as an Olympic partner for Rio. And they said, we'd love you to get on board and help out with some mentoring and various roles. And I said, well, I'd love to. I said, but I'm doing a bit of motorsport. I don't suppose you could help me with that. And they said, well, we reckon we could get you to Le Mans in, in three years time. So I had a, a crash course, in, well, not literally a crash course, but, um, you know, the kind of condensed uh, training and, and driver coaching. And I went from sort of novice driver to intermediate to, to higher up. And yeah, and I competed at Le Mans in the 2016 um, 24 hour race. and. Yeah, we came. I think it was 17, but it was 60 team, teams, and just an absolutely amazing experience and a completely different challenge to racing a bike for, you know, a minute around a track in anti-clockwise circles. It was, it was just, you know, sort of two-hour stints. You get out the car, you've got three drivers, you, you take it in turns, but not being able to sleep, you know, all the adrenaline, the excitement, trying to get any kind of rest you can within the 24 hours. And um, physically, it's it's tough, but it's not. That's not the biggest challenge. It's the the mental mental side the concentration knowing that at any moment in the car you could make a mistake that could end the race and you know it's it's very dangerous too so it's it's incredibly challenging but really rewarding um, and a fantastic experience and a lot of focus needed by lionel saunders and jan fredino at the moment slightly wet wet surface they're riding on uh, pushing 330 odd watts with a 70 cadence speed sitting at 37 at the moment so a bit of a false up for them as we watch them they're, they're getting towards the end of the bike course now chris uh, uh, just a, another quick one from you um I, I can see how inspired you are being part of the tri battle and when's your when are you going to do a triathlon <laughs> Well, if you, I think what tends to happen is you got broad shoulders, mate. You can swim. Really, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But most good cyclists, uh, sorry, most good triathletes, didn't come from cycling. If that, if I'm correct in saying that, that cyclists correct. tend to be terrible at other sports. You know, we're we're terrible <laughs> at running. Uh, we're we're pretty much terrible at swimming. The only so I had one of my old teammates, Jason Queeley, who was the Olympic champion in Sydney in 2000, he was a water polo player, so a very strong swimmer. Um, used to cycle to, to work at the university, um, you know, 15 miles away, and he was pretty good on the bike too. And then he, he started thinking, well, maybe I'll try and do, do a bit of triathlon. And uh, yeah, it turns out he can't run either. So <laughs> I think uh, <laughs> the chances of me making a triathlon are very, very slim. I think I would try and find any other excuse than than uh, taking part in a triathlon, which is probably a terrible attitude. But um, I'd, rather, I'd rather be a fan, sit and watch, cheer them on. Oh, we need the fans. The we like fans, and, and, and you're, a, you're a great <laughs> fan to have. You're also part of Laureus. You're part of the Laureus Academy. Just tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, I was very, well, privileged to be asked to become an Academy member. So the Academy is, is for all retired athletes that have been successful in their sport who get invited on. And I remember joining, it was, must have been about five years ago now, four or five years ago, and I got the, the, the email from Sean Fitzpatrick, you know, All Blacks legend asking if I'd like to, to join. And of course I did. So I turned up to the first meeting uh, in Berlin, I think it was. And you go into the room, and you sit down in the AGM and you've got 
um, you know, who well, Boris Becker on one side, Mark Spitz on the other, <laughs> Daley Thompson, um, you know, Nadia Comaneci. Uh, it's just, it's absolutely unbelievable. It's like you're kind of A to Z of your childhood heroes. Well, not childhood, but you know, through your whole life, cheap heroes of sport are there and you're part of it and it's it's a huge privilege and um, but the, the whole point of it is to try and you know improve the lives of children around the world through the power of sport yeah. so nelson yeah. mandela was one of the founding patrons obviously today is july the 18th that's mandela day um and a big reason for you know a driving force for jan Frodeno as well as he's been part of the glorious family for a while now um but yeah they've got a new campaign called everyone wins and you know we're talking about how in sport of course there are there are winners and losers um, but when, when sport is used to, to improve the lives of children throughout the world, then we all win. Um, so it's just trying to encourage sport as a, a focus to bring people together more than ever um, and use that power of sport to, to change the world for the better. And here we are on the tri-battle, uh, the, the sort of tri-battle royale. We're bringing lots of people together around the world. Our guests, like you and, and several others, uh, you, as you mentioned, Jan is also part of Laureus. Um, you, you mentioned Nelson Mandela and today being Mandela Day. Uh, Jan started his swimming and triathlon career back in South Africa in the 90s as well. So somehow there, there, there's that, that little golden thread running through all of this. Uh, it's getting a little bit brighter here, Chris. So we're going we're gonna to go back to Jan. I can see he's got a bit of sunshine on his back warming up. Thank you so much for joining us, Sir Chris Hoy. Lovely to have you with us, and, and I wish you a, a wonderful Sunday further, but please keep watching. Thank you. Great to chat to you both. All the best. There we go. Thank you very much, Sir Chris Hoy. What a legend. Lovely to have him with us as we're looking at the gap is growing between Jan Frodeno and Lionel Saunders. And still, as things brighten up, I'm really hoping, Hela, that we can get the heli up into the sky to give us some footage of... Um, yeah. Lionel Saunders, he's on his way to the canyon turn now, is Jan Frodeno. And look at that. It was getting bright for a while, but as as Till mentioned earlier on in the race, we kind of like got multiple weather zones up and down exactly. our bike course. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's still a little miserable out there. You can see it's definitely brightening up in here, but they also only have around 50 kilometers and then they're back in here. And, and I think like, yeah, he took this um, canyon curve the same way as he did the last time, Jan. Yep. And, uh, um, safe but fast and a little bit out of the saddle stretching a little bit making sure you know that you don't sit in this completely compact aero position all the way and also like yeah his muscles might be a little bit more stiff now as it is get has been cold right and now we see it again as a little replay just nicely around taking no chances and you can't go too slow around the bank turn either. No, no. You need to keep no. a bit of momentum no. through there taking no chances and, and you watch him as he stands up here. Yeah. Oh, it's just really, really nice. Yes. You want to stretch. Yeah. You want to stretch your legs. It's it, your legs are screaming for that. Your hammies or your hamstrings are just getting a bit tight. Yeah. Lying like that, you just ah oh, want to stretch them out and and you know uh, a lot of you guys have probably also tried to have like a nice hamstring cramp and it can be pretty Ooh. pretty difficult to get rid of. So you might want to just be preventive a little bit before that's going to happen. Indeed. Well. Throughout the week, we've had chances to speak one-on-one -on -one with Jan Frodeno and Lionel Saunders. And we've also given them a chance to speak about one another. Check this out. You know, when I thought of this race and really setting a, a, a very fast course and setting a challenge and, and looking for a challenge, which is, of course, you know, the biggest thing in my career right now, I look for for people that drive and motivate me. And I think there is a certain positivity to, to Lionel. I, I love his work ethic. I love his old school approach to the sport, which is where I see a certain kind of resemblance. And that's why Lionel has been very important to me in the lead up, of course, because you need someone to really focus your energy on and get you out the door. But I also, believe that you know once he's figured out his one or two little uh, issues that he's had in the past he can be the guy to push till the very end because you know he won't give up and essentially I believe that's what you need to to break records. Jan is the best to ever do it in my opinion and no one has had more of a positive impact on my career than Jan every time I race him it's funny, the first time I ever got to, you know, really race him was in Oceanside 70.3 in 2015. And I just got, I must have just got lucky, really, because I had a decent swim and then I bridged the gap on the bike and we came off the bike and went toe-to-toe -to -toe together for about five kilometers. 
And then I got dropped and blew up and finished third. But it was like the most amazing experience of my entire life. I still dream of that day to do that again. And, but what's funny is I, since then, I've gotten better and better and better at all three disciplines. And I've not been able to experience it again. I've raced them so many times. And each time it's like, he's like the teacher. And he says, sorry, guy, not good enough, not good enough. And so no one has forced me to become a better athlete and to improve at every facet of my game than him. And so it's an honor to toe the line with him. We don't really know, know each other too much. We've had one beer together in, in, in all our history. Um, but he seems like a good guy. And uh, of course, everybody feels closer to Lionel because he's so publicly outspoken and so very social, um, which, which I'm probably the opposite of. But nonetheless, it does even give me the sense and, and the feeling of thinking he, he's a nice guy, he's a good guy and somebody I'm happy to go for a beer with. So I definitely feel that, you know, we'll leave the big rivalries and the actual throwing of punches for race day. There are throwing punches out there, but I just got word from, from Talbot Cox. And just to remind you, we're doing everything to resolve some of the technical issues we've got due to the weather and and i can't believe the miracles our crew are are making out there absolutely incredible but uh talbot just said me just saw lionel gap was 614 he said he feels great and is pushing the exact power he planned he gave me a thumbs up and says that lionel is in good spirits and you know what that mental state is so important as we bring more of our our our, our athletes at home on the virtual platform who are racing shoulder to shoulder with our two kings but staying in good spirits because it's a long day Jan could go through a bad patch you know you've got to stay in good spirits as much as possible yeah and what is interesting with your your mental capacity out there and and how you're feeling your mindset and your yeah your mental spirit as you're saying it actually also affects your ability to absorb your yep. nutrition really yes ah so there's a connection you talked about this uh, gut brain connection there is a, a huge connection so it can be slowing down your absorption if you are under mental pressure out there so it is by staying calm being in control taking away the negative thoughts you know getting rid of what you cannot control don't fill your brain with that and stay calm Stay calm so everything is just still working for you. You know when you are super nervous how it can go in yes. your belly? Big time. Yeah, so yep. this is actually also happening on the fly and in the race, and that is super interesting. So Lionel in good spirits right now means that the nutrition he's got, he's absorbing it better, he's fueling his machine better. Yeah, exactly, and you can also see like, yeah, and it's also, you can see the glucose monitor is still staying really stable with him. Yep. So it's also going quite well, going- And the wattage is plane. hovering around the 300 all yep. the time. Yep, yeah, it's, it's really, it's really nice what we are seeing from both of them. It's metronome-like, and he's doing what he was doing early on again. Mm -hmm. That little, just the bottom off the saddle, just for a little bit. It's not because his bum is sore. It's just to change the muscle position slightly, yep. uh, maybe stretch the back a bit. You know, you talked about the hamstrings. Yeah, and then doing it while you're still aero is, is pretty neat, eh? <laughs> it's properly neat. Like we said, <laughs> for everybody at home, and, and I really hope we have a lot of non-triathletes watching as well, because you, if, if this is not inspiring you and if you're not learning from this, then I don't know. But yes. I know for a lot of the weekend warriors, the, the hobby athletes out there, uh, we've got brilliant age group athletes. I'm sure we've got a, quite a few pros watching as well. Yeah, and we've got those, those of us who just go out there to finish and we go there because this sport challenges us to get off the couch and beat the version of ourselves that stayed in bed late or stayed on the couch and, and stay physically healthy. I mean, that's what I, I do it to be healthy. It is an, a super inspiring sport and that I will not call it, um, okay, now we are again, we're gonna have the canyon curve and I, uh, I'm excited to see how it's gonna take it this time, Lionel. Well, it looks identical to, to the previous couple of turns through it. Mm -hmm. Taking no chances. I really think the first time when he went so high yeah. up, yeah, it, went, shook Whoa. Him. it shook him a little bit. For those of you that missed us earlier, on the very first approach of the canyon turn, uh, Jan took it reasonably conservatively, uh, but Lionel really went at it, went very high up the bank, yeah. almost to, to, to the branding at the top, and I yeah. think he gave himself a fright. Yeah, absolutely. But here we see him, no risks being taken. He's happy with his pace, he's happy with the power, he's happy with the... Well, I'm presuming he's happy with the time gap to Jan and uh, Lionel Sanders conservative through the canyon turn. Yeah, I mean, like, I think for, for Lionel, it's also about getting this nutrition strategy right. You know, he's just 
done an, an Ironman race in Coeur d'Alene where yeah. he did not get it right and he was actually doing the bike where he started to lose power where there was just no connection to his muscles anymore that he was losing sodium so fast so I think like he is feeling great out there and it seems like it's going to plan for him and and I think you know that is also keeping your spirit up and I'm doing the right thing like he wants to do a great yes. full distance race uh, and and if he's going to continue like he's doing now he's going to be fast so, Hela, I want to ask you, as, as, and you can put your professional athlete cap back on again. I mean, I know you're retired and all, but it wasn't that long ago. <laughs> Sometimes, obviously, all of us at home think professional athletes, when you toe the line, you just want to win. But there are times when, even if you didn't win, you know that you gave your best race. Exactly. Exactly. And it, it, it's really a lot about asking yourself out there, am I doing everything I can do? Am I being the best version of myself right now? And if you're giving it your all in the moment, that's all you can ask for. You know, you, you told the line on a certain date and sometimes, you know, you can't decide that race date and sometimes your legs doesn't turn up. Yeah. You know, it's not the best day for you. But you, if you give your best constantly throughout the race, when you're then passing the finish line, you might be a little disappointed just ever so slightly just in the first few minutes but when you then reflect on it and look back and you ask yourself did I do the best I can do on the day did I give in no I didn't then you can only be satisfied and happy and you will be or you know if you have the day where you actually gave in to yeah your legs did not show up or there was a lot of excuses it took over in your brain you are just not happy when you pass that finish line and when you've done that a few times you don't want to do it one more time well, whilst we're struggling to bring you pictures of Lionel, at least we can show you shoulder to shoulder their stats at the moment. You know, we've got the glucose, we've got the wattage, we've got the RPM, and we've got the speed. There's a lot of similarity there. The big difference is in the speed at the moment, and that could be, that's purely due to the terrain. Yeah, absolutely. One's yeah. on the flat or going slightly down, the other one's going slightly up Yeah, yeah. so it, is, it will be a little bit uh, misconceiving in, in terms of like, oh, that's weird that one is riding so fast for the same watch, but that is certainly the gradient. Um, I will say again, when we are coming back to this glucose monitor, what is interesting with that, and, and uh, from a, a coach's point of view, from a professional point of view, from an athlete's point of view, it's like the timing of your pre-brace fuel, you know, in terms of, okay, when is it the right time to take in that breakfast yes. before the race? Is this two and a half hours before? Is it three hours before? When is the best time for you? And I think that is where it gets very interesting with this glucose monitor to figure out what works for you. Is it oatmeal that's best for you? Is it a banana and toast that's best for you? Is best, it rice that's best for you? Best run, best half marathon I ever had in my life. I had oats and honey for breakfast. Yeah, And, and have, because I had a good run, I've always done that since, exactly. even when I've had bad races Exactly. Afterwards. I mean, you replicate if it works one time, you believe that it works and you don't want to mess it up. I like remember James Cunnamer telling me that, that, that KFC, Kentucky Fried Chicken, he had one night before race and did really well and became his race meal. But let's go back to the data. We've got those splits again for you, which I think are critical. And I know a lot of people have been waiting for these splits. You know triathletes, they're all data geeks, yes. right? And, and, and it looks like Lionel's come back on form into the, 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 the last part of the race in terms of reducing the time gap, which jumped quite quick, quite massively uh, between 80 and 100 kilometers. Mm -hmm. I'm again thinking back of maybe he's just getting a little bit more confident in the conditions as we get on, yes. you know, as you're figuring out. Well, I... it's a good point you made because, because remember the rain, mm -hmm. you know, you know, about 20, 30 minutes ago, it was absolutely bucketing and uh, po possibly through one or two of the technical spots, he, he just took his foot off the gas a bit but now you can even see from the long shot we've got it's a bit brighter out there and uh, and look at the, the time gap is reduced yeah and maybe he's you know he's written through some of the technical uh, places on the course where he's done well in the rain and then he's like well I can do that again that went fine I can do that again I'm carrying a little bit more confident into this turn so so that's maybe also what we are seeing like just you know I'm staying on the bike I'm fine everything is going well and then you get that big confidence back can we start talking about overall times? Can we start thinking about the run? Can we start looking at personal bests and how much are they going to better them? I, you know, because we, we're looking at a 
425 for for Jan on the bike as a PB thanks to Torsten and we're looking at a 423 for Lionel they both set new times on the swim and we've got Lionel on screen yes that mean green machine the colonel is back Lionel Sanders so good to see him and you know what Hele he's looking good he's still looking the way he looked at the beginning of the bike race if not better no there he he looks rock solid um, nothing has changed body position is good I, I'm really happy with what I'm seeing I think that he is in a great mind and a great spirit out there and 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 just happy how he's he's performing right right now and and yeah well I mean he is up against line he's up against Jan Fodeno yes. it, it's not a nobody right it's probably the greatest of all time that's what a lot of athletes are saying anyway so he he is racing the best right now, and, 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 and Lionel is one of them. And, and, and the weird thing is that they're racing each other, but they're racing themselves because yeah. it is there, there's a big gap between them, and we kind of expected that. And, and you can't let that mess with your head. You, Lionel can't go, oh, I was hoping to catch him at 100, and I haven't, so now it's over. Because exactly. I think even he said, I'm trying to think it was the press conference, he said, you've got to be careful. You, know, you can't think it's over until it's over. You've got to keep racing to the end. Absolutely. You don't know what's going to happen out there. And I'm sure that he has a plan A, B, C, D, F, E, D, F, what, however long down the line you have yes. to go. You need to be adaptable. You need to be flexible. You need to change your plans on the fly. That is how you're racing. You never know what's going to be thrown at you. Something can happen. You can, you can lose a bottle. Something, you know, there can happen something. You can, you can get a cramp. You can get a puncture. Touch Please. wood, that's not going to happen. Happens. That's not going to happen. But we need to know that these things can happen. And, and as a professional, you need to, before the race, if you can, think about every single scenario. It's not possible. But when you've done yes. a lot of races, you have tried a lot of things and that you have made a lot of mistakes and a lot of things has happened during the race. 80 RPM, more than 300 watts, 54 kilometers an hour. We are seeing Lionel from the front, but somebody's been watching yeah. his legs from behind and watching his position for a long time now. Here's another one of our expert commentators on board Lionel's car, shadowing him the whole way around the bike course. Elut Pal Pal Eli, so good that we can have you back. Tell us everything you've seen in the last hour or so. Hey everybody, once again from the vehicle following Lionel Sanders. It's another great moment to be able to report from the race course. We are following this Canadian triathlete and at the moment I measured seven minutes the gap, the unofficial measurement, the gap between uh, Frodeno and uh, Sanders now recently after passing 122 kilometers. The weather conditions are bad. We had some light rain as well, but now it intensified once again. It's quite heavy. At the moment, uh, we see Lionel Sanders drinking a little bit and uh, catching some nutrition. Uh, we are now at the final part of this uh, bike event, so we will get back to the transition area very soon. I think that uh, it's very important uh, to not make any unnecessary risks at this part of the competition but uh, he's very concentrated the past uh, one and a half hours i've been uh, watching him very attentive and uh, i saw that uh, he's really fighting he is really uh, eager to prove uh, his strength he would like to show that uh, he was the right challenger for Frodeno for this battle here and um, yeah i think we are seeing uh, the proof for the fact that they are Iron Man, so it's not in vain. They are real Iron Man, Frodeno and Sanders as well, because they are fighting very, very hard, uh, unconditionally, and even if it's raining or not, uh, they are really showing great stamina, great patience, and great strength here on the roads of Germany. So just uh, stay tuned and follow the race, because it's a great day and we are writing history. We are making history because it's a battle head to head between the two very best triathletes of the world. Eddie, thank you so much. Great to finally catch up with Eddie, finally to get some great images of Lionel Sanders. And I've been making a big mistake with the personal bests. Finally scrolled properly into the, into the, uh, onto the mail. So a personal best on the bike for Frodo, 4.0807, a challenge Roth when he went 7.35. And for Lionel Sanders, as you've just told me, thank you, Hella, a 4.0438. And, and my, my, my qualifier to all of this is I've always said, if I was intelligent, I'd have a real job. Okay, so there we go. We fixed that. 40807 on the bike for Frodo, 40438 for Lionel Sanders. Phenomenally fast times, mm -hmm. and potentially we're going to see sub fours. Mm -hmm. 
we are going to see some similar times here. I think we are in for a treat. Like, it's only like, what, 40 kilometers in the back here? So it's like in 50 minutes. And they're going to be in front of us. Exactly. And we've got fans on the grandstands. We've got fans uh, in, in the, 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 the VIP tent, which I think is for everybody. And remember, because of COVID protocols here in Bavaria, everybody's wearing masks. Everybody in the race venue involved in the race. We all had COVID tests yesterday. Um, it, it's just that's those are the rules here in, in Bavaria, in the beautiful Algoy, renowned for its snow sports. But here we are showing the world that Algoy is an impressive place to swim, bike and run. We started in the Große Alpste, Alpse in Immenstadt. Now we're on this Bundesstrasse, on this highway that has been closed for two athletes only, for our two kings. This is the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. We're looking at Lionel Sanders. He's about six and a half minutes behind Jan Fredena, who leads at the moment. They are battling each other. They are battling themselves. And they've been battling a little bit of Mother Nature as well with a fair amount of rain and cold. But this is the iron will, never to give up. Keep pushing. Keep pushing what's possible and what is often thought of as impossible. And I remember a sports scientist once telling me that actually, physiologically, we shouldn't be able to do half the stuff we do, Ironman athletes. But it's the power of the mind mm -hmm. that, that, that makes for superhuman performances. Exactly. And we haven't even tapped into how much we don't know about the mind and yes. the brain and what we are capable of. There is no doubt about it. When these men out there, they are as fit as they are, I would argue that there might be 80% that's in the mind. Um, there is so much, you know, the mind can hold you back. And, you know, I've heard Lionel talk many, many times that he is willing to put himself so much on the line out there that he is willing to pass out or even die on the race course. It sounds a little dramatic, but just get my point, you know. He can push himself so, so hard. He can put himself in the darkest hole ever and just, you know, keep pushing. And Do and they I enjoy think, the pain? I mean, do you, do you enjoy that pain? You, you enjoy it in a, weird it way, in a you do, sick don't way, you? Yeah, yeah, you do, because you know that when you're out there, you're pushing the body to, to its limit, and that's what we live for. Yes. We train to get out there. We train to be pushed so, so hard and feel, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's a good pain because you've been there before and you train it. Mm. You train to get out in that uncomfortable zone. And that's also why that, that training race-specific stuff and pushing yourself so far out in training and training and being ready for a battle like that, it makes this, you know, not easy. But you know what you're getting into because you're used to it. So it is really about getting into that uncomfortable zone in training plenty of time. So when yes. you're sitting out there being uncomfortable, you're you ready can, for it. You, and you can tap back in memories and think, oh, remember that session, remember that day. Oh, I was there. Oh, I was way worse there because I was actually standing in the side of the road shaking after this bike interval. I can go there again. Easy. I'm not even there today. So I think that that is that is so valuable that that you need to push yourself in training and you need to be willing to hurt. Sometimes when you look at athletes of this caliber, these two kings, you watch them perform, you think they can't do any wrong. They have no weaknesses. But we're all human. We all have weaknesses. And, and both Lionel and Jan chatted a little bit about what they perceive the other's weakness to be. Listen to this. It's funny, every time I watch one of his videos and every time I watch uh, a documentary about him, I always learn things that make me realize I've, I've made similar mistakes in my time and I've gone through similar approaches and without giving away too much uh, here because I don't feel it's the format, I'd actually like to tell him at some time. Um, I feel that he needs to work on his, pro his approach, not towards the sport, but towards himself. And that could be the key to seeing Lionel turn into the world-class athlete that he has the potential to be. The only thing I think that even Jan doesn't know is he's never pressured, right? He's very rarely pressured. The, as far as I can remember, the last time he was under pressure was in 2014 at 70.3 Worlds against Javier Gomez, and Javier ended up dropping him. But he has not lost a 70.3 since then. So that shows you what it did to him mentally. 
but he doesn't have a lot of experience with that. That's the one thing. No one, he, he's so good and so much better than everyone else. He tends to front run or come off the bike with the Uber bikers who he's a much better runner than, and it's not a contest. And, you know, that's unfortunate for him actually, I think. And I think he craves competition. After Sam Long and I went toe to toe in St. George, he messaged me and said that he was jealous, wish he could have been part of the battle. And I think when you've done everything like he's done, there's literally nothing else to do other than to have good battles. And I think that's part of, you know, what this event is, is, is the hope anyway, from his standpoint, is a good battle. And so, so that, I guess, would be where if I had something that I could capitalize on, it would be if I could somehow get in the mix and put him under pressure and make him think. Because normally I think he's running like, ah, not too bad. This isn't too bad, you know? But if you were under pressure, what would happen in your mind? And I would love to find out. I think he's mentally tough, but no one knows what happens when you're under pressure like that. I think I'm mentally tough. And in St. George, I went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bakagard and Sam Long and Ditlev, and Bakagard dropped me, and I actually, he had 10 meters on me, and I actually said I had conceded the victory. But then in my head, once he was out there, I was like, really? That's all you have? Really? This is it? This is how the race ends. And then I bridged back up to him and then ended up winning. But nobody know, you don't know even how, what's going to happen in that moment when you're at the limit of your capacity. Jan doesn't know what's going to happen if he gets under pressure. Nobody knows. But these are the things that you hope that all the training you've done, the years of experiences that you've amassed, that you will pull the victory. So... Who knows? I don't know. But if there was one thing I could capitalize on, it would be the fact that he always wins. <laughs>
That said, Lionel Sanders with a brilliant swim as well. Both of these athletes flying through the 16 degrees, I like the 18 degrees Celsius water. And uh, Jan Frodeno with a rare brief mistake. Perhaps adrenaline, perhaps nerves, perhaps just a wet helmet and slippery hands as he transitioned from swim to bike. Wanting to maximize his advantage over Lionel Sanders, but Lionel with a brilliant swim, one of his best swims ever, as they got to take advantage of a specially designed swim course with a line below the water that they could follow. Quickly onto the bike course, fortunately it started nice and dry. Jan Frodeno taking a while to get his feet into the shoes, but quickly got himself comfortable and made sure that he had nutrition and hydration to fuel those muscles to brilliant bike speeds. Remember, our viewers, you can hashtag TriBattle on Instagram and we will carry your messages on our LED boards. A quick look over the shoulder as Jan and Lionel get to see each other. Lionel Sanders, very powerful on the bike and into the canyon curve, high up on the bank as he made his way through there. Another of the innovations of our TriBattle Royale. Once in a while, out the saddle, even got some of us a bit concerned about Jan Frodena, but just stretching his muscles as the volunteers cleared the canyon turn and uh, taking it conservatively but staying in the drops, Jan Frodeno. The gaps getting slightly bigger as they made their way on the bike course. The five minute gap growing to as much as seven minutes at sometimes almost eight minutes as our riders get closer and closer to T2 here in Burgberg. It is our finish line. It is T2. It is the stadium. It is also where Lionel Sanders and Jan Frodena will be lapping on the 42.2 marathon run. For those of you joining us, one or two minor technical challenges in the form of the weather, not allowing us to get our helicopters into the sky much so that we can beam you the images from both athletes all the time. But fortunately now, we're able to bring you pictures of Lionel Sanders. Taking it easy through some of the slightly technical parts of the course, just because of the damp on the surface. Beautiful, smooth tar, very, very quick in the dry. But sometimes that smooth tar, when it's wet, you, you, you kind of hesitate a little. You feel, oh, it looks slippery, don't you? Yeah, I mean that you do also feel the bike can move a little bit underneath you. So, um, so that, so therefore, you you have to to be smart and not take any chances. Yep, you don't want to take those chances. We welcome back to the camera and back to the microphone here at our race village. Hallo Meli, welcome back. <laughs> Hallo Paul, wie geht es dir? <laughs> Hello, how are you guys doing? Uh, your commentary has been fantastic. Thank you so much for carrying us, us so professionally and uh, with that deep knowledge and excellence through this race. It's it's amazing listening to you guys. I can actually see you, that is pretty amazing. But yes, I'm here on the sidelines and currently the weather is not quite in our favor. I promised you guys good weather. I lied. I'm so sorry. I don't know what's going up, uh, up there. But we're, we're making the best of it. And as you can see, I'm not standing here alone outside, almost in the rain. Wolfgang Kohl is with me and he's a product engineer from Kenyon. Wolfie, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to, to uh, talk to us about the fantastic bikes you bought on tech track here. How's it going so far? Yeah, so far the race is running like we expected it to be in the best case. I called the guys who are taking care for the data. They said that uh, Jan will, could do it below four hours, the bike split. So that's a good base to maybe set a new record. We don't know. Yeah, the, it looks quite good, but we, we don't want to jinx it, obviously. That's why we're not uh, handing out too many prognoses. We'll leave that to the data. And yes, Wolfi, um, you are also responsible for Jan's and also Lionel's bike. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, I'm working at Kenya now since uh, 10 years. We made the third uh, generation of the Speedmax now. And yeah. I, I was about to say, can you tell us a little about the bike uh, the guys are racing? Pardon? Uh, can you tell us a bit about the bike the guys are racing? Yeah, sure. It's uh, The base is the serial production Speedmax CFR. Lionel is racing more or less the serial spec. And for Jan, we made a little adjustments with the cockpit and 
yeah, some little other things, but... Yeah, and, and you've been working uh, together with Jan since 2015, is that correct? Sure, he, he signed 2014-15, and since then we are constantly uh, working on the bike. We meet each other two or three times per year, and we get his feedback, show him some new ideas, and obviously uh, try to get the best out for him. Yes, and uh, the current bike Jan is racing, that's the first field test for, for the bike, right? Pretty yep. much like official race. For the cockpit, it's the first race. So yes. we tested it five weeks ago in Girona. He tested it on the trainer and then uh, outside the street. He obviously liked it. We had the option to use it whether here the first time or in Kona. He wanted to have it right away. So he got his will. I can't blame him. I, I, I would have it uh, the same way, actually, because, I mean, a new bike that's always very, very exciting for athletes, right? Yeah, yeah, they are like the customers as well. So it's yeah. a big day if we present him something new. We fly there, we show the guys everything, and then, yeah, they are happy for it as well. Yeah, you meet with the athletes uh, on a very regular basis, right? Sure, sure. That's very important for us. We want to do... Uh, development with the best athletes in the world and then later the goal is always to put some production parts for our customers out of this special projects. Yes and you mentioned the the cockpit ex uh, specially made for Jan so can you tell us a bit more about it? Uh, we had it already in 2019 for the race in Kona mm -hmm. and um, this was special made for him 3D scanned Jan's arms, made a special cockpit for him and then we got his feedback and the result is now that we have the pro armrest kits which will be sold in a few weeks now that this product and this gain is available for the customers as well. And the same thing we are doing now with this cockpit, the new invention is this mono grip and we are planning to sell this as well in about maybe nine months to a year. All right, you guys heard it at home. So maybe in nine months to a year, you can get a, a monogrip cockpit yourself from Kenyon. And um, Vafi, tell us a bit more about the bike itself. So because it's a very special bike, I read up on, uh, on it and I find it very exciting with all the tweaks and, and, and things that you can actually, for, for example, hide in your bike. Like you have compartments where you can store your nutrition, for example, what else has the bike in store for us? Sure, our claim was always system complete. So we at Kenyan want to deliver a complete system to the customer where he doesn't have to put any external plastic boxes or stuff additional to the bike because we have an aerodynamic concept for the bike and we have a design concept for the bike and we want to deliver everything fully developed by Kenyan for the customer. So the bike has some bladder inside the down tube that you can refill your nutrition and it's hide it completely from there. You can have uh, your gels inside the top tube and a little toolkit above the BB. So yeah, we are system complete, we are ready now. And I've, I've also heard that the compartments also help the frame, that it gets more stiff and stable. Of course, yeah, that's what we do because the weight is also an important factor for everything. So if you do not an external plastic box. If you do it, everything inside the frame, it can help you with the stiffness mm -hmm. and this can lower the weight at the same time then, yeah. That sounds fantastic. So, Valfi, when you sit uh, back in the Canyon headquarters and thinking about a new bike, what are the first steps to you take towards a new model? Yeah, you know, we constantly creating new ideas like this one. We decided not to launch a new bike every four to five years. We wanted to have um, upgrades. Wolfie, I'm so sorry to interrupt you right here because there is something happening on a track. So we have to hand it back over to Helen and Paul. We'll continue that later, all right? All right. Thank you all so right. much. Back to Helen and Paul, our athletes. Melly, thank you so much. And yeah, Kenyon, geez, that bike is insane. You know, the thing about triathlon is actually a lot of us, I think we do just because we like the bikes, because they're so cool. But what we need to talk about, Hele, is that these bike times are insane. Yeah. We had the data on the screen briefly now. We, we're looking at a sub-four bike. I mean, is yeah. that possible? 
It is apparently possible, but it's absolutely <laughs> insane. And like we are sitting here, I'm sitting here completely busting in my seat because, you know, if they are here in under 40 minutes, you know, they only have to run a 2.45 and then we're under 7.30. Jan Frodeno can <laughs> run a 2.45 running backwards. Exactly, with one arm on, the, on his back. <laughs> so, I mean, like this is fast, fast racing and it's also very fast racing from Lionel so it's, it's, it's crazy. But, but you know conditions. what's scary for me, I mean potentially both of them are going to go sub, sub 735 they both have the potential to break sub 35, 735 today mm -hmm. but, but we were saying okay well we need it to be dry, we need warm weather because the air is nice and thin it's been rain, a lot of it it's yeah. been cold but they're still absolutely destroying the bike they are absolutely destroying the bike and of course there's a long way to the finish line but right now we are just seeing something completely magnificent i mean like they even have to take it slow around the corners you know they are being careful that could be so much smart. quicker exactly we uh, we said oh we need the perfect conditions and we surely don't need the perfect we need conditions. the perfect athletes <laughs> exactly and we need athletes that are so well trained and they are um, yeah as we say they're they're kings right it, it's, it's it's crazy well we, we, we there's no doubt that they're kings and if you ever doubted it before we're going to prove it i mean the clock on the finish line says 4 8 42 we're expecting them here in uh, in a in less than 40 minutes from yep. now yep. Uh, what we're going to do is we, we're going to take a quick quick we're going to keep Jan and we're going to get Lionel as much as we can. I know the gap's about 6.40 now. Talbot sent that to me as well. So did Till Schenk and so did Sap, which is great. Thank you. But we've got another one of our, our fantastic guests standing by. Craig Taylor is the Director of Growth Marketing and tri Triathlon Running at Zwift. Craig Taylor, a huge welcome to you. I know you've been watching this. And before we talk about virtual training, before we talk about Zwift, let's just talk about these two kings and that potentially we've got a sub four bike here today, mate. Yeah, I mean, it's absolutely incredible what they're doing. Um, just as you guys are saying, like, given the weather conditions that we all expected that in order to achieve that, you'd need absolutely perfect conditions on the day. But um, it just shows the, the quality and caliber of these athletes of just how phenomenal they are. Um, so it, every time I, I turn around on this race, I just am more and more impressed with what they're capable of. Yeah, you're right. You know, we, we think, okay, let's have perfect conditions and let's get the perfect athlete and the perfect equipment. But, but fortunately in this imperfect world we live in, it's not, you can't always have everything perfect. But despite that, they're, they're going not according to script because the weather isn't perfect, but the bike times are insane. Let's just talk a little bit about Zwift. Now, if I'm not mistaken, here we are supporting a triathlon, watching one of the most incredible displays of swim, bike, and soon to be run. But Zwift actually was invented by a triathlete. Yes, so John Mayfield, the, the founder of Zwift, the, the original creator of the game, um, so he started off cycling uh, and w had, a first, had his first baby and wanted to find a way of how he could keep up with his training. Um, so it wasn't necessarily that he was a, he was a triathlete, but um, he was very into the triathlon uh, world. So when he finally got comfortable with, with the designs and wanted to share them out with the world, those were initially shown on the forums on Slow Twitch. Um, and I think it took about two comments before someone said, shut up and take my money. Um, so it was, Said it was what? Immediate... shut up and take my money. <laughs> exactly. So, uh, it was, it was that immediate, uh, just kind of uptake with the community of like, this is super cool. And, um, and that was in 2012. And then from there, I think he worked on it for another two years, started talking with Eric men our now CEO. Um, and the rest is history. Uh, here we have, here we have kind of the robust Swift worlds that, uh, that we get to bring to all the, all the users. And then, you know, <laughs> We, we, you talk about the rest is history, but we're making history right now because not only do we have Jan and Lionel racing on the road in the real world, all their fans in Watopia can basically race them as well because you've somehow figured out to take the power to power their avatars in the world of Zwift. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really cool. It's a first that we, we've been able to do this of, um, of simulating what uh, someone's doing in the real world and bringing it into game. Um, so thankfully to, to, to SAP and our, our incredible team at Zwift, um, they've been able to do that. So we've had quite a few people jump in and try to try to ride with, uh, with both of them today, um, see how long they can keep up. And I think it just gives you that even greater appreciation for, uh, for what these athletes are capable of when all of a sudden you're like, okay, they're doing this for roughly four hours and I can barely keep up for 15 minutes. <laughs> True that. But now, 
you know, some people might think, oh, Zwift is just for, you know, amateurs, weekend warriors, uh, and the rest of us. But the truth be told, you've got a huge amount of pros on Zwift. Yeah, absolutely. So um, when, when it comes to the, the pros at Kona, um, with, from 2019 of the pro field, there's about 60 um, of, of the pro athletes from that field. Um, when we look at this year's Tour de France of the 194 starters, um, there's roughly 180 of those uh, those athletes on Zwift. So um, the pro following on Zwift has been absolutely incredible. And uh, as, as a fan of the sport myself, um, it's it's really fun to see and, and to log into game and and get to uh, get to see all your favorite athletes there already. Craig, if I'm not mistaken, like Lionel and Jan are, are like two of the pros with some of the biggest followings of any pro on Zwift. Yes. Yeah. So regardless of sport, um, Jan is, is number one in terms of followers at just over 30,000 and Lionel's number two on followers um, at just under 30,000. So yet another area where they can compete. Hey, Greg, like I was thinking like from the original idea that, that you, you guys had to today, how it's impacting people's life and people's ability to train whenever at home. Um, have you ever imagined that it would have such a great impact? I, I don't think anyone could have, uh, from, from the very start, it, there was always the hopes of what, what Zwift could be. Um, but given where we are now, um, I don't think anyone could have actually fully envision this. Um, it's really encouraging to us. It's, uh, it's fun to see the impact that we have on people's lives. I know we talk about the pros and the training they have um, in how athletes like Jan and Lionel dial in their training on Zwift, but um, what's really incredible seeing are the weekend warriors and uh, all the people there, there with Jan right now in game um, and just how it helps them in their, in their daily lives, whether it be getting in a more efficient workout uh, so that way they can get back to the family and kids or um, or getting getting that early morning workout in before uh, before they begin their work day. Yeah, I've we're actually watching Jan uh, in game, as you call it. I, I like all this jargon in game. And now we've got Jan in real life. There's less than 20 kilometers to go, Craig. We 19.8 kilometers to go. And we're going into this canyon turn. I'm sure you've seen it, which is where we bring the velodrome to the highway. And uh, Jan's out of the saddle, just stretching again, just keeping the pace up. You need a bit of speed as you make your way into the bank. Middle of the bank, dropping down again, and uh, back. This is the final time for Jan Frodeno through that canyon turn. Craig, um, you know, the, the COVID-19 coronavirus pandemic has been brutal, what it's done to the world. But in some respects, there there's some industries that have massively gained for that. And as we watch the replay now, um, forcing everybody indoors, most of us have had in many countries, we've been completely locked down. We've had no choice but to race in the virtual world, train in the virtual world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's been obviously tough for uh, for everyone across the globe. There's been some countries that have even even harsher lockdowns. Um, thinking back to kind of the the early stages of the pandemic in, in Italy and Spain, um, that's been one of the big motivating factors for for the employees at Zwift of. Why we keep pushing and pushing and uh, and working super long hours is um, is that we wanted to provide an experience for everyone uh, to join a global community um, when they were at home and they felt super isolated um, and that's that's been one of the things that has been uh, really a positive for for our staff of uh, feeling like we're making an impact in people's lives um, and giving them a place where they can they can go and still have that sense of community they can get their workout in they can join their favorite group ride or group run. Um, and so it, it does make make the work feel that much more rewarding when you when you get to see the impact that it has on people's lives. Did you feel that that COVID actually pushed the speed in which in like Swift developed like because you needed to be fast, you needed to think out of the box very quickly to to be able to support all these people that was kind of locked at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and then we have phenomenal athletes like we talked about before that help us push that even further of, of Jan coming to us and saying, I would like to do a try at home and do it on Zwift. <laughs> um, it, and it was those constant flow of ideas coming through during the pandemic um, that really helped us kind of uh, hit the accelerator um, at Zwift and, and come up with new ideas and, and even drive further innovation on it. Um, you saw the virtual Tour de France last year, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal to watch um, in, in countless other events as well. 
yeah, a lot of professional racing. It was nice to for the professionals to actually have somewhere to have an outlet and actually, uh, you know, get that adrenaline kick and actually get ready for a race. And you provided that platform. I think a lot of pros were thankful for that. Well, I was thankful for not staring at a wall anymore. I could actually, I could ride with my friends because you mentioned Spain and Italy. Craig, I tell you, in South Africa also, we, we weren't even allowed to leave our front door for the first seven weeks, so it was quite brutal. Um, but uh, the other thing, you know, there, there are some people who, who are who feel that where they live, the roads aren't safe, or maybe they're, they're a bit intimidated about riding a bike outdoors. Uh, essentially, with this virtual platform, you, you've completely taken away that, that, that barrier. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, we we'd hate for that to be the, for the reason uh, people come to Zwift. Um, we never wanted to feel you to feel like uh, you're unsafe on the roads. Um, we want Zwift to be additive. Uh, it's a place where you can come join join friends virtually, get get a great workout in, um, and it adds to your in real life experience. Exactly as what we're seeing today. Um, both both Jan and Lionel do uh, a tremendous amount of their training on Zwift. Um, and hopefully that only adds to what we're seeing today of the, these phenomenal bike splits and, uh, and soon to be uh, amazing run splits. Um, when it comes to the safety aspect of it, yes, it, it, it is comforting to know that it gives people that place where they can go train and, um, and, and not feel uncomfortable. Um, but hopefully we can, uh, through, through safety regulations and such, uh, we, can, we can improve that so people do feel safe out on the roads as well as on Zwift. Well, the truth be told, Craig, the more people we get on bikes, the more, you know, we, we eventually get a critical mass out there on the roads and then hopefully people will take notice of us and uh, give us a wide berth and we'll all be safe. Craig, thank you so much for joining us. Before you go, I just want, you've got to make a choice, Jan or Lionel? Lionel or Jan? Oh. That, that's like choosing between your, uh, your favorite parent or your favorite child. Yeah, you got to do it, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, given how uh, how how Jan is looking right now, he just he looks uh, comfortable on the bike, uh, which is scary to to have a sub four hour bike split um, and still look that comfortable. So, um, as much as I love Lionel, it's it's hard to argue with uh, with the defending champion. There we go. Thank you very much, Craig Taylor. Thank you so much for joining us. Lovely to have you on board, and thank you for your insights. And let's just keep it going in game and get more and more people out there having fun there's a lovely social nature to it as well hell i know you've got a lot of followers uh, we've got 16 kilometers to go 16k jan's looking good but till shank just messaged us from the vehicle say he seems to be struggling a bit on the bike standing up for about 200 meters after the canyon turn but at this stage of the bike when you you're potentially going sub four you've been working hard right definitely he's been working hard and he's been sitting in this aero position for so long and we can also see that there's right now anyway his watts is slightly lower and his cadence is slightly lower but i will imagine that he but might look at the speed yeah yeah i know <laughs> i know he's going downhill but i will also imagine that his muscle might be a little bit cold but what is good to see is like his glucose levels are still very very steady he's fueling fine he's, he's on point and um, and i think like we have lionel going a little bit uphill um, on the other side, uh, probably from what the stats we can see right now, but I am pretty impressed of what we're seeing right now and we will soon have them in here in the stadium. I cannot wait to see them in real life in our stadium and we'll be able to see them on every single lap of the four laps of the marathon run, 42.K, 16Ks to go. Now, traditionally, Jan's been reluctant to share his data. Yeah, he is a very private person, yep. um, and I think it's, it's it's amazing that we see it now. And I think I'll, I'll say the last year since he started to cooperate with Sab, like he's been way more open and 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 and, and public about his data, and uh, it's impressive what he's showing. And I think he's maybe also a state in his life and his career where he has nothing to hide. Like he has proved it all. Um, so I mean, why not just be public? Um, he's found the recipe. He knows how it is to win where it's important to win. Hello, Fredrickson, just talking about Jan Fredino and the fact that he now shares his data. My name is Paul Kay. Let's hear from Jan himself about the importance of data. The idea of, of sharing data is obviously something that's quite foreign to me. I, I don't normally like to share data simply because I believe that as a professional, it's my 
job to get the work done and arrive there and it's really it's not a it's not a professional secret but it is something you know that I work around and that that I care about a lot and I don't really want to have in public scrutiny um, I do believe that when you start talking about records when you start talking about record-breaking performances it's important to say more than I passed yet another doping test. I believe that data adds to transparency uh, and, and that it's crucial for the success of such an event to have a level of transparency that hasn't been shared before. And that's why I'm happy for everyone to see how fast am I swimming, what kind of numbers am I pushing on the bike, what's my heart rate doing, um, and, and is that feasible, is that comparable to what I've done before, um, and you know where 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 are my glucose levels? All these kind of things for people to really dive into and give the performance a certain legitimacy. Um, and of course, lastly, adding that there are just a lot of data geeks in triathlon that I think would enjoy seeing this kind of stuff. There is no doubt about there is a lot of data geeks in, in triathlon and we do love our data and I think like it's amazing that, that, that Jan has started to, sh to share the data now and actually show um, how good he is, you know, how big numbers he is pushing and, and, and he is like a, a superhuman, he really is a well, well trained superhuman. So um, I think it's impressive that we are seeing this and it's nice we're seeing it, whereas like on the other hand, Lionel has been very, very open and public yes. about his data all the time, all the way along. So I think we had two different approaches here, uh, but now it's like it's all coming together out in the public sphere, which is, which is great for, for viewers. Less than 20 minutes before they join us here. I would say sort of 16, 17 minutes and they're here. We, we're looking, Hello, we're still looking at a sub four. We are, and we are so excited. <laughs> I'm trying very hard to keep still and keep my, my tone of voice, you know, modulated and yeah. no bias to be shown, but my goodness, aren't we blessed and lucky? Not just you and I, everybody at home, yeah. in front of their TV, in front of their laptop, holding their device, maybe on their trainer, you know, in the virtual world, but watching this as well. We are all together, one massive family globally, mm -hmm. watching our two kings, two of the best in the world, potentially go sub four on the bike today. Yeah, and I think like, you know, you could be a little concerned, a little worried uh, along the way when we had this horrible weather being thrown at us. And, yeah. and there are many We were things, worried. Yeah, we were a little worried, right? And, and there are many things that needs to happen to, to, to ride this fast and, and, and a lot of things can go wrong and it is just how it is, you know, how regardless of how positive we want to be, a lot of things can go wrong and right now it seems like um, we are in for a treat, like yeah, yeah gonna come here in 12 kilometers and um, touch wood, everything is still going really, really well and uh, I know that right now they can't wait to get off the bike and and what's going through their mind is also like, okay, have I taken in all my nutrition? Is well, I my... just saw yeah, Jan grab a bottle, you know, through, yeah. the, through, the, through the zone and I actually wanted to ask you, what is going through the mind now? You know, with, with, with 12 kilometers to go, you can start thinking about, okay, in your mind, you, you're T2-ing already. You're thinking about the run. Absolutely. You are You are getting into T2 in your mind now, and you are making sure that, you know, you've emptied your gel bottle, you've taken all the nutrition in that you need to take in on the bike because it is way, way more easier for the body to absorb your nutrition when you are riding. It's much more, you're much more calm sitting in that position to, to get everything in. Uh, get all your nutrition in when you're on the bike. That's what they're what they're doing now. So brilliant to watch this, and I'm so glad we've got these pictures again. I know the team already, and you, you know, Hela. So as an announcer, when when I'm I'm at a race, I always know that something's about to happen when the media and the photographers all arrive at the finish line and yep. the transition, and you can see that happening. Look look at the energy around the transition yeah, yeah. zone, but the energy on this bike from Jan Fredino has been un. Faltering. I know there's moments when we were a little bit worried, but we're not in his head. You know, we can merely surmise on our limited access to, to what we can see and what we think is going on. But the numbers are saying something very different. The numbers are saying that Jan is destroying the bike course. 
Yeah, I mean, there is no doubt about it that both of them are kind of a feeling of relief now. You know, yeah, we are soon ticked off the second discipline and, and the, it's always on the bike where there are a lot of uncertainties that can happen because you have the the mechanical situation that can also have, you know, there, there can be mechanical failures out there, yep. which has not happened either. And there is a go for Dissimo. Yeah, uh, this lovely. Is, this is amazing. It's so great that the people at home can yeah, be part yeah. of this, you know. Yeah, exactly. Cheering for, for their for their stars out there on the course. And blessed to watch the stars this close up, you know, uninterrupted. You know, it's not like we got commercial breaks or anything. It's mm. it's just our superstars. It's and it's stars from other sports as well who've who've come on board to talk with us and and share their experiences and their knowledge and their respect for what they're witnessing mm. here at the Tri Battle Royale. Out the saddle because it is up at the moment. He's got a little bit of a gradient, but also he's stretching the muscles. Is he Absolutely. not? Absolutely. He's getting out to run very soon, and you know, lying in that crunch position for so long, and then you need to get up vertical, and then run um, it's different muscles that needs to be used it's a different biomechanics like you need to stretch out the body a little bit to get ready for that run and he's utilizing the uphill to to kind of stretch out a little bit i've also heard of of some athletes who who tap up a couple of gears make it slightly lighter and spin the legs a little bit faster drop the heels stretch the hammy stretch the calves yeah exactly um so that you just spin the legs a little bit and see if you can get some oxygen going in and then clean out some of the uh, waste product that's in the legs um, it just makes them feel a little bit less heavy when you get off the bike and, and it is you know it does feel super super heavy when you are to carry yourself for the first time now for them it's for the first time in four hours but for relatively normal people it's way longer than that <laughs> <laughs> no kidding um and and there are a lot of people watching right now who, who are probably fairly new to the sport of triathlon the legs feel like they don't belong to you when, when you get off the bike and start running. Yeah, it could feel like you're running like on, on stilts or like on stumps. Like you, you feel like they're just, yeah, yeah, not part of you. And it takes a little time. Like it, it, it definitely takes a kilometer or two to find your legs and get into the rhythm and then settle. And and what we will probably now, these two are masters at, at pacing out of transition. They, they should be anyway, but usually you can easily get carried away because you're now on the run and you are, you might run a little bit too fast in the beginning um, and then again it might cost you later on so i think here it's all about pacing and holding yourself back when you get out on the run but they know that but still you know even though still that get you, you're human come you, on uh, you get carried and, and it feels so it doesn't feel easy but the speed comes to you in a such a different way than when you, go, when you just get off the bike so you you should check your watch yes. check you're not running too fast the first 10 kilometers is not where you're going to break the record it's the last 10 kilometers second half of that marathon is where yeah. the racing really happens that's where the hurt comes it's all about the back end of the marathon wow. we are less than nine well a little bit more than nine kilometers away from Jan Frodeno joining us here at uh, sort of race central for our tri battle royale this was tri battle royale not far to go he's going to be borderline relieved because he's worked hard we've noticed as he's got out of the saddle quite a few times uh, even till is who's behind him in the car saying he's been looking a little bit uncomfortable at one or two times to be expected he's, he's really going full gas out there at the moment but now he's riding on relief relief that he's almost at t2 in his head he knows the numbers as well yeah, he knows that he has. This bike has gone to perfection. I mean, like he wanted to. He hasn't overachieved himself, or over, overstrived to do something crazy here. He stayed within himself, as we can see from the numbers. And um, despite the conditions. Exactly, and stayed true to his plan that he's made with his coach. And um, I think, uh, yeah, we are seeing um, execution to perfection. And I also think the same for Lionel. Without a doubt, we must not ignore Lionel, the second king. And just to remind you of the personal bests on the bike, which I got so wrong early on, 40807 for Jan Frodeno. 40807, will he beat that? Yes. There's no doubt He's about it. He's going to destroy that. Absolutely. But I also will say, you know, this course, there might be a, a complete time trial. There is no drafting. There is no people out there, you know, to take advantage of in any way. But there's also no solo bag. There is no solo, and I think when it is that we do some lap course, which we often do on a full distance triathlon, uh, there are a lot of age groups that we need to maneuver yes. in and out. That slow you down? It will slow you yes. down, yeah. So that's probably also what we're seeing now, that there is no interfering. You don't have to be careful with, you know, there's suddenly an age group where you need to move out, you can't get into his draft, and all these things. Like, there's nothing to be worried about there. Just think about yourself.
more of those splits for you after the swim it was five minutes it grew to about seven and a half dropped below seven for quite a while but it's back up to just over eight minutes Jan Frodeno's lead after 160 kilometers over Canada's Lionel Sanders my name is Paul Kay with me Hella Fredrickson out in the cars Till Schenk and Elud Palpal and in the stadium you can hear world champion Daniel Unger busy winding up our spectators and getting them ready to welcome the king gold medalist in Beijing 2008 he's a three-time Ironman world champion two-time Ironman 70.3 world champion and holds the world's best time over 226 kilometers of swim bike and run with the 735.39 at Challenge Roth also here in Bavaria just a little bit further north than when we are right down south near Lake Constance uh, Liechtenstein to our right Switzerland at the bottom of us Austria on the other side the music starting to play there they are Tilschink on the left Ilud Pal Pal on the right have been giving us wonderful insights from the course and Daniel Unger is now in our stadium the music started playing my adrenaline is starting to go I need to just slow I need to pace myself you absolutely need to pace it we still have a marathon to go Paul so, Boy. so we need to relax a little bit Hella, but, you're yeah. the runner here not me yeah I know there is um, we, well we are soon getting the, the the two kings into our stadium and I think it's pretty exciting that we have Ungerman or Daniel Daniel Unger that is taking on the mic in here in the stadium I mean uh, Jan and um, Daniel has really battled as well in the ITU oh, yes. days and, and I remember um, 2007 World Championship in Hamburg that where Daniel won and which was um, pretty impressive so he has definitely also been a big star here in Germany and in the world so I'm excited that he is taking on the mic bringing all the stars to the Algoi, bringing all the stars to our Zwift Tri Battle Royale but the two biggest stars are our two kings and they're on a 180 bike course which is coming to a close Little bit by little bit, those kilometers are ticking away, and the first person into T2 will be none other than Germany's very own Jan Frodeno. Lionel Saunders, the colonel, is chasing and chasing hard. We've had word from Talbot that Lionel is in a good space. He's happy. He's doing the numbers he wanted to do. He's doing the speed he wanted to do. He had a fantastic swim to start the day in the Gross Alps there. But the man who's in charge of the record times at the moment as we speak is Jan Frodeno, and it looks like the swim was phenomenal, but it looks like the first big record to tumble is going to be the bike course record. Yeah, the, the, the bike. His personal bike record. Exactly, and the bike is where you spend the, the longest time out there, so it has a huge impact on the total time, right? Of course, the marathon is where it's all going to be decided, but we have ticked off two very, very important steps on the way. 5,000 and a bit meters left on the B19. Then he comes and joins us here in Borgberg, which is race central for the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. He's going to be so happy to see the fans. He's going to be so happy to see Hannes Blaschke. He's going to be so happy to hear the voice of Danny as we say, come on, boy, watching from Singapore. Go, Jan. Thanks to our viewers all around the world. Let's go, Frodi, no, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And the clock is just in the way of let's go, Frodo, beat Sanders. Come on, boy. Just push, 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 no time to lose. It's so great that we can get everybody involved. They're, they're watching on TV around the world, online around the world. Hashtag Tri Battle on Instagram, and we will put your hashtags on top of the Mercedes there on our LED board. 4,900 meters to go. Will he be smiling? Um, I think he will have some sort of grimace on his face. Um, <laughs> whether it's a smile or not i i don't think he's going to show anything i think he will be a bit of a poker face a relief where in, inside him he will smile he he will absolutely be happy to get off this bike and uh, he stayed on his bike so far so uh, we will like him to get off the bike too, both of them. We got our cameras inside our transition zone. You see the Tri Battle Royale gray carpet. That's the same carpet you and I've got behind us. We hear the hooters as we clear the path for Jan Frodeno. Our crowds, and these are all crowds, have been COVID tested. They're wearing their masks. It's a very limited number of crowds. We were allowed Jan out the saddle. A little bit more than 4,000 meters to go. He's on his way to Burgberg. This is a piece of the course he hasn't done. This is just a piece off the B19 straight to T2. 
4,000 meters to go. Jan Frodeno, are we going to look at sub four? The clock says 4.36, four kilometers to go at, let's say, you know, at 30 kilometers now, that's two minutes a K. He's doing well more than, than 30 kilometers now. So sub four is a no-brainer. It's done. Yeah, yeah, it is happening. So, um, I mean, after a 45-minute swim, it's... Uh, Insane. Yeah. I mean, is it human? But it is. I mean, we, this is, is we, we, we've, we've shown the data. We've got two incredible triathletes here on our course, yeah. uh, and they're doing it. And the whole world is watching. Yeah, we are witnessing something wild today. And I think, as I said earlier, we are in for a treat. And I, I think it's amazing to see uh, what the human body is capable of, um, how well you can train it when you optimize every single detail. And that's what they do every single day. They worry about the detail, and that's why they're so good. Here we go. Not much longer. Still pushing those big watts. The cadence is good. Speed is high. You're looking at one and a half minutes a K maximum to get you. So that's uh, three, it's four and a half, five minutes. Not even five minutes before Jan Frodeno will be arriving. Total time on the race clock will be a little over 4.40. Sub four hour bike. You are witnessing history. I hope you're not sitting down. I'm trying very hard to stay seated here in the commentary booth. And uh, I, I reckon everybody is standing. I, I, when I get excited, I usually jump up and I stand in front of the TV or I pick up my laptop yeah. and I go crazy. But we, 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 we calm, calm down, Paul. Calm down. Yeah, yeah. I can just feel the butterflies now coming back into my belly. I feel that they were kind of calming for a bit, but now they're back in again. And, and again, you know, we are still seeing the numbers nicely. His glucose level is still nicely, steadily, steady as we want to. Uh, we only have those levels on Yan. That's why we only talk about that. Uh, but yeah, um, Lionel is still also pushing steady watts. Like he's definitely um, kept it up and good contact to his legs like he did not have in quarter lane. He's had that throughout the whole bike, so yeah. it's great to see. Superb to see. What a display. As uh, we show his best friend Felix nervously anticipating the arrival of Jan Frodeno. Felix will take the bike and all Jan needs to do is go to the shoes deposit the helmet on with the running shoes and look at that pacing like a caged tiger to use an old cliche <laughs> super nervous this is felix i mean they've been best friends since young left south africa and went back to journey to chase triathlon glory they met each other in saarbrücken and um, you know felix himself was an elite athlete back then part of the the junior program as well and they've been best friends ever since yeah. so this means so much to Felix Rüdiger, and you can see he's got that slight frown. That is a frown of nerves. That is a frown of caring. That is a frown of love, brotherly love. Absolutely, they are very, very close. But I also think that Felix is really looking forward to them getting off the bike because it is the most unknown thing. And with these conditions, well, we imagine have had today, Emma at home. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Emma, we're thinking of you. We yeah, feel for of you. Of course, of course, of course. He's been sitting you know, clinched to the screen, I can imagine, and, and just really, really proud of her husband to see what he's doing No right kidding. Now. I think in Emma, Emma, in about 1,700 meters, you can exhale. You can start breathing again. Your husband's off the bike. Insane. What? It's beautiful. I've said that way too often. I'll find a new word. In en crowd, as they say in French. Absolutely brilliant. Into the little streets of Burgberg. It's a beautiful little town here in the Algoy. All his kit is standing by there, the hooker shoes. He's going to be putting his running watch on, which he was not wearing out on the bike course. That is great. We're keeping it dry. It's all covered. Felix will grab the bike. He's waiting in anticipation. So a brand new pair of shoes there on standby. Everything perfectly laid out. And the transition is, is almost like ITU style, where everything's in the box. It's not sort of Iron Man style, where you've got your kit in the bag and you go into the change tent. But we don't need that space. We don't need any of that. We've got a wonderful space dedicated to our two kings, dedicated to Jan Frodeno, dedicated to Lionel Sanders. But the first into T2 will be Jan Frodeno. And, and, and I hazard to say, you know, we, we have a limited crowd, all that we were allowed, but they're going to go crazy. And here he is, the other king. So good to see you again. Yeah, Lionel Sanders. I don't know, everybody in Canada, everybody in North America, everybody around the world, you've got so many fans. He's got a massive YouTube following going crazy for him. At 150Ks, he was uh, 3.21. Projected time, 4.01 for Lionel Sanders. He's got a personal best 
that he set on the bike of a 404 at Ironman Arizona. Thank you, Torsten. 404. I mean, you cannot be unhappy when, when you beat your personal best. Exactly. He is way, way in front of his personal best as well. Like, he is racing perfectly, uh, perfectly right now. So it's, it's amazing to see. But, yeah, we have the mid transition. Oh, he nearly went soon. wrong. Jan really went a turn too soon but here he is that's not going to affect the time he's still going to be sub four we got 441 on the clock here he comes into our stadium olympic gold three-time ironman world champion two times 70.3 world champion he holds the record for the fastest iron distance time ever set a challenge roth and here he comes jan frodeno onto the carpet off the bike he hands the bike to his good friend uh, it wasn't Felix who took the bike, another one of the crew taking the bike, wearing leather hose, and how cool is that? He looks Only pretty right. good, yeah, he looks pretty good, and, and there's this nice little seat for them to pick, took the shoes on, and he obviously also takes some socks on to kind of avoid getting any, uh, too many blisters. There might be a few blisters today due to the weather, uh, but he looks pretty, pretty, uh, you know, calm, and everything is, is uh, on point, on plan, and... You know, it's a fast, fast transition. You need, don't need to fiddle with the back. It's all ready for you. We have kept it dry so that he gets into a pair of dry shoes. Yep. And then uh, it's basically just uh, on, on he goes. I mean, that's it. That's it. Incredible. Superb. Look at you go. Jan Frodeno, the king. First out of the water. First off the bike. And he's going to be first out of transition onto the run course. Just a little bit of... <coughs> There we go. Yeah, stand there, Felix. Good. A little bit unhappy with something, a little bit uncomfortable. You want to be comfortable? Oh, yeah. I think he was. That was a little bit extra chamois. Extra chamois, yeah. He was ah, riding on an extra chamois. Yeah. Like, super clever. It can, it, it, it's, and it's obviously super comfortable on the bike, and you don't want to be. If you run with that, it's like running with a diaper. You don't want the chamois on the run, right? No, exactly. So I think that is really, really good. He, yeah. Fast, fast time he is. Wow, out of transition under still under four hours that is amazing pop, 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 they shout jan frodeno 443 on the clock a sub four hour without a doubt as he leaves our finished stadium he will come through here on every lap of the run we get to see him every 10 and a bit kilometers yeah it was super nice to to see them um, see him alive uh, for the first in time real, today, yeah. today in real, real right? person in, in the flesh and, and yeah. you're going to see him what every 33 minutes yeah 35 minutes yeah 10k Yep. Yep, it's about that. Maybe a little bit longer. Depends on how fast he's running, right? But, uh, I mean, run condition is good. Into T2, handing the bike to one of our volunteers. So great that he's wearing traditional garb in the form of the Lederhosen, taking the bike out of the channel. And like you said, very different to T1. Yeah, this is very more calm transition, you know. He is where he wants to be with the timing and everything. And you can't underestimate the relief he has in his body yeah. now getting off the bike. It is really nice to get that bike leg out of the way. And he's raced it like he wanted to race it. He's raced it according to plan. So, yeah, it's about getting in the shoes now, finding the legs. It's going to take a couple of kilometers and then, yeah. Superb. Very clever the way he took the, uh, the chamois out. And I think somebody just shouted to him, sub four, Jan, sub four. I actually do think that was Ben. <laughs> Might have been Ben, a bit of a Welsh lilt to the accent. There's sub four. And if anything, surely that's just another little pep in your step as we look at the weather conditions. Yeah, I, I guarantee it's a little bit colder than 18.5 after all the rain. High humidity, without a doubt, it's 100%. It's falling out of the sky all over the place. And conditions rain? Yep. 100% got that data spot on. It is damp out there, and that's not a massive problem on the run other than possibility of blisters. Yeah, the blisters are there, but you know, it is again something, unless it gets super, super crazy, but else is something that we can definitely control. I mean, it's uncomfortable, it's painful, but we will keep moving until, you know, we pass that finish line. There will no doubt he will do that, and it might be that he can't walk after the finish line and he can't walk for a few days, but he doesn't care about that at all. You know, that those feet will heal again if he get a few blisters so um, he just needs to find his legs now and then get into his rhythm and then now he's in the run and the, the mindset needs to be okay I'm here now I'm in the run now I'm gonna just take you know probably five kilometers at a time be in the present well we got another guest whilst Jan is starting the run course let's have a chat to the manager of Lionel Saunders I think it's Patrick Lemieux are you with us Patrick 
Guten Morgen from Minnesota. How are you guys doing? Hey, Guten hey, Morgen good. to Minnesota. What time of the morning is it for you? It's probably about 6 a.m.? Yeah, 645. I've been up since 4 a.m., you know, and I, I felt, uh, I got a little nervous when I watched Chris Hoy. It looked, he had a beautiful background, so I thought I'd come <laughs> off to the lake where I'm staying on a family holiday and, and make my background look a little more inviting, so... It looks uh, fantastic, Patrick. Today. Looks yeah, really, it really sure good. Is. You know, I, I it really it is. We've had we've had some some issues with the weather that's made it a little bit difficult for us to to follow Lionel. Uh, but I can tell you, he had an incredible swim, and he's blistering the bike. Yeah, he's sure predicted did. to do a 401 bike, which is you know is, it's a it's a new PR as you say in the states, new personal best for him. Your your thoughts on Lionel and how he's going, Patrick? I mean, look, we were at Coeur d'Alene, uh, you know, in the heat three weeks ago, and we kind of just said, like, what, how, what, how are we going to do this record attempt? What, what's going to happen? And, and uh, you know, on Sunday after the race, Lionel was was not in a good place uh, emotionally. And on Monday morning, he woke up and said, you know, I'm, I'm ready. I have to go to Germany and get this right. So, obviously, today you saw a fantastic swim from Lionel. There were people that were speculating what the gap would be, uh, much, much greater than where he was. Um, and again, you've got a fantastic ride for him. Now he just needs to start that run. You're always going to feel great the first 5K, right? Uh, you need to come back from that a little bit and get ready for that next 35, that last 10K that's going to be um, so, so hard. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to see what he can do on the run. Uh, the coverage has been great, you guys. And, and you know, I'm just excited to, to watch this next two hours and 40 minutes or whatever we have whatever we have on deck but it sure looks like the record's going to fall potentially by both athletes um yeah fantastic that th gave me I goosebumps just what you exactly. said that exactly look at me i mean come to boot goosebumps we we are <laughs> uh, this is not literal this is genuine patrick listening to you speak both Helen and i covered in goosebumps it's not because it's cold because it's extremely war warm in our commentary cabin uh, your setting is beautiful but you are a happy manager at the moment are you not yeah, I mean, we're having a ton of fun. Look, Lionel's a fantastic athlete to work for. He's, he's driven, he's focused, he sets clear goals and wants to, to achieve them. So he's obviously, he's very vocal about what he wants to achieve and people can, people can be inspired by that and say, oh, I got a little fly out of here. Um, people can say, wow, you know, maybe I can be a little bit more um, vocal about the goals in my personal life because I learned a little bit from Lionel. And that's the... Watching Lionel walk a 352 marathon in quarter yeah. lane and every person that he came in contact with said, go Lionel, go Lionel. Um, to me, that was one of the most fantastic things I've seen in sport where he was in, he was in a very vulnerable place, but people could identify with that, right? You look at Lionel, they can't identify anything with him because he's got fantastic VO2 max. There's not a shred of fat on him, but you see him not achieve the goals that he wants to achieve sometimes and you go wow you know that's uh i can relate to that and i think that that's that's what makes lionel so special special indeed and we've just got confirmation of a very special bike ride by jan fredeno he did a 355 22 patrick i mean what do you think of that i know you're lionel's manager but dude a 355 no i mean you can't even imagine i mean go out ride your bike 180 kilometers and try and average what do we what do we think the average speed on that is it's 46 or something kilometers i mean it's it's unbelievable try and do that for 10 minutes now imagine that jan did that for three hours and 55 minutes it's, it's unbelievable so hats off to canyon they've got a super fast bike um i think you're seeing that you're going to see lionel showcase a, a, a 401 i've ridden the bike quite a, for for many, many years, I can't imagine having to ride 180 kilometers and then you get off. I usually have a, a burrito afterwards. What's what are they going to do? They're going to put on their running sneakers and go try and do a marathon. Uh, <laughs> I, I can't even imagine. Exactly right. And then to think about it, I mean, I, when I drove down here the other day, 180 Ks in this camper van I was driving, I wasn't averaging a huge amount quicker than what Jan and, and Lionel are doing on the bike. It's insane. But just talk a bit about Lionel. You know, he, he's uh, the conditions today. I know Coeur d'Alene was just brutally, brutally warm. But we've got a cool day today. And, and I think Lionel oh, was looking forward to that. Yeah, so it was, it was interesting. You know, we'd gone back in time and try and tapped into what were, where was, where was the success in previous performances? And Lionel kept saying, you know, look, I keep, I 
If hey, we Patrick, look at hold on one second, dude. I'm going to interrupt you because Lionel's coming yeah, into T2. Fine. You stick around. Okay, he's uh, just turned the final corner. <laughs> we can see all the branding and the crowds are starting to go Fantastic. crazy. Daniel Inga screaming and shouting and Lionel Sanders under the arch as the feet come out of the shoes and he's making his way to T2. We've got a volunteer who'll grab his bike and then it's on with the running shoes and time to see him fly on the course. There he goes. He's out of the shoes. He's going to jump off the bike. The volunteer's standing by. Patrick, don't you go anywhere because I'm speak to you some more straight after this. There we go under the Zwift arch. The volunteer's got his bike, and uh, it's time for those shoes. Will he put socks on the way Jan Frodeno did? Uh, Patrick, you probably know the answer to that. Is he going to put socks on? Yes, absolutely. He's absolutely going to put socks on. Yeah. Absolutely, he's going to take all the time in the world get the socks on properly. Uh, yeah, and you would be a little bit stiff here, and you, you know, can see that you again, are. Again, I just go back to. <laughs> Yeah, he will be. Yeah, but it's look. He's looking really great now, right? He yeah, is, he's uh, looking good. He's looking yeah, unrushed. Yeah, he's looking fantastic. Yeah, the key. You know, the key is here to just get get your shoes and socks on correctly, and then say, okay, all right, so now it's time to run a marathon. Let's go. So the only little issue, Patrick, you might not be able to see it because I know you're talking to us. The carpet is wet. We've had some incredible rain. So the bottom, the sole of his foot and his socks getting just a little bit wet. But let's face it, on the run in the rain, it's going to get wet in any case. But the socks were <laughs> yeah, up. That was after. a quick transition. He's got his fuel belt with him. And uh, he's now out onto the run course. Come on, let's everybody, yeah. let's give Lionel Sanders hey, Lionel, the second go. king. Come on, dude. Looking great. Yeah. yeah, he just needs to find his running legs now, of course, a little stiff, you know, he was also shaking a little bit, um, he might be a little bit cold, you know, the muscles has been super, super tense, uh, so he just needs to loosen up now and, and, and get going and get into his zone, like, uh, now he's going to run past our boot. Yeah, we're about to see him. Yeah. Hey, Lionel, Patrick says go, go, go. <laughs> Here we go, Lionel. You can already... It looks like his hip flexors were super tight when he left T2, and it already seems he's run 100, 100 maybe 200 meters, and those hip flexors opened up and he's Absolutely. ready to. Exactly, that's also what I'm. He's ready seeing. to do this for 40.2 kilometers. Yeah. Well, yeah. Patrick, <laughs> guess what? Guess what? Lionel biked four hours 27 seconds, mate. Four hours 27 seconds. <laughs> A new PR for Lionel. <laughs> yeah, unreal. So. Um, I mean, do we have an idea? Is the split around eight or nine minutes, or where do we think it's at? Do we have an official? Gap? I don't have an official over? split yet, and I wasn't running the clock as we just show a replay now <laughs> of Lionel joining us into T2. You know, we got we got millions of people watching around the world on live TV online as well, and and the, this you can just see now there, Hiller, as his feet hit the ground of the carpet. It is a bit wet, but he's going to get wet feet uh, up there on the run course. They're going to be red in 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 500 meters anyway, so it doesn't really matter um, as long as he gets the socks on properly, so it's not folded anywhere. Reduce the chafing and yeah, the friction. Yeah, exactly. So you don't want a folded sock somewhere. And and yeah, he, he does look like he has a little bit of a, a closed, you know, hip angle, a little bit stiff, stiff hips. But that is, you know, that is normal. And, and he, he's dropping his bottle now. That happens, you know. And uh, he sees it, which is great because it's his nutrition. And he picks it up and then off he goes. Well, I mean, it's only fair. Jan dropped his helmet in T1. Yeah, yeah. Lionel drops his bottle in T2. Yeah. It happens. Another little hashtag, Frodissimo, support for Jan out on the course. We want some hashtags for the Colonel. Come on, let's get your hashtags out there for Lionel Sanders. They are both on the run course. The gap is not massive. I'm waiting for official confirmation of the gaps. Patrick, let's just talk a little bit about Lionel's running style. I'm going to have to admit this to you. Uh, I remember in 2017 when he came second in <laughs> Kona, I was at the hot corner, Kuakini and Palani, and he came running towards me, and I thought, oh, my God, is he injured? And then uh, Kevin McKinnon said to me, no, he's not injured. That's just the way he runs. You know, sometimes <laughs> he's, he's got that little hitch in his stride, but he still covers the ground really quickly, doesn't he? Yeah, you know, look, guys, uh, I love Lionel. Does he look beautiful running? Tough to say yes to that. Uh, um, but, he, boy, wow, you know, you look at the run split that he threw down in St. George. Uh, Lionel can run very, very fast and is efficient and has got high economy in his own way, right? Yeah. And so running looks very different for a lot of different people. Uh, and Lionel is very efficient at his way, but he certainly does not look um, like he's like he's it's very easy for him. But but trust me, uh, when he's feeling good and running well, I mean, you've seen the run times that he does at 70.3s. He's capable of doing a 239 marathon off the bike. Uh, he, he is a fantastic runner. 
without a doubt. Patrick, we, we, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, Such thank a you. Good timing as well that you're here as, as Lionel came off the bike for that four-hour bike split and went through T2. Uh, stay close to your screen. We're going to bring you more of this amazing coverage. And, and all the best to you and Team Sanders. Very much thanks to there to Patrick Lemur, the manager. Thank you, guys. Yeah, you guys are doing great. You have a good one. Thank you. The manager of Lionel Sanders, uh, and we're on the run course, and we're getting the real-time speeds. We're looking at fairly similar speeds at the moment. Uh, heart rates uh, quite a bit lower for, for, for Lionel Sanders, but then again, he does have a low heart rate. He does have a low heart hey, rate. Hey, cheers. Yeah. Thank you so much. So, uh, hey, bye-bye. Righty. We've seen the swim course. We've seen the bike course in real time. Let's show you a quick animation of your run course. 42.2 kilometers here as they leave Burgberg and run the marathon four laps. Here is what that run course looks like in the beautiful Algoy. Leaving us through the nutrition zone. It's flat and it's fast, but they're gonna do multiple laps as they come through the stadium every time on this Hoka run. Very much an out and a back. Four of those, a little bit more than 10 Ks per lap, and we get to see them in the stadium every time you and I are live. Everybody at home, you get to see them all day long. What? What do I mean all day long? Another two hours, steady? Yeah, we're soon done. <laughs> I mean, they're soon done. I can't believe the, the time is just, uh, it's flying. It's really flying. And, and now we have them out on the run course. And it's, uh, if, for me, it's also a relief, as I said, relief many times now. But it is. And it, it, is. Is, it is for them as well. And, and it feels like they've both uh, found their stride now and, and they're into it. And they're just now, you got to find the pace. You know, they're now they're over the first little bit where you tend to running a little bit too fast. And, and it's easy to run fast in yes. the beginning. You get carried away and then the excitement. And finally, there are spectators you know you've been a little alone on the bike and now you're seeing all the spectators and the atmosphere and the music and okay now you get out and find your groove and you just settle in find your space and and find the right mindset and then quiet the mind and then keep your pace and keep your nutrition plan quieting the mind is is a big thing great that we got the data again with speeds no, you can't really compare the speed because they're no. different spaces on the course. Yeah. Could be a bit of an up for Lionel at the moment. Jan is, well, that should be his sort of flat speed, you know, 16 kilometers now. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing beautifully. The heart rates, we can't compare those either. A lot of people don't realize that your heart rate is, is determined by several things, one of which is the size of your heart. Lionel typically has a low heart rate. It means he's got a really big heart. Extremely low heart rate, yeah, and he's, he's, he's working heart rate is, is low as well, as, as you can see. And then it's also cold, well, yeah. cool. And that will also give you a lower heart rate. Um, so, because, yeah, so, so for him, I think this is, this is quite normal. And, and for Jan as well, like around 140 in, in Ironman pace, I think that is um, also quite normal and, and nice he's settling in. So like, they definitely have control over their bodies right now. And, it, and it's great to see that, um, that it's nice and steady. I wish I could run 15 kilometers an hour with a 140 heart rate. <laughs> At 15 kilometers an hour, I wouldn't hold it for very long, and I, I would HR max. I'd be 180 something. Yeah, and then you know, uh, Jan he has a max heart rate in 195, so there is far up to. Yeah, he has a big, big engine. He has so a he's big, aerobic the whole time. It, yeah, he is. Yeah, it's, he's fine right now. He's utilizing yeah, his. Uh, his energy really, really fine. Um, and um, he has a big span in his heart rate, like I think from 36 and rest and then up to 195. So it's a huge span. I've heard a lot of stories of, of triathletes when they're not well and, and, they, and they go to a hospital. And then the first thing you do is, you know, they check blood pressure and your heart rate. And then there's a heart rate of 30 odd. And yes. The, the, the nurses and the doctors panic, like, yeah. no, there's something wrong. Like, whoa, whoa, no, I'm fine. I'm yep. a triathlete. Yeah, exactly. I've tried that too, where monitors start to beep like crazy and they come running and say, I'm fine, I'm fine. <laughs> Don't worry about me. <laughs> so it's just normal. I mean, it is just low and uh, you can train. Your heart is, is a muscle. It's trained and uh, it's normal for an endurance athlete to have a, a little bit larger heart. Look at those speeds. Speeds are very, very comparable at the moment on these beautiful narrow roads. We shortly are going to give another recap of our racing so far here at our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Stick around for that if you've just joined us. We will bring you up to speed and speedy it has been.
We took them by boat to the pontoon at 9 a.m. this morning. It's called the Grosser Alpsee, the big alpine lake, as they both shoulder to shoulder dived off the purpose-made pontoon into water temperature of 18.2 degrees Celsius. Specially designed swim, no boys needing to be sighted. White Teflon rope one meter below the water for the athletes Jan and Lionel to sight on. No lifting the head, no dropping the hips to look for those boys. No tight turns either. Early on, Jan Frodeno pulling away a gap of about two minutes. Jan was first to swim out and made his way to T1 with a gap of close to five minutes. But both these athletes swimming their hearts out. A little mistake, a little bit of energy, a little bit of adrenaline, wet slippery hands, a slippery helmet as well. But no problem, the champion gathers himself on with the helmet, clipped in and quickly onto the bike. Having one of the best swims of his life, Lionel Sanders of Canada following Jan Frodeno to T1. Quick onto his bike and quick onto the bike course. Let the games begin, let the battle begin. 180 kilometers, five big laps on a freeway closed just for these two superstars of our sport. Both of them sticking to their nutrition plans and also with that special board where all our fans could send in their messages for fans around the world and of course for our two kings. Frodeno, Sanders getting sight of one another. It wasn't often that the road was dry. These two having to challenge themselves of a wet course and the canyon turn. And Lionel Sanders going right to the top of that bank. Once in a while out of the saddle. At times we were worried, but we got news from the course that it was all good. We we're just stretching those muscles. Our volunteers keeping the canyon turn dry. And Jan, with his hands on the drops, a little bit of caution as he made his way through the turn yet again. Great cadence superb power executing the plan to perfection both these superstars frodo at times about eight minutes in front of sanders and his bike to the volunteer quickly to t2 in Birkberg. on with the socks on with the shoes taking the tracker and on to the run course relief to be off the bike with a sub four hour bike a 355 for frodissimo and on to the run course he goes four hours and 50 minutes of racing and soon it would be the turn of Sanders into T2. A brilliant bike for him as well. Four hours and 27 seconds. Also choosing to put on the socks. A little bit wet underfoot on the carpet, but that's no problem because it's gonna be wet on the run course in any case. Quickly behind Frodo, Sanders is onto the run. The tri-battle royale is very much underway, Hella. Absolutely. Yeah, we have them out on the run now and um, beautiful shot we have now. Um, and I just, yeah, I can't wait for them actually to get back into the stadium again um, because now we've actually seen them. So good to see them and we get to see them every yeah. time. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Hilla Fredriksen, triathlon world champion. My name is Paul Kay. Out on the course, we've got Till Schenk. We've got Ilud Palpal in the stadium. We have Daniel Unger. And on the course, you're looking at Lionel Sanders representing Canada, running nicely, good pace, and uh, with that low heart rate that we all envy. And he is chasing your 2008 Olympic gold medalist, three-time Ironman world champion, two-time 70.3 world champion, your current record holder of a 226 kilometers, the iron distance of a 735.39. He's already gone 355 on the bike. And what do you say? He only needs to run like a 240 to, to break yeah. the record? Yeah. 245, 245, I think, actually. Canadian strong, it says on the video wall. Send in your hashtags. Hashtag try battle. Pain is temporary, but victory lasts forever. Hashtag no limits. We've got a lot of Sanders fans out there. He's massively popular. Get after it, it says. Yep, indeed. Southwestern Ontario cheering for a Sanders try. And yep. I also saw there was a sign out there, Lion uh, Lionel for president. <laughs> well, you could do a lot better job than some of the presidents, <laughs> i tell you that much. Yeah, Lionel for president. Somebody who's honest, transparent. Absolutely. Beautiful. Bring and it on. Tell things as they are. Indeed. An inspiration to so many people out there. But you know what? There were a lot of unknowns for these two athletes going into this race. And so we wanted to get a sense from them. What were their expectations? And I think now that we're onto the run, you know, with uh, 36 kilometers to go, let's just give you an insight into the mindset and the expectations of Jan and Lionel.
The marathon will definitely be the most uh, uh, interesting part for me because I checked out the course today. Uh, it's extremely flat. It's actually very favoring in terms of conditions. You know, there's some shade cover. Um, hopefully it won't be too windy on race day. But yeah, the, the aim would be to take out the first lap a little bit quicker, but only a little bit quicker than, uh, than the next three and then try and be consistent. You know, really is not all that exciting. There is uh, consistency is, is what makes endurance sports work and nailing that consistency, especially on this kind of course will be crucial. Uh, and then on the run, same, same idea, just, just listening to my body, uh, using heart rate again quite a bit. And, uh, I mean, I'll probably won't allow myself to go out any faster through the halfway point than 117 or once I know Jan's going to be going very fast. So I, you know, if I want to even have a remote contention, then I'm going to have to also go out decently fast, but within myself. So, um, somewhere between 117 and 120 for the half. And once again, I sweat two to 2.5 liters an hour, even in these conditions, so I need to be consuming, if I did well on the bike, then I need to be consuming about 1.5 liters per hour while running at those paces, which can be difficult. Uh, but I have to, it's the only way that I can make it to the second half and still be racing. And so it'll take a lot of discipline. And that's what the big one for me is to just stay disciplined and then, and then give him a run for his money on that second half, actually race the second half. And what I've done in the past is blow up and walk the second half, which I do not want to do again. Yeah, I definitely don't think that Lionel is going to blow up and walk. Um, it looks good so far and he's really sticking to his plan and he's racing within himself. And I could see that he's also sticking to his nutrition plan. He is having his um, nutrition with him. He's having a bottle in his belt that he takes, you know, all the time. And now we can see gaps here. We actually see that the... Uh, Lionel had a significant faster transition than, than Jan had, like 35 seconds faster. Um, and right now Jan is 9 minutes 29 in front of um, Lionel. So um, yeah, I think we are in for a really, really fast time. And, and of course everything can happen on this marathon, but uh, I must admit, I think we are breaking records today, uh, which is super exciting. Like. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah, and I even think that like, both of them will get under uh, the former record, which was 7:35, which Jan Frodeno did in 2016 in Roth. So this is crazy. Like we thought we needed the best condition ever to to beat the world record, but actually we don't. We just need superhuman performance, and we are seeing that right now. Um, and there's also a huge difference between the two of them, the way they are running, like. And again, there is no perfect running style. There is no perfect running cadence. I will say, like, usually most professional runners are running around maybe 180 to 185 um, their cadence um, per minute. Um, and it all depends on the length of your legs. It all depends on the speed. Uh, but what is very important is that you're landing underneath your center of gravity. You do not want to land in front of yourself as you are then breaking your forward momentum. You want to land underneath yourself and you want to land, if you can, kind of midfoot. Uh, do not heel strike too much in front of the body because, again, it will slow you down. Uh, I will again say there are some super, super fast heel strikers out there, so there is never a rule without exceptions. Um, uh, Lionel is heel striking ever so slightly, a little bit, but if you notice, he has a fast turnover, a fast cadence, and he's landing underneath his center of gravity, which is so important. Whereas, like, Jan has a slower cadence, and is way more like a midfoot striker. He's landing underneath himself, midfoot running. When he was a short distance athlete, it was way more forefoot running, but that is really, really tough, and you can really easily be injured if you're running on your forefoot, especially when you have to run 42 kilometers. This is a marathon, this is not a 10K run. Five hours, 10 minutes. And Till Schenk, it's been five hours and ten minutes in the car. You've watched some incredible racing. How was that bike by Jan Frodeno, and how's he looking on the run? Oh, man, what a bike. Unbelievable. For a second there, I was a little bit worried towards the end when he's sort of rolling a little bit and stretching in the rain, but I, I really think it was just a warm-up for the run course. I mean, it, it was a... <laughs> 
Much better transition this time than T1, um, definitely. And he looks super active, very stable on the run here. He was gunning out the gates. Um, slight mishap there a second ago, a bit of a scary moment when he actually, in the aid station, took the bottle and when he threw it away, it dropped in front of his own feet and he kind of slipped on the bottle Oof. himself, but he looks all right. And then a beautiful moment of sport when he was passing Lionel or the other way around for the first time just before the Hoka Ono Ono Zone out there. Um, you could see Lionel like coming over towards Jan's side and just shouting at him and going with a smile on the face like going, Jan, push, push. So Lionel's definitely here, you know, to perform, to show an amazing race, but he's also here to witness history, hopefully, in, in triathlon, long distance triathlon racing. And he's here to push Jan, and it was a beautiful moment of sport and respect out here on the run course. Jan is on the way back towards the second lap. Hand him back to you guys in the studio. Absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Till Schenk. That's why we've got Till and Ellie out there to give us some of the stuff you and I don't get to see. And, and that moment, that beautiful moment of sport is something we kind of see a, a, a lot of in triathlon. There's that, the, the, these, they are battling each other. You know, and they're gladiators at the moment, and the fight is on, but there's always that respect yeah. and a camaraderie that not a lot of other sports offer. No, it's, it's amazing how there is that mutual respect, and you're actually cheering each other along as you are actually racing each other and fighting each other and want to beat one another. And I think that is, that is so special for triathlon, and you see that very, very often, you know, before you toe the line, you know, you give your best body a hug and make the, may the best man, woman win. And um, when you then pass the finish line, it's like, are we going to go for dinner? Exactly. And that's how it is. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's amazing. And, and there's even sharing. There's sharing of, of data, sh sharing of, of, of training methods, um, and often sharing of accommodation, even though they, they're competitors. Yeah, yeah. We, I think if you're not too proud to share, and if you're not too proud to help each other, you actually lift each other. And you say that, uh, you see that as well with, with training bodies, right? You, you, you are maybe a training with one of the best in the world, but he or she, for, my, uh, for, for me, mm -hmm. can lift me. And if we we can push each other in training and lift each other up we are both going to become better athletes and i think just don't be too proud and you will be lifted humility is a beautiful thing and we do see a lot of that in the sport more of it is always good i'm seeing a lot of humility now as people can come back to racing something that they took yeah. for granted yeah. they're finally realizing they really missed it Elliot Palpal is out following Lionel Sanders. Elliot, you've had a front row seat to some incredible bike riding and some awesome yep. running now. How are you feeling and what are you seeing? Hey everybody, I think we just completed the half distance of this first lap here on running. It is fantastic to see. We just came out of a roundabout and we we are just uh, witnessing uh, historical moments, seeing all these spectators, all these fans coming out, even if it's uh, easily raining here in this area. People are cheering for these athletes and now uh, we are still following Lionel Sanders here on this road. The fact that I observed after the transition area, maybe the first two or three kilometers, in his movements, in his moves, uh, I saw that he was a little bit tired. He had to adapt to this new situation on running. But uh, I think that now he is in a good shape and he is running and running and running and we are just following him. It's a great battle and I think uh, it's also possible to break these records. Everyone to achieve the aim uh, for what uh, they came here to Germany. That's a fantastic day. I think there are good conditions for running. People are cheering and applauding them. And uh, yeah, that, that, that's something great and something phenomenal. I hope that uh, on this course, all these cheers, all these spectators will stay uh, for the next uh, two or three hours to see these heroes running. That's uh, great stuff to see. Uh, stay tuned and stay with us. Thank you. Front row for Ellie and for Till. You guys have got the best seats in the house. No, we got the best seats in the house, haven't Abs we? Yeah. Absolutely, I'm enjoying this seat and I'm enjoying that we can we can see them, both of them, when they're coming into the stadium. And, and now we can also see that actually the treadmill is live and we have no, spectators no, no. running on the treadmill the, and racing. Trying to keep pace with, exactly. with Lionel and Jan. Exactly. That because that treadmill, that treadmill is actually connected to, to, to Zwift, so we're using their speed and uh, you have to try and keep up with them. But this is brilliant. 15 and a half kilometers now for Jan, 16 for, for um, Lionel at the moment. And look, 
He's covering ground quickly. I mean, if you look at him, as we see on the right, these are people trying it out on the treadmill yeah. in jeans. Well, I suppose it's a cold day. Of Why course, not? like, I mean, if, if you are spectators and you don't really have running pants with you, right, you're just jumping on yeah. with jeans. And, and this is Swift, right? They're, they're racing them the same pace as, as uh, Lionel and Yen is, is running in. And I think that's pretty cool. You're just taking up the challenge and you're part of, uh, of, of virtual racing in real life. <laughs> so what you must do, is tomorrow I want you to go to your health club, your gym. I want you to get on the treadmill. I want you to put it at 16 kilometers an hour and I want you to run like that for two and a half hours. Exactly. Nobody can do it. <laughs> Not that many can no. do it. No. Maybe Definitely. Elliot Kipchoge maybe. Yeah, and you got to remember he hasn't swam and biked no. before. So I think that is where these are definitely um, quite different from the rest of uh, normal people out there. Um, so, yeah, and I think uh, yeah, there you can yeah you can see the animation there. It's of, of, uh, yeah, it's, it is amazing. You know, it's crazy that in a world where we kind of have all retreated into our devices, uh, the pandemic has shown us how connected we are. Something can happen on the other side of the world, and a couple of months later, we're all locked in our homes and, and struggling with a with, with a virus we don't know how to treat. Yet, in a way, it's forced us to reconnect. Mm -hmm. And look what we're doing now on a virtual platform. We're connecting reality with, with a virtual platform. And, and everybody around the world, if they want to know how, how, what it takes to go as quickly as Lionel and Yano going, they can do that right now. Exactly. And uh, yeah, he followed them. I will just uh, quickly just start to mention the heart rate a little bit, as you see now when they're out on the um, on the run, like how the body is heating up slowly, the core temperature is rising now. They were probably pretty cold on the bike, and yeah. that was also why we saw a low heart rate in the beginning of the run, and it's now slowly coming up to more levels that we would probably expect. And, and uh, we could expect that, you know, it would stay for a while and then maybe actually go even higher up uh, towards the end. And that is also, um, core temperature is getting up even though it's, it's, it's cooler temperature, and then also that, there are some dehydration, it will always happen. It's just about limiting that dehydration during that the cardio week. drift. Slowly but surely, no matter what you do, your, your, your heart rate goes up as we see it. A lot of our fans enjoying the activities we have on the finish line here, completely interactive. This is not you, just merely a bystander, a spectator. You're completely part of the action, be it at home, in the virtual world, be it sending us the hashtags, hashtag try battle via Instagram, be it here in the stadium. And also good to see quite a few spectators out on the course who are there encouraging. I mean, Ben messaged us to say, lots of people on bikes who are out there supporting Young, supporting Lionel. And, and that's also a great thing about Triathlon Hill. And I'm sure you've seen it, you've raced all around the world, that we don't only cheer our athletes, we cheer all the athletes. Our athlete gets a slightly louder cheer but we cheer everybody. Yeah, we are impressed with, with them, right? We're impressed with the performance and we want to carry them along. And, and as a spectator and a fan of the sport, you are also high out there. You know, you are high. You want to yes. show them. You want to encourage them to keep pushing. You want to show them that you're with them and you are helping them um, just because we're so inspired by what they're doing and they need help because this is not easy. Oh, no. You know, they, they need... It's going to start hurting. It, it will, right? And, and it definitely in, in, in 10 kilometers, you know, it will start to hurt. And um, there you, you have the back end of the marathon that we're going to see there. Look at this. <laughs> Could you ask for a, a better run course? Beautiful trees on either side. It's like an avenue. The lovely pre-Alps behind you. It's the start of the Alpine Mountains here. Uh, wonderful skiing part of the world. Hello, Fredrickson, myself, Paul Kay, in the commentary booth out of the Finnish venue in... Burgberg. It is Till Schenk and Ilut Palpal out on the course. Daniel Unger is our stadium announcer here. Lots of fans enjoying all the activities okay. at the finish line. And thank you for joining us. You can ask us questions. Hashtag try battle with your question on Instagram. And we will do our best to answer them for you. And I love Germany, Switzerland, Austria. I love the cowbells. Yeah. And it's it's part and parcel of, of, of the cheering on of the athletes this is, is part the of, It's part of this region, you know. Far end of the run course through the turnaround. Lionel Sanders. And look at the crowds. Now, there they are. It's not like we've advertised this, but it's gone viral. The people have heard about the Swift Tri-Battle Royale, and they are now part of history. 
And then you could see the turn as well was also a turn where you can carry the speed in and around. I think that is, again, very important that they don't have to slow down. They don't have that 180-degree U-turn that actually is hard on the legs. You have to break the speed and pick it back up again. It is something that can give you a, a, a cramp, especially longer into the race, a nice one sitting in the hamstring, and it can also cause some blisters. So it's really, really nice that they just can carry that speed around the corner. Pretty much a straight line on the run course, except for that turn. And as you mentioned, very well, well spotted, Hella. That gentle turn, you know, it's almost like the turns on a track where you, you don't have to lose any speed. And now with the feet just a little bit wet, you don't want them slip sliding inside the shoes on the sharp turns as well. Also reduces the risk of, uh, of, of blistering. But not that they're going to be thinking about blisters at the moment. They're thinking, they're, they're both, I think that Lionel is relishing this opportunity. He's relishing being part of history. He's relishing that he had an awesome swim. Mm -hmm. He's relishing that he had an awesome bike. And surely he takes that, as much as he's taking nutrition out of his bottle, this is also mental nutrition, emotional mental nutrition. Fuel. Yeah, yeah, he knows he's, he's, he's racing really, really well. He's racing within himself. He's true to himself. He's true to his plan. And it's going really well. And, and you know, we might have talked about he has a little limp and he might not look like picture perfect. He's but look flying. how he's looking from behind. Look how he's landing. Yeah. He is really straight down. When he's landing on one leg, there's no rocking to the side. You know, his glute medius, the top of the glute, is so strong that he is not moving from side to side. He's moving in a straight line from A to B. There's no wasted energy he is relatively you know relaxed in his upper body what you want and if you're looking the way he's landing on his feet there is no one foot that is uh, like a little bit in or a little bit yeah, out yeah. it's totally very neutral. very neutral and straight down so he's really using the the, the speed to his advantages and um, so um, he as I said he might have a limp but that is definitely not uh, going to do it is not affecting his uh, forward momentum whatsoever no, it's not a disadvantage in any way, shape, or form, whatsoever. And look at this beautiful countryside. I got a funny feeling we're gonna have a lot more people coming to the Algoy. <laughs> Even if it's just for a holiday, I can hear Daniel Ungo winding up the crowds. That can only mean one thing. We have Jan Frodeno en route to complete a lap and make his way through the stadium, and here he comes. There we go, the crowds are making a noise. If you listen carefully, you can hear a little bit of the ambient noise from outside. We can see the speed at which the bicycle is moving in front of him they're going quickly look they're riding 40 k's and look at the speed at which i mean we, we don't have to look at the monitors now we can see jan himself he's got that long gait he's got the relaxed arms at his size his shoulders are relaxed listen to the cowboys just just listen to the cowbells and the crowds for a while Oh. Come on, Jan. Oh, yeah. Come on, Jan. Come on, Jan. Going again. Come on, Jan. Oh. You know, as commentators, you want to be neutral, and but oh, you don't want to see that. He will. Oh. He gets over this. He will get over this. He just need. Oh, that was a shock, right? He just yeah. fell, and he just fell on his hip. And let's hope it is just the impact and he can run that away again. No doubt he'll have a sore hip, but let's hope it was Come on, just yeah. an impact. I'm not sure I could watch this again. Wet, wet carpet. Yeah. Look how relaxed he looks. He's holding a lot of speed as he goes through the turn. And boom, as he lands with that left leg, it just... Oh, it takes a while to think about it. And this is giving me flashbacks to Nelson Mandela Bay 2018. He came off the bike at the 70.3 World Champs. And uh, there was an issue with handing the bike to the volunteer, and Jan went down. But I, I actually, I'm no, not even going to no, mention don't. Emma. We won't even talk about that. No. I retract that. Yeah. Oh, come on, Jan, yeah. run it out. It's just a little bit of a bruise. The yeah. muscles are cold, like you said. <sighs> no, don't think back on. No, the... no. Let's just stay in the present, as you say. Come on, Jan. No. Shake this out of your mind. Your body is so strong. Your mind is stronger. Come on, Jan. Yeah. Hey, we need a lot of those hashtags yep. for Jan. Come on. Absolutely. Hashtags for DC mode. Get out there, people. Let's get the collective global spirit, all your positive energy. Yep. Channel it here to the Algoi. Send it to Jan. Send us your messages. Hashtag try battle. We're going to put it on the board, and we're going to give Jan your energy. Come on. 
Yeah, he, he definitely got a shock, and there's no doubt about it that his his body remembers what has happened to him before. Yeah. And uh, I think there's no hiding that we're both sitting and thinking about what happened after yeah. this crazy performance he had at 70.3 Worlds in South Africa, yeah. where he probably most one of the most epic battles I've ever, ever. seen in in triathlon between between Jan, Alyssa Brownlee, and Javier Gomez, um, the three greatest, almost one of the three greatest of the sport, uh, battling it out, and Jan won, and and uh, on his way home he um, got a sore hip and, and it turned into be a sacral fracture um, so that is obviously could go through his mind but that we're gonna shake that out again no. that is not the case but of course the body do remembers and he got it he, he got a shock he just got a shock and he has to just turn that voice off. exactly off off he go and he runs again like shake it off well we're looking at young speed he's back up to speed yeah, yeah that's good news Let's keep the data this. coming. Heart rate's jumped up a little bit. That's adrenaline. Yeah. But he's back up to speed. This is good news. Yeah, yeah. They're going to see each other soon, I think. I have to calm down a bit now, Hela. I get emotionally far too involved. Yeah, yeah. It, it does hurt a little bit. It does sit in the belly. If it does give you a little bit, feeling a little bit nauseous. But Whoa. that's because we care and because we... Uh, it, it, yeah, we want this to go well and we want them both to succeed and... Um, but things can happen then all the time. You just need to be so, so focused. And again, we have the elements to battle with as well. And these carpets do get wet and very, very slippery. Um, and Jan was obviously taking the speed into the corners like you would always do. You would not slow down in a turn like that. But that was super, super slippery down there. But let's say it's... Um They're going to see each other very, very soon. Uh, Lionel Sanders will see... Jan Freduna, but Lionel will have no idea what's happened. He'll have no idea. So all he's going to look at, and I know the athletes look at each other, they look at body language, they look at facial expression. Yeah. Even in these conditions, they're wearing sunglasses. Yeah, yeah. To hide the pain behind of the course, eyes. Of course, you're never going to show your eyes. No. You're not going to show your eyes before you get to that finish line. Um, because you can save, you can keep or hide so much behind. But I don't think that Jan is going to show any sign of weakness now. If he not, believes, Well, look at his speed. He's right up to yeah, speed. Yeah, yeah. This is good news. He's and not going to show Lionel it. anything now. Soon they're going to pass each other, and soon we're going to have another one of our famous guests joining us. I'm uber excited. Yep. So potentially now, the Sanders fans who saw what happened to Jan, they're going to say, hey, Lionel, be careful, the carpet's slippery. Of course. But it is what it of is, course. right? You know? We also don't Here they're going to pass each other. Here we go. Jan Frodeno on his way out, lap number two. Lionel Sanders finishing lap number one. Eyeball to eyeball, the two kings. Here we go, there's the lead bike. Jan will see the other lead bike. They pass each other, and it's just a little, yeah, no. a little nothing. So Jan looks perfect there. There Jan is nothing great. there, but there is no doubt that they should also tell Lionel it's slippery. They yeah. will tell Why Lionel. Not? He should not slip as well. Of course they will. And and you also see that in races. If you is, you have a race and people have crashed in a corner, there will be marshals out there saying, slow down, slow down. We don't want more of this. And, and that is how it should be. And you know what? The fans are here too. And they, we might be in Germany. There might be mostly German fans. There might be young yeah, fans. Yeah, yeah. But they, they're human and they have respect and they have exactly. humility. And they're going to say, be careful, the carpet's wet. Exactly. Anybody would do that. So we're so good to see Jan back up to speed. Lionel's keeping speed. They're looking controlled. Lionel soon into T2. So we've got one of our officials. As a matter of fact, it's Hannes Blaschke. Hannes Blaschke, who's a local legend. As a matter of fact, he's a global legend. He is going to inform um, Lionel that the carpet is slippery. And you know what? I've got no issue with that. No, no, no. It should be like that. No, it should be like that. Exactly. So there's Hannes. But you know, we've got another guest on the line. Cool. The only person, the only person on the planet to do the double quadruple or the quadruple double. Have you heard of that? Nope. To win two gold medals and to win the world championship in the same year and to do it twice. Sir Mo Farah, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing great, thank you. It's good to see some running here. Hey. I'm actually enjoying myself. And I'm up in Silverstone watching the Grand Prix. Oh, yeah. Look at you, that's so good. Uh, it seems everybody's got sunshine except us, Mo. I mean, even in England, you've got sunshine. Uh, listen, good to see you. Uh, I remember having the pleasure of meeting you at the Ironman 70.3 Middle East Championship in Bahrain. Yeah. I don't know how many people know that you've actually been part of a triathlon. 
No, I have. I actually talked to my accommodation. We were even thinking bringing something out uh, in terms of just get the people going, something different. And I think it's really important for people to see sports and enjoy themselves and have a laugh. I think that's what it's about. Important to have a laugh, important to sometimes not take yourself too seriously, important for a bit of distraction and a bit of change of pace. I can tell you, Mo, that at the moment, here in the Algoy, Jan Frodeno had a phenomenal swim. He had a record-breaking bike. He's having a brilliant run. He had a little slip and a fall, but he's up and running again, so we're happy with that. And the Canadian Lionel Sanders is chasing him. They're both on the marathon run, and they are looking to go for 226 kilometers of swimming, biking, and running under wow. seven hours and 35 minutes, possibly under seven and a half hours. You're an elite athlete. I've given you some of those numbers, and I hear you go, wow. Wow, it is incredible. You know, uh, I, do run a, I do run around a lot, but to see these guys, what they're putting into it, and to see your body to carry on, to continue throughout three different sports, it's incredible. And he still looks good. He's looking Great fantastic. <laughs> Tell us more about what you're seeing as you watch Jan Frodeno. Yeah, as you can see, he's still got that uh, knee lift. His, his legs are moving, moving, his arms working well. But when you get tired to this point, you know, it's hard to get that response off the ground. And you can see he's getting a good response. The knees are high. It looks good. It doesn't look like he's in fatigue, but I'm sure he's saving a little bit towards the end. Yeah, we always say it's always about the second half of the marathon, but you'd know about that too. So the, these chaps are going to be doing round about a 234, 235 marathon, maybe even quicker. But Mo, I know you go a lot faster than that, but you don't have to swim 3,800 meters and, and ride your bike for 180 kilometers beforehand. I mean, big respect, right? Yeah, no, I've got massive respect for these guys to swim, to run. And then again, to do that and carry on throughout three different sports is incredible. Um, I saw, I'm lucky enough to know a couple of friends from triathlon and other sports. And they put in a lot of work. They wake up early in the morning, they go swimming, they come back on a bike and they're in the evening runs or sometimes they are training three times a day. Yep, indeed, there are machines. Uh, Mo, just stay with us. We're just showing where, where Jan Fredino had a little sli a slip. There was a lot of water on the carpet through the turnaround at our finish line. And our volunteer, it's, it's Melly, our presenter, who's busy cleaning the carpet. Look at us. Multi-talented everybody. As we go back to Silverstone, back to the Formula 1 Grand Prix, uh, Mo Farrow, we won't keep you for too long because I think that sprint race is not far away. Um, you also use Zwift as part of your training, do you? not yeah for Just me as a, i've always been on the treadmill and now i'm like a big part of the uh, you know swift and, and you know to, i do enjoy running on treadmill even the other before i just got injured i actually did four mile tempos on the treadmill almost fast and race pace so for me treadmill i find it a lot easier there we go swift, you know you've got company you can join with your friends and it's about having a laugh you know you don't even need to be out from your, your house you can call somebody and say join I, I, well, I like to hear your regular theme that it's good to have a laugh. I know that uh, with the focus and dedication, the sacrifices needed to perform at your level, to perform at Jan Frodeno's level, at Lionel Saunders's level, you need to take and steal those moments to have a good laugh. I'm going to let you have fun at the Formula One Grand Prix at Silverstone. Thank you so much for your time. Mo well, Farah, enjoy tell your him weekend. Tell him, tell him good job if he does. Hopefully he will do. It looks good. Yeah, I will tell him exactly that. Hey, Jan Frodeno, Mo Farah says you're looking good. Into the transition zone. Here comes another chap looking good. It's the Colonel. It's Lionel Sanders. And he'll see this water splashing off the tires from the bicycle. He has been given a little word of warning. Melly, our presenter, did sweep away some of the water on the carpet gingerly through that left turn. Another left turn. There we go. Lionel Sanders, no mishap. How about that, Hela? Yeah, it looks really, really good. Of course, they told him they were slippery and they've, they've cleaned the carpet a little bit, but you can still see a lot of water coming up. Obviously, it's raining like crazy, or it has been. So he looks really, really good, really, really composed. The first 10K is in the book, uh, another 30K to go. So that is really, really great. He looks amazing. So good. Okay, lap two now for Lionel Sanders as well. We're 29 kilometers to go. Mo Farah himself. I mean, if Mo Farah says you're looking good, you're huh. looking good. That is probably the best compliment you can ever get like, I mean, as we a need, triathlete. We need to give Danny Unger a message to shout to Jan that Mo Farah says you're looking good. Actually, I'm going to get Ben to do that. But you know what? These athletes invest a huge amount just to get to the start line. 
the focus, the dedication, the, the time, the hours, the sacrifices, less red wine at dinner, you know, less time with friends and family. And so what we want to do is we want to hear about their expectations on this run course. Let's hear from Lionel and Jan. The marathon will definitely be the most uh, uh, interesting part for me because I checked out the course today. Uh, it's extremely flat. It's actually very favoring in terms of conditions. You know, there's some shade cover. Um, hopefully it won't be too windy on race day. But yeah, the, the aim would be to take out the first lap a little bit quicker, but only a little bit quicker than, uh, than the next three and then try and be consistent. You know, really is not all that exciting. There is uh, consistency is, is what makes endurance sports work. And nailing that consistency, especially on this kind of course, will be crucial. Uh, and then on the run, same, same idea, just, just listening to my body, uh, using heart rate again quite a bit. And uh, I mean, I'll probably won't allow myself to go out any faster through the halfway point than 117 or once. I know Jan's going to be going very fast. So I, you know, if I want to even have a remote contention, then I'm going to have to also go out decently fast, but within myself. So um, somewhere between 117 and 120 for the half. And once again, I sweat two to 2.5 liters an hour, even in these conditions. So I need to be consuming, if I did well on the bike, then I need to be consuming about 1.5 liters per hour while running at those paces, which can be difficult. Uh, but I have to, it's the only way that I can make it to the second half and still be racing. And so it'll take a lot of discipline. And that's what the big one for me is to just stay disciplined and then, and then give him a run for his money on that second half, actually race the second half. And what I've done in the past is blow up and walk the second half, which I do not want to do again. Hela, do you think, was, I'm always worried about the commentator's curse. You know, as commentators, we get excited and we, we give a scenario and then suddenly yeah. Jan slips or something goes wrong. And I, and I, in my mind, I'm thinking we wait for like 15 Ks to go, but yeah. do, we, do we hazard thinking about the world record? Because look at that. There I mean, is, yeah. There is no doubt about it that we can see that we are plenty on course for a world record for both of them. Um, but, but, uh, but don't you, that's amazing. For that is both absolutely of them? amazing. But you also need, you know, the athletes know it as well. They know they are racing well. But you cannot get too excited out there. You cannot carry yourself. You cannot get carried away to that finish line. You have to stay within the moment. If you get carried away, you are not doing everything right in the right moment and, and, and at the moment, right? So that's, I feel like, you know, I want to get further. You know, I want to take my brain to the finish line, but I'm stopping myself yes. because I'm in that athlete's head of like, no, you can't do it because things can happen, you know, and, and it, it can. And you need to adapt. Well, we saw to, it. We exactly, saw it happen on the carpet. Exactly. And we don't think that anything will happen, but we need to be open and we need to be adaptable. We need to, you know, always, you know, yeah, as I said, be adaptable to a plan B if stuff happens. I, I just want, I want the director, Thomas, to just leave that graphic there just a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of people like me who are slow with numbers, but that's a very pretty picture, what I'm seeing there right now. Yeah, 345 per kilometer, 350 ah. per kilometer. I mean, like 345, that's 16 kilometers an hour. That's pretty fast. Try and put your treadmill up on that and then just keep running. Um, and then makes it, make it look this easy, the same as 350 pace. I mean, make it look easy. Um, they, are, they are really running efficiently. Um, if you're seeing uh, Jan as well, we've had a lot of um, shots, obviously, of both of them, but also like his running economy, the way he runs um, so relaxed, the way he runs so s straight and so strong in his glutes, staying relaxed in his upper body. He's not wasting any energy at all. And as I talked about, it's all about running in this straight line, right? And do not rock from side to side. And they are definitely not doing that. And that is just, uh, oh, this is just a uh, beautiful um, running. Um, beautiful, that's yeah. a good way to put it. It is, it's, uh, it's lovely to see. <laughs> and, and I think like here, where we're talking about treadmill running and Mofero was talking about treadmill running. There is so much good things to say about treadmill running. There, there are a lot of people who are against the treadmill uh, running, oh, but yeah. you know, if, if you're slightly injured, which I am, I've got a torn meniscus, 
only place I run comfortably is on the treadmill. So I give it a bit of a like a four percent gradient okay. plus the spring of the mm -hmm. treadmill. And I can actually run, whereas on the road, I struggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's definitely way more forgiving, and you can tolerate way more volume, and you recover faster from a treadmill run. And it also, if you have a mirror in front of the treadmill run, it's Check nothing... Your form. Yeah, and it's not about seeing yourself as per se, seeing yourself, well, how do I look? Uh, <laughs> no, it's nothing to do with that. This is to do with form, and it really informs you, okay, if I'm one hour into this run session, and I can see that my left shoulder is starting to go up to my ear, and this is kind of a compensation pattern, or this is something that I usually do, you can work on getting that left Good shoulder one. down so that it doesn't implant further down into your body and you're creating this comp compensation pattern. So therefore, treadmill running is amazing and they use it, both of them use it a lot. I would say the more mileage you do on the run, the more treadmill running you can incorporate and a, and a champion like Miranda Carfrey, yes. she's running over half of her runs so or 50% of her running on the treadmill and she is one of the fastest runners on a marathon uh, in Ironman. Well, that gap is staying pretty constant between your leader at the moment, Jan Frodeno, and Lionel Saunders. And I'm going to whisper this, both who are predicted to go under the world record time. Yeah, I actually have said it before when you were out for a little break. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I'm human, I take breaks. Um, I, I want to see some more of those messages on, on the LED clock on top of the car, please. Come on, some more hashtags, try battle. Let's get more of your messages out there as Jan just takes another little look at the watch. Frodissimo blood, sweat and tears for the world record. Well, thank goodness there was no blood uh, and there were no tears that we know, but there's a lot of sweat. You can't see the tears underneath the glasses, you know. It doesn't matter if there are tears, he would keep pushing on. But as you can see, it hasn't changed his running form whatsoever. He's no, he still, looks amazing. He's still running so solidly. Look at those hips. And just the feet, look look how beautifully he's landing. And then also, like, I'm just looking at the hips, how they are not moving. Hips don't lie. <laughs> hips don't <laughs> lie. And this is the power, you know, that is the power center, the core of this, his running style. You know, you need to have so, so strong glutes. Um, your gluteus muscle needs to be so strong to run well, um, and obviously the whole body. But but the glutes is something that we can easily get weak in, and we can easily be weaker in one side than another. So something that you need to train a lot. A lot of lunges? Um, yeah, a lot of lunges, a lot of squats, a lot of one-legged lunges. Look yourself in the mirror. Make sure you don't drop that hip, hip, hip one, one to one side. Um, hip strength or hip and gluteus strength is important for biking and running, so important. And a man who's been doing all his homework is Jan Frodeno leading, done all his homework as well. One of his first trips ever to the Algoi, first time in Germany, it is Canada's Lionel Saunders, who's keeping that gap very even, round about the 11 minute gap. Both of them under world record pace. It's now boils down to how much under world record pace. Running at about 3.45 is Jan Frodeno, 3.50s for Lionel Saunders. And uh, Jan just going through the far part of the course turnaround and he's halfway through lap two on his way back to Burgberg where Race Central is of our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Please, more of those tweets, more of those messages, hashtag Tri Battle Royale on Insta, on Twitter, wherever we can monitor you. We want to put it up on the car. We want to get your messages out there. And uh, we'd love to hear some of your questions. You can send any questions to Hella and myself. Hella will answer them. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Hashtag try battle. Send us your questions as we watch two masters at work. The two kings, Jan Frodeno, Lionel Saunders in the Algoi. Beautiful southern Germany as we get them both on screen. And here again, you can see we've kind of like a two of the different weather patterns uh, on the course at the moment. But I think it's because the long shot of Lionel, mm -hmm. We're not really seeing the the, the rain on the lens compared to the tracking I, shot with Jan. I think what is interesting here is there's two completely different running styles. There are two people that is running. It's not far from, you know, the pace is not too different between the two of them, like five seconds per kilometer is different. So it's not a lot. And it might be looking like uh, Jan is running way faster than Lionel, but he it's is five not. five seconds. Exactly five seconds per, per kilometer. So that is really nothing. It just shows that there is no perfect running form. It's about running efficiency. It's about the motor. It's about, yeah how well you can run with your running style. Um, and I think like uh, Lionel is definitely proving that you can run super, super fast uh, with a less picture perfect style. Yet he's super efficient. You can see by his heart rate and by his energy expenditure, he's already running considerably better than he ran three weeks ago in Coeur d'Alene. And if in a strange way, and I'm gonna be selfish here, 
In a strange way, the fact that he walked a four-hour marathon in Coeur d'Alene meant less impact on his body, much quicker recovery, a much better battle for us to watch today. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I also thought the same, that he even said that he, re he had a very, very easy bike. He said 275 average power on the bike and 110 average heart rate on the bike in Coeur d'Alene for the 180 kilometers um, and then he walked uh, most of the marathon. So I mean like uh, it was just a, a long training day for him. Uh, more, not Very more, long yeah. by his standards. <laughs> but you know, and there's a lot of people and his manager Patrick was saying you know so much respect and love that, that, that he still honored the race and finished it. Yeah, I think that many professionals, they, they honor Young each did other. Young did that in Exactly. Um, yeah, they are just respectful for the organizer. They're respectful for each other. And, and it's very, very often that they will finish the race um, just to, to show that respect. And in no other sport do competitors support each other than the way they do here in triathlon. Great sports at the Tri Battle Royale. What an awesome race. Great to see two triathlon legends battling as great sportsmen. Indeed, as we bring you more of those messages, thank you for sharing your messages. No matter where you are in the world, live on TV around the world, live online on tribattle.com as we pan across the beautiful green pastures. Where are the cows? We can see both. How about that? We can see both parts of the course. As we see Jan in one direction, Lionel in the other. Look at that. For your ihre Gesundheit da, ein Leben lang. For your health, one lifetime. One lifetime long. I think I got that right. Superb. So great that we can actually bring you pictures of both athletes at the same time. We're bringing you the data of their speeds on the course at the moment. I think um, Lionel might have gone just through a little turn or something there. Suddenly the speed dropped. But it's also they, they're carrying tracking devices on them, mm -hmm. which were handed to them in T2 and uh, relief relief to see Jan running strong we want them both running strong we want it to be a battle without external factors yeah absolutely i will say like the running speed is probably slightly off there i if it's a 345 average pace that they have been holding for the first uh, 10 kilometers that is 16 kilometers average um, so but it's again you know it's dropping in and out with the, with the pace so um, we just know that they are on course for a super fast time so just to remind you, we started at 9 o'clock this morning in what is called the Grossa Alpsee, the large Alp lake, Alpine lake. We're in beautiful southern Germany, in Bavaria, Bayern, in the Allgäu region, Liechtenstein, Switzerland and Austria, very, very close to our borders. As a matter of fact, when we did the press conference on Friday up on top of the Fellhorn mountain, uh, at 2,000 meters above sea level, the phone said, Willkommen in Österreich, welcome to Austria. That's how close we are to our neighbors at the beautiful Algoy region hosting the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Jan Frodeno, a phenomenal swim in the lake. Lionel Sanders, his best swim ever in the lake. Both of them smashing their personal bests on the bike with Jan going 3.55 and Lionel going 4 hours and 27 seconds. They're on the marathon course. It is four laps. Jan is on his way back to us as he passes Lionel Sanders. Lionel shouts words of encouragement. Exactly. I love it. It's this sportsmanship highest level, at highest, the highest level. And, and Jan gets to read the messages on the board as well. <laughs> because they get to, they, now that they're running, they can actually read the messages, yeah, right? Yeah. So funny. I love it. Yeah, you definitely need the encouragement on the run. This is when it's starting to get hard. Of course, it's been hard all day, but this is when it's starting to really, you know, you have the last, um, yeah, what is it, like a, not even a couple of hours left racing. Um, but it's it's now when you need, really need to focus in and, and um, yeah, stay strong. But you can see how efficiently he's, efficiently he's running. I was just looking from behind just before, like, um, well, he is uh, he's just pulling a little bit in his pants. Uh, no, uh, Squirting some water on, on, on the quads there? Where was he? Yeah, doing? it is still his left hip he's, he was fiddling with, but it could also just be the pants just not sitting well. He might have a little rash, a little road rash. A little bit of road rash, a yeah, yeah. carpet burn, yeah. Probably, he, I, would, I would imagine that he has that. And it's obviously not nice with the friction of his suit on top of that, but it is what it is. It's a little painful, um, but as long as it hasn't done anything to his hip, then it doesn't really matter that he has some road grass in there. So whilst the world of triathlon and endurance sports focuses at the moment here on the Algoy, 
A lot of the world this evening will be focusing on Paris, but we're going to be talking to Zach Paris. Zach Paris is joining us. He's at Hoka. Jan's in his Hoka's flying on the course at the moment. Zach, your feelings, your thoughts on an epic day so far. Welcome. Good morning. Well, evening for y'all. Um, it's did I hear you correctly say is sub four hours on that uh, bike course? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Jan, Jan did a 45 swim. He did a 355 bike. Lionel did a 51 swim and a four hour bike. And they, they're running, Jan's running 345s and uh, Lionel's running 350s at the moment. We've got 25K to go. That is smashing. That's just, that's crazy to think about. Uh, I, I grew up doing some triathlon as well. So to see, uh, guys like Jan Fredino, Olympic gold medalists, really stepping up and crushing the long course racing like this has been phenomenal to see. Um, and it's just crazy seeing the pictures and hearing those kind of times. Crazy indeed. I don't know how much you've been able to watch, Zach, and just going to give you a bit of an upgrade, update. Uh, uh, as Jan was finishing the first lap and came through the finish line where they're lapping, uh, the carpet was very wet due to some crazy rains we've had, and he slipped quite badly. We're just showing a replay. I'm not sure you can see it. And slipped badly and fell hard on his left Ooh. hip. Keep in mind, he's running like 15, 16K an hour, and he weighs 75 kilos. So at first, it looked like he was in a world of pain. He could barely move, and we were super worried about him. But then uh, once he went out of sight, he was back up to like 16K an hour, 345s. But we have heard from the course that he is grabbing that left hip quite often, but the pace is still up there, 345s. His stride still looks super efficient. That's one of the things about Jan, right? He's got that longer legs, but still like a fairly efficient and intermediate stride. It's not the track racers that you have like legs for days out the back. Uh, well, so I can tell you that, that Mo Farah said he was looking really good too. So there was good words yeah. of, of encouragement we had for Jan then. And we kind of got the, the whole world, we got them to just take a big breath and, and send their, their energy of, 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 you know, hope and positivity to Tian that he can keep going. Let's just talk a little bit about Jan Fredeno and Hoka and the partnership. Yeah, we've been so blessed to have him on our team. Um, he is one of those incredible athletes that just seems to be able to pull amazing races week in and week out. Um, and he's been doing that for a long time now. Um, and we're so blessed to have him on our team and testing out some of our newest shoes. Um, and I think he's been racing in and loving the Rocket X's for the past couple seasons now. And that's our super lightweight carbon fiber plated shoe uh, that just gives you a little extra snap and roll towards the toe off uh, and plenty of cushion to go these crazy, crazy distances, um, like Jan is crushing today on the Ironman distance. Yeah, he's crushing indeed. And I can just share with you one of the messages that the fans sent, keep pushing your legends. And another message said, and that's the beautiful thing about this sport is there's so much mutual respect. It said, there will be two winners today. How about that? I agree with that. Both Lionel Sanders and Jan Fredena putting on a show in the tri battle. Let's smash this record, guys. Awesome performance. Loving the coverage. Thank you for that. Uh, Zach, we're going to talk a bit more to you. If I'm not mistaken, Hoka started in France as a trail running shoe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first samples um, were actually just large, large EVA slabs that um, our founders, Jean-Luc and Nico, uh, were literally shaping by hand uh, and testing in honesty France, so in the mountains of the Alps. And, you know, going out the back door, if they didn't quite like something the way uh, it ran down the mountain, they would come back in, tweak it, and go back out and, you know, figure out how to retest and redefine it. And here you've got a three-time world champion, Olympic gold medalist, uh, world record holder, busy testing your shoes for you as well in real life and showing the world, you know, how fast you can run in them. How about that? It's crazy. Yeah, it's amazing to see Hoko come all the way down from the top of the mountain to the fastest roads. Um, from the so top of the mountain, sports. but lifting our athletes to the highest pinnacles of performance as well. Zach, we're going to have to thank you so much for joining us. Um, really great to have you on board and, and uh, for your support of Jan and, and of this tri battle. And, and let's hope that Jan's hip is good and he's going to just create a time that will stand forever. Fingers crossed. Thanks so much for having me.
Thank you very much, Zach Paris, joining us from Hoka. That was absolutely awesome. Really appreciate your support. And as we were talking to Zach Paris there, there's Lionel Sanders going through the Hoka arches. Jan is still pushing hard. Jan's speed is still looking good. 16 and a half, 17 kilometers an hour. And uh, it's great that we've got more of your messages on those boards. We are start at 9 o'clock this morning. We are approaching 3 p.m. in the afternoon here in uh, southern Germany. And both our legends, both our kings are on the run course. Swim, tick, bike, a very big tick. And I think that run's going to be a massive tick as well. And, and Helle, I love that, that, that message we saw. There are two winners today. Absolutely. I think they're both, like just if you said that again, it gives yep. me goosebumps. It's like I think they're both doing an amazing job. And uh, yeah, well, I think we are... We shouldn't say it, but we are saying it right now that we, they're both on for getting under the, the old world record. Um, so, so that is really, really exciting to see, and they're both looking amazing. Yeah. And, you know, some people were saying, and I saw the criticisms up front, oh, it won't be a real battle, they won't be side to side. They don't need to be side to side to battle. No. Because they, they're, they're battling each other, they're battling their own demons, and they're chasing a world record mark. And you don't need to win to make the world record mark. You can come second and still set the world record mark. And it's been an incredible day that started in the lake. And it's going to be a day that's going to finish here in beautiful Burgberg. What a start it was. A cloudy, moody morning setting the tone for our two kings to duke it out, swim, bike and run. An innovative swim course, no sharp turns, no sighting of the big boys, actually managed to put a line rope one meter below the water surface for these two rock stars to just keep their head down and go for the swim of their lives. Quickly, Ian Fredino, managed to establish a decent gap and never looked back. A brilliant swim, 45 and a bit, as he exited the water and textbook stuff ripping off the wetsuit, going to his bike. A little moment there as the adrenaline kicked in. Back on with the visor, on with the helmet, and uh, Jan Frodeno taking to the bike course with the five laps of 180 kilometers. Everything pretty much going according to script at the early stages, other than the weather. A phenomenal swim from Canada's Lionel Saunders, who's been improving in leaps and bounds in the water. And to his happy place, onto his brand new bike that he got this week. Yep, Christmas in July for the Colonel. Jan Frodeno leading the way onto that bike course. Flat, fast, not much elevation. Lots of innovation on the bike as well with the moving nutrition with the messages on the board as well, as well as our very innovative turn, the canyon turn, which we'll show you shortly. Thanks to the nature of the course, they would see each other several times on every single lap. Lionel Frodero, Lionel Sanders, <laughs> after Jan Frodero, onto the big canyon turn, right up at the top of the bank, out of the saddle a couple of times, just to change the muscle groups to stretch out the back, and making sure we kept things safe by keeping the turn dry. A little bit more conservative in the later parts of the bike course through the turn, also using it as time to just recover a little bit and rest those legs briefly. Both of them steady in the bars, arrow all the time, dropping massive watt bombs, 300 plus, handing the bike over to the volunteers into T2 at our race central in Borgberg. The finish T2 and lapping on the run. Jan Frodeno with a 3.55 bike, incredible. Onto the run for Jan Frodeno as Lionel made his way to T2. Four hours and 27 seconds for the Canadian superstar. Onto the run course as well, 3.45s for Jan Frodeno, 3.50s, but then through the finish line. End of lap one, a terrible slip on a very, very wet carpet onto that left hip. Everybody was so worried. It's not what you want to see. We had our hearts in our mouths. But he got up again. And Jan Fredino was very quickly back at 3.45 pace. Still in front, still in lead, still well ahead of world record pace is the king. And as one of the tweets said, today there will be two winners. 
Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders. All that remains to be known now is what will the clock say? Yeah, we still don't know. <laughs> we that's, don't. that's why we are hanging on <laughs> and we have, yeah, half of the marathon um, to, to go now. We are halfway on the run. We are actually going into So this into is where the, the race starts. Exactly. We're going into the second half of the marathon, the back end of the marathon. That's where the race is really happening. Um, so this is exciting. And you can also see um, Jan's heart rate now is, is also going a little bit more up, which is, again, acceptable and expected. Um, but still, both of them looking great. And I'm so, so happy to see that Lionel is still looking amazing. Yep. and that he is still battling it out out there and he's still running as fast as he has done um, all the way through. So there is no, um, you know, pacing mistakes or any nutritional, nutritional mistakes right now as, as we can see and he's still moving really nicely which is amazing and he's also still on course to get under the old world record. Oh yeah, as you're right, he, he's looking good and he's moving very, very well. The chest just a little bit forward, the hips are good. The leg turnover is great. His feet look good. Landing to the roll through to the toe off. Shoulders are relaxed. Jan Prodeno has got the glasses on. You can't see what the eyes are saying behind the glasses. Nope. But the stats are saying that this man is still on fire. Yeah, he's he's definitely working, um, but he still looks super relaxed. And his 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 arm movement, you know, is, is propelling him nicely forward. And he has this slight forward um, posture of his upper body. Um, as also as also is, is perfect and then he's landing straight underneath his center of gravity and that's what we want so he's still looking really good and i pray that there is nothing wrong with his hip oh, um, it doesn't look like it but as we are hearing he is touching the hip a little bit uh, we hope it's only a bit of rash uh, but of course they those those guys they they can tolerate so much pain and they they will yeah they will keep pushing on unless this is really 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 bad 21k to go, he's on his way to the turnaround, a transition. We've been racing for six hours, two minutes, 38 seconds. And for a lot of people, they're not even off the bike yet. You know, we're talking that the hobby athletes, the age groupers, no. as the crowd start to go crazy soon, Jan's in the stadium, but for a lot of people, they're not even off the bike yet. No, 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 <laughs> many people, most people. Well, let's bring him through. The crowds are ready, the fans are ready, our crews are ready. And Jan Frodeno comes past this big sports hall where we've got more than 100 media assembled who've been following the action. I can hear Daniel Unger's voice, more urgency as his tone rises. And uh, Jan Frodeno will be coming from our right to our left and going through the turn. And I guarantee you it'll be a gentle turn Absolutely. for Jan Frodeno. Listen to this. We're going to keep quiet. Two laps to go. There we go. Nothing wrong with a bit of caution. He grabs the rail. Safe through the turns. Come on, Jan. Oh, it's amazing with the crowd to see how everybody's just gathering and then standing along the, yeah, the run course and just cheering him on. It gives so much energy for Jan uh, to have that support. Um, people, it's, it's actually going crazy. Um, I would love that, that you, you viewers could see what's actually going yeah. on in front of us. Yeah, exactly. Another bit of drone shots for you as we look at Jan from above. And that's not a bad shot because sometimes you want to look at the shoulders. But how much is he rocking? And I think he's still, I mean, we, 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 we've done a 3,800 meter swim, 180K bike, half marathon, and he's looking solid. Yeah, everything is still going to plan and then he's still looking amazing. They both are. Um, so there won't be long before we're going to have Lionel in here as well. Look at the and crowds. Then, yeah, I think it's amazing that you see the, the, the village is really supporting them out there on the course and, and carrying them through and giving them energy. It's not only in here on the stadium, it's actually covering the whole run course. It's, um, it's really amazing for the runners or for the athletes. Just briefly, Hela, we have a lot of, you know, families of triathletes watching, you know, and, and they're the supporters at the race. And uh, we always when I'm announcing races, I always get this, I want to get the spectators involved because I always say that the spectators are um, uh, legal EPO for the, for the athletes. Just that the wonderful injection of energy as we show you the stats again, how we're looking, we're still looking flipping fantastic. 
Yes, they're still keeping the same pace, and Lionel is actually even a second faster yeah. than he was when we got the last um, data in. It's I'm really, really happy to see that. Um, they're running so great, and they're way ahead, both of them, of the world record. Can we start getting... Look at you, you can't even sit still. Can <laughs> we start getting excited? Yeah, no, we can't get excited. Yeah, we can okay. be excited, but we still need to be, you know, keeping calm. You guys at home can get excited. Helen and I, we just got to stay calm. Yeah. We've got a job to do here. But I was just talking about how important the spectators are. So everybody sitting at home, you know, when you're at a race and you, you, you're encouraging the athletes, you as the athlete, you don't often show it, but that, that support from the spectators yeah. is massive. Yeah. There is no doubt about it. Like, it's giving you so much energy. And I think with, when you're still deep into the run course, you're still keeping yourself so calm and so focused. And you're not allowing yourself to get too emotional. And, and yes, the spectators will lift you, but you won't get emotional over it. Whereas when you're getting into the last bit of the, the race, and you know you're coming in for a good race and you've been racing really really well and then you have the spectators you're starting to get eye contact maybe with some of your closest friends or family and and some huge fans and you're actually starting to get super emotional yes. yourself and you're also letting yourself get emotional and whether you we will see that later i believe <laughs> but whether you're gonna scream or cry or what are you gonna do but you're so high there is nothing better Okay, now I've taken us to the finish line. <laughs> but there is absolutely nothing better than, than when, when you let yourself. What sport can do to your emotions is insane. I like to call the finish line, and you know, we've got the carpet that unfortunately Jan slipped on, but, but he's good and he's going. I like to call it the magic carpet. Yeah. Because I, I see this day in and day out. Grimace become a smile, pain turn into pleasure. Yeah, but uh, I mean, that finish line, I mean, that is not just the finish line. Well, we should probably talk about what we're seeing right now here what on the screen. This is insane what we're seeing. Projected time of a 7.21.50. That's a, a like. A, am I getting this right? Um, yeah, you are getting this right. So, so, so we're looking at, we're not looking at sub 7.30. And by the way, Lionel, when he started training for this, he put up a poster. Um, in his pain cave that said 72930. You know, yeah. we're not talking, looking at sub 730. This, I don't think people understand how massive that differential is 735 to 721. It's, That's insane. it's worlds apart. It is worlds apart. And, uh, and Lionel's former personal best is uh, 744. In uh, done in Arizona, um, Tempe, Arizona, and Arizona, which says it's a perfect course for him, and and actually also says that this course reminds him a little bit of yes. that, especially the bike course, whereas this just has a better asphalt, better surface, and less rolling resistance. So, I think uh, he feels home on this course, and right now he's definitely showing that um, with an impressive performance so far. But what we were just talking about this finish line just before, and, and as you say, it's a magic carpet and all these things. And it's just not that race. It's just it's not just what you're going yeah. that's going through your mind. It's not just what you've just done. Just what you've just done. It is everything that leads up to it. You can have been through a lot of struggles on your way. You have had injuries. You have had. Well, he had maybe, a sprained ankle. Exactly. He he had a sprained ankle. He got that six weeks ago, and and you know he's as I spoke with his coach about Dan Long. He's done what's necessary. He's fit and he's ready. But we haven't done more than what's necessary. And we would probably have liked to have done more, a little bit more, a little bit. We always want to do more. Yes. He's done what's necessary. But that's and, actually part of the problem with triathletes. Yeah. Yeah doing more yeah it, it's about staying within that limit you know and and not tipping tipping over um the edge and it's that fine line because those guys are training 35 hours a week um a week and it it is a lot of exercise on your body and it requires a lot of time to recover and body maintenance as well and and a little bit more is not necessary better mm -hmm. and sometimes it's better to get to the start line 100 percent healthy and 90 percent fit then 100% fit and... Not healthy. Not healthy. Because we've spoken about the power of the mind a lot today. And that 100% that healthy, 90% fit, the mind will compensate for that 10%. Yeah, and, and when, you have, when you're racing this well and when you have the setup and the spectators like they have today, 
they will always they will help you and it will carry you along and you're feeding on that energy and you're also feeding on your own performance so far that so far you've actually raced to the plan maybe even better than you could expect or that you even dared hoping for yeah and that's giving you a lot of energy let's not race to the finish line but i'm going to put you on the spot when can Jan start thinking about okay i've ticked the boxes i've executed but the plan I don't want to go there before 5K before the... Okay, we won't go there, okay? I retract that. Yep, 36. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, like, f 5Ks, I think. 5Ks, then you have it. I'm sure he can keep it together. But I, we need to get over at least 32 kilometers. Yep. That's I know the that, wall, isn't it? Yeah, but I don't know about a wall. I, I think a wall in, in only marathon running is maybe more legit than in, in Ironman racing. I think you can hit the wall any time. Well, not any time. But, I mean, like, it's all about nutrition as we talk about and those nutrition problems can happen on the run anytime yep, really agreed we're not getting the sun today i don't think so you know what i've been hoping for the sun because i i, I know that sunshine somehow it it, it it brings a smile to the face yeah. right it, it lifts the spirits i think on the run we don't need any sun this is these temperatures are good yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we, they we, don't we need the sun at all. And and as it looks by here, the spectators don't need it either. They are already drinking beers. Oh yeah. So uh, hey, we, we we're in Germany. We we we're we're in Bavaria. We're, we're around the corner from the oldest family-owned brewery in the world. Yeah, that's you know? true. Uh, and and Hela, I think maybe a little bit later. I'm not going to worry about the think about the finish line, but I'm thinking beer already. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't go there yet. Okay, no, not yet, not yet. I'm. Just wondering if I've seen one or two grimaces on Lionel, on uh, Jan's face recently. Yeah. The facial expression is changing. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. He's concentrating now. He um, he's really really need to to uh, take every kilometer um, and thinking. You know, for when when you're starting to suffer like he is probably suffering a little bit, you again need to to channel in your mind a lot to become very tunnel visioned and really just focus on usually when it's very painful and you feel uncomfortable a good thing to focus about uh, on is your form you know what can you control okay i need to run tall i need to stay contracted in my core i need to land underneath my center of gravity underneath myself relax in the shoulder don't waste any energy remember your nutrition and just calm relax stay relaxed and stay within yourself just remind yourself about all these things when you are suffering and when the body is screaming, oh, can you slow down? Like, oh, it would be so nice. Can you see that bench that's just around the corner? We could just sit for like a minute and relax. <laughs> no, 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 no. Just stay there. Stay there and think about your form and then don't think about the pain. Just get that away. But that's also what you're training. You're training the body that when it fatigues, it maintains form. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't want to lose form. So that's how it's, we're training, you know, you, we do run sessions tired. So if we're doing like a long run session, um, we would do like a session within a session. And what I mean by that is that if we say we're doing 90 minute sessions or one and a half hour session, you would then maybe run 45 minutes before you do your main session of this session so that you would already be a little bit pre-fatigued before you do the main session and that is to train to stay strong when you are fatigued and hold form when you are fatigued Lionel was saying form and fuel that is his mantra for the Zwift Tri Battle Royale he comes into our race central our finish line and run course and T2 and we're going to let him come through and as soon as he's gone through we've got a message of good luck from two of our Formula E drivers Stoffel van, van Doorn and Nick de Vries but we're first going to watch first going to watch first going to watch Lionel come through our lap completing lap number starting lap number three am I right yes yep, yes there we go always said I was terrible with numbers the crowds are going crazy we're going to hear those those kettlebells clapping their hands. Lionel Sanders still floating across the carpet, looking good. His body language hasn't changed in uh, 22 kilometers. Easy around the corner. Come on, Lionel. Joining us from Canada, having made the flight across, living in Arizona at the moment. Things a little bit cooler here in the Algoy, but running strong is Lionel Sanders as he leaves the stadium close up he's got that trademark moustache and headband and he leaves half a marathon left for Lionel he Sanders looked, he looked really good he I would think, have looked I very good I think he good. saw me <laughs> I think he saw me cheering 
He's looking very good. And uh, I think, if anything, he can only get faster because he's holding back on purpose yep. to save for those last sort of 15 Ks. Yeah, and that was also what he said. He want to hold himself back the first half marathon so that he can really race the back half. And uh, right now he's executing to plan. And uh, I know that his coaches um, are happy. And I know that Patrick is very proud of him as well. We spoke with Patrick yep. earlier, his manager, very proud of what he's seeing. And um, we are too. And we know that Jan still needs to keep pushing because, um, you know, Lionel is having an amazing race. All righty, we've got another guest, a very, 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 very important yeah. guest, somebody you've got massive respect for. He's in the car at the moment, on his way to the Champs-Élysées for the Tour de France. The one and okay. only, the coach of Thank Jan you. Fredino, Dan Lorang. Thank you for making some time to speak to Dan Lorang. Dan, can you hear us? I hear you, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for for, for, for for taking a little bit of a break from the, the Tour de France. We've got your 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 incredible athlete Jan Frodeno who's absolutely smashing it out there. Yeah, I'm, uh, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, I'm yeah here at the Tour de France. That's why it's a little bit hard for me to follow, and uh, I would be I would like to be there and to see what's happening there. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, yeah. We are here with the team and um, yeah, I, I cannot split myself, but I try to be informed as good as possible and get messages from, from friends there and I think it looks good at the moment. What all have you heard, Dan? Because we can give you a quick update if you want. No, I, I got the, the split times, I saw um, his strong bike performance and then I also saw the crash on during the run, so that he slipped away during the run. And then uh, I immediately contact um, Felix just to know if Jan is okay, if he's uh, healthy and if he can continue. And he confirmed me that it looks okay for the moment. And uh, yeah, now I see also the picture. And um, yeah. but so these are the information that I have, the times and also um, that he had the, the crash during the run or the yeah, he's still looking really, really good, Dan. I really, you can be very proud of his performance. He's <laughs> definitely executing, and I think like he is executing maybe better than the the plan that you made. I'm not too sure. Is he following the plan that uh, the mastermind has made? Yeah. So uh, I think uh, on the bike uh, with this time, what I saw, I, it's always hard to say because you don't have the wind conditions. But uh, I think he was really at the upper limit that what we talked about. What is really great and uh, i'm already excited to see what the fire will be and uh, in the run uh, for sure if he's um, on the pace that i saw he's a little bit uh, uh, faster than we expected mm -hmm. um, also because of the injury what he had in the, in the during the past few weeks or months so that's why yeah I, i'm not surprised i'm happy and i, I know that jan can do something exceptional um and that's yeah because he's just an incredible athlete and um, that's what he always shows over the years that he can, when he has everything is healthy, when he has this motivation, when, yeah, when, he, when there is the big challenge ahead that he can bring something on the course that you perhaps don't see in training. Um, but I also want on the other side be, uh, yeah, be careful because he's not at the finish line yet. No, but until now it looks like a really, really amazing performance. And also I've, what I saw from Lionel, it seems to be a yeah, a tremendous performance at the moment. Yeah, they're both racing really, really fast. If it's if it's through their, the paces that they're holding now, we just got some stats up that it's a 7.21 finish for <laughs> Jan, and it's a 7.31 <laughs> for Lionel. I mean, this is absolutely out of this world in these conditions. So, of course, there's still 16 kilometers to go. And as as you, we are also kind of trying to just uh, let's not get carried away. And um, but so far, they're both looking amazing. So um, I think like um, right now, he didn't harm himself too bad. Um, so we're happy. Okay. <laughs> yeah, great. Uh, so I already get some goosebumps here when I listen to this, to the possible finishing time. But uh, yeah, to be honest, I'm I'm really happy that he can run and that he can perform on that level. Uh, he had some good training sessions the past weeks and months, but we also had some downs. So that's why yeah, I would, would be already be happy just if there would be a good fight and a good competition and a show for the audience. Yeah. But if we are now in this time, uh, 
times yeah. I wow it's, it's, uh, it's really crazy to hear it's insane and what you said like you have just done what's necessary on the run and I mean right now it seems like that was the perfect plan of not pushing it too much and then you know not trying to reinvent the wheel but just do what's necessary when you had that little bump on the road with that li with the ankle that he sprained on on a training run so it seems like uh, yeah it's, it's it's perfect what we're seeing right now it looks like it's beyond perfect <laughs> dan i know you've you you you've, you've got to make your way around the champs elysees uh, you know your your man jan is phenomenal. He's doing an incredible job. I saw your face when we said 721. That's all I needed to see. <laughs> Let's hope it stays like that. Dan, keep your phone close by. And uh, yeah, what a race. What an athlete. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you too. And, and yeah, uh, fingers crossed that the show continues. And uh, yeah, perhaps speaking later again. Thank you. We hope so. Well, there we go, Dan Bye. Lorang. Thank you very much. We've got a two legends two winners in today's race. We've got a message from Girona on the LED wall, but it's too far for me to see. Hell, I doubt that even you can see that, even though you're much younger than me. But uh, thank you for your messages that keep coming. Keep them coming. We've got another 16K to go. We got another hour to go if we are uh, only on, an hour uh, on track for the time that was predicted like 15 minutes ago. So, yeah, let's see if uh, when they get back in after 30 kilometers, um, then we maybe can get excited. Not yet. We, <laughs> we are excited, but we can't get carried away. I think we just still need to, you know, be calm. And, and I love the, you know, how humble Ben is as well to kind of just, you know, but he got excited when I said 721. <laughs> So we're looking at the, the graphics again, you know, after almost 25 kilometers into the run. Remember, they've done the swim, they've done the bike, it's been a massive day. We're still running, I mean, it was 345s, now it's 330s, 347s, that's, there's nothing in that. And, and um, running, getting a little bit faster even, looks like Sanders, he's, he's picking up the pace a tiny bit. Yeah, Sanders is really running well, he's really pacing well, he is racing very, very clever. And yeah, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing to see. I mean, I'm just so happy that he's still pushing and he's going to get a good race. And I don't know how I'm going to be when they pass this finish line. You know what? You're going to be you and that's all that matters. <laughs> we just got to be us. They're being them. They're doing what they do. Our two kings proving to the world that the, the title we gave them of being kings is appropriate. What an incredible race. Great athlete, but even better person. Go Jan from Girona. Thank you to the Girona clan. Uh, I wonder if that was Emma. <laughs> I doubt it. Gosh, this is amazing. We, we be us, they be them. Uh, by the way, we, we've still got um, a, a special message of good luck from our Mercedes EQ Formula E team. They're currently racing in Monza, so they couldn't do it live. So let's hear from Stoffel van Doorn and Nick de Vries their messages. Hi there from Monza. Unfortunately, we couldn't make uh, the event live due to our schedules, but um, we cannot wait to see how everything will look uh, following the event. So from our side, we didn't want to miss the opportunity to uh, send our best wishes and uh, good luck here from Italy. So as it didn't quite work out to meet each other in person, we'd like to invite Jan to the final round of the Formula E season in Berlin. And that is at the same time as a virtual Mercedes EQ run will come to an end. So let's see if Jan will come out on top of the 90 minute challenge. So from our side, we'll keep pushing hard, keep training hard, and it would be awesome to see you in August. Thank you to the two of you for your messages. And I tell you something, you have no idea how well it's going, but we wanted to keep going well. We've been racing almost six and a half hours. Jan is now halfway through his third lap. When he gets us here, it's one lap. 10.2 kilometers between him and the finish line getting under the clock will that clock say 721 well anything under 735 is a win anything under 730 is incredible it's not human and uh, we sense that we'll be going under 730 here in the Algoy for our Zwift Tri Battle Royale Sometimes in the lead up to an event, you think we're over hyping things when you call it a tri battle royale, but you see this now. It's a battle royale indeed. Tilshank, you got a front row seat of Jan Frodeno. You get to see Lionel as he comes past. You see all the crowds lining the road. We are witnessing a phenomenal day of swim, bike, and run.
Yeah, we're out on the course. Uh, Jan just made the turnaround point again, so it's 15 kilometers to go. And Paul, I heard you in the live stream talking about the times, the predicted time, 7.21. So when he set his last record, at this point of the run course, he was going towards a 7.28. So about seven minutes slower at this point of the run course than he is right now. So even estimating he might slow down a little bit on the run course, he is very well on pace for a superb time here for a new world record time for a sub 730 but we just had the opportunity to talk to him a little bit and um, you know he's always a professional out on the course but he really hesitated to answer the question how his hip was feeling after the crash and then he was honest about it and it's like he's not happy with the hip he's feeling it out there on the run course the legs are even worse so it's all head from here and out for the next 15 kilometers but he is pushing on he's fighting but uh, if you look in the face he is in a world of pain right now yeah, that's not really we, what we wanted to hear, but that just tells you so much about the, the, the character of the man, the caliber of the man. Frodo, you know, looking like a projected 724 now, slowing down just slightly, but likewise Sanders looking at a 734, both of them, you know, just doing so incredibly, incredibly well. So these yeah, 241 run for Frodo. So that run time has uh, dropped quite a bit below what we expected. But this is a man who took a, a nasty little fall at the end of lap one. But the character, the grit, that mental strength. And I've heard Lionel talk about the mental strength before. But the mental strength of Jan Frodeno is incredible. And that's something that Lionel has tipped his hat at to Jan Frodeno. These two gritting it out, 15 kilometers to go. And hopefully shortly we can hear from Elud Palpal, who is uh, following Lionel Sanders around the course. Is Elud ready? But we get this beautiful close-ups. So good to get close-up view of Jan Frodeno. He looks at the clock. He's not worried about heart rate. It's just about pace. We've heard some great updates from Till Schenk. Now let's speak to Elud Palpal, who is uh, following Lionel Sanders. Elud, what is the latest from you yep. on both these athletes? So everyone, hey, hey, nice to hear from you. Nice to see you again. It's some fantastic moment now to see because we are now at the turning point and in some uh, 10 or 20 seconds we will be approaching Jan Frodeno who will come from the opposite direction. This is the place where normally these two athletes meet in every lap. So it's also meaning the fact that uh, it's almost a similar time each lap. So the pace uh, set by Lionel Sanders is quite constant. He has a very, very balanced performance today. And I have to admit, since we are following him, he has the same moves, the same movements. He is incredibly concentrated, focused on this task. And I really hope for him that he will manage to achieve what he wants because it's a fantastic move. It's a fantastic performance that we are seeing now at this moment. And you know, the rain has started to intensify in the last couple of seconds once again, but here now, we are now in a very, very long straight and we are waiting for Jan Frodeno to come from the opposite direction. It will last several seconds. I will stay now um, via phone to commentate to you the meeting of these both fantastic athletes as they see each other once again. Normally when they meet on the road, they just smile a little bit, but they don't want to waste energy for uh, use their hands to salute, to cheer the another one. So they are only here to make this fantastic athletic performance and to bring it home, the world record. And I think that they are ambitioning, motivating each other. And this is the most important fact, this mutual respect, admiration, and uh, really this um, kind of work on the asphalts of Bavaria, which, which was today the case, it's something phenomenal. And this is the moment when they are meeting. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders meeting here for the third time on this straight. We only have about uh, 13 kilometers to go, I guess, and then we will come to the finish line. Stay tuned, stay with us. Thank you very much, Ellie. Yeah, your guess is pretty good. Uh, it's a bit more than 13, 14.3 K to go. Uh, Hella popped out briefly, but uh, Hella, just in case you missed it, uh, we did hear from Til Schenk that he spoke with Jan. They had a brief moment to pull alongside, have a chat. Jan has admitted that he is hurting. He saw 
but it just shows you the mental strength of this 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 champion how he just continues to push uh, you know it was 345s now 347s that's nothing do you know what i mean and yeah. then you you spoke to to lionel's wife erin yeah i just spoke to erin just uh, just as i came back here and uh, she's very very happy and i asked her uh, you know have you seen her him eye to eye have you got eye contact with him how is he what is he saying to you and she's saying uh, he's good he's really good he's still there yeah. he's completely within himself he is racing to plan and she seems super, super happy, and I was very, very happy to see her. Well, that is good to know. We want to know. We want people to be happy. It's not hard, you know. You're hurting like crazy, and uh, Till Shank says Lionel's closing the gap a little. You can see on the run course now, passing each other, that uh, it happened a little bit earlier than on the last. Yeah, lap. but so we can also see that that Yen is slowing down ever so slightly, a few seconds per kilometer, whereas Lionel is keeping his pace. And um, so he's racing perfectly. Um, and we can also see like mm, Jan's body language is maybe a little bit more deflated. And of course, it's really hard. He, he's hurting and he has a hip that's hurting. And and I hope that, uh, you know, still um, as he's still running, it is not something that we are too worried about, but it's definitely a thing. Hella, let's just talk about that. Without having slipped on the carpet, without having landed on his left hip, right now, an Iron Man hurts. Oh yeah, it, it hurts. hurts. It hurts so much. Like uh, yeah, you are in a world of pain. That's why you got to keep that mind quiet because your body is screaming with pain. It hurts from everywhere. That's why when I earlier spoke about blisters, I mean yeah, blisters hurts, but okay, it hurts everywhere. So you just really just have to focus on taking one step in front of the next, doing your nutrition plan, keeping your form, contracting your core, make sure you don't wobble from side to side, and then just stay fresh in your head, like. Yeah, just really, really that tunnel vision is so important. And if you feed off the spectators, if you feed off seeing them, then do that to keep the energy level up and um, do whatever that works for you. And Lionel is, uh, no, no, Jan is looking at his, his watch quite a lot. And I think like he's just making sure that uh, he knows he's slowing down a little bit. He's just making sure he's not slowing down too much. So we, we, we have dwelled a little bit on the fact that, that Jan is hurting and that he slowed down just a tiny, tiny bit. Even the projections from SAP showed that he was slowing a little bit. Uh, we're looking at, at Lionel, who's just metronome consistent, uh, yeah. not missing a beat at all. But we did take the time to look into the future and to think about that world record. And we chatted to Jan about beating 735.39. Listen to this. You know, if uh, if we're uh, if we're close to the world record on the last lap, yes, of course. I mean, that's uh, I would definitely try and 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 go as hard as I can. I think if if there were a buffer back to Lionel, then that would be good. But it would be even better if Lionel is at my side and there is actually no option. Uh, that, because that's how I like to race these days. It's just, it, it's all in. It's putting my heart on a plate for everyone to see. And if it goes off, then it's fireworks. And if it's not, you know, it's all right. I'll go home and have, uh, have dinner at mom's place and be happy with peace and quiet for a few weeks. I use the word fireworks. I, I, I think Jan, Jan and, and Lionel have been giving us fireworks since 9 o'clock this morning. Yeah, they have, and, and I think that the fireworks is getting more and more crazy, and I would love to share the fireworks with them when they get in here, and I would love for them both to share the fireworks. And as it looks right now, it looks like they will. And what do we have left? 50 minutes of racing, hopefully. Um, let's just see. So we get those projections again, and this graphic is great. You know, red is young, green is, is Lionel, and, and, and the gold is, is the world record pace. And both our rock stars, both our kings, mm -hmm. still looking amazing. And, and, and we can start, I mean, I know you're super professional in Danish and, and emotional and focused on the gold. <laughs> me, me, I've got a bit of Latin blood in me, and I also <laughs> come from Africa. I get very excited. But we, we're almost like into the final 10K soon. Can we start getting excited? Yeah, I mean, like we are way above pace right now, world record pace. We are slower than world record pace on the run if you're only looking on the run. But it doesn't really matter because we're so much in front and it's ever so slightly, right? It's one second per kilometer. Yen is running slower than the world record pace and, and Lionel is three seconds per kilometer. So it, it's really nothing. And they were so much because they rode and swam so, so well. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, we can still afford 
thought. We have a big span up to 7.35, if we were predicted. Now we're probably a little slower, but a while ago... 7 7.24-ish. Okay, yeah, so we yeah. still have 10 minutes to give, right? We're not going to give 10 minutes at oh, all. No. At all, but then um, they're still clear within. Um, and I just... Uh, I um, yeah, I just hope and hope and hope that they're both gonna run as well as they're doing right now, and I and I hope for uh, that Sanders. Uh, I think he is just showing a perfect performance on an Ironman, a performance that he's never achieved before, and a performance that he's been seeking all the time. How do you actually gonna get this perfect performance on an on a full distance? And that looks like he's getting it today. So that's a good point you've made because Lionel actually said to me. He said to me, if I have a good day on Sunday, if I crack the nutrition, if everything goes according to plan, that is the motivation that I need to, to, to finish the season on a high. And he's talking about he's going to go and, and stamp his ticket to Kona and then back off and just refocus, you know, for, for the big island. So yeah. I think he, he I, I don't think I don't think it could be going any better. No, no, absolutely not. I think like he might have been racing a lot and, and he might not get the performance that he wanted in, in quarter lane, but I think this performance today is going to give him so much energy, so much motivation and so much self-belief. And this self-belief is probably the biggest factor in this long distance racing in Ironman racing, a full distance racing, that you can, you've you shown yourself you can do it. And when yeah. you've shown yourself once you can do it, you can do it again. Yeah, but now you know. You know you can do it. And that self-belief is the most important thing whatsoever. Everybody can tell you that you can perform at this and this and level. But until you do it, you don't believe it. Exactly. It's like you often see with athletes, only when you win do you start winning. Yeah, and then you're seeing that one win feeds another win, yeah. another win. And well, you, you know. know. How, yeah, you know how to do it then, and, and you are then on a roll. And I think, like, yeah, Lionel will have to, to get his ticket to Kona probably in Ironman Copenhagen in about a month's time. He and might do it a little bit sooner, he told me. Right, okay, that's another, <laughs> I haven't heard that one. I was hoping he was coming to Denmark. I wanted to go over and cheer for him, but hey. You're going to anyway. have to cheer for him now, which you are already. Yeah, absolutely. But can we talk briefly about records? Um, you know, I, I'm very privileged. I'm always inside the ropes, and I get a front seat view on all the racing and and i've had the privilege of watching chris we, chrissy wellington go 833 in south africa i watched um, marina van Hunica do a 745 which then was the fastest 745 58 um i know you did you did the the 355 in bahrain um i saw um christian blumenfeld you know you, you go, go sub 330 in Bahrain as well, you know, and, and here we are, here we are in, in the Algoy, southern Germany, and we're watching, we're going to watch not just the winner, we're going to watch first and second, yeah. potentially break a world yeah. record by a substantial margin, as yeah. well as setting huge personal bests. Yeah, like, like the human performance, we just keep raising the bar, um, and it's like, when are we going over under two hours on a marathon, when is that going to happen? It's going to happen. Uh, but of course, also in, in triathlon, there are also all the equipment, right? The material, we are getting wiser, aerodynamic, um, a suit that is, you know, also aerodynamic and also both aerodynamic on the, on the bike, but also, you know, you can ventilate on the run. It's not limiting on your run. It's not restricted on the run. So we are getting much better. The wetsuits are getting better. Yeah. We are optimizing everything. You even saw the like nutrition. nutrition, the goggles um, that Jan was swimming with is also, you know, um, almost aerodynamic. It's not creating so much drag in the water so we are optimizing and optimizing and the athletes are getting cleverer as well and they are also optimizing every single detail i tell you that there are no stern stone on uh, there's not turned right like we are really making sure we tick all boxes without a doubt and and you know you often talk about marginal gains and we've been talking you know we've been talking about jan and lionel we we're talking also about lionel about, about the future you know where is he going to stamp his ticket for the world championship and i think instead of you and i sort of guessing about it why don't we let them tell us here's the season ahead for young and lionel yeah this is I, I mean for me if this is the end of the season on sunday i'm fine with that you know what i mean obviously i'm gonna go do i'm gonna try and get my Kona slot probably in copenhagen uh but but this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to race Jan head to head over the full distance, and I'm here to do that. And uh, I'm in great shape. Uh, if I if I execute the nutrition and my body functions properly, I will show you this. I will prove this to you. Trivedel is uh, an interesting and and very good project. Project I think after the whole Corona time, 
leading into Kona because you just don't prepare quite the same uh, about a race that you're a little bit more ambivalent about. You know, we're deeply invested in this race. We put our heart and soul into it. Uh, Felix, my best friend and I, we really have invested all, all we can in this. And that, of course, makes, makes me care a lot more about the preparation, which makes it very comparable to Hawaii. And it does remind me a lot of my 2019 preparation and what I still need to get there. Um, at the moment, travel restrictions to the US seem quite in place. So we'll have to see how that all unfolds. I will be racing at the Collins Cup at the end of August in Samarin. And looking forward to having one more hit out over the middle distance against some uh, young speedy kids. And that's always good after a long distance for me just to get my speed back up. And then hopefully go back to the States and, and prepare a little bit in the heat before Kona. And um, yeah, just hoping it all goes ahead. <laughs> I love the way he talks about the young speedy kids because it's the 18th of July and on the 18th of August he turns 40. Yeah. Yeah, he is not, well... And he's still speedy. He is, it's impressive. As Again, like, it's impressive what the human body can do. Like, he has been doing this sport for 20 years, right? He's 40, he's doing it half his life. Yeah. Um, and he is still the best in the world. Um, and he's been the best in the world across all distances. I mean, that is impressive and, and the greatest of all time. I think like we, uh, most of us can agree on that. And um, yeah, and I, and I think that Lionel has many years to come and he started the sport uh, late compared to Jan. So therefore, I mean, like he has big, big performances later in his life. So 20 years of racing, an Olympic gold medal, two 70.3 world titles, three Ironman world titles, 735 39 challenge roth you'd almost think that there's there's nothing left for for, for young to achieve hence the try battle you know yeah exactly like he wants to challenge himself he wants yeah he wants to see if the impossible is possible exactly he he wants to make a mark he wants to make history he wants to yeah to keep being pushed and 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 setting the 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 bar high and and that is what he's doing and he doesn't want to make it easy for himself like he could retire now and he's yeah has done the the has the most perfect possible career but he still wants to keep pushing a little bit longer we still don't know how long he's gonna push and how long he's gonna keep going but he loves it and he can do it with his family and his family helps him out and, and his wife um, emma snowsill emma frodeno yeah. is definitely um supporting him so much and there there are two kids from Girona and and emma in her own right is a legend herself uh no she kidding. won also olympic goals in yeah. beijing so i can only imagine the genes that the kids having do you think the kids were born with gold medals I do think so. Like, they definitely have an advantage in front of a lot of other kids. Um, so I think, like, Emma, if anyone, she knows what he's going through and she's, yeah, she, she, she loves, you know, she's in this with him and yes. he know, she knows how to support him. Definitely not, you know, you're on your own out there, but but to get to the start line, it's a team effort. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you you need that team around you and you need to delegate the responsibility. And, and Jan has a perfect team and, and Lionel has that too. And it's a team you build up over year and it's a trust that you, you know, you share and you know the recipe and you know the goal. You have the, the mutual goal and you can see like his manager, Felix, right? Uh, how yeah. much he's burning for the same yep. thing. And I think that we have something going on. We have, yeah, Jan coming back into the stadium for the last time before he's going to come to the finish line. We only have 10K to go. Ooh, <laughs> which means I'm allowed to get excited. Yes. No, I tell allowed. you what, I'm going to let Daniel Unger do all of this as, as Jan gets, and I keep saying that and I always interrupt, but I'm going to let Daniel Unger take it away. Everybody's moved out of the tent into the rain. The barriers are lined. Here he comes, the first of our two kings. And he's got a grimace that's also a smile. And Daniel Lunga, this is all yours. To the crowds, this is all yours. Everybody at home, I want you on your feet. I want you clapping as well. This is the start of the final lap.
The next time Jan Frodeno goes under that clock, it is to win the Zwift Tri Battle Royale in a time never seen on a clock at any iron distance triathlon anywhere in the world. Frodissimo, 10 and a bit kilometers to go. He wasn't comfortable on that left turn. Thank goodness this course is a lot of long straights. But yep. as he did those two little left turns there, he wasn't comfortable at all. No, he, he, he's suffering now. There is no doubt about it. There is a lot of grimace. There's a lot of, oh, thank God, this is the last lap I'm getting out on now. I wish this was the last lap. He looked a little bit like that. But right now he looked, he also looks super determined to just eat this pain and just get on with it. Keep moving forward. I think, you know, I am, a, I must admit, I am a little nervous about this hip. Yeah. Uh, of his um, and um, I would uh, he I would love him see him moving forward like he is right now and and I know he can do it and he will eat himself if he's not gonna do any permanent damage on himself he would eat himself like this is something he has never achieved before he needs this one too oh he's gonna get it and you know what we've got a special guest we've got a very 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 special guest it is the one and only other half of the first king, Name. Emma Frodeno. Hello. Hi. Oh, Emma, <laughs> I, I'm not even going to ask you questions. Um, this, this, uh, lovely to hear the whole family there. Great to see the sunshine. That, that, that's a nervous <laughs> smile on your face. I can see it. Uh, the tension must be killing you. Um, I have to say, actually, I have been a bit nervous since the crash. Yeah, um, yeah it's certainly, um, yeah, it's not nice to see, obviously. And um, and it certainly, um, yeah, it rattles all of us when we're watching. And, and obviously, you know, we've seen Jan crash before and it's never pretty, um, <laughs> you know, the way it's resolved. But he's looking as good as he can, I have to say, um, yeah. trying to get messages to Till and, and give him just the, the, the old general cues that we go through when, um, yeah, at this point in the race when it's not, not only just getting tough, but especially after um, a little fall like that too, just to try and focus on away from oh yeah away from the pain obviously that he's he's got quite a bit in his hip at the moment yeah what are you seeing emma what are you seeing do you feel like like yan is still you know he gonna keep push on gonna pushing on like or do you feel that this hip is too much of a concern like we are obviously a little nervous but it seems like he wanna he wanna get this in the book what are you seeing like you know his body language better than ever anyone I uh, yeah, I was giving messages to Till just to focus on, you know, abs and glutes to do basically <laughs> relieve the pressure from his hip. Um, you know, it's just about focusing as much as you can on his form. And um, and if I was on the sideline, that's what I'd be yelling out at him. Yeah. Um, to just try and focus on because it's, yeah, I know how much, you know, this is, it's not an option not to finish. And, you know, no. it's just been such an incredible event and um and he knows that too and he's got that own pressure and expectation on himself so i can tell he's in a lot of pain um also that he's checking his watch as frequently as he is um you know i guess somewhat it's bothering him if he knows he's slowing down but uh at the end of the day i think he's just yeah it's one of those things isn't it like you're hurting at this point in the race and it's not nice to be dealing with um you know a, a little crash like that as well but um yeah at this point i honestly it's as good as it could be it truly is yeah exactly like how how proud are you like we are getting some some crazy um finish line times like was that any you know what were you imagining what were you dreaming about when were you talking about you know in the evening when the kids went to bed like what time did you see in front of you um, it's funny, um, Jan and I, um, I guess maybe that's where sometimes I, I get a little bit more um, realistic in the sense of, of taking all this hype away um, yeah. and, and basically focusing on what you can do because, you know, he said, you know, all well, the world record tomorrow and I said, yeah, but that's just the secondary, you know, that that's that's the end of a long day and, and I think, you know, one thing that Jan's really been good at working out now is that um it's all about the process and the outcome will come you know when you see that finish line and, and obviously you know there's a certain amount of controllable you need to take into account with looking at all these data and and obviously sometimes he wants to push through that and prove that he can do more than that and a time is um has been something that we honestly didn't put a number on it's just yeah. been um it's a byproduct of a great race and, yeah. and i think the thing is that's what we're seeing between him and lionel and and I'm also like 
totally amazed. Lionel's having an, an incredible race too. And I think that goes to show that, you know, these two athletes are having a phenomenal race in pretty tough <laughs> German conditions, oh, yeah. um, but on, a, on an amazing course. Absolutely, yeah. And what we're seeing now, the predicted time is now is 7.25 for Jan and 7.35 for Lionel. And Lionel is still under Jan's old world record. So if that is going to hold, this is going to be so epic. And I know that Lionel will also get this information. And I know he would eat himself to get under the old world record too. So uh, yeah, you must be beaming and you must be so proud. Like uh, I think um, the pressure that I can imagine that's been on at home, like because, you know, getting this race off the ground. I know that, that of course, Jan and, and Felix has done a, a crazy job to get this going. What, what, what are you saying? What are you thinking there about this pressure that you felt? Yeah, I've said to a few friends, especially that are there working with Felix and helping out, um, is that, you know, it, it, obviously it's, it's going to be such a relief when it's over. But that, that's the thing with any big race. And when there's any high performance that you're, you're asking more of yourself, um, but I think at the end of the day, like, it's something, you know, Jan thrives on. We all thrive on the build-up of this pressure and um, putting all our energy um, behind what we can. And, and yeah, we, we definitely try to, um, you know, help Jan as much as we can in any way to make sure that he's getting the best out of himself. And, and sometimes the hard decision is to not come to a race like this so we can now allow him to sleep and to rest. And, um, you know, he's got so many commitments um, around the event and with what he's doing. Um, and so for me, it's, it's mostly about um, letting him do, you know, his job and doing it to the best of his ability. So, yeah, we can't wait till he comes home. Um, and like I said, I think, you know, the big kudos also has to go to the unsung hero in this event, which is Felix, his manager, um, who, you know, he puts everything together at the end. Jan and him have the um, incredible ideas, but it's Jan's, jo Jan's job is today to perform and, and show up and deliver. Um, but Felix has been the one that, that really, honestly, he, he creates this. He is a perfectionist. Um, he's, he's, you know, Jan and him speak 15, 20 times a day on, on all the details of, mm -hmm. um, of an event like this. And this has been something that even for me to witness um, has really been truly spectacular that, that one person has been the mastermind behind all of this and, and to pull it all together. Yeah, it, it is amazing to see and that team effort and also, as you say, like staying home in Girona with the kids so Lionel can, also Jan can do his job and you are not there so he can <laughs> sleep. And I mean, like, you also know if anyone how to perform at one day, like also winning gold in Beijing. So the mindset, you know, that you can also help Jan with, I mean, like that can only be... A, humongous uh, benefit for Yen, like also sharing your knowledge with him? I think that's something that, yeah, we, we both have um, enjoyed big races and um, enjoyed the pressure and, and, and to embrace the pressure and, and yeah, somewhat sometimes knowing you need to wrap yourself in cotton wool to a degree mm -hmm. um, that, you know, it, it's, it's being serious but not too serious, you know, it's a counterbalance that I think Jan's um, also really um, you know, change within himself too is that he loves the pressure, but he needs the counterbalance. And sometimes yeah. that's, you know, the kids and, yeah. and just normal general life. Um, but then there's moments where, you know, he knows he needs to put himself aside and to focus mm -hmm. um, and that we're here and know that we're, we're cheering him on and, and we're always there watching and, and going to be here at the end of the day. And, you know, most upset the kids were <laughs> when he crashed on the run was that they might potentially might not be any Lego for them. So, you know, it really puts it back in perspective um, as to what it's all about, you know, for them. Um, they love watching watching their dad and, and, and seeing what he can do and, and obviously don't truly grasp the concept. But uh, sometimes it's that lightheartedness about, you know, pressure and performance, but also the reality is that it's it's an it's an amazing sport. It's the best job in the world. You'll never get it better. And and sometimes taking that with you into a race can sometimes just remind you that you know what, I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate. I get to race, and, and especially in in these last few you know years, and, and not really much of a, a racing season. It's it's nice to find yourself motivated to um to push for a big event. And this has certainly been something that's um that's really worked for Jan. 
Well, you know, the best job in the world, and he is the best at it, Emma. We're going to let you go so that you can enjoy these last moments as well. And uh, <laughs> we'll be sure to remind Jan that he better bring home some Lego. Otherwise, that <laughs> world record is going to mean nothing to the kids. Uh, Emma Frodino, thank you so very much for your time. And, uh, yeah. Jump in the pool. I hope you got a waterproof iPad because your husband is flipping yeah. amazing and doing some incredible stuff. Yeah. No, you probably had the kids trying to come down and, and uh, find out what was happening. So, yeah, no, we'll like, keep them entertained for a little bit longer and then uh, time for a big bike ride for them. There we go. Thank you so much, Emma Fredino. Your husband is smoking the course here in Algo. It might be cold and wet, but my goodness, the racing is hot and pretty hot in Toronto as well. It looks lovely to have her on the line and to get her insights and you know, they're the golden couple in more ways than one. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Like, uh, yeah, two Olympic gold medalists there together. And, and Emma is also a world champion, short-distance athlete. She was, uh, you know, what she has achieved in her career has is phenomenal. We are not far away. 7.8 kilometers to go. So seven times four is less than 28 minutes. Here comes Lionel Sanders. The final lap for him. And this man is having the race of his life. Like that one hashtag said, I'm going to repeat it again because it's brilliant. Two winners today at the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. The body language on his face a little different now. Yeah, he's absolutely hurting now for sure and also had slowed down. I'm looking forward to seeing some, some stats on his pace afterwards. But yeah. We have uh, 10 kilometers to go for Lionel, and there's no doubt about it that this is uphill now. It is, is you know, he's really within himself now. He's digging deep. Digging deep. Lionel Sanders just going through the turnaround, leaving the stadium for the final time on the run. The next time we see him, it is to finish a record-breaking, groundbreaking, historic event a triathlon over the iron distance of 226 kilometers with a big twist, not a mass field, two incredible proponents of this sport, two wonderful ambassadors of this sport, two individuals who inspire hundreds of thousands of people to swim, bike and run, or even to just get off the couch and go out there and be fit. And one man has been doing it for half his life. And here he is in a world of pain, but not giving up. No, he is definitely not giving up. He is bringing home the Lego, that's for sure. Um, he <laughs> is uh, going to get under this world record and he will, you know, he will take that pain in that hip. Um, Emma said that uh, he's confident that he will get this, finish this job, what he started. This is something that's never been done before. It uh, was um, his idea together with Felix and uh, they have uh, definitely uh, conquered uh, that dream and the setup that we have down here in Algo is, is absolutely insane and it's, it's, it's crazy actually a setup that we have um, witnessing today and, and um, it feels like he is still, uh, he's still moving at a nice pace um, if so, so we're still in way under the world record. Well there we go, there we go, I mean that big black block is how much of a buffer Jan Fredino has over his own record. Remember, yeah. he's breaking his own record. Mm -hmm. He's breaking the wrong. And that slim black line underneath Sanders is that he's, he's, he's there. He's just there. Yeah. And, and hopefully that body language that we saw as he came under the clock here for the penultimate time, uh, that's because he's sitting at 30 and a bit K. Yeah, yeah. And as he comes out of that, as he sort of hits 33, 34, and then he gets to about 5K to go. He can start believing again. And then there's that, that new energy. That It's like a, it's a reserve tank kicks in. You're almost there. Yeah. You can smell the finish line. You can smell the, the relief of where you can let go. And you can just, you know, literally let go. You know, you don't have to move anymore. The body has been screaming to let go for a while now. But your mind is so strong. It's not going to let go. And, and uh, he will push. And, and it's, it's, it's hurting now. Um, I like to see how he, he looks now. And you can also see, like, in here in the stadium, like, they're running on this slippery carpet. And the carpet that's so, so wet and it's heavy. Yeah. So it's also going to make them look a little bit more. It's like running on long grass, right? Yeah. And it's going to suck you in, yeah. this carpet. And, and that's also why they have no spring when we see them in here. And, and the spring will come back when they're out on the asphalt. We can definitely see that uh, Jan is getting his spring back out there. 
That's what it looks like. But Till's saying that uh, his body language is changing a lot. He's hurting and seriously fighting the pain. Looking at his watch a lot feels like he's slowing down, is what Till mm -hmm. says. But the truth is that that is not that is not unnormal to be happening at this stage. No, Only no. when you get to that 5K can you go, well, okay, well, I can run 5K, even in a world of pain. You know, mm -hmm. I, I've got this. But he can't believe that yet. No, no, and, and I think he's, he's also looking at the worst because of course he knows and he feels that he is slowing, but at the same time, it's keeping him honest. You know, it, it pushes him to see that time. Like, he knows that, okay, I don't want to see much slower than 355. I don't want to see anything with four in front, you know. I always want to run faster yeah. than four zero pace, you know. And also, the, the Emma also said it, his wife, like, he is looking a lot of him, of him on his watch, and he knows he is slowing down, but that is a way to keep him honest and keep pushing and he is just trying to get all this forget about the pain um, even though it's very difficult in this moment you know when, when you watch shoulder to shoulder racing and you know, some people say well will this be another iron war a la Mark Allen and Dave Scott don't you find that sometimes the shoulder to shoulder racing when you're in a world of pain is a little bit easier than when you're currently on your own with your pain yep you know so he's fighting the voice is on your shoulder at the moment. Yeah, you're fighting yourself right now and you're fighting your your want uh, to achieve a goal that is unbelievable. Um, so, so yeah, he's just grabbing a, a bottle there, getting a bit of nutrition in, and it's, it's his own nutrition, so he knows exactly what he's getting there. But, yeah, he is fighting um, demons. He's fighting the, the... But he's trained this, you know. He hasn't trained... But he's still... I mean, he's, he's still going to have those voices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he hasn't trained having such a painful hip, no. of course. But he's trained feeling like that, and he's also been in a lot of races where he's felt like that, right? And he knows he can get through it because he's done it before. So he feeds off the experience as has I mean, done it before. All that tank, you know, all that you have in the bank, he's taking that. He is... He's you know, cashing in that investment He is definitely now. cashing in, and you know, he, has, he has 20 years of investment in him. So uh, you're seeing that now. And look at the spectators, the people of Algoy, and, and a lot of people have come down, especially we saw Timo Bracht and his son. They've come all the way from Heidelberg, you know. We, we've got all these people who are riding their bicycles alongside. That, that's not a Sunday ride. <laughs> They are there for the tri-battle. They are there for Jan Frodeno. They are there for Lionel Sanders. This is respect. This is awe. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. They are in awe of what they are seeing. And we can again see now that Jan has slowed a little bit down again. 7.26, still absolutely crazy fast time. And, and Sanders, yeah, he is hurting. Um, he's down at now. Uh, 739 uh, expected uh, total time his personal best as we mentioned before it is 744 so he's still way better than his personal best and actually executing a, um, an Ironman or a full distance race um, of course um, you know as he has slowed down there is obviously something is happening now whether it is uh, over pacing or whether it's nutritional we don't know um, but you know Almost perfect racing. See him shaking out his hands there a little bit. I know sometimes you get that little pins and needles feeling in yeah, the hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that is all, you know, neuromuscular spasm. Yeah. Like the body is just shutting down now, you know. And he's also, uh, it can also be dehydration, uh, lacking of salt that you're starting to feel this electric feeling in your Look hands. Look at his tummy. A little bit... Yeah, bulging a little bit. That's 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 a bit of water retention. It is could it not? easily sit some some water and be sluggish, sluggish around in in his belly. Um, he is not uh, comfortable anymore at all. As no doubt it, he is uh, finding all the tools to stay there and to keep pushing and to. You know, he can feel that finish line. Come on, six kilometers. <laughs> He's going to keep saying that to himself. How many times have I run six kilometers feeling completely smashed? How many times, you know, he, six kilometers is absolutely nothing. He doesn't even want to put his running clothes on to go and run six kilometers normally. So no, for him, you, it's nothing. You don't get up for a 6K, right? No, absolutely not. So, I mean, yeah, he will get through this. Um, we are just excited to see how fast. Not long now, and it'll be the final 5,000 meters, the final five kilometers of 226 kilometers, swimming in the Grosse Alpse, biking up and down the B19, a, a freeway that was closed especially for the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. Running four laps, 42.2 kilometers, in and out of our stadium here at Burgberg. It is Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders, Germany and Canada, two kings battling it out 
but with such massive respect for one another and one world record that is going to be completely obliterated. Soon he's going to go to that turnaround and I think that that turnaround is a big energy boost. That last turn yep. at the end of the course. Yeah, you don't have to get out there again. This is the last time. You actually think a lot about that as an athlete. Like, this is the last time I'm going to yeah. run here. I'm not going to go back in here again, out here again. Next time when I'm back, you know, um, well, next time I see the finish line, I am actually going over the finish line. I'm not going out again. Uh, and that is absolutely amazing. It gives you energy. It gives you energy. And, and of course, everybody out there is shouting to you where he is. He knows exactly where he is. Yeah. And that's also why he keeps pushing so hard. I know that the... Um the lady in charge of Algoid Tourism at the press conference. She said to Jan, you know, we know you've raced here before, but would you come back with the family, a bit of leisure? I tell you right now, he's thinking I'm never coming no, back to the Algoid. I'm, I'm ne <laughs> no, he's thinking I'm never going to do a triathlon again in my life. You know, you always think I'm never going to do it again. And then tomorrow he'll be planning the next one. This and is that big, big injection of energy. The last time he goes through this turn, the very last time, and it's a uh, just a hair more than five kilometers and he's run five kilometers a million times in his career in the sprint distant triathlons you know sub 15 minute 5k and in his head he can say well look hold on you know in 16 minutes I i'm under the clock yeah exactly yeah he was actually giving a fist pump to people out there i love to see that yeah it's amazing he is he's confident he knows he will get this look uh, how he's lengthened his stride already. yeah yeah it gave him a lot i think he saw someone out there he knows quite well um, which is it's amazing to see how that just gave him some energy. Yeah, you promised me we could get excited. Yeah, with we, 5Ks are, to we are excited now. We are here. We're <laughs> inside the ropes. You are inside the ropes. You're in front of your TV, your phone, your iPad, your laptop, whatever it is. And you're watching GOAT, the greatest of all time, yeah. proving that he is beyond the greatest of all time. You are watching a man who's a month away from turning 40, who's got an Olympic gold medal, three Ironman world titles, two 70.3 world titles. He's got a 735.39 in the bag, and he's going to go. And a lot of people find it hard to think, how do you go under seven and a half hours for 226 kilometers of triathlon? Yeah, I think most of us can't believe how And we're that's struggling to believe it right now, but, yep. but we're getting properly excited. Yeah, and we're even seeing, like, you know, this was not the perfect race. No. And, like, he, he, he had a bad transition one uh, he fell on the run and he's still so far under and the weather and had him to, to slow down in a lot of the corners he you know out of his you know his t1 and the first couple of kilometers were not good on the bike but he was still riding at 355 on the bike so it's absolutely crazy it just shows what you can do without the perfect conditions and then you are then thinking what if we then got the perfect conditions yeah. <laughs> so you mean we're going to have another tri battle yeah, we'll have to. i hope so <laughs> but you know we, we we've obviously spoken a lot about Jan, and, and part of that trust me people at home it's not because it's young and it's the record and because you know he's untouchable seemingly it's because we've had major technical issues due to the rain and yeah. we're not going to carry on about it but it's so good to have this rock star on yeah. our screen again yeah. in the green and gray yeah. you know lionel sanders i struggled to find the words to articulate how incredible he is for our sport mm -hmm. and what he's doing here today you know sometimes we want to keep it simple and we want to see them head to head and who crosses you know what exactly happens but that's not this race but still I mean, Lionel is racing out of his skin. He has had the best swim of his life, the best bike of his life. And considering what happened in Coeur d'Alene, that monkey is not on his back. Look at him now. No, actually, no, no. He, he is, he's dialing in his plan. It's still not perfection, but it also might be that he overpaced himself. We don't know what's going on. There's just no doubt about it that he is a very, very, very dark place, but he is not giving in. He just keeps pushing and, and I think it's so admirable to see, and he also, you know, the way he, the way he shares his life yeah. with, with all of us, he makes it, uh, you know, relatable what he's going through. Um, he's human. 
He's, they're both humans. And fragile even, and, yep. and emotional. And, and you know what I'd love to do? I'd love to run out onto the course now and say, hey, Lionel, how's retirement? Because <laughs> in Coeur d'Alene, when Talbot went up to him and said, how are you feeling? He says, ah, this is my last Ironman. I'm retiring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah? yeah. And that's what I'm saying. Like, they're both thinking out there. I'm not, never going to do this again. And then in a few hours, they will. Um, so that's just because you're just in a world of pain. You don't want to be here anymore. You want to just sit down. This bench or whatever you're going to pass next time, you want to, th that bench is screaming to you, sit down, just sit down. I've heard lots of benches <laughs> in my runs. Yeah, exactly. They run at, they, they scream at you and, and then there's the mind screaming back at the bench, no, no, the finish line it was, is in within reach and then I'm sitting down, lying down. So, Lionel's got a little bit more than 5k to go. Young's got a, a touch more than 4k to go. Look at the chest is out. He's swinging the arms a little bit more. Mm -hmm. there's, 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 there's a bit more animation in his run, but I also think he's got a little up that he's going. It's a bit of a false flat. Yeah, he's not running up as tall anymore. He's not, he's not so contracted in his core and his glutes any, in, anymore as, as he has been, and that's only normal. Um, we, we obviously train to be able to, to run well um, in the end of the run, but I mean, like, this is a... This is a lot to ask, and um, he is super, super strong, but uh, it's a lot to ask of the body, and it's just slowly, slowly turning off, just turning off. I, I usually call an Ironman the slow death. <laughs> it really is. Like, you just have muscle fiber after muscle fiber saying, I can't do it anymore, I'm giving in. And it then does feel like it. Yeah, and you're just finding the reserve. You're finding it, you keep moving, you keep moving, because you're so strong-minded. Well, I can tell you that um, Elute, Pal Pal has just given us a message saying that Lionel refused his nutrition. He only took water. And, you know, at Coeur d'Alene, he was only drinking carbs. Now he's going, hold on a second, let me just take in some water. He's slowed down a bit and he refused nutrition. He's only taking water. Lionel Sanders with 5K to go to the finish line. He's one kilometer behind Jan Frodeno. I'd love to see the stats again, if they could give it to us in terms of the prediction. I'd, I, I, I would love, I would love for Lionel to go sub, sub 7.35.39. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm, I'm sorry, I saw a 7.39 prediction just before, um, but a 7.40 is definitely still possible. We are, you know, we are going to see that. We, I'm, I'm still positive he's going to go under his personal best. And you talked about his only taking water out there. Maybe he, he's having some, you know, some, some symptoms telling him, I need water now. Yeah. I, I don't need any more heavy uh, concentrated um, carbohydrate solution or electrolyte solution. I feel like water and maybe he's just starting to learn to listen to those signals that the body is telling him. Look at his running style. Early on, you said he was just landing so perfectly. Now that right leg, yep. look, it's, the foot's just rolling slightly in. Yeah, he's definitely starting to hang a little bit. Yeah, we have this pass again and... and um, oh, both of them looking straight ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, they have so much, you know, in their own little head and their own little tunnel vision now. They, they, they just can't cope with giving out any energy. They need their energy for themselves right now. Uh, but just finishing up with Lionel, uh, you can definitely see he is starting to rock a little bit from side to side and, and wasting energy. Uh, but that, again, that is normal. Um, the body is just shutting down now. Well, with this angle, this camel angle we've got, it looks like it's downhill to the finish line for the greatest of all time himself, Jan Frodeno, as we bring you the predictions. And still, Lionel is oh, he's just he's right about there. Yeah, he's but still running a, 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 a 356 pace. I mean, that's still really, really fast running. Um, so, so it's not it's not anything like we've seen some of the other uh, full distance races he's done, where he's really, you know, the run is really, really gone slow in the end. It's nothing like that now. Well, whilst you look at that, here's something really incredible. Another history moment being made. The Zwift Tri Battle Royale is the first of its kind triathlon race, no doubt about that. This event groundbreaking in so many ways. In another sporting first, the community of virtual training platform Zwift were able to pit themselves against their idols. So for this unique race, there is another first. For the first time in triathlon history, you can own a piece of a historic race. After the Zwift Tri Battle Royale, there will be an NFT auction. An NFT or non-fungible token is a unique 
digital certificate that is stored on a blockchain and provides a certain ownership rights in an asset such as a digital work of art. NFTs are described as non-fungible because each one is unique and of a different value. The Tri Battle NFT is the first of its kind, featuring the complete data set, swim, bike, and run times, including all performance and bio data of the day, a 3D model of the track, video highlights, and a personal video message from Jan Frodeno after the finish line, as well as the finish line photo. We're going to start the auction. It'll last for, last for a week. Auction proceeds will be distributed to the Frodeno Fund as a non-profit organization whose mission is to positively influence the lives of socially disadvantaged children with the help of sport. Another first at the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. These boys just don't stop giving. <laughs> They're giving us the most incredible race, one of the most incredible races. We are making history here in the Algoi, and it's not long before, in blue with that red stripe and white, this 1 meter 93 giant in triathlon will come back into the finish line for the final time into our stadium under the clock and i bet she's going to grab the tape and do raw but it's going to be one of the most emotional screams and yeah. shouts at the finish line photographers and cameras ever jan frodeno is less than 3,000 meters to go. Yes, and we can be very excited now. You, we are allowed to let it all out now. Oh, yes. It let will it happen out. now. Uh, we will definitely bring a, a beat this world record today, and I, I can't wait to, to meet him at the finish line. Um, Did you see the Canadian flag just, just beyond yeah, Lionel there? Yeah. Those people that were riding alongside Jan just a moment ago, they're riding alongside Lionel. I'm sorry to have interrupted you. And with the maple leaf, the Canadian flag, uh, projected times again, we're looking at a 7.24. Lionel is still under his personal best from before. Yeah, he is. Um, he is still hanging in tough, and I and I and I hope to see him continue that pace. Yeah, there is the Canadian flag. Like I really hope he sees it. He is seeing it. Um, yeah, he's definitely. Oh, he is. He going. needs that flag right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, he is somewhere very, very dark. Um, but that's what he lived for, and they both say they live for this battle. They live for these moments. They live for, you know, you never want to do anything that's easy, and this is definitely not easy. The darker the moments you go into, the deeper the hole, the greater that finish line feels when you get there, the greater the sense of achievement. And when you step back and you've got time to internalize and you look at what you've done on the swim, yeah. you look at what you've done on the bike, you look at how you persevered on the run. Three weeks after walking the marathon yeah. at Coeur d'Alene, yeah. I mean, if young... If Lionel doesn't go, come on, look yeah. at me. If, 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 <laughs> if Lionel doesn't look at that and actually beat his chest and go, I did it. No, no, it's definitely going to make him even stronger. You know, it's going to make him even taller. It's going to make him yeah. stand tall and say, I can do this. Um, and if there's anyone that can really, really eat pain, it's Lionel. Um, and I think that, yeah, that is what we are witnessing right now. And, and I know this will give him some confidence. And that I hope flag is better than a gel right now. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, and it's following him, so, uh, yeah. Oh, he, oh, Listen yeah. to him. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Come but, on, I mean, Lionel. I don't know if you've seen uh, yeah, quite a lot of his training videos. He wants to walk, but he's not. Oh, yeah. They both want to walk. The fight is huge. I, I'm talking about these benches that's talking out there. Right? Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They're shouting for them to sit down. And he's used to shouting of himself. Yeah. I don't know if you've seen some of his training Look videos. at the lead bike talking yeah. to him. Come yeah, on, yeah, Lionel. Yeah, and he knows it. Um, oh. Go, Lionel. There we go. Come on, wear yeah. your hashtags. Yeah. Bring it. Yeah. <sighs> uh, we want to carry him home now. And oh, we're also seeing Jan. Is good. He's showing a bit still of relief. Still going. He's still yeah, going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's looking at his face. I think he's really keeping him honest, that watch. Look, the, uh, the record is there. Now it's just about how how big. How big, yeah. How big the and margin And he's is. definitely not going to let it uh, over th uh, 7.30. Oh, no. No, no, no. Never. We're sub, we're sub 7.30. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, it was uh, 7.27 we saw just before. And, and it seems like he's still keeping pace. And uh, we only have two kilometers to go. Do you know something? <laughs> You know, you know, there, there, there are things that sometimes you latch on to. Like, like sometimes for me, when I'm, I'm really tired, I know that I can stop for a Coke or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But I think Jan's going to be so happy to see the white hoardings on our fences mm -hmm. that show that it's yeah. the path to the finish yeah. line. You're actually starting to look at landmarks, you know. Yeah. There you're like, okay, I run to this tree that's down there. Okay, I'm at the tree now. And next time I'm going to run to this bus station and then I'm there. You know, you're starting to kind of, again, play trick to your mind so that you cannot think about how much pain you're in and how much you just want to walk or sit down. You know, you're just playing these tricks. Get 
the, get the mind away from the suffering and then just, yeah, cheat yourself to keep running. And yeah, he's doing, he's using all the tools in his toolbox to get to this finish line. Well, with Jan, a bit more than two kilometers to go, look at the grimace on Lyle Sanders' face, but he's not giving in to those words that are saying, hey, take that bench Hella keeps talking about. Hey, you can walk. Hey, no, he's not. He's gritting his teeth. And uh, that grimace is the grimace of a king. That is the grimace of determination. That is the grimace of making sure all the sacrifices and the hard work to this moment are respected and reaping the investment that has gone into getting to this place mm -hmm. at this time, mm -hmm. here and now. And the clock says you've got less than 2,000 meters to go, Jan Frodeno. Less than 2K to go. And he knows those landmarks you're talking about are those spectators there with a the cowbell. That building, those pink flowers in the flower box, mm -hmm. you know. He's ticking them off in his mind, and with everyone he ticks off, he knows he's that much closer to the And if you just tape. saw, he was just passing like a random house, and yeah. he just looked at that random house, and it's again to play mind, uh, to play tricks with your mind. You're not really, then you're thinking about the house. Oh, who lives in there? Oh, that would, that, you know, you're just doing something to yourself so that you are not in this pain world, because now he's back in the pain, right? Yeah. And you see the grimace on his face, and now he's trying to find something else to distract him. And, but, he's, but he's probably also thinking, but hold on, I've got about 1,500 to go. Yeah. Where's that other gear? Let me just, can I actually just stand a bit taller, push the chest out, yeah. find a little bit more I think pace? you will see that the last kilometers, he's going to ask himself, do I have more whatsoever? Do I have like a 0.1 percentage more to give? Then I will find it. I will open up because this is a life, a once in a lifetime opportunity maybe. And you're definitely writing history today. People can only ever give 100%, but I, <laughs> we are seeing, 100 plus. Yeah, we definitely are. And I think uh, before we started today, we did not think that breaking the record with that much was possible. And when we spoke with, with Dan Ran, his, his coach earlier, um, he was really, really smiling from ear to ear when we said how fast he was uh, racing at the moment. And um, yeah, they, they try not to talk too much about the record. It was all about the battle. But I mean, lately we've talked a lot about the record, but that is because we are going to beat it significantly today. We're destroying it and we're making it very difficult for anybody else to come close. The only person who's going to come close is the man on the right of your screen, Lionel Sanders. And it's going to be a very, very long time before anybody can smash that. We've got the branding up. We're about 1,500 meters to go. Conceive, believe, achieve. Well, tick, tick, tick. Let me tell you, for Jan Frodeno, 1,500 meters to go. We were hoping for some sunshine, but the sunshine is the performance that is glowing from every pore in the body of Jan Frodino. It's oozing out of him. Briefly, that pain will be suppressed and he will realize, wow, we did it. He's not going to say I did no, it. No. He's going to say we did no. it. Him, Emma, Felix, their team, mm -hmm. the physio, the Cairo, the master, the nutritionist, the diet, everybody who's been involved, the aerodynamicist, the bike, yeah. the guys this is, that This is a team effort. He might be the one that's going to execute on the day, but to get to that start line is a huge team effort. He could not do this alone. Never Schwarz, can. Rot, Gold, Deutschland. Any oh. performance at that level, you cannot do alone. And there's no doubt about it. He is racing for his team right now. He's racing for Emma and the kids at home. He's thinking about Felix. All these things are going through his mind. It's like, we did this, you know. We pulled this off. We, we yeah, I'm beating this, my own world record. We did this, you know. He's starting to believe that this is actually happening. And he's starting to let himself take it all in, enjoy the moment. Even though you still know, oh, Okay, I have a kilometer to go with the pace I'm doing now. Okay, I have like a three forty three minute forty five seconds to go before I can let it, you know, let it go, you know, just relax, get it all out and Ah, I, I think we are in for a massive finish line. Relief, shouting, screaming, crying. I don't know what we're gonna see today. Uh, you know what? My habit is is to to talk the athlete into the finish line. I, I think we're going to bring him into the stadium, but I, I'm going to want to he hear the ambient noise when Jan grabs that tape and, and, and when, when, he, when he crosses the line. This, we, we, such an honor, such a privilege to be part of 
history being made. A phenomenal swim in the Grosse Alps there. A spectacular bike ride in far from perfect conditions. Very, very wet, cold. A first lap run, which was insane. That slip on the carpet onto that left hip. He got up and we thought, oh my goodness, would he carry on? And you know the caliber of this champion as he carried on. But we've heard from the course that he's been in a world of pain. But we know that he's stronger than his strongest excuse. Absolutely. His mind is stronger than, than anything right now. This is mind over matter. The mind has completely taken over and he's controlling. The mind is controlling his body right now. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, the body is just shutting off. Um, it doesn't want to do it anymore, but the mind is in charts. He's getting to this finish line. He's beating his own world record with eight minutes or something <laughs> like that. Um, it's, it's pretty ridiculous. Um, yeah, and it's, it's tough now. It's tough now. He has about three minutes to go and then we will see him in here. Three minutes or less for the fireworks on the finish line, on the carpet, on those final meters. And that left turn, I think he's going to look at it and he's going to go, I would be absolutely fine if he used some choice language for that little left turn <laughs> and that slippery carpet. And he should actually keep that piece of carpet and take it home <laughs> with him because it nearly got the better of him, but he overcame. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, beautiful people around the world, thank you for being part of this massive day in triathlon history. Jan Frodeno, Lionel Sanders, a dream that is moments away from being reality. Jan Frodeno, an Olympic gold medalist, two-time 70.3 world champion, three-time Ironman world champion, set the record 2016 in Challenge Roth, 7.35.39. He's going to blow that out, not out of the ballpark, not out of Bavaria, but out of the planet, through the stratosphere, into the stars, because this is the star of the triathlon world. He's about to turn into the stadium moments away we're probably a minute away from the greatest of all time born in cologne fell in love with triathlon in cape town south africa came back to germany met felix and saarbrücken together they dreamt up the tri battle royale and that dream became a reality at nine o'clock this morning when the race started but making the impossible possible <laughs> despite the weather despite the wet carpet. It's a right-hand turn. The people of uh, Burgberg have come out in their hundreds. And here we are, a few archers left. The Zwift Tri Battle Royale on asphalt, soon to be carpet. Daniel Unger, world champion, commentator now in his retirement, is standing by in German to get the frenzied German fans on their toes, jumping up and down, screaming and shouting. You can get off your chairs. You can stand in front of your TVs. You can clap your hands. You can scream. You can shout. Conceive, believe, achieve. Jan Frodeno for Germany has achieved a brand new world best. Seven hours and 27 minutes have elapsed. Now it's just about those final seconds as he is about to go under the clock. I will leave this moment to what it deserves. The GOAT himself, the greatest of all time, Jan Frodeno. sit here with a quiver in my voice, struggling to see what a privilege, what an honor. The greatest of all time. The greatest time of all. Seven twenty-seven. The seconds don't count.
That's right. We're making a noise here in Birkberg, and you should be making a noise at home. Seven hours, 27 minutes, 53 seconds. That's not just a new world record. That's a new planet when it comes to iron distance times for triathlon. Felix Rudiger, I guarantee you, is overwhelmed with emotion. Jan's best friend. He definitely hurt himself. Look how he struggles to get up, not just from the muscles. Can everybody at home, can I hear you scream? Five and a bit in the Grosse Alps there. 355 on the bike. And a 727.53. Prost, Jan Frodeno. Crowds are going crazy. Taylor Fredrickson has left the commentary booth. And I really want to hear, Taylor, please speak to young Fredino. We want to hear from this man. There we go, Taylor Fredrickson. This is your chance. Wow, wow, wow. This is absolutely crazy. How is it to be Jan Fredino right now? I can't believe you're writing history. What is this? Tell me about it. Uh, I'm not sure anybody can hear us, but. Uh... Oh, that was, that was so hard. That was so unbelievably hard. It's just, uh, you haven't done an Ironman for two years. You just, uh, you rate it like a 70.3 and that's, that's a mistake in the beginning. Uh, massive thank you to everybody who came out. Uh, it was so tough because it was cold, it was rainy and everybody was out. It was uh, really quite something. So, uh, oh, I'm speechless, but I'm just, I'm, I'm a broken man right now. Yeah, absolutely. Like, I can imagine that. I think, you know, what happened on the run, you know, you had our hearts really sitting in the throat and thinking, look, okay, is he still good? You know, is he still able to run? But we spoke with Emma and she could see that you were still good. So uh, we're just so, so happy to see what you performed today. And I mean, like writing history, I think you have not dreamt about going this fast, though, have you? Well, uh, the truth is, uh it's not exactly what's referred to as Frodino weather. So um, I'm sorry to everybody who came out and uh, endured the conditions. It's amazing. I, I have to say it was, it got quite cold on the bike, um, but really it was just, it was just amazing to do this kind of thing. Like it was so clinical because you just never had to look up and could just try and go as fast as possible. And I was doing the maths in my head. I've, I don't think I've ever calculated so much. One minute. One minute twenties, one kilometer at 45k now. I don't know how many times I've worked that out. And then same thing on the run, just, you know, uh, trying, to, trying to keep the time as fast as possible. Of course, we dreamt of this, but I didn't have a time in my head. Lionel said he wants to go 729. I'm like, I gotta go faster than that if he's going 729. But again, uh, I think he's coming out soon and He's going to be pretty close to the old world record, so uh, a big, big hats off to him as well. Yeah, put your hands together for Jan Frodeno, world record, absolutely amazing performance today. This is when, no matter how articulate you are, 
you're speechless. You run out of words. There are not the superlatives to explain what we have witnessed today. <laughs> and look at even Jan struggling to believe it at the moment. Look at his face. I think he's in a world of pain. As he said, he's a broken man. But look at that time, 7.27.53. Danny, auf Deutsch, vielleicht bist du mit Jan sprechen. Danny Unger chatting with uh, Jan Frodeno in German. I know that Lionel Sanders is not far away. The German hero in Germany. Got to give them their moment in German. Well, whilst Daniel Unger chats to Ian Frodeno, I think it's only right that we show you again this historic moment of Jan Frodeno on this historic day in the beautiful Allgäu, southern Germany. Watch this now. It's borderline unbelievable. Starting the day in the locker room. That steely stare before jumping into the Grosse Alpsee. A perfect swim, 45 minutes. Could not fault his form. A little moment in T1, but faultless on the bike yet again, despite those moments where he got up a few times. But that was just to change position, stretch the legs, flew through the canyon turn. And flawless over 180 kilometers on the bike for the best in the world, Jan Frodeno. Cold and wet, not Frodo conditions, but that did not stop him from forging forward towards making that dream come true. A decent transition in the stadium, right near the finish line. And that run was under world record pace to start, but near disaster at the end of the first lap still catches me off guard every time I see it. That left hip in a world of pain. Jan Frodeno in a world of pain, but he never gave up. He never gave up, never gave in to the negative speak, even gently through the turns as he came through the stadium again. What looks like a smile truly was a grimace. And that final time into the stadium, the crowds going crazy. 7.27.53, a brand new world record for the best ever, Jan Frodeno. A gold medal, 270.3 world titles, three Ironman world titles, and now another brand new world mark, the greatest of all time, Germany's Jan Frodeno. Victory is yours. The world record is yours. Finally, Young got to smile. And I know he'll be sticking around, standing by for the arrival of a great rival, but a good friend. They push each other so hard, they inspire one another. And on the way is Lionel Sanders. But many, many, many autographs for Jan Frodeno now. And don't forget, become part of uh, that auction. Another historic first. We want to put our cameras onto Lionel Sanders now. We want to bring him to the finish line. He had a, a really, really tough day three weeks ago in the heat of Coeur d'Alene, Ironman Coeur d'Alene, where he says he ran about 10 miles and walked the other 16. An almost four-hour marathon is unheard of for this phenomenal, phenomenal character. He's got a huge heart. He's got a massive personality. So transparent, so honest, so inspiring to hundreds of thousands of followers around the world. Been racing triathlon professionally for 10 years. He's open about his drug and alcohol addiction. He's open about how triathlon basically saved his life. 
He's also open about how he's decided that triathlon will not become a new addiction, but without a doubt, he does obsess about being the best he can be, getting the best out of himself. He certainly had his best swim today. He's had his best bike today, four hours and 27 seconds for 180 kilometers here in the Allgäu, making his trip for the very first time to Germany. He's been surrounded by castles, and it's only appropriate because he is one of the kings. On the left, King Frodeno. On your right, King Sanders. Make sure you join the auction and own a piece of trap on history. Visit tribebattle.com forward slash nft.com for more about that. But let's move back to the right-hand side of your screen. Few kilometers left for Lionel Sanders. His wife, Erin, is here. Talbot is here, who captures all of Lionel's frank and honest moments, shares his training, shares his thoughts about what he did wrong, what he did right. Three weeks ago, he said he was going to retire. But look at him here giving one of the performances of his life. He's also been in a world of pain for the last 15 kilometers, but he's not given in to that negative speak, continuing to forge forward one foot in front of another. Still moving at four minutes a K is Lionel Sanders. Hashtag no limits. Well, don't you know it. No limits is not just about winning. No limits is about always getting the best out of yourself on the day, whatever that may be. So as uh, Lionel Sanders continues to push to the finish line to join his inspiration and his friend, Jan Frodeno, we also have our face of the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. She started it all at the Große Abse Meli. Let's hear it from you. Paul, thank you so much, but what a day it has been. We have a new world record. So ladies and gentlemen, everybody, please, once again, put your hands together for athletes, for Jan Frodeno, for the world record. There we go, all Allgäu is celebrating this very moment. Immenstadt is standing on their head and are celebrating, well, the history that has been written here alongside the valleys and hills in beautiful Immenstadt. And it has been a fantastic day. Guys, we have a new world record. How amazing is that? And But I think we need another athlete here in the arena and I think he's also on the way. So Paul, take it away. Thank you, Millie. Lovely to have you there with all those crowds around you. And look at this. There's a world of support. Hashtag no limits. Yes, indeed. Hashtag no limits. There's no limits from Jan Frodeno on the left. Breaking previously thought limits. And there's no limits from Canada's Lionel Sanders. His wife, Erin, is here standing by. It was going absolutely perfectly, but sometimes perfection is not enough. But look at this, pushing, pushing hard. He's been in a world of pain for the last sort of around about 10 miles. But if you compare this to three weeks ago in Coeur d'Alene, he ran 10 miles and he walked 16. Well, here he ran 16 and he's continued to run the other 10 miles of pain, never giving in, never giving up. The Canadian flag is there for him. He's not far away from the finish line. To everybody here, liebe Leute, we need you to go crazy. It's almost time for a reason applause for Canada's Lionel Sanders. Moments away from joining us on the finish line. He can't wait. The people on the side of the streets are going crazy. Jan Frodeno will be there to welcome him. That final little right-hand turn. There's all the branding. And he's into race central for our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. A phenomenal swim. An incredible bike performance. And what a run as well. Get ready to bring him home to all the family and friends and the fans all across Canada, all across the United States of America, all across the world. Yes, your superstar, one of our two kings on the day, on this historic day of the Zwift Tri Battle Royale, Canada's Lionel Sanders fighting every step of the way in those last 10 miles, those last 16 kilometers, and he's into the final 150 meters, maybe 200 meters is all that's left. Listen to the crowds going crazy in the background. This is so good to hear that respect. And your new world record holder will be standing by to welcome him. There we go, the final 50 meters, 743.20. It's gonna be a new personal best for Lionel Sanders on this historic day. What a gladiator, what a fighter. The second of our two kings, Lionel Sanders.
Just wish we could hear what they were saying to each other. Look, look, that grimace has become a smile because he just heard from Jan what that time was. Look at that. The respect, the celebration, being together, being part of the team on this historic day. Thank you, Lionel Sanders, for all that you do and all that you've done and all that you will still do. Across to our media crews, the cameras are going crazy. Social media is going to go crazy. With Felix Rüdiger, the best friend and manager of Jan Frodeno. <laughs> He's in a world of pain, really, really struggling. Lionel Sanders, we're going to give him a little break. We'll chat to him a little bit later. Although maybe he'll give us a quick word. Hello, Fredrickson, in the white shirt of uh, our Zwift Tri Battle. I'm going to hand straight across yeah, to you. Hello, yeah. Fredrickson, straight yeah, to you. Okay? Let's get some words from Lionel Sanders. I'd rather stay here. Yeah, yeah let's do it. It's all yours. He's got the microphone here. It's all yours. Let's hear from Lionel. Yeah. Lionel, you almost made me cry uh, when you passed that finish line. That was an amazing performance like today. I know you would have done better. I know you would have wanted to keep the pace up in the end, but you still did a PB and you pushed uh, Jan incredible. Talk me through what, what, what's going through your mind right now? Jan is an amazing athlete. That's what's going through my mind. Um, I gave my very best. It was an honor to be invited to this event. Uh, I mean, we, we put it as a battle, but I always knew that Jan was going for the world record. He didn't want to say too much about it beforehand because, as you know, the conditions and everything here can... And it wasn't that fast the conditions today. That's the impressive part. Um, but when he asked me to come, I, that's an opportunity of a lifetime to, to go up against literally your hero and to, uh, to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him. And I don't know how much I pushed him, but um, it was an amazing experience. I definitely think you pushed him a lot and, and you were way under the world record for a long time as well and just shows your potential on the distance as well. And we are all excited to see that you're getting your nutrition better and better and better. And I know there's still improvement to make, but what do you feel today in terms of how, how much of you improving in your nutritional plans now? Yeah, I definitely feel like I, I did better in that department. I mean, I probably should have went out in 740 pace and not try to do 735 pace because I think I paid for it uh, pretty badly at the end there. But I, I don't have any regrets. I, I, this was the opportunity of a lifetime, and this is something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Exactly. You take a chance and, and you did it perfectly today. Congrats on an amazing, Thank you, Helen. amazing race. It. And it was just amazing to witness you two battle it out. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hela Fredrickson. Thank you very much, Lionel Saunders. As we watch him come over the line, oh, that finish line couldn't have been quick enough. And he was talking about 740 versus 735. He's talking about per mile, minutes per mile. But we just love you, Lionel. We love what you do. We love how you do it. And today, you've been incredible. What a swift try, Battle Royale. The title couldn't be any more apt. Phenomenal, and I know that everybody sitting at home, you're glad you've taken the time to be glued to your screen. Seven hours, <laughs> seven hours and 20 odd minutes. I, I, I'm struggling to remember the times. World record, personal bests, blowing up the course on the swim, on the bike, on the run. Your Zwift Tri Battle Royale, Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders. Watch Lionel's face change from a grimace. And then Jan says something and he smiles. Yeah. So nice of you to join Hela Fredericks and myself. Till Schenk who's out on the course. Ilud Palpel out on the course. Daniel Ungo who's been here in the stadium. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. What a day we have had so brilliant to be here not inside the ropes but smelling their sweat sensing their anticipation feeling the excitement even feeling that doubt there was those moments of doubt 
The conditions were far from what we wanted. Shortly, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be doing the finish line presentations. The podium presentation. Look at those tri battle trophies and a massive bottle of, we're not allowed to call it champagne, Zekt, as we now hand across to Meli for the finish line presentations. What a day it has been. History has been written here in Imstadt in Allgäu. A new world record has been set by Jan Frodeno. And it is, well, he beat his time from 2016, where he laid down a seven hours and 35 minutes with 39 seconds. And now here in Imstadt, he set a whole new record with 7.27.53. What a time. Dear Lord, what a what a day it has been. We had a fantastic day full of amazing sports and I found a new love in this, this uh, sports in this in those different disciplines. It was just crazy to see how willing these athletes are to push themselves. Of course, Lionel Sanders, a fantastic time as well. He couldn't quite beat the world uh, the, the record from 2016 sadly, but also splendid time by 7 hours and 43 minutes and 32 seconds. Seconds. I mean, we went the full distance. We had 3.8 kilometers in the lake. We had 180 kilometers on the bike. And to close things off, the guys just went on and pulled off a whole marathon of 42.2 kilometers. And it is just insane to see how happy and how enthusiastic they are about their sports. And I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. What a fantastic day it has been. Algo, you've been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Immenstadt, for being so such a great host to this fantastic, fantastic event, the Swift Tri Battle Royale. And of course, a big shout out to our fantastic commentators or experts in the booth who covered the full distance here with us, Paul Kay and Hella Fredrickson. Thank you so much for being our voices today in this fantastic, well, triathlon history that we have, uh, we have written together. You guys were with us. And I mean, you guys here on site, you've been an amazing, amazing audience cheering the athletes on until no end and I think you're a vital part of this world record. So applause to you guys. Thank you so, so much for being a part of today. And I would say I'll quickly hand over to back to Helle and, uh, and of course, Paul. Thank you so much for being here today. And of course, a huge shout out to our partners and the team that made this possible. And I think we set a new uh, standard for Triathlon and I'm really, really eager to see how things will go on from here. Thank you very much, Meli. The Algo is famous for its winter sports. Well, it was. Now it is famous for triathlon. Thanks to our two kings, Jan Frodeno and Lionel Sanders in the Zwift Tri Battle Royale. We are moments away from presenting our two kings to the podium for the final little bow that we're going to tie on this gift that these two kings have given us, making history on this day, Helen. And you got to be there right next to them. Yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> I, I was almost lost for word. I didn't know what to do with myself out there. I mean, it's two role models, both both of them. And, and we got everything today. Oh. We, we, we got more than we could expect. We got a lot of drama as well. And I mean, like, we, they really made it exciting, maybe a little bit too exciting sometimes. I, I, I got to admit to you, I mean, it, it was hard to contain my shock when, when, when Jan took a tumble, you know, it was really hard to, to contain my shock and, and, and as a commentator, sometimes you need to be a little bit more, you know, neutral, yeah. but we're so invested in this, you know, these are our friends, these are our heroes, Absolutely. this is a sport that we love, like, yeah. like few people love sports, and, and you never want to see an external influence like that slipping on the carpet or a mechanical, whatever no. the case may be, impact what is otherwise potentially no. the most amazing day in our sport and it didn't because Jan didn't let it exactly no his mind was way way too strong so uh, no he got what he came from and I think for that and maybe even more than he ever dreamt about like definitely more than I took they are dreaming about this morning so this is impressive seven hours 27 minutes and 53 seconds just remember those numbers 727 well you get a boeing that's a 727 and they went like a boeing let me tell you 72753 as we just uh, show you again how things have been here yeah. yeah the recap of the canadian rock star lionel sanders the colonel himself one of our two kings and i think people thought maybe we're exaggerating a little bit when we use the term kings but when you see what they've done on this day in far from perfect conditions they deserve the title of kings 
Absolutely, it was, uh, and also as Lionel said, it was it was a true honor for him to be here battling it out. And he also went under his former uh, personal best record, so he also had an amazing, amazing performance. And yeah, there are definitely way more to come from Lionel. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. You know, Jan's got 20 years of triathlon in him. <laughs> Lionel's got 10. Jan's 40 in a month's time. Lionel's 33. There, exactly. There's a lot more racing to come. And I think, it, you know, Lionel often talks about the fact that how Jan inspires him and he loves going toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jan because he learns so much. I think he could write a book on what he learned today. Oh, absolutely. And I hope that But what he learned about himself. Exactly, Len. And I think he's improved himself a lot and he's learned a lot about today. And I know he will go down and write go home and write some notes down because he will keep improving and keep learning from, from some mistakes he had because he still hasn't got it perfect, but he's so hungry to prove he can. And I tell you something, you know who else is hungry besides you and me because we've been stuck in the box all day? <laughs> I'm hungry to see his videos, his post-race videos. Yeah, yeah. They're going to be awesome. Absolutely, yeah. We're in for the street there as well. Make sure you follow, uh, if you don't already, you're following Lionel Sanders on his social media platforms, but especially YouTube. Uh, he's got his good teammate, Talbot Cox, who produces these fantastic raw and real videos. You know, they're very raw, they're very real, yep. they're uncensored, they're very transparent and massively honest. And as they say in German, super sympathetic, you know, you, yep. you really feel that, that this is not scripted. No, no, and it's not, this is real. Yeah. This is raw, this is authentic. And this we is live what in, you a, get. In, a, in a world where we struggle to, the lines between reality and, and virtual reality yep. is so blurred, but yep. then when you get reality, you really latch yep. onto it. And that's, you know, that's what maybe what social media has done. Like we are craving authenticity and that's that's what Lionel is giving us on, on social media. That's why we, that's we the love word I was to, looking for, authenticity. Yeah, we, yep, we love right. to follow him. We love to see what he's on about and, and, and we're inspired by, um, you know, where he came from and where he is at now. Yep. It's been a huge production, not without its challenges. Not only that, it's been challenged. We were challenged as well, but what a privilege and an honor it's been to be with you since just before nine this morning, German time, when we started with the 3,800 meters in that beautiful lake, the Große Alpsee, onto that bike course on the, a freeway closed for these athletes, our two kings. We were hoping it'd be dry, it wasn't. We thought, well, if it's not dry, there's no ways we're gonna see a record, but these two rock stars surprised us. Yeah. They continued to push both of them, setting phenomenal bike times. 3.55 for Jan Frodeno, 4 hours and 27 seconds for, for Lionel Sanders. And then they shot out a transition, but they actually held back. They maintained, even though Lionel says he thinks it went a little too fast at first. And then Jan came and slipped on the carpet and we were like, oh my goodness, is this over? And I am so glad it wasn't over. No, exactly. He definitely proved that it was mind over matter there. He pushed through and he wanted this so badly. And, and whatever you want, you can get it if you keep pushing. They are proof. And you know, this happens in one day. But this is the metaphor for life. Mm -hmm. You've got to keep pushing for, for what you believe in and believe in it with 100% of your heart and mind. Yeah, absolutely. No, you can bring this with you for the rest of your life. Um, and I'm sure they're gonna put this memory down in the back of, of, of great, great memories and you'll always be able to take it out when you need to. Thank you to you, you, you and you for being with us all day today so far. We're gonna be doing the podium ceremony shortly. Hello Fredrissing. dressing been insane wouldn't you agree i mean you've been incredible so great that you joined us for this um nice to have fresh perspectives fresh voice a fresh new eye on things uh and that you and i we are both humbled that we yeah. had the privilege and the pleasure of sharing this event with everybody at home all across europe how ah, he's got his robe on awesome. all across europe all across north america south america asia Australasia, Oceania, the whole world has been watching uh, and it's been a privilege and an honor. It's not something we, 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 we take for granted. You and no, I both couldn't no. sleep last night, right? You know, I tell you. Well, it looks like we're going to be beginning with our ceremony now. Unfortunately, Lionel is a little bit under the weather, cannot join us immediately. And we're going to give him his moment. He's, he's left it all out on the course. Yeah. We love you, Lionel. Thank you for everything you've done today. Yeah. But it's time to take you back to the finish line as we get ready for our finish line presentations. I know that Daniel Unger is there doing the presentation in the stadium. 
as we get ready to remind you about what we witnessed today. Thank you to everybody in Algarve for hosting us. You've been incredible hosts. These memories are made for a lifetime. The volunteers have been working tirelessly for the last week. The citizens who let us close their, their freeway, their roads, and yeah. their village. I mean, you can't imagine a setup for, for two people racing like we witnessed today. This is amazing, magnificent. Magnificent is very, very unique. Um, yeah, we hope this is going to happen again. Oh, I don't see why not. Jan Fredero is still signing those much wanted autographs. And the good thing about this, we have no time constraints. No, we, we can take all day. Nobody wants to let this moment go. Seven hours, 27 minutes, 53 seconds. Two heroes, two kings, Jan Fredero and Lionel Sanders. Can you imagine social media must be going mad? Yeah. Hey? <laughs> it should be. I mean, we're writing history. So it should be like Social media is writing it for us. And I'm still still sitting and thinking, what if we had the perfect conditions? What then? Well, that's the good thing about that is I'm glad the conditions were not perfect today. Look at that chair. <laughs> Cuz this is making them think, hold on, we're going to come and do it again. <laughs> Yeah. He's just sat down and we're going to get him back up again. You know uh, that's, how much that's going to That's going to be hard, yeah. <laughs> Can you see how much he enjoys sitting down right now? Oh, that's a That's going to hurt. That's a stiff leg. How do you even get your leg up to your knee after what you've Ooh, done after falling on that? He hip? could easily cramp up by doing this. Yeah. We need someone to help him to put that shoe on. Ja, und vielleicht hat Frodo noch eine Sekunde Zeit, denn viele von uns haben ja einen Langdistanz-Triathlon nicht unter 7 Stunden 30 gefinisht. Frau Dissimo, wie fühlt sich das denn jetzt an, so kurz danach? Ja, es hat sich auf jeden Fall vorher besser angefühlt. <lacht> said it felt better earlier. Aber es ist schon wieder gut yeah. drauf. It's hurting now. Oh, definitely. Nach dem Zieleinlauf, da war natürlich erstmal die Anziehung relativ heftig. Da muss man sich mal ganz kurz erholen. Aber die Jungs sind absolut top durchtrainiert, sonst wäre das natürlich auch alles gar nicht möglich. Und wir blicken immer noch mit Staunen auf are. diese Zahl. Best trained, otherwise this would not have been possible. Just trying to interpret yeah. the German for our non-German speakers around the world. Yeah. This time of 7.20, 7.53 in this valley, in the Algoi, the whole world is watching and still the world can't believe. I don't think Jan can, can believe it quite yet. It's going to take a while to, yeah, to, to sink, sink in. in. He's still hurting too much to believe it. Yeah, he's high. He is so high on everything. Endorphins, adrenaline, emotions, everything. Yeah, this actually happened. Um, you know what? I, we, we, we're getting ready now for the podium presentation in the champagne shower. And I always say that's the best shower after a race. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you want your kit to smell of champagne when yeah. you get back to the hotel room. <laughs> Then Actually, you've done well. You know, that kit that he's wearing right now, what I think we should do is once it's full of champagne, he should take it off and we should auction the champagne smelling kit. Yeah, and plus a little bit of blood on his hip. So <laughs> it's been through the battlefield uh, today, that's for sure. <laughs> See, he's now trying to kind of, fix, yeah, put his head, wrap his head around what he's actually done today. <laughs> Look at him. I'm doing the presentation, then I hand to me and then we die. Dieser Mann, Olympiasieger in Peking, dann 2013 Weltmeister mit der Mixed Team Relay, Nationalmannschaft Deutschland, unter anderem im Team damals Franz Löschke, Anja Knapp und unsere Hawaii Champion Anne Haug. Dann zwei Jahre später auf Hawaii zum ersten Mal Champion 
Das Ganze dreimal wiederholt in Rot 2016. 7 Stunden 35 und 39 Sekunden. Das war die Weltbestzeit. Dann kam auf Hawaii eine Zeit unter 8 Stunden 7,51. Auch das ist nach wie vor Rekord. Und heute hier in Burgbock im Allgäu noch einmal einen draufgesetzt. Unter nicht ganz einfachen Bedingungen auf einer sehr, sehr schnellen Strecke. 7 Stunden 27, 53. Es ist kaum zu glauben. Und wenn wir es noch mal aufdröseln, 45 Minuten, 55 im Schwimmen, 3 Stunden, 55 auf dem Rad und 2 Stunden, 43 für den Marathon. Wahnsinn. Unglaublich. Unglaublich. Unbelievable. That is Danny busy reading out all of Jans Palmares, including being, you know, um, mixed relay world champion. Just, just sharing, you know, with the German fans, we've got to do it in German, right? You know, yeah. and, and I, I think it's just right to let that moment breathe and share it with the world. This, this is a man, Dan, who's, who's battled Jan Fredino, you yeah, know, yeah, and, and, and beaten him. Yeah, and he was also taking him back to some of their, yeah, their ITU days where they were battling it out together. And, and Daniel has got the better of Jan many times. Well, Jan, so. Jan did say, look, I, I've lost more than I've won. Yep. I think right now <laughs> he's thinking, I, I'm looking forward to my champagne shower. But we, he was talking through, you know, all those Palmares through 70.3 World Championship, two of those to, to the 735.39 in, in Roth in 2016. And there, Hannes Blaschke is uh, another one of our legends in his traditional Aloha shirt. <laughs> Finally, he gets close to Jan and, and congratulate him. And, and Jan's raced Hannes's Allgäuer Triathlon yeah. here in the region, in the Große Alps as well, where he's become Deutscher Meister, German national champion. Die Legende aus dem Allgäu, Hannes Blaschke, vielen Dank für deinen Einsatz heute. There we go. Big cheers for Hannes Blaschke. Why don't we just remind you one more time what Daniel Unger was saying in German. Let's put those graphics on the screen of the achievements of this superstar. That is Jan Frodeno. Look at that, Olympic champion 2008. His wife that year as well, gold. Exactly. In uh, Beijing, Ironman world champion 15, 16 and 19. 17 is where he had that major back problem. Remember, he was lying on the ground, stretching out his back. Yes. That's where uh, Lionel came second in 17. Yeah. Uh, 18, he didn't do it after a brilliant 70.3 world championship in Nelson Mandela Bay, but took a tumble, hurt his hip, came back in 2019 and set a new world best time at the Ironman world champion ship on the big island of Hawaii in Kailua, Kona in 2019 and two years of no triathlon like this, two years of no Ironman yep. and two years he's had a two-year rest so I don't know why he's looking so tired. <laughs> <laughs> no he did not race any races last yeah, year exactly. only the try at home well only he did a, 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 a full distance race at and he home raced inside. He raised so, not only did he race at home he raised so much money for the for Freedom charity. Foundation for yes. charity yeah. and the the auction that we're doing here as well uh, all that all those funds going to charity. We're waiting for Lionel uh, for Lionel Sanders to come and join us we, we thought it's only right that we give him a little bit of time. Absolutely, yeah. We freshen up a bit. And yeah. it, it would be wrong to have him on the po to have Jan on the podium without Lionel there. Yeah, yeah. And we have all the time in the world, and we're definitely going to wait for him and show the respect that he deserves. Without a doubt, that is that is what the sport of triathlon is about. Absolutely. Yep, so we'd love for you to get involved in our auction. So here we go. On the screen now is where you can bid in the auction and help us raise more funds for the Frodeno Foundation. There we go. Try-battle-nft.com. Join the auction and own a piece of triathlon history, yours and only yours. Get into the auction action now as Dan is getting the crowds to chant Lionel, Lionel, Lionel in the background. We're just keeping Jan warm now because if he gets too cold too quickly, he's going to cramp like mad. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then his recovery is going to take even longer. I'm not sure that he's worrying too much about recovery, but <laughs> you still need to think a little bit about he's going to be so, so stiff. And getting off that chair is going to be a hurt. struggle. It's going to hurt. Yeah, and he might need a few, few hands to be carried almost away. So keep him warm. He is very, very very lean he's fit and ready for this race as we saw so therefore yeah he doesn't have much fat on his body so therefore getting easierly cold right and as you can see but right now chatting to uh, his manager and best friend Felix and yep. it's it's amazing to this see this is uh, their victory absolutely this is their record yeah and and Felix is over the moon um, he can relax now yes finally <laughs>
Come on, Lionel. He's going to join us shortly, and we can do the presentation to wrap the bow around a brilliant day. A gift to the world of triathlon in the form of our two kings here at the Zwift Tri Battle Royale ah, cool. with an all new world record of 7.27.53. Personal best for both these athletes. Phenomenal to watch. And, and that, we, that we could bring these pictures to the world live. Yes, with one or two little dropouts, but I think people at home very much got, Yeah. they could almost smell it, they could taste it. Yeah, people will, will they will be fine with the few drop-offs. Of course that would happen, we are live and things happen, life happens, you know, so we definitely did our best. And I think, uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the, the viewers has been able to, to see a lot of amazing racing and some, some superhuman performances today. Thank you also to the spectators who, who lined the course. You know, we, we very, very strict COVID profiles here in Bavaria. You've got to wear a very specific mask. You can't wear any mask. All of us on the crew had to be COVID tested, even though a lot of us are vaccinated already. Uh, so many people on the bridges out on the bike course, lining the run course, um, riding alongside their bicycles with a Canadian flag in support yeah. of, of Lionel Sanders. And let me tell you something, Lionel needed that flag. Absolutely. I think that gave him so much right there where he really, really needed it. He was suffering big time and he was in a black, black, black hole at that point. So that wow. Canadian flag just gave him a little bit of patriotic feeling and remembering home and I'm doing it for more than just me. I remember, you know, just not so long ago, we were watching the, the Euro 2020s, you know, even though we had it in 2021 and uh, how appalled I was at the booing in the stadium of opposition teams yeah. and the booing of national anthems. Yeah. Here we are, we're in Germany with the German hero Jan Fredino. Lionel's very, very far away from home mm -hmm. and they're cheering him and Absolutely. they're flying his flag. Yeah. That is what you've got to love about this sport. Yeah, we, I just love this respect we have for one another and mutual respect and, and uh, the, the performance that, that the athletes is showing today. And I mean, we are all in awe and super inspired and what, what you saw today, today was not driven by money. No, no. This is driven by the Pride. want, yeah, and they want to excel and they want to achieve something greater than you can ever imagine is possible to achieve, to push yourself to the limit. That's what you want, you know. That's what they live for. That's what they train for. And a lot of people watching now are thinking how they can push their limits. And here comes Lionel Sanders. Yep, that's what we call no limits. Hannes Blaschke with his hand on Lionel's shoulder. Lionel having a bit of time to, to compose himself as he makes his way to the finish line. Meine liebe Leute, ladies and gentlemen, everybody that can hear us at home here and at the stadium, come on, put your hands together. and riesiger Applaus. Here he comes back. Lionel Sanders, he needed a moment to step away, but he's coming back to the finish line as we get ready for our finish line presentations. Look at the applause. Look at the welcome he's getting. Gosh, it's beautiful. I'm so proud to be a part of Triathlon. Yes. Yeah. Look this is him. amazing. Wow. Looking he's, fresh. <laughs> see how emotional he is as yep. well. Look, he's holding it in. Yeah. He's trying hard. Yeah. No, this is a roll. You don't get more roll than nope. this. And you know who's going to help Jan out of the chair? Yeah, of course. Lionel. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did Jan just say long day? <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a long day, it was 7.27. What are you talking about? Look at these guys. And prior to this week, they'd only ever had one beer together. I'm sure they're going to have a few more. Lionel Sanders aus Canada and Jan Frodeno aus Deutschland. Ein unvergessliches Erlebnis und wir wollen diese beiden Helden des Tages. So we want to celebrate the heroes of the day. Lionel Sanders of Canada, Jan Frodeno of Germany, and we're getting ready for the final part of our Zwift Tri Battle Royale. As I said earlier, we tie the bow on this gift of history that these two heroes have given us. Lionel Sanders and Jan Frodeno in Richtung Zielbogen zu kommen und da steht sie immer noch diese Zeit Look at these incredible trophies that, that, that's a piece of the Alps they've got there those big rocks oh, wow yeah. Yeah. Jan is up off with the top incredible passion being shown here 
beginnen mit dem Mann, der heute Zweite geworden ist. So, wir wollen uns we start now with our second position. We present to you, joining us from Canada, living in Tucson, Arizona. And I think it's wrong to say second. I think uh, I'd like to stick to the hashtag we saw a little bit earlier today, yeah. that today we have two winners. Absolutely. And I want to bring up the first of our two winners. A huge congratulations, Lionel Sanders! The first of our two winners, Canada's Lionel Sanders. 30 Ironman 70.3 distance victories, four Ironman victories, and now part of triathlon history at this Rift Tri Battle Royale. A best swim, a best bike, an incredible run. Lionel Sanders, Canada. <laughs> Up onto the podium, you can do it. Oh, that must hurt. <laughs> Oi. Oi. He's up. He doesn't really know whether he want to go up on that one, but of course he, he should be up on that one. And there's only one more person to bring to the podium. But we're letting Li Lionel enjoy this. We're letting the crowds enjoy it. We're in no rush. Listen to that. Yeah. It's amazing Lionel, to see Lionel. the support. Yeah. Beautiful. Look at that trophy. The beautiful golden wreaths in our carpets, in the logo. Try Battle Royale, the first of our two winners, the first of our two kings, Lionel Saunders from Canada. There's only one person left to bring. Yep. Can't wait for that too. Our Olympic gold medalist, our two time 70.3 world champion. Our three-time Ironman world champion and the all-new record holder. The three battle royale for sich entschieden hat, der den Triathlon in eine neue Dimension gebracht hat. Bringing triathlon to a brand new dimension. Seven hours, 27:53, a brand new world record. Jan Frodeno, the first of our two winners. <laughs> And the biggest winner today is triathlon. Yeah. Showing it's, what's possible. Let's watch him get up. Oh, he's got a Wee. helping hand. <laughs> Amazing. It's super humbling, isn't it? Still having a big chat, these two, eh? They don't yeah. stop. No. I think they will go on all night. And look at that. The trophies are identical. But the difference is... 72753 the world record is Jan Frodenos. Look at that. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. Another goosebump. <laughs> we've we've been struggling with the goosebumps all day and it hasn't <laughs> been cold in here, I promise you that. And I think they've got goosebumps as well. And one of my favorite moments of any triathlon is when we have the champagne shower. Yes. Here in Deutschland it's called Zekt. Ja, das war der einfache Teil und jetzt kommt die Champagner-Dusche und der Hinweis von Jan und Frau Deno ist natürlich berechtigt. Vielleicht erst mal das goldene Buch des Landkreises in Sicherheit bringen. Und jetzt <laughs> Just heißt moving. es... All our officials out of the way for the champagne sh celebrations. Save this one, all right? And then we'll, we'll just use his for the champagne. <laughs> it's all right, it's all right. That's heißt dann, Frodo, the stage is yours. Wir schauen mal, wie Champagner dusche geht. Shows you what a gentleman Lionel is as well. He wants yeah. Jan to spray the champagne. Jan with the magnum of bubbles. And there we go. This is the official moment, the crowning moment of a historic day, only one month away from the 40th birthday of the man who set a brand new world record of seven hours, 27 minutes and 53 seconds. We say Prost und zum Wohl, Jan Frodeno. Congratulations, Lionel Sanders. Thank you for what you two have brought to this historic day and the gift you've given the triathlon world. Look at those smiles. must taste good. Yep. <laughs> it definitely tastes good. Yeah, Jan says so too. I can yeah. see by his face. What an amazing day. It's good, see? <laughs> you might have changed your shirt, Lionel. <laughs> that shirt should be auctioned as well. <laughs>
Hela, I'm just going to use this moment to say a massive manyatak. Thank you very, very much to you for everything you've brought, your insights, your expertise. Thank you for being part of the sort of tri battle round. Yeah, thank you for having me. I've really enjoyed it a lot. This has been a, a massive experience for me and a great, great day. And uh, yeah, we witnessed something wild today. We witnessed something wild. It's time for me, Paul Kay and Hella Fredrickson to say thank you for joining us. Congratulations on being part of a historic day. As we head now to wrap up the Zwift Tri Battle Royal, it's all yours, Melly. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Helle, for being such fantastic casters throughout the day and carrying us through this fantastic historic moment where we've set a new world record by Jan Frodeno. Seven hours, 27 minutes and 53 seconds over the full distance. What a day it has been. The weather was trying and we had a few hiccups here and there, but overall our athletes are pretty happy with their performance. And I think that they can be because they have written history, both of them. Lionel Sanders finished today's uh, full distance with seven hours, 43 minutes and 32 seconds. And that is also a fantastic performance performance right here, here in Immenstadt in Allgäu. And it has been a pleasure being your host today. Everyone watching this, if at her from home or here on site, thank you so much for sticking with us throughout the day, cheering our athletes on and giving feedback via social media. Hashtag try battle if you want to share something with us. Shoot away, we love reading from you. And that's it here from Immenstadt. My name is Melek Meli Balgun, and that was the Swift Try Battle Royale. And we're gonna wrap things up with with beautiful uh, shots from the venue and of course this amazing challenge our two kings have mastered. See you next time. Two kings. One battle. Time. to make triathlon history. The Tri-Battle Royale.